Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so with Thor Ragnarok right around the corner, what I wanna do here is I wanna cover the story of the death of Odin. And this is actually pretty important. And the reason why is because what this does is this leads directly into Ragnarok itself. It basically sets up the stage for why it is that Thor is king of Asgard when Ragnarok happens, why it is that Odin isn't there. Now, initially, there are a couple things that I wanna talk about here. A couple things that sort of make sense of all this stuff. So uh, for the most part, this all comes out of Heroes Reborn. Technically speaking, this is considered Thor Volume 2. But for the character of Thor, it was basically this sort of soft reboot. One of the things that we've talked about before in Marvel Comics is that Marvel does not do a hard reboot, which is to say Marvel doesn't say everything's reset, everybody starts at zero, nothing that came before this matters. They don't do what like DC does. Instead, Marvel just kind of shuffled things up a bit. The way this worked when it came to the character of Thor is that in the mid-1990s, he was one of the many alien titles that Marvel had. For the most part, when it came to like 1995, 1996, 1997, the only titles that Marvel had that were standout and would basically always sell were Spider-Man and the various X-Men related publications. Outside of that, it was a crapshoot. It was anybody's guess if the story would do well. And so what Marvel wanted to do was basically reshuffle the landscape and see if they could reinvigorate interest in their characters. And so what they did is they launched a story called the Onslaught Saga. Now we've talked about Onslaught Saga before. It's not super important. We kind of need to go into it a little bit, but the whole idea of the Onslaught Saga is that it was basically a story that dealt with the minds of Charles Xavier and Magneto coalescing into one and then creating this insanely powerful psychic entity. But the whole idea was that it ended with Thor and the Fantastic Four and a handful of the Avengers jumping into the energy of Onslaught and then being reborn when Franklin Richards resurrected them in the Counter-Earth universe, basically an alternate reality. And the entire line of publications from Marvel in the 90s that was called Heroes Reborn Born, took place within that universe and it was designed for the purpose of just giving new origins to different characters and it was literally Marvel just kind of testing the waters ultimately Marvel decided to cancel it out and bring the characters back that happened in a story called Heroes Return and everybody knows that story sucks but with regards to the character of Thor when he returned in 1998 the title was more or less revamped and then ultimately it was taken over by a guy named Dan Jurgens. now Dan Jurgens got his claim to fame in comic books when it came to writing the death of Superman the problem is that the death of Superman basically destroyed the sales of action comics for God only knows how long, really up until recently. But he was brought into Marvel, he wrote Thor, and what he basically ended up doing was reshaping and just kind of shaking up the landscape in a lot of different ways. There were a couple things that he did, two really important things he did that we need to cover here in the story. The first part is the character of Jake Olsen, and the second is the character of Tareen. Now, Jake Olsen was basically Marvel trying to return Thor to the old, you know, Thor, Donald Blake dichotomies. When Thor first popped up, in Marvel Comics, he was just a guy named Donald Blake and then became Thor. It was over the course of the publications that came after that that we basically learned that when Thor was younger, he was full of hubris, he was very arrogant, and the result was that in order to teach him humility, Odin banished him to Earth in the form of Donald Blake. Now, eventually, basically, Donald Blake stumbled across, uh, you know, this old cane and he hit it on a rock and then he became Thor, realized he was Thor. It was this scenario where Thor was shackled to the character of Donald Blake. And so whenever Donald Blake was going about his normal business, it would just be him. When trouble brewed, he would hit his cane on the ground and he would become Thor. Now it did teach Thor humility, but because of the fact that the whole Donald Blake and Thor dichotomy was a reflection of old hat stuff in comics, which is to say alter egos, different things like that, Donald Blake basically began to go away and then Marvel replaced him with Eric Masterson. The version of Thor that you see in the Infinity Gauntlet story, that's Eric Masterson Thor. Now when it came to the character of Jake Olsen, it was again yet another attempt to create this intriguing scenario. The way it played out is that Jake Olsen was basically an EMT. He was killed in this battle between uh, the Avengers and Thor against the Destroyer armor, I think it was. And then ultimately, because Thor felt guilty and a lot of other things that went on behind the scenes, he was confined to the body of, uh, of Jake Olsen. So it was interesting for what it was, but it wasn't super intriguing. But the more important thing, and really one of the more significant things when it comes to this, is the character of Tareen. Uh, right now in Marvel Comics, which is to say at this moment with their publishing stories, uh, Jane Foster is currently Thor. And one of the things that a lot of people say is, well, Marvel should like make Jane Foster 
character not Thor, and then give her her own line of comics where she's equal to Thor, but not the same. Tareen was Marvel's attempt at that, and it failed disastrously. That's why a lot of people don't know who Tareen is. But the idea of Tareen is that she was introduced in the form of something called the Designate. Now, the Designate was basically this concept that was made up by Dan Jurgens for the purpose of saying Tareen is a character that just can't die. No matter what happens, they have to keep her alive. I mean, she can be killed, but the goal of Odin and Thor and, and the other Asgardians is to make sure she doesn't die. And the reason why is because as the Designate, she is a character who's prophesied to usher in this golden age of enlightenment for humanity in the sense that maybe everybody gains powers or whatever the case may be, but she'll lead humanity into the next stage of their evolution, becoming better than they currently are. If she dies, that won't happen. And so again, it's an interesting scenario because during the interim in which she would eventually become that character where she would undertake that role and the time she first popped up, she was basically Thor girl. I mean, that's literally what they called her. They called her Thor girl. Didn't really hit a lot of people. A lot of people weren't really interested in it, but she was basically a tie into the existing story. And so there was really no way to escape it. But the whole idea here is that this initially picks up with the schemes of like Loki. Now, Loki is actually working alongside a girl named Carnilla, I think her name is. And Carnilla is a character that debuts all the way back to like Journey into Mystery number 107 in 1964. She's been around forever. And she's basically one of these characters where she's obsessed and in love with a character called Balder the Brave, just one of the Asgardians who exists out there. And the idea of Carnilla is that she routinely put the characters of Thor and Loki in these precarious situations to where she would hope they would lose favor in the eyes of Odin. And so that Odin would basically look to Balder and say, well, yep, he's the only person who's really capable of leading Asgard in my stead when I basically pass on or whatever the case may be. And so she was hoping to basically marry Balder so that when he became the new king of Asgard, she would become the queen. More often than not, it didn't work out. People would figure out that she was behind all these different ruses and tricks. But again, she was just kind of a background character and there really wasn't a whole lot to her than that. But in this scenario, because of the fact that uh, Tareen is a female version of Thor, Loki and Carnilla are working together to basically discredit, defeat, and hopefully kill Thor. What they end up doing is they actually bond the essence of Tareen to the Destroyer armor. The Destroyer armor dates back to Journey into Mystery number 118. And the whole idea behind the Destroyer armor was that at, at some point in time, the Celestials showed up on Earth. Now we know just by virtue of different discussions that we've had that the Celestials are the ones who are responsible for like the rise of superheroes in the sense that they modified the genes of humans so that as time progressed, uh, humans would evolve to the point where instead of turning into a giant mass of tumors, Bruce Banner would be blasted with gamma radiation and become the Hulk. Mutants would basically start developing an X gene and they would start gaining powers. But basically humanity on Earth was a giant experiment for the Celestials. And so they would show up every so often and visiting or what was referred to as a host. And they would look at their experiments and they would determine whether or not it should continue on. Now, the first three hosts was them basically walking up, looking at Earth, just kind of inspecting it and saying, OK, we'll be back. When they came the fourth time or when they intended to come the fourth time, they were going to judge whether or not humanity should be allowed to continue living. If humanity was judged against by the Celestials, which means the Celestials didn't like how their experiment progressed, they basically would have cleansed the Earth in its entirety and then allowed everything to start over again. Because of the fact that this was a possibility, what ended up happening is Odin, along with the other Sky Fathers, basically these Marvel comic uh, versions of like Vishnu and different, different things like that, created the Destroyer armor. And it was believed that the Destroyer armor would be able to topple one of the Celestials. It didn't work. The Celestials totally obliterated the Destroyer armor. <laughs> it was pretty funny because it was like the last hope they had gets totally destroyed. But following that and going into the future of Marvel Comics, the Destroyer armor popped up, you know, every so often and it would be some event that was taking place. But because of the fact that it is built for death and destruction, if a person is not powerful enough to overcome the programming, quote unquote, of the Destroyer armor, then basically they'll be an un unwilling pilot. They'll just be there and they won't be able to control it. And that's why it is the character of Tareen has been thrown inside the Destroyer armor. She can be a sentient host, but she's not powerful enough to stop it from wreaking death and destruction everywhere it goes. And that's why this creates a precarious situation. Because while all this is going on, while Thor is facing off against the Destroyer armor, there's two things happening. The first of these, and one of the more interesting, is basically the arrival of the Watcher. Now remember, in Marvel Comics, when the Watcher shows up, his arrival basically means things are going to pop off. And that's immediately how Odin takes it. Now keep in mind, the whole idea of the Watcher is that they basically just don't intervene. They simply just watch things unfold, hence the reason why they have that name. But the Watcher showing up to Odin is with a warning of sorts. Because of the fact that Tareen is supposed to be this harbinger for this new era of humanity, if she dies, then it means that new era will not unfold. And in its place will come an era where Thor rules with an iron fist, 
where he basically just becomes this bloodthirsty tyrant of a ruler in place of Odin. Now, the other half of this is that it deals with the perspective that Odin is put in a tough spot because he has to consider the betterment of humanity as a whole over the betterment of his son. Keep in mind that while Earth itself is not within the immediate realm of Asgard, it's still considered part of Idrisil. It's still considered part of the world tree. And so Odin looks at Earth as a place to be protected, just like all the other realms that are under his rule. And so in this instance, all of humanity being threatened by a future version of his son who basically becomes a warlord is a very dangerous scenario. Do I sacrifice my son to guarantee that humanity experiences a better tomorrow? Or do I save my son and doom humanity to a future where my son becomes a warlord? Now, the other half of this is that this is what the Watcher sees happening later on in the future. But the Watcher is a very representation of the idea that the future always changes. Just because the Watcher sees something turn out a certain way doesn't mean it will. It just means that's how he sees it, that's how it is, until something else comes along and changes that. And so there's no absolute guarantee that Thor will actually become a warlord. And that's an important thing to bear in mind, because with Odin being as old as he is and being as wise as he is, he is still a father. And so if he has to make the choice between saving the life of his son and dooming humanity, or saving humanity and dooming his son, he will basically do what any father would do. He would let humanity burn. He would let humanity die and save his child. The other half of this is a very, very, very small subplot that doesn't initially seem huge at first. What it does is it picks up with a fisherman named Sven. And the cool thing about this is that Sven just kind of shows up in Norway and everybody, like all these different fishermen, are killed. Wearing a talisman, his eyes end up beginning to glow red and then he just kind of wanders off into the town and that's the last we see of him for like the next little while. The rest of the event largely deals with the idea of Thor facing off against the Destroyer armor. Now keep in mind, because of the fact that the Destroyer armor was built by Odin and was designed for the purpose of using any tool necessary in order to achieve its goal of defeating whatever foe it's facing, there's no limit to what it is that the Destroyer can achieve insofar as the various artifacts of Asgard. This is the reason why the Destroyer is able to take the Hammer of Thor and use it. And so when it all seems to come crashing down and the whole idea that Thor has basically been defeated by the Destroyer, what it does is it switches back to Norway. And with this massive bonfire that's been created, Sven leaves this bonfire and basically says, the time is at hand, my master is coming, his master obviously being Surtur himself. At this point in time in Thor's comics, he was basically a lover of sorts to Amora the Enchantress, the two of them basically being kind of on again, off again lovers. But for Amora the Enchantress, because of the fact that she is so beholden to Thor, the question becomes, why is it that he's basically being defeated by the Destroyer armor? And so what ends up happening here in this really interesting turn of events is Odin basically arrives on the scene. Now, Odin does not initially jump into the fray. Instead, what is up happening is Amor the Enchantress actually travels to the realm where uh, Loki and Carnilla are at and are currently holding the physical form of Tareen uh, in captive while her essence is confined to the Destroyer armor. And what is up happening is Amor basically takes the uh, hammer of Tareen and then brings it to Jake Olsen. The problem is that nothing happens just because of the fact that it's not Mjolnir. And so what Odin does is temporarily imbue the hammer with the same magical properties as Mjolnir, which allows the Thor persona to essentially emerge. The problem with this is that it's not Mjolnir. It's not the Hammer of Thor, meaning it's not as durable, it's not as capable, and it's not as powerful. While it does allow the two of them to engage in battle and actually go hand in hand, what ends up happening is Odin actually steps in and basically helps Thor to defeat the Destroyer armor. And what this does is it completes the prophecy of the Watcher that Odin has effectively doomed all of humanity, that he set humanity on this collision course where everything's going to come crashing down. Simultaneously in Norway, almost every single human that exists inside this country has basically been turned into one of the fire demons of Surtur. And what is up happening is Surtur himself emerges into the mortal realm. Now remember, when it came to the character of Surtur, he's very different from what we've seen in like Norse mythology. You know, when I was flying back from uh, from Kentucky, I bought Norse mythology by Neil Gaiman and basically gave myself a crash course in a 200 page book about Norse mythology. As far as I'm aware, Surtur is not inherently a character of ill will, which is to say he doesn't have like a vendetta against Odin. For the most part, he actually isn't even the one who kills Odin in Norse mythology. Instead, Surtur is basically a guy who waits until the end of all things and then burns away all the old gods and makes way for the new gods. In Marvel Comics, Surtur has been adjusted to a degree just due to the fact that he and Odin have had previous skirmishes in the past and Surtur has always been defeated. And so as a result, Surtur harbors just this absolute animosity for the character of Odin. He basically wants to see him defeated more so than anybody else. Not only that, Surtur rises into prominence because of the fact that Earth is one of the realms under the protection of Odin. The easiest way 
way to get to Odin to throw him off guard is to conquer the Earth, turn all the Earth's inhabitants into fire demons, and then march an army seven billion strong onto the gates of Asgard and bring the whole thing crashing down. And so because of this, with Surtur making his move and effectively attacking everybody left and right, what ends up happening is the words of his actions reach the ears of Odin following the defeat of the Destroyer armor. Now, simultaneously, this also sets the stage for the future of the Thor character in the sense that Jake Olsen and Thor are basically just split into two separate beings. And the reason why is because with Odin dying, what it does is it allows Thor to become king and allows Jake Olsen to do his own thing. They can function totally separate, so we don't have to worry about how Thor is going to be king and Jake Olsen at the same time. And so again, with Odin learning about the actions of Surtur and with Thor himself having sustained injuries in his battle against the Destroyer armor, Thor is basically put in this kind of healing bath where it takes time for his body to recover. At the same time, Odin grabs almost all the Asgardian warriors and brings them to Earth. But the problem with this is that because of the fact that Odin had basically re-energized these healing pools for his son Thor, because he had taken all these different warriors and teleported them all to Norway, what he's done is he's basically sapped and used up almost the entirety of the Odin force. Now keep in mind, in Marvel Comics, Odin is extremely powerful, but the caveat that Marvel made to the power that Odin has is by limiting the capabilities of what he can do by virtue of the fact that the Odin force is not infinite. It's a way to basically say, here's a guy who can do virtually anything that we want him to do because he's got the Odin force. The caveat is the more he exerts himself, the more of the Odin force he uses. And so what he has to do is enter what's called the Odin sleep, where he basically just recharges his energies. This is the worst possible time to have to go into the Odin sleep. <laughs> You've got a guy who is the harbinger of the end of all things, storming earth and basically converting every single human he comes across into a fire demon. And Odin has virtually no more energy left. And so what is up happening and probably one of the greatest displays of like comic book heroism ever, we end up having Tareen travel back to the realm of Asgard, use her powers as a designate to basically jumpstart the healing of Thor, get him healed faster, get him back to the battlefield, while all the other members of Asgard are basically facing off against the fire demons of Surtur, as well as Surtur himself. Now, in this scenario, what ends up happening is Odin does the only thing he can do. He basically charges directly into the fray, engages directly with Surtur himself. Now, the problem with this is that both of them are basically believed to have been destroyed in the process. Odin is, eff is effectively eradicated. Surtur is eradicated. They both basically die. Now, we'll find out what actually happens to them later on, but at the moment, they're basically just gone. They're out of the picture. Everybody in the universe believes that Odin is dead. With the death of Odin, everybody mourns. Like, everybody's just like, this is insane. People's hearts stop because nobody could really envision a scenario where Odin dies. Not only that, the rise of Surtur, the death of Odin, this basically marks the beginning of Ragnarok. This marks the beginning of the end, the end of all things when it comes to the Asgardian mythos. And so in the mind of Thor, in the mind of all the Asgardians who are here, they're basically on pins and needles. What's coming later on down the line is far worse than what's happened here. But with the death of Odin, his funeral is basically recognized by every being in existence, Doctor Strange, Mephisto, the Living Tribunal, all these different beings that exist throughout the cosmos, even Hela herself, notice and they take note of the death of Odin, the fact that one of the most powerful beings in existence has basically died. And so what this does is it sets the stage for the events of Ragnarok itself, but in the interim, it also deals with the idea of all these different enemies of Asgard coming out of the woodwork, basically coming to this realization that Thor is not Odin. He's not as powerful as Odin, and there would be very little he could do if these armies marched together against the walls of Asgard. He would try to save them off as best he could, but ultimately it probably wouldn't work. And so they basically see it as their opportunity to finally seize the revenge on Asgard in the absence of Odin in the hopes that they can effectively take him out. Okay. So I was sitting here thinking about the audio that I recorded for the death of Odin, and it actually occurred to me that I misspoke. <laughs> I think in that video I stated that Odin killed Surtur. Uh, he didn't, because I mean, I recorded it like three hours ago, and I've been I've been sitting here thinking about that. I was like, man, did I say that? But the audio is already sent off to my editor, and he's already got it put together, and I'm not going to make him go through and edit the whole thing again. And so I was like, man, like on the off chance that I did, you know, I don't know. Uh, in any event, Odin did not actually kill Surtur. Instead, it was basically the defeat, quote unquote, of Surtur, who was sent back to his own realm, basically 
quickly sent back to the realm of Muspelheim. Now, the reason why this plays out is because of the fact that, remember, Surtur is an insanely powerful being. And Surtur himself, while Odin could probably go toe to toe, depending on the circumstance, if Odin is fully charged with the Odin sleep at the time they battled, Odin was weak. And so it was really more of a means to basically defeat Surtur temporarily, as opposed to take him out entirely. And so where Odin had basically died in the process, the result was that Surtur was confined back to his own realm. Now, there are a few things that took place with regards to the character of Thor between the time that Odin had basically died and Thor became king of Asgard and the events that take place here during Ragnarok. The first thing and really probably the most important thing is that there was a period where Thor had the Odin force. The problem is that if you recall our video on the death of Odin, one of the reasons Odin did not initially intervene in Thor's fight against the Destroyer was because of the fact that if Thor won, he would eventually go on to become this tyrannical ruler using the Odin force. And so it was really Odin, basically his life essence, essentially the Odin force itself, killing two birds with one stone in the sense that it saw the defeat of Surtur and the death of Odin himself. But when Thor gained the Odin force, it resulted in the Odin force being taken away because Thor just wasn't ready for that kind of power yet. Now, a lot of that stuff's being revisited right now during Jason Aaron's run as he started with like Thor God of Thunder and the future, you know, old man Thor, different things like that. So a lot of that information that existed will probably be eliminated and replaced with something else. But for the interim, it's basically this idea that right now Thor does not have the Odin force. Now, remember, the Odin force is basically the energy source of Odin. It's the life force of Odin's two brothers. It's basically what allows Marvel to tell stories where Odin can do all these incredibly, uh, incredibly crazy things. The downside to this is that with Thor only having whatever strengths available to him as the most powerful Asgardian in terms of the fact that he's the son of Odin and the son of uh, Mother Earth, more or less, of Gaia, uh, it allows Loki to begin the process of developing his own schemes. That's the whole idea here. Remember, when it comes to Loki in Marvel Comics, his ultimate goal is to always basically depose Thor, remove him from the chessboard, and then when the time comes when Odin passes on, or if Loki has the opportunity to kill Odin, to basically take his place and become ruler as Asgard. And so in this instance, because of the fact that Loki is looking to basically topple Thor and replace him, since he's the only thing that stands in Loki's way of becoming the new king of Asgard, Loki basically seeks out the mold that was used to create Thor's hammer. In Marvel Comics, the creation of Thor's hammer was not something done explicitly for Thor. Uh, both during, you know, the old Stan Lee, Jack Kirby stories, Walt Simonson's run, and even the modern run with Jason Aaron, it's been established over and over and over again, the hammer of Mjolnir was created by Odin for him to use in order to basically defeat the various enemies that Asgard faced. It wasn't until Thor came along that Odin had basically decided that Thor would be the next best person to wield the hammer, especially after Thor became worthy, because Odin didn't really engage in conflict anymore. He was more or less just a ruler and let everybody else deal with all the different battles and different squabbles. Odin would step in, but only when things really, really popped off and everything was pretty dire. And so what this does is it basically hits home at the idea that Loki takes this forge and sends it to Surtur back in his own realm. And what Surtur begins to do is basically begin crafting hammers. Now, this is a big deal because it was always prophesied that Loki would be the one to bring Ragnarok to Asgard, which is to say, to bring the end of all things. And this is when Loki basically makes his move. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that in the story, some things will be left out in the sense that there is basically uh, a whole huge set of battles that aren't necessarily given here. Instead, it takes place off panel and Thor figures it out as he goes along, which again, we'll basically talk about here as we progress through this video. But the whole idea is that Loki Loki marching against Asgard comes with essentially every enemy of Asgard, whether it's the, the trolls, the giants, whether it's his son, uh, you know, Fenrir Wolf, it's Loki marching against all these different characters. Now, one thing to keep in mind, when it comes to the offspring of Loki, it's not really fleshed out in Marvel comics, whether it's Fenrir Wolf or even the Midgard Serpent. These in Norse mythology are concepts that will lead to the ruin of the gods in the sense that in real world Norse mythology, when it comes to the death of Thor and the deaths of Odin, Odin dies dies at the hands of Fenrir Wolf. Thor himself dies at the hands of the Midgard Serpent. Again, the events of Ragnarok in Norse mythology play out pretty differently than they do in Marvel Comics. I mean, with this whole scenario of Loki basically just obliterating every single Asgardian that he can possibly come across, Thor being incapacitated in the onslaught, right off the bat, things go crazy. Amor the Enchantress is dead. Sif ends up losing an arm. Thor is knocked unconscious and tries to make his way back, but ultimately is taken out by the other individuals who are wielding hammers that were fashioned for them, Fenrir Wolf and Ulick the Troll, I think it is. And the whole idea is that while these hammers, again, are not as powerful as Thor's hammer, when they all make contact, Thor's hammer is shattered and basically all hope is lost. And that's the significance of this. And that's the significance of Ragnarok. The idea of Ragnarok is not the notion that, man, everything's coming to an end, but it'll all be okay 
because Thor will save the day. No, it's the end of all things. It's the end of the Asgardians. It's the end of all the gods. But the destruction of Thor's hammer is a pretty big deal because it signifies that there's no coming back. That there's no conceivable way for Thor to be able to win. And so what he does is in the midst of fighting this Midgard serpent, he basically takes what little energy is left in his hammer and then teleports himself all the way to New York. <laughs> and when he when he shows up, it's him and like everything with him, which is to say all this water and the Midgard serpent and so on and so forth. But it meets with the arrival of Captain America and Iron Man, who are off in the middle of doing their own thing. But with Thor showing up here, it's him basically saying, the end is nigh. The end of all the Asgardians is here. You guys have to come with me and you guys have to help me stave this off. Now again, this is an act of desperation because under normal circumstances, we would not expect Iron Man or Captain America to be able to reasonably stand against all the forces that are invading Asgard right now under the leadership of Loki. And so with, you know, Captain America and with Iron Man and with Thor basically showing up in the ruins of Asgard, what they end up having here is this realization that Loki is indeed killing every single Asgardian he comes across. Now, what's going to happen here is we're actually going to find out there's a little more to this scheme than Loki's initially putting on, but it's cool in terms of what it is because it's basically this idea that we get Captain America and Iron Man fighting against these pretty incredible forces. I mean, when it comes to like Fenrir Wolf, when it comes to Ulick the Troll, we're talking about some pretty powerful beings. Even the giants themselves are pretty incredible. But remember, when it comes to the ingenuity of Tony Stark, when it comes to the fighting prowess of Captain America, while Captain America is not the strongest being out there, his shield is the strongest metal in existence. It's even stronger than adamantium. And so it's able to basically withstand attacks from virtually anybody, including Asgardians themselves. The other half of this is that when it comes to Iron Man, Tony Stark developed his armor to basically withstand against almost any threat, regardless of what it is. His suit is able to allow him to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of these guys. So remember, it's really kind of an even playing field when you start looking at, at the Asgardians in comparison to almost everything else. The problem with this is that they can only do so much. With Thor's hammer being almost completely and totally destroyed, there really isn't a whole lot of hope for them. At, at this point, it's more of a band-aid than anything else. And so they end up defeating some of the forces of Loki. Loki basically races off to recuperate himself, to re, you know, regain his bearings. But the fact is, as they continue to go through, Thor ends up finding more and more Asgardians have been killed. Balder the Brave, the son of Odin, the brother of Thor himself. But there are also Asgardians who survived. The issue with this was that when Ragnarok first kicked off, when the invasion of Loki first happened, and he basically launched an attack against Asgard, almost every single one of the Asgardians just fled for their freaking lives. And they basically fled to all the different realms. The fact that Thor is alive, however, is a rallying point because again, when Thor was knocked into the water, when he was when it was believed that he faced the Midgard serpent and it was believed that Thor died, it demoralized almost every Asgardian because not only had Odin already died, you in turn had Loki launching an attack against Asgard. You had Thor who was believed to have been dead. You had Balder the Brave who was dead. You had all these different members of the Asgardian pantheon who were largely considered to be the most powerful and the bravest of them all who would all believe, you know, who were all believed to have fallen in battle. And so all the other normal Asgardians, average people living in Asgardian society, they felt they had no hope of actually winning. But in the aftermath of this, Thor basically sends Captain America and Iron Man away because at this point, he's basically done everything he can. He's essentially learned that there are still Asgardians who are alive. And because of the fact that Thor views himself as the rightful king of Asgard, the goal is to muster whatever Asgardians he can, try to take back Asgard, and if they can't, move to a different realm and then rebuild Asgard there. And so again, that's why this is pretty interesting is because because of the fact that we actually end up picking up with a couple of survivors. The first is Volstagg. Now, Volstagg is one of those intriguing characters when it comes to Marvel Comics, because he's one of those guys where he's like the guy you want in your corner, right? Like the one guy you want on your side. But he's also kind of jovial and a little bit of a silly guy. And so in this scenario, because of the fact that Asgard had been totally destroyed, Thor's on the hunt for whatever Asgardians he can find, making this sort of journey on his own to gather everybody he can currently locate, there's basically a massive passage of time in the sense that months have basically passed since Ragnarok began and Thor started this journey of mustering all these forces together. Now, because because Volstagg has essentially given up, Thor rallies him back. You are a man of Asgard and you're one of the Warriors Three. You do not have time to, to rest on your laurels and pity your circumstance. Now is the time for fighting because if we don't fight, you might as well be dead because that's the way, that's the fate that befalls you. That's the fate that awaits you. Now, this is more of an honorable thing, right? Like tapping into the honor of Volstagg. It's Thor basically tapping into his warrior spirit and saying, do you want to die on your knees or do you want to die on your feet like a warrior? Volstagg chooses to go out like a warrior and so he alongside Thor can 
continue this journey of mustering their forces. But everywhere they go, regardless of where it is across the Nine Realms, as they look for Asgardians, they find Asgardians dead. They do find some who survive, but we also end up finding that where all these different Asgardians had fled, there were people who rose up to basically lead whatever tribe of Asgar uh, Asgardians were with them. In the case of Valkyrie, you know, she basically mustered whoever she could find and then just took off. There were other Asgardians who did the same thing. And so it was basically them just trying to find a way to muster their forces, but not aware of the fact that there are other groups of Asgardians out there who were alive. So again, it's very much this idea that things are just sort of scattered to the winds. Now, in the midst of Thor facing off against Fenrir Wolf, basically under this idea that he could destroy him and at the very least begin the process of eliminating all these different foes of Asgard itself and those who follow Loki, where Fenrir is getting the upper hand on Thor to a degree, in the middle of this, there's a massive blast of energy that seemingly comes out of nowhere, only for us to find out that that blast of energy originates from Beta Ray Bill. Now, Beta Ray Bill is one of these really, really cool characters of Marvel Comics, and in truth, a lot of Thor fans just hold a special place in their hearts <laughs> for Beta Ray Bill. A lot of fans love Beta Ray Bill, because Beta Ray Bill was the first person to lift the hammer of Thor in Marvel Comics. He was a Walt Simonson creation. He was introduced with the idea that somebody besides Thor could lift his own hammer. It was huge when it happened. Now, there were some events that took place. There was a little bit of a, uh, a contest of sorts that was held by Odin to decide who it is that should actually be able to wield Mjolnir. Ultimately, Beta Ray Bill was given his own hammer called Stormbreaker. And going forward into Marvel Comics, he was very much a sort of warrior brother of Thor, which is to say they were brothers in arms, but they also kind of viewed themselves as brothers in legacy in the sense that they had fought together, they'd shed blood together. They were very much a team. And so where Beta Ray Bill had actually vanished in like the mid 1990s and hadn't been heard from for almost 10 years, the whole idea of him coming back sets the stage for a couple things. The story of Thor Ragnarok was a massive story because it was basically, again, the perception that people believed Thor was going to die. And if ever there were a time to bring back characters that Marvel could use to basically jumpstart stories based on those characters, Thor Ragnarok was the time to do it. And so the return of Beta Ray Bill to a comic that was highly publicized and that was extremely popular among readers at the time meant that a lot of new fans are being exposed to a character that they'd never seen before. And so with Beta Ray Bill and with his involvement here in Asgard, where he initially offers to basically step in to fight alongside Thor to help defeat the forces of Loki, Thor's response is actually no. Instead, go back to the Corbinites, go back to your race, and basically keep the memory of Asgard alive. It's important that Asgard be remembered in the hearts and minds of those who are out there if we don't survive this conflict. And so again, it's sort of this tour of all these different characters. But following the events of, of really his appearance here, going into the future of Marvel Comics, there was a series that Marvel launched, or really a mini-series called uh, Stormbreaker, the saga of Beta Ray Bill. That story took place alongside the latter half of this story. So it was really kind of cool in terms of, you know, how the character of Beta Ray Bill progressed and so on and so forth. But the issue with Thor is that at the end of the day, he does not legitimately believe that he can win this conflict because in truth, he does not have the power to pull it off on his own. The Asgardians are too few in number and Loki's forces are too incredibly strong. And so in response to this, Thor is actually met with the Odin force. But what this does is it basically offers this significance that the Odin force is separate from Odin himself, which is to say Odin uses it, but the Odin force can manifest itself in its own way and speak to Thor directly. And that's the cool thing about this is because Thor does not initially know what the Odin force is. He doesn't really recognize what this is, but with enough time and basically thinking more with his heart than with his mind, he begins to realize this is the Odin force itself. The other half of this is that the Odin force makes the case that Thor does not fully grasp what it is that's going on with the event of Ragnarok. As far as Thor is aware, it's the end time of the Asgardians, and that's it. Thor will meet his own demise, Loki will meet his demise, all the Asgardians will basically cease to exist, and that'll be the end of all things. There's nothing more going after that. What the Odin Force says is, you have no idea what's going on here. You have no idea of the bigger picture that takes place. And so what the Odin Force does is it guides Thor to a place called the Well of Mimir, I think it's, I think it's how it's pronounced. Now in Norse mythology, the the Well of Mimir is basically this well that's guarded by a guy named Mimir. And the whole idea is that if you can drink from the well, you can basically gain a, all this knowledge on all these different things. Odin initially approached it and was turned down. And there were a whole bunch of things that went on with regards to the, you know, real world Norse mythology that took place there. With regards to this comic, Odin, along the line, drank from the well. And when he did, he basically gained all this knowledge on all these different realms and all these things that were going on. It's what elevated him from just a guy who was an Asgardian to basically a true god. And the 
sense that he was wise. He knew what was going on. He had this vast amount of knowledge, different things along those lines. The problem with this was that Odin had to make sacrifices in order to be able to pull it off. He had to pluck out one of his eyes, which is why he has an eye patch. He had to hang himself from a tree. It was all these different things that went on in order for Odin to basically gain this great knowledge, this understanding of everything that was out there in existence. The other half of this is that the knowledge you gain is limited to your experiences. And so because of the fact that Thor had basically plucked his own eye out and thrown it into the well, the knowledge he gains far exceeds that of Odin. This is compiled by the fact that Thor can't just do the same thing Odin did, right? Like if Odin came along and Odin plucked his one out, you know, plucked out one of his eyes and threw it in the well, and then Thor said he was going to do the same thing, that's not going to work. He's the son of Odin. He has to take it a step further. Otherwise, all he gets is whatever knowledge Odin has. But if Odin had knowledge and his knowledge was enough to try to stop Ragnarok, then the ultimate idea here was that Odin didn't have enough of, didn't have enough information to be able to keep the events of Ragnarok from happening, or at the very least, didn't have enough power or something along those lines. And so in this scenario, Thor basically sacrifices both of his eyes. And when he does this, he gains knowledge, not only what Odin had, but transcends that information as well. What he ends up seeing is basically this entire history of the universe. He ends up seeing the origin of Asgard itself. All these memories begin flooding in. And with this massive expanse of information, Thor basically learns a secret that had long since been held hidden by Odin himself. I mean, when you have Thor basically hanging himself and trying to gain access to the runes, these artifacts more or less, that would allow a person's knowledge to transcend everything. That would basically elevate them to the position of a god. It basically imbues them with a massive amount of power of the sorts that they can actually change the future if they chose to. And that's why people usually call this version of Thor Rune King Thor. It's only for a couple pages. It doesn't last that long, but Thor himself effectively has what's referred to as cosmic awareness. It's basically this idea that a person can look around and know everything that's going on at that particular moment all throughout the cosmos, all throughout the universe. Again, it's insane in terms of all the power that he has at this brief moment in time. But what ends up happening is that with Thor effectively hanging and sacrificing his life in order to be reborn and take the steps necessary to officially end the events of Ragnarok, he's initially sent to the realm of Hela. Odin rescues him and brings him back. And so in this moment when he's basically experiencing this sort of in-between place between life and death, which is to say this moment between him being rescued by, you know, from the grasp of Hela and being brought back to the realm of Asgard, he experiences a vision of this council of sorts, these beings who are referred to as the ones who sit above in shadow. Now, the ones who sit above in shadow were basically Marvel's answer to the, the question of why Ragnarok always repeats itself. What we're basically left to believe here is that Asgard is effectively, or at least was, recreated when the universe was born anew. And so the cycle of Ragnarok coincides directly with the destruction of the universe itself. And so what this does is it gives us sort of temporary answer. Now, the reason why we can make that case, the reason why we can make that argument that the cycle of Ragnarok coincides with the destruction of the universe is because of the fact that when Marvel was writing Secret Wars or writing, you know, the lead up to Secret Wars, what we got was a story called The Last Days of Loki. That was the true Ragnarok. And so grabbing that actual argument over there, grabbing that story and then rolling it over into this and comparing the two side by side, what it really means is that whenever a universe comes to an end, because Asgard is basically part of that universe, albeit in some pocket dimension somewhere, then it essentially, it essentially gives us this idea that when the universe ends, Asgard ends with it. It just so happens that the pieces unfold in a way that the end of that universe coincides with Loki launching an invasion against Asgard. And so it basically means that every single time a universe ends, Asgard dies. When the destruction of that universe leads into a new universe, Asgard is born along with it. What this does is it basically offers this idea that this end of Ragnarok, I guess this, this event of Ragnarok, this destruction of Asgard, basically lets off a massive amount of energy. Effectively, the life energies, quote unquote, of the Asgardians, of all things in existence, are essentially absorbed and fed on by these ones who sit above in shadow. And so because of that, they have a vested interest in ensuring that Ragnarok happens over and over and over again. The problem with this is that none of these characters are fleshed out. At the time this story is written, we don't know anything about these guys. They're basically just the ones who sit above in shadow. It's Thor coming into conflict with a power that he can't necessarily overcome on his own, or at least it doesn't seem that way. Thor has to find an end run way to basically defeat them. And so coming back to the realm of the living with this, you know, awesome godly power that he has, uh, he basically takes out Loki and chops his head off. <laughs> You know, well, really, he just kind of like tears his head off his shoulders. But the fact remains, with Loki surviving this whole endeavor and then using his head as he transitions from one location to the next, Thor comes to the realization that Ragnarok has to happen. It cannot be stopped. And so what he ends up doing is he travels directly to Surtur, 
to the realm of Muspelheim. And essentially what he does is he tells him, I will allow you to continue your quest to fulfill your role within Ragnarok to go through and cleanse Asgard, to basically burn whatever's left after all the Asgardians are dead, if you will rebuild my hammer for me, if you will recreate Mjolnir. Now again, that's the purpose that Surtur serves. When it comes to the events of Ragnarok in real world Norse mythology, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, Surtur is not necessarily this being that's going to just immediately attack, you know, uh, Asgard with everybody else. Surtur just kind of waits until, you know, Ragnarok ends until all the gods are, all the gods are dead and then just burns away all the old gods and then allows for the new gods to take their place. And so in this scenario, it is Surtur fulfilling his role, giving Thor his hammer back or reforging it for him. This allows Surtur's forces to begin going forward and just start burning away everything that's out there in Asgard. And so in a lot of ways, it's Thor betraying his own people. And so what Thor intends to do is in the cycle of Ragnarok to give their death some sort of honorable meaning. And what he ends up doing is traveling directly to Idrisil, to the world tree itself. And where he intends to completely and totally obliterate it, he's basically brought forward by the ones who sit above in shadow who actually beg him to stop. They basically say, look, man, you can't destroy the world tree. If you do, it will end all things in existence. It'll destroy Asgard. It'll destroy any hope that Asgard has of making its return. It'll basically lead to the destruction of the gods in their entirety. Thor's response, he doesn't care. As far as he's concerned, Ragnarok has to end. The cycle has to stop. The gods have to be allowed to die one last time. And so in doing this, he basically grabs his hammer and destroys the entirety of Idrisil. And when he does this, it brings everything crashing down. It brings Asgard crashing down. All the realms that are out there crashing down. Essentially, the only Asgardians who survived are going to be the ones who fled to Earth. And so what this does is it leads into the aftermath of Ragnarok itself. It leads directly into J. Michael Straczynski's run with answering the question, with Asgard being destroyed, what happens next? What happens to all the gods? Are there any gods left? And if they are, is it possible for them to come back? Okay, uh, we are going to be a little bit dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to cover Thor the God Butcher. Now, here's the deal. I did a rundown episode on this once before where it was like Thor versus Galactus, and it was really fun because that's what we get. You know, it's actually the, the later part of this story. I think it's the second half. I want to say it's God Bomb where we end up getting that. But really, everything from like Thor God of Thunder number one all the way up to like number nine or number 10, I think. It might even be 12. I can't remember exactly how many issues off the top of my head. Uh, it's all one, co one cohesive story. It's all just like one great big story. But for those of you guys who are reading James, Jane Foster Thor, this is really where uh, Jason Aaron's run kicks off. Now, Jane Foster won't become Thor for quite some time. We actually focus almost exclusively on Odin's son. Uh, but here's the other funny thing too. I've already recorded the origin of Gore the God Butcher, and I'm probably gonna release that after this video comes out. So you guys are gonna watch this video, then watch the origin of Gore, and then in the origin of Gore, I'm gonna act like this video hasn't been made. <laughs> It's going to be kind of a weird scenario, but uh, but the fact remains here that Thor the God Butcher is really one of the greatest stories ever told when it comes to the character of Thor. I mean, there's that's just the way it is. It is. It's so incredibly good because in my mind, it really reinvigorates and really revitalizes Thor. Now, once the movie Ragnarok comes out, we'll actually start all the way back with Thor Ragnarok and then get into uh, J. Michael Straczynski's run and then Matt Fraction's run, which basically covers everything leading up to this particular story. So it'll be just one great big cohesive playlist with something like 30 30 videos or 40 videos by the time we get done with it, uh, but it will be pretty cool in terms of how it all comes together. That includes like Fear Itself and the tie-ins and all that kind of stuff, because Fear Itself is really, really good. So with Thor the God Butcher, the great thing is that we basically join up with three different generations of Thor. Now the way that Jason Aaron does it, it paces out and it makes perfect sense when I was going through it. It wasn't convoluted, it wasn't difficult to understand, not at all because it tells one cohesive story over three generations. One part, or I guess the part that we pick up with, is in 893 AD. Now back when it came to Thor in the modern day, his stories are pretty straightforward. But really, writers just kind of pick and choose what they use from like the early days of Thor. You can really just kind of throw anything in there. I mean, we've seen stories that have been kind of thrown in with Uncanny Avengers, for example, where Thor fought Apocalypse. When Thor was fighting Apocalypse, because of the fact that the weapon that he had at the time, because he wasn't worthy to wield Mjolnir yet, uh, wield his hammer, because of because his axe Jarmbjorn was not powerful enough to defeat Apocalypse, he in turn had the axe magically enchanted so that it could defeat Apocalypse. And that was the explanation going going forward for why the acts of Thor 
has a magical enchantment on it, why it's so much more powerful than any other axe, because it needed to be in order to defeat Apocalypse. These are the kind of things that writers use in order to add things in there, because for years and years and years, the axe, the one that we'll see him using in this story, uh, it was really just an axe that was there. Like it was just a weapon that he used. And we really didn't know the basis behind it. We didn't know why it was so capable. Uh, it just was. And so that story of Uncanny Avengers offered that explanation. Now, the cool thing is that Thor showing up uh, really in this town on the western coast of Iceland is designed to show us that there are a myriad of gods that exist out there in the realm of Marvel Comics. Now, this is kind of a wholesale rework by Jason Aaron. Um, he's not like rebooting the god mythology in Marvel Comics. Not at all. He's actually adding in new information. And the reason why I say that is because when it comes to gods in Marvel, there are gods and then there are cosmic entities. And they're two distinctly different things. Cosmic entities represent an aspect of the universe. So like, you know, eternity represents time, infinity represents space, the living tribunal is basically the judge of the multiverse, the one above all created everything. And then from there, you've got like Master Order and Lord Chaos. Master Order represents absolute order in the universe. Lord Chaos represents absolute chaos in the universe. And they have to exist in balance in order for there to be chaos and order. And the in-betweener represents that balance. There are a lot of different, you know, representations of what the different entities mean. But in terms of gods, you have the Greek gods of Olympus. You have the Asgardian gods of Norse mythology. You have the Sky Fathers, which are just kind of like these head gods of all these different religions that exist out there. Judeo-Christianity, more or less. Yahweh, you have Vishnu. You have all these different gods that exist out there. But for years, that's really all there was. It was just modern Greek mythology and modern Roman mythology, which is just kind of a reworking of Greek mythology. You had existing religions from around the world and the gods represented in comic books. What Jason Aaron does is he expands that and he says other planets and other races have their own gods and those gods are just as real as Thor. And so again, it's really kind of cool because it gives us this perspective on how it all comes together. The issue with this is that someone's been traveling around and someone's been killing them all. Now, of course, again, this takes place in the past in 893 AD. And so with someone running around and killing all these gods, well then from there, it's just a mission of Thor to find out who that person is. Now from here, we jump to the present day and we actually pick up on a place called the planet Indigar. Now the planet Indigar will be very, very similar to the planet that belongs to, uh, to Gore the God Butcher. And in fact, this was explicitly designed by uh, Jason Aaron himself to give us this kind of parallel between how things could have been for Gore and how things turned out to be for Gore. And of course, we'll find more about that in our video on, uh, on the origin of the God Butcher himself. But the fact remains here that this is really Thor just kind of being depicted as a character who very much hears the prayers of every living being out there. Now, this is also kind of a new introduction for Jason Aaron because Thor historically wasn't really a god that like heard the prayers of mortals. I mean, he would deal with mortals. He would fight in conflicts to protect mortals, different things like that. And it was more or less just like a generally accepted thing that it happened every once in a while. But it wasn't like it was a guaranteed in stone. Yes, Thor hears the prayers of all mortals, no matter where they are in the universe. Uh, it wasn't like it is now, but Jason Aaron is throwing this in here in order to give us a perspective of where Thor stands in relation to all the other gods, telling us that gods everywhere hear the prayers. Sometimes they'll answer, sometimes they won't. It really just depends on what that god's motivation are, you know, what their what their motivation is. If they're a god of destruction, they will not answer the prayers of a society that's being destroyed. But if they're a god of life, then they will answer the prayers of a society that's being destroyed because they exist to preserve life. So again, what we end up doing is we end up picking up with uh, one of the members of this, of this, you know, race on this planet uh, who's basically saying, look, we prayed to our gods and our gods never answered. Well, the belief of Thor and the knowledge of Thor is that because there are gods out there and because the gods of these planets would respond to their denizens, if they're not, then it means that the gods are derelict in their duty or it means that something is wrong. And so what he does is he actually travels to the realm of the Lords of Indigar, the Lords, or I guess the gods of this particular planet, only to find out that they're all dead, that they've all been slaughtered. Somebody went through and just killed every single one of them. And this is a huge thing because we're talking about beings, we don't know what their power is, but we can guarantee that they have your like standard run of the mill Thor abilities, super strength, endurance, longevity, so on and so forth. And so for someone to walk into a chamber of these things and kill them all would be tantamount to somebody walking into Asgard and killing everyone. Like that's something that just is inconceivable. We can't imagine of a scenario where a singular being would walk into Asgard and kill everyone shy of someone who could just warp reality on a universal scale. So again, this is a really crazy scenario, but from here, we jump to several millennia into the future to what's left of Asgard. Effectively, everybody in Asgard's gone, and the only person left is old King Thor. For those of you guys who are reading or who have been reading uh, Jane Foster Thor, one of the things you'll notice about old King Thor is that his arm is missing. And in fact, this is a question that I've received time and time again, and I, I believe that I had answered it, but I may 
not have. In the inaugural story, when Jane Foster became Thor, Jason Aaron basically wrote a circumstance whereby uh, Odin's son lost his arm, and he he basically used the Destroyer armor as a replacement arm. What this this point, this several millennia in the future, this takes place well after the events of the modern day Thor, and it seems like this is basically the future version of the Thor that we're used to. He lost his arm, but he is the sole survivor of Asgard. We don't know exactly what it is that happened there, or at least at the moment we don't. It's actually explained in uh, Loki, Agent of Asgard, but we don't know exactly what it is that happened there. All we know is that Asgard has been completely overrun by these black serpents, these black forces of or the God Butcher. And so again, it presents a very bleak future. It presents a very bleak outcome in the sense that this is basically a multi-generational fight. You know, in the past, 893 AD, uh, Thor encountered God Butcher for the very first time. In the present day, he's trying to track him back down. And in the future, Gore appears to have won. And so it's a really cool scenario because then what Jason Aaron does for the rest of the story is he connects the dots. He says, if Thor met, you know, Gore for the first time in the past, and then he's tracking him down again in the present and seems to have lost in the future, then how do we get from A to B to C? And it's so cool to see it unfold. It's so cool to see it happen because what Thor does is he continues his journey to basically travel around, you know, back in the past in 893 AD, he continues his journey to try to track down this person who has basically killed these gods, which of course leads him into a direct conflict with Gore the God Butcher. Now, the important thing to notice here is that again, with this taking place in the past, Thor's never faced anyone like this before. Thor's never faced anyone like Gore. Gore has this necro sword that basically allows him to kill gods. Now, it is the source of his power, but the real benefit of the necro sword is that it is a weapon of the gods. And so it would be like trying to fight Superman with a steel sword versus trying to fight Superman with a kryptonite sword. One is going to work and one is not. The necro sword basically allows Gore to kill gods. It's a weapon for God to kill a god. And it was previously owned by gods. Of course, we'll learn more about that in the origin of Gore itself. But the fact remains here that with Thor facing off against Gore, this is a hitherto unrivaled situation. Thor's never dealt with anything like this. A person who just cannot be stopped, cannot be reasoned with. All he wants to do is just kill Thor. Now, the cool thing about this is that Gore has like some amazing dialogue in this story. And that's really one of the reasons why readers love him so much is because he's got such amazing dialogue. You know, he was like, look, you know, I fought so many gods. I fought gods of war. Are you a god of war? Because I've fought and I've killed so many of them. I fought gods of wrath. I fought all these different gods and I've killed them all. You will be no different. Not only that, Thor, of course, charging into battle, you know, for Asgard. I'm Thor, god of thunder of Asgard. What this does is it turns Gore onto the idea that he can basically begin the process of killing even more gods by invading Asgard. So again, this is a really cool scenario because what it does is it gives us this conflict between two beings who have never met before, but who seem to be virtually, uh, you know, virtually equal in power. Now, of course, jumping back to the uh, to the modern day, this is really when Thor begins to realize what it is that's going on. By going through this temple, you know, this this uh, this realm where these gods have effectively been killed, he's been hearkening back on his memories of conflicting with, uh, with, with Gore. And this is when he realizes that he previously believed he had killed Gore, only to find out that Gore is still very much alive. And so again, this is interesting because what it does is it continues to sort of fill in the gaps. It continues to sort of let us know what's going on. Of course, finding the gods of this planet having been killed, Thor travels to a place called Omnipotence City. Now, Omnipotence City is new. Jason Aaron invented this. This is a place that never existed before. And this is why I say he's doing this wholesale revamping of sorts when it comes to the god mythology in Marvel Comics, because previously the only real meeting, the only real form of meeting among the gods, so to speak, was the Sky Fathers. That was it. You know, the leaders of these various godly pantheons. And that's really all there was. But with Omnipotent City, what it does is it basically creates a central hub of information. And within Omnipotent City is basically knowledge on everything about everything. Now, Thor is not looking to learn everything that there is. Instead, this is Jason Aaron basically saying this library is filled with like the stories, the achievements, all these different things of every god in existence. And so what Thor begins to do is travel around to every single realm where these gods are supposed to exist, to every planet where these gods reside, to every moon, the whole nine yards. And all he finds is dead god after dead god. They have all been butchered. Every last one of them have been killed. Whether it's these massive gods, whether it's these small gods, whether they're tree nymphs, you know, whether they're gods of destruction, gods of war, it doesn't matter. Every single one of them has been completely destroyed and completely obliterated. And so having found that all these gods have been completely obliterated, what Thor does is he reflects back on the final battle that he had with Gore in the past and recalls the cave, the base of operations, so to speak, that Thor, or I'm sorry, that Gore was operating out of. And so traveling back to this 
location uh, where he intends to confront Gore again, he actually comes into contact for the first time with a guy by the name of Shadrach, I think it is. Now, this is kind of cool because Shadrach's just like a god of wine. And it's really interesting to see how like Jason Aaron is very much invoking like this Greek mythological godly pantheon and just kind of applying it to Marvel and then spreading it throughout the universe. Like there's gods of wine, there's gods of dancing, there's gods of the harvest, gods of the hunt, gods of the sun, so on and so forth. It's really cool to kind of see this expanded out into the realm of Marvel Comics and expanded to the universe. But the issue here is that Shadrach basically says, look, the reason why all of this is being done is because of what you did to Gore the last time you guys had met, the last time you guys had fought. Now, again, this is Jason Aaron continuing to kind of expand on this. Jason Aaron continuing to, to essentially go through and add the narrative to this story that will increase the relationship between Gore and Thor himself. And the reason why is because what Thor does in the modern day is he takes Shadrach to Omnipotent City with the goal of basically saying, look, let's see if we can't find this realm of Kronix, you know, basically these time traveling gods. And let's see if we can't figure out what in the world is going on with them and see if there's a way that we can basically go back and defeat Gore or see what it was that I did that led to this circumstance in the first place. And so jumping back to Thor in the past, we end up having this moment where during the final battle between himself and Gore, uh, he was effectively captured and taken prisoner. And the cool thing here is that Gore basically, you know, the reason why I say his narrative is so cool is because he starts taunting Thor. You know, now again, when it comes to Gore's character, while he is sadistic, while he is twisted, his goal is to just kill gods. And so really torturing Thor is just as much for fun as it is for, you know, resulting in the death of Thor in the first place. But the other half of this is that Gore cannot simply just kill people by himself. He needs to know where they are. He needs to be able to access them. And that's basically what he's been doing. Going on a mission and just traveling throughout the universe and killing gods wherever he finds them, just happening to stumble across them would take so long. But if he can find a god and he can torture that god for information and then kill him, that god will lead him to other gods, which will lead him to other gods. And in turn, he'll just be traveling around the cosmos, obliterating everything. And that's what he's been doing. That's really how it all started. You know, he basically took the Necro Sword, he became a god, and in turn, began torturing other gods for information. Now again, for the character of Thor, the torture that comes here is just simply for Gore to be able to access Asgard. Now, we know that if that if Gore were to access Asgard and try to kill everybody, likely it wouldn't happen. Odin would probably kill him, which begs the question, where's Odin at in the future? Why is it that all the Asgardians are dead? Again, it creates kind of a really cool narrative, and it begs so many questions, and it makes things incredibly bleak. But again, back in the future with old King Thor, really this is just kind of like a continuous last stand where he's constantly just trying to take down these various iterations of Gore the God Butcher's forces, constantly trying to tear them down time and time again at the very least, trying to defeat him. And it really seems like he's fighting a losing battle. He's a one-man army against a veritable horde of forces coming from Gore. And it really seems like he's just going to spend eternity fighting and basically surviving and that's it. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact that during this conflict, uh, he basically fights off against a bunch of these forces, he's effectively consumed, put back on his throne, only for him to continue the pattern of trying to fight them off again. And so that's really going to be his life for the rest of eternity, is just trying to face off against the forces of Gore and never being successful. You know, it's, it's almost like Sisyphus having to push the rock up the mountain or whatever it was, you know, that, that uh, mythological story where he's constantly doomed to push the rock up the mountain. And then as soon as, you know, when it seemed like he's going to get to the top, it comes tumbling back down again. And so it's basically him just kind of doomed to live out this existence forever and ever and ever. And so again, what we end up doing is we basically travel, or I guess we follow Gore uh, in the modern day in his attempts to travel into the past. Again, this is really what he's been doing as Thor has been trying to track him down. And what ultimately ends up happening here is Gore basically accesses the Kronix gods. And by virtue of spilling their own blood, he's able to use the power imbued with them to travel back in time. Now, the reason for why he's doing this is to actually travel all the way back to the very beginnings, to the formation of all things. Now, this is kind of an interesting scenario because when it comes to Marvel Comics, there have been so many different tellings of how the universe came into existence. I mean, there's the telling that was that, that comes out of the classic Thor 161 and 162, I think it is, where Galactus basically recounts his origin story to Thor. There's Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. There is Al Ewing's Ultimates 2, the uh, troubleshooter story, where we basically end up seeing the new origin of all things in existence. The origins have been told time and time again. What's usually left to the writer is what happens after the universe comes into existence. And that's usually what writers end up kind of building on is looking at this and saying, okay, look, you know, the universe came into existence because the previous universe collapsed in on itself. It was a cosmic egg. It exploded with energy. And now we have the modern universe. What happens after that? Now, in terms of where life comes from, this again has been explained several times over. Jonathan Hickman, for example, introduced a group called the Builders. And the Builders basically just traveled around the universe 
seeding worlds and creating stars and so on and so forth. But if you go and you read some old X-Men stories, uh, they'll tell you that the Celestials are the oldest living things and the Celestials are what, are what uh, basically created the universe and then the multiverse. There's a lot of different stories that go on here. But what Jason Aaron is saying is that in the early days, 14 billion years ago, there were simply the Elder Gods, or, or at least there was the original Elder God. And this original Elder God gave birth to other Elder Gods, which in turn gave birth to more gods, which led to the creation of planets and stars and all that kind of good stuff. And so the goal of Gore is to basically kill this Elder God, steal its heart, which will grant him all the power that he pretty much needs, and then from there, go forward. Now, the reason why he had to travel 14 billion years ago is because Elder Gods don't exist anymore. Remember, we did our video series on, you know, the a history of the Marvel Universe. The Elder Gods had basically wiped each other out to the brink of extinction. There was really nothing left. I mean, they're, they're all virtually extinct. I mean, as far as I'm aware, there are no more Elder Gods. Not only that, it's really kind of like the half-life concept, which is to say, you can never create anything that is equal to yourself. In some form or fashion, it will always only be a fraction of you. You know, two parents, for example, cannot create a child, and that child has all the traits of one parent and none of the traits of the other. Uh, it'll have a combination of both traits. With regards to, you know, what goes on in Marvel Comics, it's this idea that whenever an Elder God gives birth to another Elder God, that new Elder God is only half of what the original Elder God could be. And so going back to the original, going back to the very first Elder God, is as powerful as any Elder God is ever going to be. It's basically the creator of all things. And so by stealing its heart, it basically imbues God Butcher, it imbues Gore with all the power that he will need, or at the very least, it can offer a source of all the power he'll ever need. Now, the other half of this is also just pride, right? It's also just Gore kind of testing himself, seeing what he can do, how far he's come. And being able to kill an Elder God, a being of such immense power, means that he is insanely capable in terms of what he's able to do, in terms of how efficient he is. The fact remains here, jumping into the past, the motivation for Gore doing everything that he's done is because of the fact that he encountered Thor. And that's why I really wanted to wait to this part of the story to expand on this in order to kind of, you know, give you guys a lot of the information that was there and then tie it all together. And that's what makes this so cool. With Gore the God Butcher, his motivation in killing gods was singular. I mean, he was just a guy who was pissed and hated gods and wanted to kill them because he'd lost his family. That's his condensed origin story in 10 seconds. That's all he ever did. He just traveled the cosmos and killed gods. And his motivation was to just do that. He never really had a reason to question it. He never really had a reason to believe there was anyone out there that could challenge him until he met Thor. And then Thor forced Gore to experience his very first defeat. And so what Thor represented was the idea that there are still gods out there who are more powerful than Gore. There are still gods out there that Gore simply just can't defeat because Thor, for example, just has the will to win. He has the fighting experience. He has the prowess. He has the strength. He has the enchanted weapons at his disposal. At the end of the day, Gore just can't beat him through conventional means. And so what Gore began to do was basically go around and kill all the other gods that existed out there, absorb their power, and then basically went back, killed an elder god for the purpose of traveling into the future and securing his reign. And so that's ultimately what's going on here. It's essentially trying to bypass Thor. But that's the idea, is that Thor is the source of all this. He's the reason why all this is happening. He's the reason why all this is taking place. Gore had been killing gods for a while, but it wasn't until Thor arrived on the scene that Gore encountered someone that he couldn't beat through normal means. And so what ends up happening here is that with uh, in the present day, with Thor arriving to this realm of the Kronix, Kronix gods to discover that Gore has just jumped into the time stream and traveled into the future, Thor immediately follows after him. And so what ends up happening here is that modern day Thor basically ends up traveling thousands of years into the future with future Thor. And so both modern Thor and old King Thor are basically fighting side by side in their bid to take out the forces of uh, of Gore the God Butcher. So what this does is it actually ends the story on a massive cliffhanger because the question is asked, what's going on? First of all, why is it that Gore basically rules with absolute control in the future? Two, what happened to Earth? Three, where are all the Asgardians? And four, how does it end? Okay, so during my 1 million subscriber live stream, uh, as short as it was, it was something like maybe 25 minutes, wasn't anything outrageous, but I had talked about how I wanted to begin shifting my focus from Marvel Comics uh, away from all new, all different Marvel and focus on some classic stories. And we're going to test the waters here a little bit. Uh, I want to do the origin of Gore the God Butcher. And the reason why is because this guy's amazing. <laughs> we did uh, the God Butcher storyline as like an episode of the rundown, uh, which was fun, but I also wanted to, like, I've always wanted to do like an actual like tried and true Thor the God Butcher, or I guess uh, Thor God of Thunder, you know, the God Butcher storyline explained video. Like I've been wanting to do this for quite a while and I've been trying to find a way to fit it in. Uh, the issue with this is that Benny over comic story and is doing uh, Thor God of Thunder. There we go. <laughs> He's doing that when the Thor movie comes out, I think. And we're actually gonna 
going to kind of switch because what I'm going to do when the Thor movie comes out is we're going to start with Thor Ragnarok and then just work our way all the way up through Straczynski's run, you know, up to this point to God Butcher. Assuming you guys care about this, then we'll just do this, you know, God Butcher run and then we'll do like God Bomb and then we'll do, uh, what is it? Last Days of Midgard. And there's one more, I think it is. I think Last Days of Midgard is the last part, but we're just going to test the waters and we're going to experiment and see how you guys respond to us doing uh, some classic stories with regards to, to Thor stuff. So Gore the God Butcher is a pretty cool character. He's pretty cool. He's pretty interesting and he's pretty tragic at the same time. And the reason why is because of the fact that this was a guy who basically just ran across the cosmos, killing every single God he found. And it was one of the most interesting stories to have ever been done with this character. But what this does, at least what this comic does, is it just kind of goes back to the early days. And it really tells us how Gore ended up from being, you know, how he went from being just a regular guy to eventually becoming a murderer who was just killing gods all across the cosmos. And so what we do is we jump to about 3,000 years in the past. And we actually pick up with this pretty dark and pretty, uh, pretty sinister environment. I mean, it's not dark in terms of, you know, light or anything like that, but it's a very harsh environment. It's full of all kinds of predators. The people who live on it are nomads, meaning they just travel from one location to the next, simply trying to make their way and trying to survive. In this instance, what ends up happening is the mother of Gore is basically killed by some of the natural beasts that just kind of roam around the landscape, you know, monsters or, you know, whatever the, the natural predators are. Uh, but this in turn instills in him a lack of faith in gods. And the reason why is because as they make their way across this planet and as they try to reach their, their chosen place, you know, their eternal land, whatever you want to call it, his wife is of course pregnant with what seems to be, you know, their, their third or fourth child. The issue with this is that as they're traveling, his wife basically steps on some loose rocks and she falls to her death. And so all this left to him is for his son, or at least for him to carry his son, uh, his oldest child, as well as whatever the villagers are left and try to make their way to their chosen destination. But Gore the God Butcher has basically just lost faith in gods. And the reason why is because the people pray day after day. They constantly pray for sustenance. They constantly pray for nourishment. You know, the son of Gore dies in his arms because he doesn't have water. He doesn't have any food. You know, they're basically just living this really terrible and really crappy life. But the faith of the tribe is what gets them through. They've got their own religious leaders, their own spiritual leaders. They've got guys that basically say, look, we have to pray to the gods. And if we do, then the gods will give us what we need to survive. Now, something that Jason Aaron is doing with this little bit of a story is he's kind of going back and forth with things, right? Like he's kind of bordering on this realm of literal and metaphorical in the sense that where, you know, these guys basically say, look, we kind of have to pray to the gods and we have to, you know, uh, beg that they will give us the things that we need. In reality, the gods will not provide them and Gore doesn't even believe they exist. All he does is he just looks around at a really harsh environment. Now, it's entirely possible that this planet is not hospitable, which begs the question, how did the people, you know, how did they arrive to where they are now? You know, how did they evolve this far? We're not given an answer to that. It could be they just crash landed here and they've been there for, you know, several generations and they're effectively dying off because they can't live in the environment. There's any number of reasons why this is the case. But for Gore himself, he looks around and says, if the gods really cared about us, if the gods really listened to our prayers and listened to our hopes, we wouldn't be dying of starvation. We wouldn't be dying of dehydration. They would bless us with water. They would bless us with rain. They'd give us some sign that they actually exist. Now, of course, this in response is meant to, to basically be viewed as heresy. But it also kind of makes sense that people would respond that way. And the reason why is because what Gore is doing is effectively taking away their hope. The people that he's walking with, the gods that they believe in are the only thing that stands between them and just giving up. It's the only thing that stands between them and just saying, yeah, there's no help coming and then just laying down and dying. You know, believing that the gods will answer their prayers if they pray long enough is the only hope they have that their lives will get better. And that makes sense. You know, nobody wants to believe that there's no light at the end of the tunnel. People want to believe that there's a better tomorrow on the horizon. That's just the nature of people. Even if there isn't, even if there's no hope of getting out of their circumstance, people want to believe that there is. Now, of course, Gore answering this and basically saying that hope is nonsensical leads to him being cast out by his own tribe. And so on the verge of dying, he's suddenly met by the arrival of two gods. Now, this is where Jason Aaron also plays it a little fast and loose because how these guys are depicted, one gold, one black, is clearly an allegory to good and evil. That's clearly what it's designed to be. But this also shows this sort of, you know, struggle that's been going on between the two of them for eons and eons and eons. But for those of you guys who read The Unworthy Thor, and those of you guys who read, you know, where, where Nick Fury had basically told Thor Gore was right, this is really what it's kind of hearkening down to. These gods, you know, the gods of, of this planet, of this realm or this region may very well exist, but they probably don't care about the goings on of people on the mundane ground, you know, who are just kind of living out their regular lives. I mean, how many comics have you seen where Thor rescues a homeless man or where Thor gives money to a homeless man or he saves him? How many comics have there been where Thor saves some little girl who's in an abusive uh, situation with parents? 
violence or some guy who's being beat up by a bully or something like that. You don't see those comics. Those comics don't exist. The only comics that you see are comics where Thor is fighting alongside the Avengers, where he's fighting in Asgard. He's going against, you know, the Frost Giants or something like that. It's Jason Aaron hitting at the nature of the comics, the stories that we've seen and said, look, maybe it is true. You know, if the gods exist, then why don't they care about the small guys? Why don't they care about the little guys? Why do they just fight amongst themselves with all their nonsense? And that's really what's being hit at home here with regards to Gore, because one of these gods survives and begs for help. The immediate response of Gore is, why would I help you? Where were you at when my mom died? Where were you at when my wife died? Where were you at when all these different members of these tribes had died? But in truth, it would be like screaming at Thor because a man's wife was run over by a car. Could Thor have really saved her? Possibly, but there's no guarantee that he could have. It's really just the wrath and the anger and the emotion and the pain that Gore has felt over the course of his life and just experiencing loss after loss after loss after loss that all really comes to a head. And so ultimately what ends up happening here is that some of this power, at least it seems to be that way, of this dark god basically allows itself to be used by Gore, and it actually takes the form of what's called the Necro Sword. Now, of course, the Necro Sword will be a major aspect of his character going forward in the realm of, uh, of, of you know, Thor, the God Butcher of that particular story. But Gore having this power uh, basically gives him the ability of a God. The difference is that he doesn't quite know how to use it yet. And that's the importance is that over the course of the next several millennia, he'll basically begin to harness his skills. And so what ends up happening is that we actually transition to another realm, to a different universe called Earth uh, One. 4412, uh, 14, 412, I think is what it's called. And we actually pick up, you know, in the future of this universe, where we basically have like Volstagg, who's normally part of the Warriors 3, but is clearly in shape and trimmed down, who's being tortured and then eventually killed by Gore. And he basically keeps kind of taunting, you know, Volstagg and so on and so forth. And Volstagg even makes the claim, look, if you have the power of a god and you're going around and you're killing other gods, what do you think that makes you? Do you think it makes you a good guy or do you think it makes you a bad guy? It's basically saying you be, you have essentially become what it is that you hate the most. Now, this particular universe, not this situation, but this particular universe is extremely important. And the reason why is because of the fact that over the course of God Butcher and God Bomb, Jason Aaron will span three different time periods. He'll span in the, the really the early days of Thor, you know, back when he was younger. He'll go in the present day and then he'll go in the future. The future in this particular universe where this matters, the reason why this is important is because this is a reality where Loki destroyed everything on Earth. He wiped out all life on Earth, all the superheroes, all the humans, the whole nine yards. Everything is gone. Loki literally killed everybody. That's where things are different. That's where it branches off from. That's what makes that universe different. Everything else in, you know, Thor the God Butcher is, you know, the past of the main Marvel Universe or the present day in the main Marvel Universe. This is in the future of an alternate universe. And so that's one of the cool things uh, about that little tidbit. But anyway, guys, I figured it'd be kind of a cool video to make. I thought it'd be pretty enjoyable to, to talk about um, the origin of Gore the God Butcher. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty short. The reason why is because his character gets a huge amount of development in Thor the God Butcher and the actual, I'm sorry, Thor uh, God of Thunder. I keep saying Thor the God Butcher. Um, he keeps getting, he gets a lot of character development in uh, Thor God of Thunder Volume 1 and the God Butcher storyline. Really, it's the story that kind of made him so cool. Art is amazing by Asad Ribic. It looks absolutely insane. But in my mind, it's probably the greatest Thor story ever told. Uh, getting into God Bomb, this basically brings the end of Gore the God Butcher. This is kind of like the, the self-contained story. And that was a cool thing. I mean, I imagine that, you know, with Jason Aaron, when he was writing the story, it was all designed to be one great big cohesive thing. I mean, once the time comes when Jason Aaron, you know, when Marvel announces that Jason Aaron is now leaving Thor, you'll literally be able to pick up with God Butcher and just read all the way up to wherever he stopped, and it'll just be one cohesive story. And I have, and I will continue to say that this is the greatest run of Thor that there's ever been. Like, I can, I, I've read so many runs of Thor. I've read Matt Fraction. I've read Straczynski. I've read uh, Walt Simonson. And to me, I sit down and I say, this is the best run there's ever been. I mean, all the other ones are great. They're fun. They're interesting. I like them. But in terms of development, in terms of storytelling, in terms of expansion, in terms of the art and how gorgeous it is, it's the greatest run of Thor that I think there has ever been. And so picking up from the last video, you know, when we had basically talked about the idea that Gore the God Butcher had essentially jumped to the future after grabbing a heart, really the heart of the uh, first Elder God, this essentially fueled his power. Now, keep in mind, as Gore kills gods and, you know, takes their blood or whatever the case may be, he expands his own powers. And so in the future, he's become really the most powerful being in existence among the, the traditional pantheon of gods. I mean, keep in mind, if like the living tribunal showed up and was like, okay, you basically disrupted the balance of all things, the living tribunal would just phase him out of existence. Eternity could destroy, you know, Gore, the God Butcher. I mean, there's a litany of ways that like Jason Aaron could end this. They wouldn't be fun. 
one. <laughs> but he could end them in a whole litany of ways. But the idea here is that we initially pick up with, uh, really, I guess, with modern day Thor and King Thor. Now, this is where things are going to get a lot more streamlined than they were, because in God Butcher, we were following three eras of Thor. In this story, we are, but they're all in the same place. So it's not like we're jumping through the past, present, and the future and trying to confine it into a story and make it make sense. Instead, uh, we are basically just kind of covering all different versions of these Thor in the same point in time. So we'll still call them like young Thor, or I guess, I guess, you know, past Thor and modern Thor and King Thor. But the fact remains here that uh, with modern Thor and King Thor meeting together, some of the questions that we have are answered to a degree. One of the things that he basically states is that in this era, that about 900 years before this current moment, Gore had just shown up on Asgard and invaded Asgard proper. And in doing so, he had essentially uh, taken all the Asgardians prisoner with the exception of Thor himself. Thor was forced to basically stay on Asgard and just fend off against wave after wave after wave of the Black Berserkers of Gore. Now, this begs the question, what happened to Odin? Now, when it comes to the character of Odin, we have what's called Ragnarok. Ragnarok, and we'll talk more about this once we actually get to like the Ragnarok story. Ragnarok is basically the end times of Asgard. It is the apocalypse of Asgard. But what Thor had learned and what we as the reader had learned was that Ragnarok was a constantly repeating cycle that to the Asgardians, to their mind, you would eventually have Surtur who would kill Odin. Loki would launch a war against Asgard. He would invade. Uh, he would conquer Asgard. Thor would be killed. And then eventually the Asgardians would be killed. And that would be it. Everybody in Asgard would effectively just die. Like that would be, you know, they die in some grandiose battle, but they would all end up dying. What we learned was that there was this group called the ones who sit above in shadow uh, who have been feeding on this cycle. And so where, you know, where Thor looks at the modern day and says, this is the only life that I have. In reality, he's been repeating his life over and over and over again. He just didn't know it. And the ones who sit above in shadow were feeding on this perpetual cycle of Ragnarok. Now, eventually Odin figured out what was going on. And instead of Thor just staying in Asgard, Odin basically cast Thor out. It's one of the reasons why he banished him and then confined him to earth so that he would be raised on earth and would eventually, you know, come across this path that would lead to the death of Odin. And Thor would have the reason to ask what's going on here, because by his own involvement with Captain America and Iron Man and different things like that, he would see the world through the perspective of a human, which in turn would create curiosity. And in his curiosity, he would want to know what's going on with Ragnarok. How does it work? And how do I stop it from happening? And so again, it's really kind of a cool scenario in terms of how that unfolds. We'll get into a far more in-depth explanation of Ragnarok once we get around to that story with the release of, uh, of Thor 3. But the fact remains here that that because of the fact that Thor knows what Ragnarok is because he's aware of Ragnarok, so does King Thor, since he's basically Thor in the future. And so the idea here is that in his mind, Odin has effectively just died somewhere along the line. That's really what it is. I mean, Odin has basically just kind of moved on and Thor has what's called the Thor Force. Now, the Thor Force and the Odin Force, those are just names given to whoever it is that's wielding that particular power. The Odin Force is just an insane amount of energy that Odin has, and it allows him to do whatever it is that he wants to do at any particular point in time. It's a plot device. When Odin dies, that power passes to Thor and it becomes the Thor force. Likewise, it could be that both Odin and Thor die and the power would pass to Loki and it would become the Loki force. It's just whoever it is that's wielding that power at any particular point in time. But the fact remains that King Thor has the has the Thor force. The difference is that remember the Thor force is like a battery. So anybody who wields it long enough, if they do not go into the Odin sleep or the Thor sleep, in this case, they would just basically run out of power. And that's really what it is. He's been fighting for so long and he's exhausted so much energy he can't go into the to the Thor sleep he can't rest otherwise you know there wouldn't be anybody to defend Asgard and so the result is that his power is effectively almost completely defeated now with the arrival of modern Thor what this does is it rekindles hope it rekindles the possibility that he may yet live it rekindles the possibility that Asgard could very well be saved at the same time modern Thor and future Thor are joined by past Thor and the reason why is because of the fact that past Thor basically has this dream where he realizes that Gore the God Butcher isn't dead where he previously believed uh, previously believed he had killed him. One of uh, Gore's Black Berserkers kind of throws like this Cronus charge at him or something like that. Anyway, it just time displaces him and it teleports him to the future. That's really all it is. Of course, he rises up through the pond. The difference here is that he does not immediately join uh, modern and future Thor. Instead, he's actually forced into being a subject. He's forced into being a slave. Now, the reason for this is twofold. The first half is that in the mind of Gore, he's captured so many gods already and his power is so extreme. He's not worried about modern modern or future Thor. Now that will be the, the really the source of his undoing and that's his hubris. The other half of this is that because Thor is so strong and because Thor is so capable and because he is the one that almost killed Gore, capturing Thor is really more of like a trophy than anything else. You know, I finally captured the guy who almost killed me. You know, it's basically
basically Gore kind of solidifying in his own mind that he is indeed the God of God, so to speak, that he's the one person that's going to bring everything crashing down. And so with this in mind, uh, what King Thor tells modern Thor is that again, where, uh, where Gore had basically showed up on Asgard, he had captured all the Asgardians. Those who fought against Gore had basically been killed. And uh, those who have been captured have been whisked off to a planet on the far side of the universe where Gore is building a God bomb, a bomb that's designed to eliminate all gods. We follow uh, King Thor and modern Thor over to the location of where Gore is hanging out at. Now, getting a little bit more into this whole idea of a, uh, of a God bomb, what we end up finding out is that Gore is not entirely wrong. Now, for those of you guys who are reading Unworthy Thor, this is why Jason Aaron's run is so important. This is why Jason Aaron's run is so significant. There's a conversation that happens between Gore and his son. We don't really know where his son came from. We don't know why he's there, but there's a conversation that happens between the two of them. And what Gore says is that in his mind, gods are inherently evil. Gods are inherently bad. Gods, you know, answer the prayers of their followers based on a whim. They may choose not to answer. They may choose to answer. It's just kind of doing whatever they want to do when they do it and how they do it and so on and so forth. And so because of that, Gore wants to eliminate them all. The purpose of the God bomb is to essentially detonate the bomb so that when it goes off, it will kill all gods throughout the time stream. Gods from the present, gods from the uh, from the past, gods from the future, those who may have been hidden away from Gore that he just didn't know about and never caught and killed, those who were never caught and captured, whatever the case may be, they will die all throughout the time stream. Now, notice the motivation of Gore with this mindset. Gore has basically been passing this information onto his son. And so when Gore's son speaks directly with Thor, who's basically working as a prisoner, Gore's son basically says, look, what this is going to do is it's going to usher in a great era. It's going to usher in an era where people don't fight over which God's real and which God's false. People won't fight over which God's right and which God is wrong. People will not live their lives waiting for an eternity of splendor or fearing an eternity of hell. People will live in the moment. They will value what they have. They will recognize this life is the only life they have and they will treat it that way. They will take the most advantage out of it. That's not wrong. And that's the coolest thing about that is because that's what Nick Fury was saying when he whispered to, to Odin's son and he said Gore was right and it made him unworthy. It was the hammer realizing that's true. Like it's true. Like people, you know, people like Thor, they represent the ideology that people don't value the life they have. They value the life they hope they have. And so again, it's basically, you know, never really living in the moment. That's why Jane Foster was chosen because she's literally a person dying of cancer. Every moment could be her last. And so she values what she has left of her life because for her, she doesn't view the possibility of an afterlife. She doesn't view the possibility of going to heaven. She views the life that she has as being the only one she has. And she looks to make the most of it. She's living in the present, not living in the future. That's why the hammer chose her. And that's why it's so cool. That's why all this wraps around and creates one great big cohesive story because you get a little piece here and you get a little piece there and then you get a little piece over there somewhere. And then it all comes together to create this amazing cohesive story where everything is important. And that's why I love it so much. That's why it's, it's such a cool thing. Now from here, we are introduced to the granddaughters of King Thor. And this is really kind of cool because these chicks, they do not play like they are. <laughs> they are hardcore. But the funny thing about this is that while they are being forced to work in subservience, which is to say to basically help build this God bomb at the end of the day, they're also planning a way to get out. And the funny thing is that with past Thor being so young, being so brash, being so reckless, showing up here, having been captured and saying, well, we have to fight, we have to fight and we have to win and we have to get our freedom. He's not thinking rationally. He's not thinking according to a plan. And that's really what Jason Aaron is hitting on when it comes to these different iterations of Thor. And that's something that I hope you notice. Past Thor is young. I mean, he's young, he's brash. Let's just battle. You know, when it comes to modern day Thor, modern day Thor is a little more reasonable. He's a little more thinking. He's still quick to fight. He's still quick to battle. But King Thor is old. He's wise. It is basically the steps of Thor as he becomes essentially Odin. As he eventually gets to the point where he realizes that sometimes you can't just fight directly. Sometimes you need a plan. Sometimes you have to function accordingly. Sometimes you just have to be intelligent about what you do. And so it's really kind of cool to see these different iterations coming together. But of course, with young Thor, he's basically told, look, you know, get back to work, keep your mouth shut. Do not draw attention to us. And the reason why is because picking up later that night with the, the granddaughters of King Thor, we ultimately find that what they've done is they basically constructed a bomb of their own. And the reason why is because of the fact that in three days, the God bomb will be finished and every God everywhere in existence will be destroyed. And when that happens, uh, all things will essentially come crashing down, including all of them there. And so the goal is to basically destroy this God bomb before it can go off. Now, of course, the funny thing about this, and this is really when like the brash nature of, of young Thor comes into the equation when he simply just grabs the bomb and races off. <laughs> races off with the God bomb with the intention of destroying it. Now, things 
get a little bit murky at this point, and I would imagine Jason Aaron kind of fast-tracked things a bit, and the reason why is because of the fact that where the bomb is detonated, we immediately transition over to King Thor and Modern Thor, where they're facing off against some of these, these gods that are basically being used, like these shark gods that are being used as kind of like uh, guards of the planet of Gore, and then they're suddenly met with the arrival of young Thor. We don't know how he got there. We don't know, you know, if he was just teleported, if the god bomb went off, and he was just suddenly moved away. We're not really sure exactly why it is that he's here. We just know that he is. But alongside modern Thor and alongside King Thor, what they basically say is we have to destroy Gore. We have to kill him so that we can make sure that all gods everywhere survive. So we effectively have three different Thors fighting in the same battle, and it is a sight to behold. Now, from here, we get into the downfall of Gore, and this is one of the greatest things about this. With Jason Aaron's storytelling, he does not take a conventional approach with ending stories, which is to say, hey guys, here's a really cool event, and it's done. It doesn't go that way with Jason Aaron. Jason Aaron really kind of builds up, he builds characters up, and then he gives them a gradual downfall, and it's usually an ironic downfall. Against the, the force of three Thors, Gore cannot pull it off, and what Jason Aaron is basically saying here is that Thor is unique among all the gods that are in existence because of his desire for battle, because of his desire for conflict, because he's so capable at what he does, he cannot simply just be defeated like any sort of god. When you have three of them, they are nigh unstoppable. And so Gore literally throws every single thing he has at them. He kills other gods that are currently his slaves to absorb their power and increase his own, and he still can't pull it off initially. And so what we end up having is all three of these gods racing into gore, engaging in this massive battle, which leads into them basically kind of being, I guess, catapulted into the sun. Now, this is kind of cool. Actually, this is this is pretty damn amazing, to be honest with you guys. And the reason why is because of the fact that with three Thors facing off against gore, we would expect them to win, right? Like, we would expect them to take the day, only for gore to, you know, for the battle to end, for all three Thors to come crashing back to Earth, and for gore to have been the one that came out triumphant. And so what Jason Aaron does is he gives us this amazing crescendo. It, it's almost like this, this feeling that all hope is lost, that Gore has managed to defeat three Thors, and they all have an incredible endurance, fighting prowess the whole nine yards, and Gore still wins. And so again, it's a very terrifying situation. But what we end up doing is we pick up with the wife of Gore when she basically begins, you know, kind of talking to her husband. Now, this is where the downfall comes into play. And the reason why I say that is because of the fact that she says, look, you know, I look forward to an era when the God Bomb is detonated. I look forward to an era when there are no more gods out there, when there are no more people to, to worship, you know, and she expresses her affection by basically referring to him and saying, you are my God. In return, Gore kills her. And that's where the downfall comes into play. And the reason why is because of the fact that the entire scenario is observed by the son of Gore. Now, where the son plays along and says, look, you know, yes, I can't wait for this bomb to go off, yada, 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 you know, we'll get everything set up and going. At the end of the day, he intends to kill his father because his father killed his mother. And so again, it's so cool because usually whenever it comes to like dystopian rulers or like totalitarians or something like that, the one thing they fear is someone rising up and either becoming a martyr or mustering all the forces together and just outright bringing them down. It's the one thing that Gore fears above all others. He he fears someone rising up with enough power to bring him crashing down. And it's that way with every single narrative when there's someone with absolute power. Now, it doesn't mean that they are successfully defeated, but it does mean that it is one thing that they fear. And so by going through and, and you know basically charging up this god bomb with uh, one of the Thors who's remained captured by Gore, as well as the other two Thors, you know, trying to climb back into battle, you know, climbing up mountainsides from wherever it was that they landed, the modern Thor is basically rescued by the son of Gore. And the son of Gore says, look, my father killed my mother. I will help you defeat my father. Now, the reason why this is so cool is because the son of Gore represents what Gore used to be. In the origin story of Gore, Gore used to be a guy where he was basically just trying to live a reasonable life. I mean, he had a wife, he had, he had children of his own. He was very mortal. He was very emotional, dare I say, very human in terms of how he existed. Existed. It was only after he lost everything that he became so dark and he became so bleak. But his son is still who Gore used to be. His son still cares about others. His son still feels love, still feels emotion, still feels affection. And so because of that, in his anger, in his wrath, and in his desire for revenge, he takes a side against his father. In doing this, it grants a reprieve for all three Thors to reband back together again and begin the process of waging a war against Gore, trying to bring him down. Now, this is where things get get incredibly cool because as each one begins to take on Gore, each one of them begins to meet their defeat. And ultimately, it comes down to the modern day version of Thor who picks up both his hammer and the hammer of King Thor. Now, this is something that we've almost never
never seen before. I don't think I've ever seen an instance when we've had a Thor wield two hammers at the same time. Now, this is crazy because the power of the hammers has always been something that's a little bit ambiguous. And even then, when this story was written, the power behind the hammers had not been explained by Jason Aaron. Now, we know now that it's just like this sentient cosmic storm. It's basically cosmic energy inside this hammer that's been harnessed by Odin so that Thor can use it. Having two hammers composed of cosmic energy creates a level of power hitherto unrivaled. And so what this does with Thor essentially smashing them together, it allows him to both destroy the God Bomb uh, before it kills any of the other gods across all time and space, as well as absorb the Necro Sword. Now, what this does is it basically transforms Thor into the God of Gods, because we now have Thor wielding the All Black Necro Sword, a weapon designed to do nothing more than kill gods and destroy worlds, as well as wielding two hammers. This this is probably the single greatest picture that I've ever seen in my life when it comes to Thor. He looks so badass with this with his whole his whole getup. He's just like cloud and black with two hammers. I mean, it's one of the coolest things that I've ever seen. But but uh, Gore has essentially lost the source of his power. That's really what it is. He has no power left. There's nothing left coming to him. He is effectively as mortal as he was in his origin story. And so because of this, because of the fact that Gore has been defeated, his uh, son appears to him and says, look, I am the source of your defeat. But what we also end up learning is that his son is not actually his son. Instead, his son was a construct created by the Necro Sword. So again, this is really kind of an interesting scenario because what it does is it shows us that deep in his core, once you get past his whole desire to kill gods, Gore was still very much, you know, human, so to speak, in the sense that he wanted offspring, he wanted a life but it also shows us that he was not just inherently evil. He may have lost his way, he may have fallen down the wrong path, but at the end of the day, his motivation was to basically create a world or a universe, a reality without gods, because in his mind, the gods were the source of all suffering that existed out there. And so it begs the question, how many civilizations have suffered? How many people have died across the universe because the gods did not answer their call? Again, rolling back into the idea of why the hammer chose Jane Foster to be worthy instead of allowing Odin's son to be worthy. So again, it's it's a beautiful story that all kind of comes together and, you know, really becomes cohesive. But in these final moments, Gore's effectively defeated by being decapitated. And that's really about it. I mean, from there, there's really nothing more that goes on with this character. That's pretty much the end of him. And so what this does is it gives us kind of a, a really cool epilogue in the sense that we pick up about three days later after this battle in the sense that uh, Asgard is turned into this sort of beacon and home for gods across the cosmos, that all gods from all these different races are all kind of coming back. They're arriving on Asgard. It's going to serve as a major hub. Of course, what's left of the Asgardians still reside there. We don't know explicitly what role that, you know, Asgard will play in the future, at least not yet. But at this moment, we just sort of pick up with the idea that everybody's living out the rest of their lives. You know, that, that past Thor, that modern Thor are sent back to their own times, respectively. King Thor stays in the future. And, uh, and that's really it. I mean, it's really the idea that they just kind of go back to doing what they were doing before. But what this does is it sets the stage for the arrival of Galactus on Earth. And it actually sets the stage for old King Thor versus Galactus. And the question, of what it is that happened to Earth in this reality. Okay, so getting into Jason Aaron's uh, Thor God of Thunder, I guess, you know, last days of Midgard, this story is actually split in two. And it's really kind of interesting the way this is done is because the, the part that we're going to be focusing on here is Thor fighting Galactus, since that's the part you guys care about. <laughs> the other half of this is basically setting the stage for like Roxxon Oil to get involved with uh, with Malekith and his desire to launch his War of the Nine Realms and so on and so forth. And we'll wrap back around to that because this really kind of like ends Jason Aaron's run, but we will wrap back around to this once we pick back up with Thor with the release of Ragnarok. So we've got a little while. We've got a little bit of time before we, we jump back into Thor again. That is, we might start our X-Men run and then uh, like pause the X-Men run for Thor Ragnarok and then do all the Thor stories going up to this, which is Jason Aaron's run, and then go back into X-Men again because there's no chronological series of videos on the X-Men stories after the events of House of M, but we'll cross that bridge once we get to it. One thing to keep in mind, and I'm really kind of debating on whether or not this is something that we're going to cover because it's not wildly significant it's just a thing he did in the future. But essentially, Earth itself is completely uninhabited because of the fact that Loki basically obliterated all life on the planet. Now, this was covered in Loki, Agent of Asgard. And Loki, Agent of Asgard was basically designed to kind of emphasize his character. The problem with doing that
that is in order to understand why Loki, agent of Asgard, happens, we have to understand why he's young again, why he's trying to change his ways. And in order to understand why he's trying to change his ways, we have to understand why he was a little boy, why he was a chick. All that stuff comes out of Thor Ragnarok. So again, Ragnarok was kind of like the House of M or kind of like the, the reboot, so to speak. Because of that, all we really need to know is that Loki basically obliterated all life on Earth. And that was really all there is. But what this did is it set the stage for the arrival of Galactus. Now, keep in mind, this section of the story takes place millions of years, or at least maybe not millions, but thousands and thousands of years in the future. So even if humanity hadn't been wiped out by Loki, it certainly would have died off at some point along the line. But the fact remains here that Galactus is still, again, very much alive. Now, this really, and, and it'll probably drag a lot of questions into fray, this really kind of throws into sharp relief the nature of Secret Wars. Now, something that I want to point out here is how Secret Wars fits into the chronology of events in Marvel Comics. And this is where Marvel tends to contradict itself. In Marvel Comics, you have a character named Cable. And Cable is a guy that hails from the future. The guy is a retconning machine. Essentially, if Marvel wants to change something, they'll have Cable just suddenly travel back in time for whatever reason. And he's like, I'm here to prevent this from happening. Case in point, Civil War. When the original Civil War event happened, Cable and Deadpool still had their team-up comic. Cable jumped into the past and said, hey, look, Mr. President, if you do this, I know where this is going to lead to and you're not going to like it. So it was basically kind of fitting it in. And so the issue with Cable's character is everything that happens between right now at any given point in Marvel Comics and the future is all part of Cable's timeline. The issue with this and the reason why it's, it's so important is because in this particular story, we're kind of left to believe that had Secret Wars not happened, then this series of events would have transpired some, you know, five, six, seven thousand years in the future. And so the best way to think about this is that whenever you pick up a Marvel story and it says thousands of years in the future or something like that, and it's a story that took place before Secret Wars, then basically just act as though that story took place as if Secret Wars never happened. And for whatever reason, Secret Wars ended up taking place. And so because that is really the only way we have to kind of rectify these two things and, and sort of bring them together. But the fact remains here, remember for the character of Thor, uh, Midgard, which is basically Earth, had been his home for quite some time. Now, of course, again, this really all kind of cycles back to Ragnarok in and of itself. But at the same time, it's also just the idea of him having been a superhero on Earth, fought alongside the, you know, Captain America and the Incredible Hulk and so many different superheroes, you know, having met Jane Foster there, having been a friend to humanity in so many different ways. It's really kind of him just sort of losing a piece of himself. And so what Thor routinely does is he travels back to Earth for no other reason than to just kind of uh, gather his bearings and to just kind of, you know, pay homage to the world that gave him so much and to sort of mourn over the friends that he's lost because of the actions of Loki. The problem with this is that Thor, alongside his granddaughters, basically showing up here, is suddenly met with the arrival of Galactus. Now, for Thor, this is as much an affront as it is really the final battle. Because remember, as it stands right now, in terms of like the old gods, so to speak, which is to say those who lived on Asgard as far back as Asgard goes, the idea here is that Thor is really the last of the old Asgardians, and Earth is the last refuge. It's really the one thing that he can't let go. And so because of this, he actually banishes his granddaughters away. Now, this makes sense because you have to keep in mind, in the mind of Thor, he's fought Galactus so many times. And while his granddaughters know who Galactus is, they are not prepared for the, you know, the, the kind of power that Galactus possesses. Now, something else to point out here is Jason Aaron didn't just arbitrarily grab Galactus. He wasn't just sitting in like, you know what? I think we should have some kind of a villain. Who are we going to use? Well, let's use Galactus. In truth, Galactus and Thor go way back. And just in the realm of Marvel Comics, the origin of Galactus first appeared in the Thor comics. I want to say it was 161 and 162. The fact remains here that with regards to, to Galactus and Thor, their history is extremely rich. I mean, they fought side by side to defeat Ego, the living planet. They've been enemies and they've been allies. And so because of this, Thor is well aware of how powerful Galactus is, but Thor is not without his own capabilities. Keep in mind, Thor is currently in possession of the Thor Force. Now, when it comes to, to the Asgardian mythos, and when it comes to Marvel Comics, uh, the concept of the Odin Force, or the Thor Force, or whatever we want to call it, uh, is simply just a source of power. It's not like it is a well. Uh, it's basically just the power he possesses. Now, with Odin, it's a little more straightforward. With Odin, his brothers had previously died alongside Odin, facing off against Surtur, which is kind of like this mortal enemy. It's the arch enemy of Odin, and he's actually the guy that killed Odin going into Ragnarok. But the fact remains here that the, the brother of Odin basically died and their life force merged with him and gave him the Odin force. And so it was really kind of Marvel's way to just explain, here's why Odin is so powerful. And so it's almost as if it was just kind of powers that, that were bestowed upon him. But again, it's, it's still kind of murky. It's not really clear cut. There's no definitive explanation. Now, this is something that can be passed on from person to person. So it's almost like a power that he can remove from himself and give to somebody else. It's actually what happened during the events of Ragnarok.
Ragnarok, uh, Thor basically spoke directly with the Odin Force. So it is an actual tangible source of energy that can exist outside of Odin. It's just with Odin all the time. And so whenever he uses it to its completion or uses any fraction of it, he has to go into the Odin sleep to basically recharge that power. But the fact remains here that Thor, you know, with Odin having died somewhere along the line, Thor is now in possession of this force of energy. And so effectively he now has the Thor force. And this is insane because the Odin or Thor force basically allows either one to do whatever it is that they want to do at any particular point in time, shy of warping reality on a universal scale. It basically just amplifies their existing powers in the extreme. The funny thing about this though, is that as powerful as Thor is, he's not on the same level as Galactus. Because remember, Galactus is a force of nature. I mean, you're talking about a being with hitherto unrivaled power with the exception of the highest ranking cosmic entities. And even then, they dare not try to destroy Galactus because if Galactus were in a hungered state, let's say for example, Galactus was basically ravenous. He was absolutely feeding, you know, he was dying for something to eat. He could probably lay waste to a litany of different things. But if Galactus is completely full, if Galactus is totally charged with energy, you know, if he were a battery and he's at 100%, I would dare say there's almost no one who could stand in his way barring maybe eternity himself and even then it would probably be a pretty formidable challenge and so because of that you know Galactus is not someone to, to be trifled with here now the cool thing is we get this really really beautiful conversation between the two of them and the idea here is that you know Thor's question is why are you going to consume this world this world is half dead I mean it'll only ever give you really half the sustenance you need it would be like eating a, a half-eaten sandwich why eat a half-eaten sandwich we can go eat a whole sandwich go to another planet that's that's rich with life take that planet there's no reason for you to take Earth. But for Galactus, it's more than just consuming a planet, right? Like it's more than just saying, well, I'm hungry right now. I'm going to go eat a planet. For Galactus, it's consuming Earth. Because remember, Galactus and Earth have a very close history. I mean, Galactus's first appearance, you know, in Marvel Comics came by way of the Silver Surfer arriving on Earth, telling the Fantastic Four, Galactus is coming and he's going to consume your planet and there's nothing you can do to stop him. And then, you know, the Silver Surfer and the Fantastic Four banding together to defeat Galactus by way of using the ultimate nullifier, or at least threatening to use the ultimate nullifier. Fire. But time and time again, Galactus has shown up on Earth with the intention to conquer it. And time and time again, the Earth superheroes have basically stopped him. And so for Galactus, it's basically saying, I finally get the planet that I've been wanting to consume this entire time. It is not necessarily a life rich planet. This planet is basically dying. I mean, but for me, it's really more of just the principle of the thing, you know, and that's kind of the irony here because what it does is it really shows how powerful Earth was in a lot of different ways. And that was something that had been touched on time and time again. I mean, Thanos has referenced that over and over again, the different alien races in Marvel Comics at some point along the line, the Shi'ar Empire, the Kree, the Skrulls, you know, the Badoon, they've all talked about that time and time again. The Earth is home to some of the universe's most powerful beings, but the Earth is also filled with people who still live in a very primitive capacity, which is to say politics run the show and different things like like that. And so the Earth was always viewed as a very dangerous place because if one of the superheroes like Franklin Richards managed to lose control of his powers, he could wipe out everything in existence to say nothing of people like the Molecule Man Owen Reese. So again, it's really kind of a cool scenario here with regards to the nature of the Earth and how it all functions. Now, of course, this leads into a direct conflict between Thor himself as well as Galactus. And so again, this is really kind of cool because it's basically like this last stand. It's really Thor doing everything he can to try to keep this planet it alive. The problem here is that as capable as Thor is, at the end of the day, he's no Odin. He's basically being toppled at every single turn. Now, in some ways, we could say this is Jason Aaron just nerfing the power of the of the Thor Force, just sitting down and saying, okay, look, you know, we're going to reduce this power, right? It's not nearly on the same level as Odin. And to a degree, that might be the case. I would say this is just Jason Aaron writing the story for the sake of writing a great story, which is exactly what he does. It's absolutely amazing. But in the middle of all this, Thor, again, going head to head against Galactus is ultimately toppled and actually just kind of kicked off the planet and just sort of sent flying. Now, again, this is cool because despite the fact that Thor is not as powerful as Odin was, it's still an incredible fight. Galactus is relishing in this, right? I mean, when you're Galactus and you've been traveling around the universe for billions of years and you show up on somebody's planet and they fire off their little weapons, which tantamount to throwing toothpicks at a hurricane, you know, you kind of get bored of the idea that no one can put up a real challenging fight. But then here you come to Earth, you know, trying to conquer this planet that's 
stood against you for so long. And then you find one God left with an insane amount of power and you relish in the challenge. You're like, finally, you know, I have something to keep me entertained. So it's really kind of a cool scenario. Of course, once Thor is basically kind of cast out of Earth or cast out of Midgard and sent into the depths of space, it allows Galactus to begin going through and consuming the planet. Now, again, the cool thing about this is that while all this is happening, we're suddenly met with the arrival of Thor's granddaughters. Now, in my rundown video, and this is one of the funny things, it was like, hey guys, we're back from shopping. But this is one of the coolest moments in the story because Thor's granddaughters are badass. But not only that, one of them looks like they're wielding Stormbreaker. Now, Stormbreaker, for those of you guys who don't know, is basically the hammer of Beta Ray Bill. And Beta Ray Bill, the reason why fans love him so much, and the reason why so many people are like, put him in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is because Beta Ray Bill is the first person to have ever picked up Thor's hammer. And it was a huge moment when it happened. Nick Fury contacts Thor, says, hey, look, there's a ship coming over here to Earth. Thor goes to investigate. You know, Beta Ray Bill basically is, is part of his race, or at least is one of his, uh, as his race's main protector, you know, the protector of the Corbinites, comes across Thor, fights against him, and then picks up his hammer it was mind-blowing it was just like oh my god that's never happened before and so it was a great big huge moment and it set the stage for marvel to begin introducing these moments here and there when someone other than thor picked his hammer up and it was always a really really cool moment whenever it happened but uh because of everything that had taken place odin had basically hosted a contest between uh beta ray bill and thor to determine who was the most worthy and because of the fact that beta ray bill had proved himself to be an honorable warrior because his conflict with thor was not due to villainy but because of the fact that he was a protector Beta Ray Bill was given his own hammer fashioned by the dwarves at the request of Odin and was called Stormbreaker. And so again, it's a really, really cool moment. Of course, there's the actual Yarmbjorn, there's the mace. I mean, there's all different kinds of little trinkets and so on. And it really kind of shows us that Thor really is the last of the gods. There are no other gods left in terms of the traditional pantheon. The cosmic entities still exist out there. But at the end of the day, the granddaughters of Thor, while they're not necessarily able to topple Galactus and we wouldn't expect them to, they're able to put up a pretty significant fight. A lot more than we would expect, a much greater conflict than we would expect to see here. Now, again, this is really kind of Jason Aaron delving into the idea that there are still really those individuals out there that are part of the Asgardian pantheon that do the best they can in terms of holding off various threats. But it's also the notion that the granddaughters of Thor follow very much in his footsteps. They're just as capable as he is in terms of straight up battles. And so, of course, following this quick little skirmish between them, we end up jumping back to Thor himself and finding out that he effectively transitions to the furthest part or ends up in the, the furthest part of the universe where Gore the God Butcher had essentially been left, you know, where he had been destroyed with the uh, Necrosword just sort of sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. And so what this does is it basically allows Thor to grab this sword, kind of hearkening back to when he had absorbed the sword and when he had both hammers at the same time and really just kind of realize this is basically the only way to take out Galactus, to basically use the sword that's designed to kill gods. Now, what this does is it basically gives us this little bit of information that tells us that the Necrosword was designed for a myriad of different purposes, that the sword is designed to kill gods, but it's very much one of these weapons where its capabilities and its level of power is relative to whatever it's going against, or at least that seems to be the case. And so when Gore the God Butcher is using it to kill gods, the weapon has enough power to kill gods. But when Thor is using the Necro Sword, it amplifies his existing powers and allows him to take on Galactus. Now at this point, Galactus is in a pretty weakened state, and that's the other half of this equation. Galactus, whenever it is that he uses his power cosmic, it's just like a battery, right? It's not an infinite source of power. It's not like telepathy. It's not like the optic beams and Cyclops' eyes, it is a finite amount of power. It's, it's not unlimited. And so as Galactus uses the power cosmic, it's like a battery that's just kind of slowly draining. Now, the other half of this is that the hungrier Galactus gets, the more desperate, the more ravenous, and the more dangerous he gets, the lower his patients get. And so if Galactus, for example, had showed up on Earth and was absolutely starving and this conflict had started, it never would have gone on this long. He would have just been like, and you're done now. And he would have just, you know, obliterated Thor out of existence, killed his granddaughters when they showed up. This thing would have been three pages long and then Galactus would have consumed the earth and that would have been it. But the fact that he's getting hungrier, the fact that he's using more of his powers means that now he's beginning to get more irritated and he's beginning to get more desperate. Now, this is kind of the cool thing here is because once Thor arrives back on the scene with this Necro Sword, he absolutely decimates Galactus. I mean, he literally just kind of plunges the sword right through him and that's really about it. Now, again, this is kind of a, a quick ending. I mean, it's not something grandiose. It's not something absolutely insane. Things come to an end quick, fast, and in a hurry. But it is this idea that with the Necro Sword, you know, Thor essentially has a power of a thousand gods and going through, kind of declaring himself Thor the Destroyer, fighting against Galactus and basically taking Galactus down. What this does is it basically just kind of sends Galactus running. It sends him basically saying, okay, look, this battle is far more than it's worth. I mean, you're really more of a hassle than you're worth at this point. Now, this is also compounded by the fact 
The Galactus physical form is absolutely tattered. I mean, it's almost in complete and total ruins just because of the fact that the battle's been so extreme. So again, at this point in this conflict, we're talking about a level of power that's so high up there that normal people couldn't even fathom what it is that's going on. But what it does is it also sits down and it says, even if Thor right now is not strong enough to go against Galactus, he will be. He will face off against Galactus somewhere along the line, and he will probably be successful in doing so. The other half of this is that following this skirmish, Thor actually bleeds onto the ground of Earth, and the Earth begins to just repopulate and regrow. Now, this is not just a random thing. This is not Jason Aaron just saying, yeah, man, like the blood of gods repopulates Earth. Thor also has the Thor Force, so he has the entire energy of Odin imbued to himself. The other half of this is that Freya is not the biological mother of Thor. The biological mother of Thor is Gaia, basically the physical manifestation of Mother Earth. And so because of that, Thor is basically taking the life energy of Gaia and just kind of throwing it out there on Earth. That's essentially what's happening. What this tells us is that it's somewhere along the line, the Earth will return to its normal self. I mean, the Earth will, you know, just kind of regrow and, and populace will begin to come back and, you know, humans will begin to, to grow and so on and so forth. We don't know how long that process will take, but we know that it will. But with the Earth basically having been restored, the rivers and streams and so on and so forth, we actually end up picking up with this epilogue. And what we find out is that with this all-black necrosword basically having been, you know, attached to Galactus, you know, that Galactus himself actually ends up just sort of evolving and kind of growing and imbuing himself with the necrosword and then suddenly goes forward as the Butcher of Worlds. The sad thing about this is we never find out what happens next. <laughs> That's the worst part about all that, because I was like, I really want to see, like, Galactus, the Butcher of Worlds. Like, I really want to see that happen. I really want to see what ends up taking place here. But the problem is we don't. We never get to see that. We never actually get to see what takes place. Instead, Galactus is just kind of forced to consume Mars, and, and that's really about it. Okay, so I want to be dangerous in, for the next week, I want to try and experiment for the next week. I've actually been thinking about doing this for a little while, and I've been trying to find a way to see if we can make it work. So what we're going to do for this, for this whole week is we're going to cover the event of fear itself. And this is going to be like a background series of videos in addition to the videos that we normally do. The exception, of course, is today because it's Sunday. And so normally we would cover X, well, we should be covering X-Men and, and Green, uh, Green Lantern, but I've been getting a house remodeled and all kinds of good stuff, and that went on the back burner and I'm going to do this instead. So I'm kind of curious to see how people will respond to this. Now, Fear itself is an interesting story. Here's a funny thing about this. So when Marvel, when Joe Quesada took over Marvel uh, Marvel Comics in the, the early 2000s as editor-in-chief, uh, basically from 2000 going forward, it was designed to like rework everything, right? And then we went into Siege, and then we, we had like Dark Reign Siege, the Heroic Age, and then we go into Fear itself. And the Heroic Age was designed to basically say, here's heroes being heroes. Initially, it was like that. Like all these different characters and teams got one shots, and then you had like the actual Heroic Age miniseries and so on and so forth, but it didn't last all that long because in reality, people had kind of liked the darker tone of storytelling, like stories like Civil War, Secret Invasion, things like that. People somewhat enjoyed that. The other half of this was that by the time 2011 and 2012 came around, Marvel was planning out Secret Wars. And so the result was that Jonathan Hickman's fan, I'm sorry, Jonathan Hickman's uh, Avengers, the new Avengers picked up shortly after this and then just started going forward with the collapse of the multiverse. So there wasn't really a whole lot of time to sort of restore heroes back to what they're supposed to be, quote unquote. Instead, it was just kind of picking up, sticking with what worked, and then eventually going into Secret Wars, which led into all new, all different Marvel. Now, initially what this does is this picks up with the character of Sin. Now, Cynthia Smith is the daughter of Red Skull, and her character originally appeared back in Captain America Comics in issue number 290, or really 289 going into 290. But she was basically this, this idea that Red Skull wanted an heir for himself. And so with this in mind, what ended up happening here is that Cynthia Schmidt was basically brainwashed, more or less. Now, the original intention of Red Skull was to kill her because she wasn't a boy, but ultimately her life was spared and he started raising her to become his new protege. Now this comes after Ed Brubaker's Captain America run. And the reason why I say that, the reason why it matters is because during that run, that included basically the conclusion of Civil War, uh, the events that went into the death of Captain America, the return of Bucky Barnes, Red Skull having a uh, cosmic cube, different things like that, but ultimately resulted in quote unquote Red Skull dying. And so Cynthia Schmidt, it was really kind of her chance to shine and it was a way to bring her in and have her go forward as a potential replacement for the Red Skull, which of course, as we know, didn't work. That's, that's one of the things you read comics long enough you, one of the things you learn is that nothing ever stays changed forever and so in this instance what she's done is she's allied herself with baron zemo now what they've done is they've discovered the book of the skull and the book of the skull basically housed various secrets that red skull kept hidden and various sources of power that he was never able to use for one reason or another now this ultimately leads into them basically accessing the bunker of you know of red skull and then once they get in cynthia schmidt begins to basically sort of reveal this tale and what we end up finding out is that in in the 19 
1940s, during uh, during World War II, that the Red Skull had essentially traveled to a, a section of Atlanta, really in Germany, but had brought Atlantean mystics to him and in turn basically forced them to start using their, their various forms of magics in order to access a sort of super weapon out there that would serve the purpose of allowing the Germans to basically win World War II. Now, the other half of this is the invaders themselves, because with this going on, essentially the artifact that's been summoned, more or less, by Red Skull has flown across the sky and landed somewhere else, meaning they have to go chase it down. Now, this ultimately leads to uh, to them basically accessing where the Red Skull was operating out of, just because of the fact that word had reached their ears that strange things were going on, and the invaders were literally jumping from, like, basically following the trail of the Germans and liberating all the camps that they could come across. And so when Namor steps in here and ends up finding out that all the members of, uh, you know, these various uh, Atlanteans have essentially all been killed, it's a big to-do. Because one of the things to remember is that when it comes to Namor, he is fiercely protective of his people. As Prince, as basically the ruler of Atlantis, he'll go to the ends of the earth. Now, from here, picking up with uh, Red Skull, as well as the rest of these German forces, once they arrive here, you've also got the, uh, you got the invaders hot on their trail. Because by this point, the various folks in Germany have basically said, hey, look, here's what was going on with the Red Skull and various magics and so on and so forth. But this item had basically crash landed in, an, uh, crash landed in Antarctica. And the initial indication is that it's a hammer because Red Skull cannot pick it up. He can't lift it. Now, this is not the hammer of Thor. This is a totally secret hammer that no one's ever known about before. And so the result here is that Red Skull's response is to basically say, no one can know about this outside of us. Basically, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Not only that, like build a fortress, do whatever you have to do, but your job is to study this thing and learn how to use its power. Now, the big takeaway from this is that one, this is indeed a hammer. Two, uh, Red Skull basically lies to Von Strucker and everybody else when he says, this is explicitly for the fear. None of you guys are supposed to know about this thing. This is not for your eyes to see, when in reality, it was never moved, it was never lifted, because it couldn't be lifted by Red Skull or anybody else. And so when Cynthia finishes telling this story to, uh, to, to Baron Zemo, what she ends up doing is basically saying, like, this is, you know, what I have here is a map, a location of where this hammer is. Because, you know, accessing this tomb, again, only really reveals information. It doesn't actually reveal any particularly powerful artifacts. And so Cynthia essentially betrays Helmut Zemo and takes off to, to find the hammer for herself. And so at this point, we jump forward to the actual fear itself story. So again, we're going to do this very similar to Civil War, in the sense that you've got the, the tie-ins and you've got like the main event itself. Now, this is where fear itself really begins to give us what it was that Joe Quesada and company were shooting for, in the sense that like Civil War, it was designed to be a reflection of the, of the modern day. Now, this is in 2010, 2011. And so we're talking about right before the point when like housing prices after the mortgage crisis had reached bare bottom, when it basically like dropped off to the lowest point and then began the, the point of recovery. And so what you have here are a lot of people who are just angry, right? I mean, that's the nature of this. While this story isn't really political, it is designed to basically take these political tones from the real world and feed them into the story, right? Like you had the mortgage crisis in 2008, Americans almost destroyed the economy, Obama told the American people, sorry about your luck, bailed out the banks, and that was the end of that. And so with, with this whole thing going forward, what you have are people who are in a state of anger and resentment and who are lashing out accordingly. But the funny thing about this is that Steve Rogers basically catches on to this small nuanced thing and essentially says people are more aggressive than they normally would be. And so where he's kind of looking at all this, the, the initial response is something's wrong. Things aren't right here. Something's going on here. This also leads to the uh, various armed forces tear gassing uh, protesters because as we know, uh, civil disobedience is still disobedience. And so, of course, they're basically all tear gassed and they're, they're you know, knocked out for a time or at the very least subdued and things kind of return to a state of normalcy. Now, picking back up with with, with Sen and traveling to Antarct Antarctica, this massive citadel of sorts has basically been constructed. Not only that, what she says is that all these scientists from World War II are currently occupied inside this place, that they've been stuck here the entire time and they have no, no idea of what's been going on outside in the real world. They don't know the war has ended. They don't know that Red Skull is basically dead. They don't know any of that stuff. As far as they're aware, they're still operating on orders from the Red Skull. And what they've been doing is studying this hammer the entire time. But in the end, it's all to no avail. They haven't figured out a way to lift it. They haven't figured out a way to tap into its power. It's just a thing that's there. And they're basically doing the same thing day in and day out. And so what ends up happening here is that Sin basically approaches the hammer, picks it up, and immediately switches over. She basically starts calling herself Scotty. Now, the reason why is because that's the actual inscription on the hammer itself. It's basically that hammer's name. And so where she dons this hammer, she begins going forward saying, we're going to seek out its, you know, basically its father, its owner, and then go from there. Now, at this point, this is when we start to switch over into Iron Man, basically rebuilding Asgard. And it's actually a pretty cool thing because remember, this comes after the events of Siege, which come after the events of Dark Reign. So Norman Osborn's already been deposed, right? He's already been toppled, been defeated, and Dark Reign is over. He's no longer in, in control of S.H.I.E.L.D. But for the most part, the, the purpose of Dark Reign and even the events of Siege was to basically disband and to remove the entirety of the
the Superhuman Registration Act. That was basically a holdover from the events of Civil War. Essentially, it was the Marvel Comics equivalent of somebody just sort of letting their voice trail off. It would just kind of be something that was never really referenced anymore, kind of forgotten, and fans would eventually ask the question, what happened to the Registration Act? And Marvel wouldn't want to have to release a one-shot or go through a whole bunch of hoops in order to provide an answer to that question. And so in this instance, what ends up happening here is, is with the Registration Act gone, Captain America Steve Rogers is, is long since back. He's been reborn after the events of his, of his death. And this basically leads into Iron Man chipping up and essentially saying, while this does seem kind of weird, at the end of the day, it is people acting aggressively. That's really all it is, because all these tests are being done to ask the question, is it some kind of external factor? Is there some psychic mutant out there that's going crazy and using their powers? Is it some villain? Did Mysterio make it all happen? And there's there's no answer to that. It's not the actions of any one person that push these people to the extreme. It's just that they're just really that pissed off. And so the response of Iron Man basically looking at Captain America is saying, after World War II was over, what did you guys do? You guys built things. You had the economic explosion of the United States in the 1950s. And so his response is to say, we need to do the same thing. You have people right now who, who basically feel like they were ripped off, left hanging. What they need is to be put to work. What they need is to be able to do something with the auspices that they can make the world better. And so the result is that Iron Man says, we're going to get them to work. Asgard's been destroyed. It was destroyed by the century during Siege. So let's build a new one. I told them I would. So let's just start, you know, let's get to work on building a new Asgard. And that's what everybody starts to do. Now, this is kind of a background thing. Instead, it's basically Iron Man getting out there and telling the world, here's what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild the entirety of Asgard. Now, the reason why this matters is that for those of you guys who are reading Thor comics right now, what you'll notice is that there's two Asgards. There's basically old Asgard, which also exists in the dimension of Asgard. Then there's Asgardia, which is hovering out there around Saturn somewhere. The one that's around Saturn, that's the one that Iron Man built. And so again, with, with Scotty traveling down to uh, where this particular being is located at, she basically starts facing off against all these various monsters and demons that have been placed there by Odin as kind of a measure of protection. Now, when it comes to Asgardian magic, it gets a little iffy. It's really a plot device more than anything else. Captain America might be able to overcome Asgardian magic in one story, and then he's just hopelessly power uh, powerless against it in another story. In this instance, these kind of beasts and monsters being placed here, we would have to believe are most likely beings that none of the superheroes would be able to successfully defeat on their own. And so that's why Scaddy's here is because she's going through and literally tearing them limb from limb uh, using this hammer, ripping them apart, only to find out there's basically a kind of sarcophagus with a seal of sorts on it. And when she penetrates this seal and enters into the inside, into this sort of, you know, tomb, more or less, she's met by the arrival of a guy who refers to himself as the Allfather, saying that, like, he's the rightful ruler of Asgard. So it's a pretty cool thing, because when that happens, Odin basically says, this is it. This is the prophecy that I've been trying to avoid for all this time. The serpent has finally made his return. And so it's interesting here, because when Thor comes along and, and basically starts conversing with his father, the two of them start getting really, really aggressive, because Thor's idea is, look, we should be standing next to the earthly superheroes who are looking to try to find a way to rebuild Asgard. For Odin, it's really more pride than anything else, and that's always been the thing about his character. The way that Odin's been written in Marvel Comics has always been that he's exceedingly prideful, in the sense that he's like, Asgardian business is Asgardian business, and we do not air our dirty laundry. But for Thor, he's walking the middle of the road. He's an Avenger on one side and an Asgardian on the other. And when the, when the question was asked earlier, which one would he choose, Asgardians or man, he chooses man. And so the result here is that he's kind of taken a stance against Odin. Now, where Thor pops up with Mjolnir and is just kind of like, look, if that's how you want to be, then we can take this to the mattresses and, and I can beat, beat the hell out of you with the hammer. It's basically Odin responding by saying, hammer drop. Do not allow Thor to lift you. Now, it's small things like this that really go towards the idea of Thor becoming unworthy. When Thor first lost the ability to wield his hammer, not only could Thor not lift it, Odin couldn't lift it. The hammer had basically had a will of its own. It was doing its own thing. Now, of course, we know the answer to that now, but at the time, it, you know, at the time we didn't. And that was the nature of the hammer in response to how the Asgardian mythos functioned. That while it was the hammer that Thor wielded, it was it was basically passed on to him by Odin. And the enchantment that Odin placed on it was that only a worthy person could wield it. And so the response that Odin makes is that he gives and he takes away. And so basically it's, it's one of these things, by the grace of me goes your ability to wield that hammer. And this is a significant moment because it shows just how much more powerful Odin is than Thor. Regardless, what ends up happening is Odin basically says, we're departing this place. We don't need humanity aid. We're leaving this place and we're going back to Asgard. And so again, it's interesting because switching back over to uh, to, to Scatty and with this, this guy, basically the serpent, her response is, if what you're looking to do is topple the Asgardians and essentially conquer the world, is this something that can be done by us? And the, the response he gives is, it will not just be us. It's going to be those who I deem to be worthy. And so what he does is he basically summons a handful of hammers, which are going to land in different places on Earth and various people are going
going to pick them up and they're going to become the worthy, basically the followers of, uh, of, of the serpent and in turn, like be imbued with all new levels of powers, each one representing a different facet of what the serpent stands for. And so while all this is going on, essentially earth is, is under siege by hidden Asgardian powers that no one really seemed to be aware of before outside of Odin. And in the moment when they could use the help of the Asgardians, they leave. Odin instructs all of them to walk away. And so they're all basically being taken back to Asgard. Thor himself is being forced back there and earth is being left to the defense of the superheroes who were there. And that's really about it. So we are continuing on with fear itself. And uh, yeah, fear, it is a really cool story. It is a pretty badass story. And this point we pick up with Journey Into Mystery. Now, those of you guys who don't know, Journey Into Mystery, originally it was like a sci-fi sci story. It was, it was a series of like, you know, science fiction, mystery comics, whatever. And then Thor appeared. And then Thor was so popular that eventually Journey Into Mystery became the Thor line of comics. For the most part, when Journey Into Mystery was brought back, it basically revolved around Loki. And the reason for that, again, came out of Siege. And this is part of the things that we've talked about in the past, where we've said that Marvel does soft reboots, which is to say they shuffle up a character, they change status quo, but they don't do hard line reboots, despite the fact that they need to. Uh, in this instance, what ended up happening is that during the events of Siege on Asgard, in Thor issue number 617, which was actually part of the aftermath to Siege, we ended up discovering that what Loki had done is he had gone to Hela, who was basically the ruler of the Asgardian afterlife, and it essentially like bartered things so that he could basically return to life when his physical form died. And so what ended up happening after this was that in Thor 617, Loki he came back but he was a little kid and he had no knowledge of anything he had done when he was an adult he was basically a blank slate so again it was pretty smart and it was a pretty genius idea in terms of trying to rework his character kid loki is actually pretty cool namely loki has discovered the internet and it is interesting <laughs> <laughs> he's basically taking pi taking pictures of all these crazy things happening around like Asgard and people are just like that's not like like you had to have used a lens filter because obviously he's using Instagram but anyway one of the things to notice here is that Loki's basically being ridiculed by one of the other Asgardians and this was par for the course people remember him as the trickster the bad guy the one that's essentially brought nothing but ruin and pain upon Asgard itself but for Thor one thing to remember is Loki is his brother and Thor really sees this version of kid Loki for what he is he's not really blinded by the things Loki's done in the past and so the result is that he kind of chases a few of these bullies off and basically says hey look this is kind of how these things go eventually it'll pass and so it's kind of interesting here because loki's saying stuff like like when he discovered the internet he's saying stuff like i told people i was an asgardian and they started calling me a troll like nobody on the internet believes me and 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 to me it's it's such an awesome exchange right you know because thor's kind of like well i mean you know loki is i am aware of the internet and we avoid it avidly because people on the internet are weird like i, <laughs> I mean not really but it's just kind of a fun funny thing you know like I like the idea of kid Loki discovering the internet but the fact remains here that what Loki ends up doing is stumbling upon this this magpie this bird and as soon as he approaches it the thing explodes and reveals a key and this is why journey into mystery is so cool is because when you look at traditional Thor stories which is to say basically everything after journey into mystery and especially going from really the the bronze age from like the mid 1970s up to the modern day Thor stories are pretty straightforward it's just like Thor's fighting a bad guy and smashing things with his hammer because that's what he does and that's what you you want to see. But with Journey into Mystery, the way this is done is a throwback to the old Journey into Mystery stories, where it was as much about like the history and mythos of Asgard and telling stories in an Asgardian fashion as it was about events unfolding in a way that was interesting. And so in this journey that Loki goes on, he discovers this key, takes it to what's basically kind of a, a an elf of sorts who starts singing off this poem. Loki, Loki listens to it, realizes part of the poem is a location. He travels there, awakens a demon, which immediately explodes, feeds the demon to Volstag, and then listens to what Volstag says which is kind of a rhyme or really kind of a, a few words of sorts follows the the advice that's given to him in the sense of just like the the third passage or so on and so forth discovers a dragon which basically explodes in front of him kind of disintegrates and then like speak or at least, at least it speaks to him in the old tongue first then it disintegrates and then he starts basically following these these sage bits he reads this little passage that says that loki went into the void and no one knows why and that's when he falls down into this darker place and discovers the older version of himself this is classic journey into mystery thor storytelling so meeting with his older self uh this older version of Loki basically says, look, like I am here to impart wisdom on you and I'm the reason why you exist. Basically, I had bartered with Hela, everything that we said at the beginning of the video. Uh, and the idea was that I would be reborn in a new physical form. Now, this is important because this is not really the spirit of older Loki. It's more of like a memory echo. But this is kind of an important thing because over the course of the journey into mystery line, which we may or may not cover, there will be points when kid Loki will meet with his older self. And there's actually points in, in the modern uh, Thor storytelling where Loki, where kid Loki will 
not only meet with his older self, he'll actually meet with a female version of himself. And then the modern day Loki will meet with Kid Loki and the female version and his original self. So there's it's really one of these things where because of the steps that Loki's taken to ensure his own existence, very akin to like Voldemort and the Horcruxes, what this means is that there are sort of echoes of himself that exist out there in the Marvel landscape, which can be encountered by any one of his versions at any particular point in time, assuming that echo has already been created. But it's basically him saying, look, like I have sage advice to give you. I have bits of knowledge to give you. You have to listen to this because there is a crisis coming to Earth and to Asgard. Of course, we know that older Loki is speaking of uh, speaking of the serpent. And these are important things to remember because by and large, Loki was always considered to be the trickster and the guy who created mischief. And that's true. But because of his experiences in traveling around the various cosmos, because of his experience in seeing and doing all these things, what this means is that Loki has a vast amount of knowledge, some of which is based on things he's not supposed to know. And so because of all this, he's a very, very huge resource if you can find a way to tap into that without incurring his wrath or, or you know, letting him trick you or something along those lines. And that's what happens with Kid Loki. And it's kind of a cool thing because this is really Marvel saying like, Loki is Loki is Loki is Loki. It'll always end up being the same. All of this has happened before and all of it'll happen again, to quote Battlestar Galactica, that all roads lead to Rome. That no matter how many times Loki's reborn, no matter how many, no matter how many times he returns to his former self, he will always end up becoming the Loki that we always know because that's what his character is. That's what he's about. And so what this story does is it basically segues into the, the tail bit of Asgard, I'm sorry, of uh, Fear Itself that we covered in the last video, where Odin essentially like leads the Asgardians out of uh, out of Earth and takes them directly to, uh, takes them directly back to Asgard, to the Asgardian dimension, uh, where they can essentially go through and start recreating everything. Now, at this point, we kind of switch over to the aftermath, right? Like to when they're actually in Asgard itself. And remember, like this, this place is just in shambles. I mean, it's been this way ever since Ragnarok. It's been just torn to pieces. Now, again, it's entirely within the power of Odin to fix it all. And that's really what he says. But notice this, not everyone agrees with what Odin does. And that's one of the misconceptions a lot of people, I think, have when it comes to the Thor mythos is a lot of people look at the character of Odin and they say, well, he's the all father. He's the leader. Of course, they all follow him. Loki and Thor are the only ones that really kind of do what they want. Not true. Just because Odin is the all father and the leader does not mean everyone agrees with what he does. The difference here is that Odin has enough power to obliterate anybody, and he pretty much will. And so because of this, Thor basically speaks up. When a couple people start talking about how it feels like a retreat, Thor says, that's because it is. Because the power that's there on Earth, whatever this serpent is, is enough that it scares Odin. And Odin is essentially running away. And so where Thor questions his father's authority, where he calls him in and, and says, look, you're essentially a coward, is what you are. Like, you're a weakling. Our job is to protect all nine of the realms. You are hiding in your in your home, waiting for the threat to come to you. You are every ounce the coward that, that you're acting as. Then Odin immediately has him locked up. Immediately has Thor, like, taken away and put in chains. And so at this point, this is when we start getting into the idea of the worthy. Those individuals out there who are given these secret Asgardian hammers. And the first one up is Juggernaut. So, <laughs> uh, but what ends up happening is, of course, you have Juggernaut going through his workout time. Seven minutes is really all he gets. And then he, and then like, while all this is going on, a hammer crash lands into uh, into the prison. And of course, this is one of the things that you, that you end up finding out. Those individuals who are worthy, the hammer will speak to them. They'll just hear words, voices, things like that emanating from the hammer itself. And so when Juggernaut picks it up, he basically ends up becoming Kurth, the Breaker of Stone. Now, again, this idea of Juggernaut gaining another power source in addition to what he has will be a major plot point when it comes to this story. So this is something that I want you to keep in the back of your head as we go further through the Fear Itself event. But Juggernaut with this power is, is immense. I mean, he just starts smashing everything in his path. And so what ends up happening is we switch over directly to uh, Steve Rogers, to Captain America, uh, to Maria Hill, to Sharon Carter. And it's basically like the new Avengers roster combined with what passes for what's left of the Thunderbolts. And it's essentially this idea that like all this pandemonium and chaos is happening around the world, that these objects are crash landing. Now, in response to them landing, various places around the world, major metropolitan areas are turning into absolute madhouses. Things are completely and totally going awry. And so Reed Richards chimes in as part of the Future Foundation. Remember, this comes after Hickman's Fantastic Four. So the Future Foundation's already been formed by that point. But Reed chimes in as a Future Foundation and says, look, a hammer or something like that has crash landed in New York. We're studying it at the moment, but it looks like it's as, uh, you know, it's from, uh, it's of Asgardian nature. So this thing looks pretty intense. And then we switch over to the one thing everybody wants to see, the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the coolest things. This is what I love about you guys. Everybody loves the Incredible Hulk. What people love even more is when the Incredible Hulk gets something that modifies his power. What they love more than that is when he gets somebody else's power source. <laughs> Specifically when he gets an Asgardian hammer. People love that kind of stuff. But this basically takes place after the events of Greg Pak's run. And 
really kind of the finality of that event, you know, from, from Heart of the Monster Hulk. And we saw from that story that it picked up where it really ended with like the Incredible Hulk, Bruce Banner, and Betty Ross, Red She-Hulk, just kind of jumping out and doing, doing what they do in the heat of passion. And so they're just kind of there doing their thing. But while all this is going on, a hammer basically lands. And the Incredible Hulk sort of listens to it, hears it talking, and then against Betty Ross' protest, goes to pick it up. And when he does, he turns into like the most badass looking character. Now, it is not an accident for why he looks this way. While this is a totally new design for him, it does have some hints and homages to the time when he basically became a horseman for Apocalypse. When he became War, I think it was. But again, I mean, he's Null, and he's basically called the Breaker of Worlds, uh, because what in the hell else would you call him? Everybody loves World Breaker Hulk. But again, it's, it's, it's kind of cool, because from here, we basically pick up with a character named Titania. Now, the character of Titania made her debut back in Secret Wars, issue number three, the original Secret Wars from 1984. The original Secret Wars was a highly publicized story. So because of that, the idea was that if so many people are going to be reading this story, then not only was the basis of it to bring like all the heroes and villains together and have them face off against each other in an effort to sell toys, uh, but why not add some new characters in there? And so what we got, we got a couple different people there. We got uh, Jennifer Carpenter, who was the original Spider-Woman, uh, but then we also got Titania, Mary McFerrin. Now, Mary McFerrin was not really interesting up until that point. In fact, her origin story was pretty mundane. She was raised in the suburbs of Denver. She was shy. She was timid and never really had anything going for. The idea was that during the events of Secret Wars, before Doctor Doom had stolen the power of Galactus and then eventually the power of the Beyonder, what he had done was he had basically created kind of like a supervillain team trying to recruit people to his side. And so what ended up happening here is that Doom discovered uh, Mary and another character, and I can't remember her name, like Vanessa, I think it was. And then in turn, basically endowed them with powers. Now, Mary was endowed with basically super strength, durability, different things like that. And she was also like grown in size. So she became a lot more voluptuous and uh, she became a lot like a lot stronger, a lot more muscular than her previous version had been. Now, after the events of Secret Wars, she kind of had an on again, off again relationship with Crusher Creel, which basically became more solidified by the mid 1990s. And so by that point going forward, they were just kind of together. Uh, but from there, like what ends up happening? She's one of the people who basically seizes a hammer for herself. It crashes, she grabs it, picks it up. And then she tells Absorbing Man, you have a hammer waiting on you. And this is kind of a big deal because Crusher Creel is someone who can basically absorb various metals and turn himself into those metals, absorb their properties. And so in turn, giving him a hammer, I would argue he, he could potentially be one of the most powerful. Now we'll find out as time goes on, but it's, it's somewhat of a cool thing because in this moment with all of the all the worthy basically being selected or a huge number of them being selected, essentially the serpent starts reaching out to all of them and saying, your job now is to basically fill the world with chaos, to seed as much chaos, destruction, and fear as you possibly can. And when that's done, we'll take the next step. And that's exactly what they do. They start ripping through and tearing things up. Now, this fear spreads more fear. I mean, the Incredible Hulk running through, ripping things to pieces, Red She-Hulk doing what she can, it's instilling as much fear as possible because now you have all these people with this these insane levels of strength and power who are just running rampant across the face of the earth. And where the Avengers try to respond, the problem with this is that their communications network is essentially taken down when the White House and the Capitol are totally obliterated. And so where Captain America kind of sends out the SOS and says Avengers assemble, there's no one there to respond spawn. No one answers him. And so essentially everyone's kind of scattered to the four winds. It's pandemonium. It's, it's a worst case situation. It's pretty messed up and it's pretty rough, but it's amazing. Okay, so we are continuing on with Fear Itself, and uh, here was the deal with Fear Itself. I kind of want to talk about this for a second, because there's a couple things that I feel like we need to explain, looking at the comments of the previous videos with some of the questions you guys had. First and foremost, Fear Itself was one of these stories that was designed to rework things. Marvel still had a lot of things that had been held over from the Joe Quesada era of, of or at least his whole idea of pushing things and, and making a new direction. So, essentially everything from, like, Avengers Disassembled running all the way up to to, uh, really the heroic age, running all the way up to Dark Reign. So over the span of about seven years or so, uh, there were a lot of things that had happened, a lot of a lot of status quo changes. The Avengers were disbanded. They were replaced by the new Avengers. 98% of the mutant population lost their powers. There were a lot of things that went on in Marvel at the time. One of the most notable things was the death of Captain America. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. But what this story was designed to do in a lot of ways was to take a lot of those uh, threads that had kind of been left hanging, those plot threads that had just sort of been dangling all this time and essentially wrap them up to, to basically tie up loose ends. Now, not all of them were tied up. And in fact, the ones that weren't tied up were designed or were left that way for the purpose of telling future stories later on down the line. For example, you know, the formation of Stark Resilient, which would come later on, different things like that. But the idea here is that we initially pick up with, with Captain America facing off against, you know, the forces of, uh, of, of Sin and really what kind of passes for Hydra, but not really. But again, this is not like Steve Rogers' Captain America. This is Bucky Barnes' Captain America. Now, the reason why I feel like that needs to be explained is because 
because one, I don't think I explained that in the first or second video. And two, this, this event fear itself actually wraps that up. So when Captain America died after the events of Civil War and following that, Iron Man, I'm pretty sure it's Iron Man, takes Captain America's uniform and gives it to Bucky Barnes. And so Bucky Barnes becomes the new Captain America. And his arrival was met with a kind of a, it was a mixed reaction. Some of the, the old guard who really, really, really wanted Steve Rogers to stay. And there were some who were the old guard that wanted Steve Rogers to go. And then of course there were new fans who wanted to see Steve Rogers stay. And there were old fans who, or I guess new fans who wanted to see him go. It was really kind of a mixed bag of people who wanted to see different things. But in, in any event, Steve Rogers had come back about a year before this story took place. He came back 2009, 2010, somewhere along, uh, somewhere along those lines. And it was, of course, the Captain America Reborn storyline where you found out he was time displaced. They basically pulled a Batman from Final Crisis. But then once he made his return, there was a one-shot follow-up. And it was basically the question of who's going to wear the shield? Who's going to have Captain America's shield? Is it going to be Bucky or is it going to be Steve Rogers? And what this did is it allowed Marvel to spin Steve Rogers out into a whole other series called Secret Avengers. And Secret Avengers basically serve the purpose of having like a black ops team for the Avengers group. But that's, that's the team that Steve Rogers largely led. Uh, and, and that was his whole thing. What this does is it basically removes Bucky Barnes from the mantle and it brings Steve Rogers back. But at the moment right now with this initial charge going into uh, going into the US Capitol, it really is Bucky Barnes leading the team. Now, switching over to Asgard, this was, well, this was this was an interesting, uh, interesting situation because this again deals with Kid Loki. And that's one of the things that goes on here. When it comes to the event of, of uh, fear itself, it was a little bit different from a lot of the other crossover events that you saw in the sense that Journey into Mystery was designed to provide the back end for why it was Loki was doing what he was doing in the main story itself. Whereas in a lot of the events that go on, sometimes, especially like when it came to like Secret Empire, for example, the tie-ins are wholly separated from the main story itself. And so you'll have like the beginning of the of the event, you know, of, of like Secret Empire, for example, and then it'll split off into tie-ins. And the tie-ins will show what characters are doing, and then they'll, they'll wrap back into the main event at the end. And so unless you've been reading the tie-ins, you have no idea how that character got to where they were. With this, it's it's totally different. Fear itself was designed to be kind of like a new age of storytelling when it comes to crossover events. It was basically this idea of like the main story gives you all you need and you don't really need anything else. But you go read Civil War and it's it's woefully incomplete if you don't read the main or if you don't read the tie-ins. Nothing really seems to make sense. And, and and so it's 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 one of those interesting scenarios. But nonetheless, Kid Loki showing up here is basically for the purposes of breaking Thor out of prison. What Kid Loki's been doing so far has basically been trying to sow revolution within the Asgardian uh, landscape. The problem with this is that under under most normal circumstances, people may have been inclined to side with him if it wasn't him, if it wasn't Loki. If it was Thor, people would follow him. They would. It would basically be Thor leading a revolt against Odin, which isn't really something Thor would do, but with Kid Loki, he definitely would. The problem with this is that, again, Kid Loki's got the reputation of Loki, and so everybody would look at what he's saying and essentially coming along and being like, look, Odin's kind of lost his mind. We've got to find a way to stand out to him. We have to go back to Earth, and we have to protect it. They would look at it as some kind of ruse, and so nobody really trusted Loki, and so at this moment, it's just kind of coming along and saying, okay, look, we've got to free Thor. Like we got to get Thor out of here and get Thor back to Earth. And so in the interim, what this does is it picks up with uh, really this kind of calamity across the board in the sense that Absorbing Man basically has the powers of Thor. The Incredible Hulk now has the powers of Thor. I mean, it's it's all these crazy situations. And in response to the Incredible Hulk, what this ends up doing is bringing in like Carol Danvers, Spider-Woman, Jessica Drew, which I don't even know why she's there. Here's a funny thing. So Jessica Drew has the ability to emit pheromones that will not really have this the exact same effect as Purple Man. She can't really dominate the wills of others but she can make them fall in love with her. Now she tried it on Wolverine. In fact, myself and Sal at Comic Pop were having this cool conversation. I called him up, but we ended up getting, like he ended up talking about Jessica Drew, about Spider-Woman. And he was like, well, Spider-Woman tried her pheromones on Wolverine and all it did was make him dizzy. So people with healing factors can combat it, but they're not like totally immune to it. With the Incredible Hulk, it would have to be the same way. But keep in mind, this Thor Hulk, for lack of a better word, is basically like mindless savage Hulk, but bent for a particular purpose. But all these people who are picking, who are wielding these hammers are all driven by fear. That's the important thing to bear in mind here. And the reason why is that when we switch over to the Fantastic Four, with the hammer having landed on Yancey Street in New York, the Fantastic Four were one of the first people to respond and to investigate. Now remember, while all this is going on, the world is going to pot. Like everybody else is dealing with a zillion different things. But when the Fantastic Four chime into the Avengers and say, hey, look, we're investigating things, then that means you leave the Fantastic Four to their devices. And so with Ben Grimm showing up, the hammer starts talking to him. He starts hearing voices emanating from it. And when he goes to pick it up, of course, he's transformed into a mindless beast itself and just starts ripping everything to pieces. So again, every single person that gets one of these hammers is driven by fear and serves the purpose of sowing chaos. That's basically what this is. And the reason why is because the serpent feeds on fear. So, so long as those around him are feeling fear, he'll continue to grow stronger and, and you know, basically gain more and more power. Now for Thor himself,
himself, where he is freed by Loki and basically meets with Sif and the Warriors 3. The idea of basically standing against Odin, of leaving Odin's Odin's eye traveling to Midgard, it amounts to heresy. This is a very dangerous game they're playing, because while Odin wouldn't necessarily kill them, Odin would certainly, like, he could banish them from Asgard, he could make them mortal, like send them away. The Odin forces is capable of doing all manner of different things. Again, it's a very dangerous game that they're playing here, and this game is discovered when Odin shows up. Now, this is kind of a funny thing here. This is really sort of feeding on the old nature of the Thor comics, the historical, you know, publication history of Thor comics, as opposed to what we would expect. With Odin having previously locked up Thor and Loki breaking him out, and then coming into the situation where Thor has basically been freed and he's talking of revolt against Odin, it's not really like Thor is talking of revolt in the sense of leading the armies of Asgard against Odin himself. It's basically Odin walking in to his son and his friends, talking about abandoning Odin's view and traveling back to Midgard. And at this point, it's one of those things where it's like a father and a son. Sons always get a lot more lead way with fathers. It's just the way it is because it's their offspring. You know, parents are a lot more lenient with kids. And so instead of like casting Thor to prison, instead of making him mortal or something like that, he says, fine, then you will, you'll have your quest. If what you want to do is go to earth and fight among the people who are, who are there, then do that. Now, a lot of this stems from the fact that Odin knows how stubborn Thor is. If Thor says, this is what I want to do. I want to go to earth and I want to fight alongside the earthlings because I feel more kin to them than I do to you. Uh, then Odin's going to be like, fine, because there's no talking Thor out of it. And so ultimately Odin casts him out since him back to earth, gives him his hammer and says, here, you'll need this, but you've got a time frame. Once the serpent's power rises, like once he gets to the point where he's all powerful, where he seizes control of earth, then one of two things is going to happen. Either I'm going to bring you back or I'm going to let you die. But regardless of what fate it is, you've brought it on yourself. And so again, it's kind of a cool thing because switching back to Captain America in the Capitol with him, Falcon, Black Widow, facing off against Sin with all this new power, it's interesting because one of the things to bear in mind is that when it comes to Marvel, when it comes to stories like this, oftentimes they kind kind of seem to stretch the limits of credulity and they don't really seem to make sense. And the reason why is because you're dealing with someone with a formidable amount of power, both in strength, speed, durability, as well as the, the power she wields by virtue of her hammer and would easily be able to crush Black Widow, Falcon, and Captain America. And so the question you would probably ask is, why are these the ones fighting? Well, in reality, the Avengers were never really, they never really consisted of the most powerful beings in Marvel, in Marvel comics. That was really reserved more for the X-Men. The, the Avengers were mostly just like the bravest people. You know, they'll run headlong into their own deaths, but they'll run headlong. No, aside from the Incredible Hulk, Thor, the Avengers usually consist of mid-range to some of the weakest characters in the Marvel Universe. I mean, it's Captain America. What the hell can Captain America do? He can punch really hard and run fast and throw a shield. He's not ultra strong. He can't, you know, control the elements. I mean, he can't do any of that cool stuff. The X-Men can, which some people will say the X-Men are kind of broken, which they are. Sidetrack, think about that for a second. All right, so among the mutant population, you've got Franklin Richards kind of, depending on who's writing the story. Sometimes he's a result of the cosmic control rod, which is basically Galactus's power, the, the power cosmic from the negative zone, uh, or he's a mutant. All right, you've got Storm, who's pretty much Omega level. Why the hell haven't they confirmed it? You've got Magneto, you've got Emma Frost, you've got Matthew Malloy, I mean, you have like all these super powerful Omega level characters who are just broken as hell. Like, dude, the X-Men are so broken. Somebody make an argument in the comment section. Somebody create an argument and, and tell me why the X-Men are not OP and broken. If, if you can make a convincing argument, I will give you a Rob Core ring. So moving on <laughs> from our little rant, our little diatribe. Uh, of course, Sin takes it to Captain America. And that's the important thing to remember. Captain America is kind of like the leader of the group, right? Like he's like the moral support. If you take him down, then every most everybody else will lose their moral backbone. She ends up ripping off the arm of, of Bucky Barnes, plunges a staff right through his chest, and it essentially seems to kill him. And that's really the end of him. Like, that's the end of Bucky Barnes. You know, at this point, he's just kind of like, look, you have to tell everyone the serpent is, is, is literally the person behind this, because at the moment, they haven't known. The, the Avengers haven't really known who's behind this. All they've known is that these artifacts, which they learned were hammers, had crash landed on Earth, different people had picked them up, they gained insane levels of power, and they'd just been attacking cities. By having contact with the hammer itself, he's learned the hammer's secrets. And the hammer's secrets are that it's basically the serpent who's behind all this, who's waging a war against Earth and eventually seeks to set his sights on Asgard and retake the throne. Okay, so continuing on with fear itself, uh, at this point, we pick up with well, basically with the re the arrival of Thor, with Thor showing back up. Now, here's a funny thing. Thor showing up here after being kind of banished, but not really from Asgard. Uh, once he shows up here, he immediately arrives in Broxton, Oklahoma. Now, again, for those of you guys who are not really familiar with Thor comics, Broxton is basically where he rebuilt Asgard. The problem with this was that the War of, of Dark Reign essentially came on the doorsteps of Broxton to Asgard proper and left the city in complete and total disarray. And so no one here is too happy to see Thor. You know, everybody's none too happy to see him. They're kind of like, man, get out of here. Like, we really don't want to see you or your problems go away. It's kind of like my ex-girlfriend, you know, just get out of here. Uh, I'd rather not see you like 
for the rest of my life. And so because of this, uh, Thor ends up just sort of making his way back to the you know to where the rest of the superheroes reside. But what this does is this transitions over to the serpent himself, sort of talking about what's going on. Now, it's not a great big, huge, long explanation, but one thing that, I, that we're going to kind of do here is we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to sort of cover this and then the next part and then we're gonna like we're basically gonna skip over the uncanny x-men and then come back to it in the next video that we make so we're gonna cheat a little bit uh you know we're basically gonna kind of you know skip over the part of unstoppable juggernaut i kind of think don't think we should but we're going to and uh, in the next video we'll, we'll we'll cover that bit but in any event with everything unfolding the way it is the serpent really just kind of gives us a synopsis of what he's done so far which is to say what it is that he's shooting for and all he's doing is powering himself by fear and that's the whole basis that's one of the things about normal humans in marvel comics in marvel comics when it comes to average everyday people it's usually that they're like the most annoying part of the story because by and large they just get really scared and run away but that's really the big the big thing that happens every one once in a while, like a person might step up, but by and large, they just kind of run and hide and let the superheroes do all the heavy lifting. And so in response to this, with humans being so, so really so timid in relation to like the greater universe out there, when a being of significant power shows up, they react with fear and that feeds the serpent. At the same time, Odin is basically not really rebuilding Asgard, but essentially having the, the, the wheels of war pre you know, prepared, having the Asgardians get to work on building more weapons, different things like that. Now, in reality, one of the things that people would ask is why aren't the dwarves doing this? And in truth, is probably just to kind of push the story. The dwarves were really some of the some of the greatest you know weapons masters in the entirety of the Marvel universe. I mean, that includes like every everybody. The dwarves make some of the best weapons. And so where Odin is going through and creating weapons similar to that, this is an Asgardian war. So it makes sense that Asgardians would be the one to build these things. And so that's really what's kind of going on. Now at this point, we transition to the aftermath of the death of Bucky, and it's kind of a cool thing because we end up meeting up really with classic Nick Fury. Now of course, classic Nick Fury is always alive because he's classic Nick Fury why wouldn't he be but well the question sort of asked what is this this happening here and and what's this serpent being that you know Bucky had, had basically talked about Thor arrives and chimes in and simply says the serpent is a being that really only Odin knows about and is known about for quite some time now something I want you to notice here is that Thor just kind of takes it with a grain of salt he just sort of throws it out there because by this point it's to be expected especially when you're Thor and you're dealing with things like this it's par for the course Odin doesn't tell the Asgardians everything and it kind of makes sense because the Asgardians are like children for, for Odin. You know, you don't tell your child everything because your child doesn't need to know everything. And so it's much the same way when it comes to Thor and, and Odin and the rest of the Asgardians. Odin houses a lot of secrets and those secrets are really just his to keep and to let them out if time permits or if he wants to. And so with a situation like this, Thor knows enough to know the serpent is a very, very old enemy of Asgard, but that's really about it. But the bigger thing he hits on here is that the serpent is fighting with the full might of what's basically Asgardian power behind him. The longer he stays here, the more people are terrified, the more powerful he will become until eventually he returns to 100% full strength. And when that happens, it's going to be difficult for anybody to win. And so when, what we end up doing is basically picking up with Steve Rogers. He's kind of been kept in, in the background the whole time. And he's brought back out, basically redons the Captain America uniform and his business as usual. Now with him, it's, it's kind of chiming in and saying, look, okay, where do we stand with everything? And he's given the whole rundown of everything that's happened so far. But Steve Rogers response is, okay, well, we have to act. We have to do something. If we do nothing, the serpent will continue to get stronger. The Serpent's power developing and, and expanding is not a result of the action of the Avengers or the superhero community, it's a result of fear. So if they do nothing, they'll basically be sitting on the sidelines while the Serpent gets more and more powerful. Because of this, uh, with the Serpent drawing his energy and feeding on it more and more, ultimately he finally reaches his quote-unquote final form, if we had to give it that, that depiction, and it's basically a very young guy. And so it's kind of cool here, because this, this dude is wielding an insane amount of power. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy how much power he has. To give you perspective, when Captain America alongside the mighty avengers and the the you know what's left of the regular avengers when they all show up here they're basically doing their best to fend off as best they can but they don't really stand much of a chance now for a second i want to sidetrack and i want to pick up with with iron man now iron man being here is actually kind of funny because he shows up to like the old ruins of asgard what used to be asgard and broxa uh, broxton oklahoma and summons odin now that's one of the important things to bear in mind here in marvel comics it's entirely possible for anybody on earth to contact odin whether odin will respond or not is totally up to him. That's one of the things to bear in mind. The idea of the of, of Earth, you know, of, of Earth kind of being divvied up among these various deities, more or less, these godly beings, is somewhat of a misnomer. All the various godly beings that exist in real world religion exist inside the Marvel Universe, and you could talk to any of them. I mean, you could you can try to contact any of them. You can contact Zeus, you can contact Odin. If they want to listen to you, if they're willing to give you, you know, any measure of attention, if they'll give you an audience, they'll listen to you. If not, then they won't. And so in this instance, Iron Man shows up and just screams out the name of Odin. And basically what happens 
happens is he gets drunk and then starts yelling at Odin. That's basically what happens here. You know, it's it's kind of interesting because in order to get the attention of Odin, it's not really a sacrifice. It's not like you have to go to an altar, sacrifice a goat, and then, you know, dance around nine times, say a prayer, and then Odin will respond. It's one of these things where it's like, if you're worth listening to, then Odin will listen to you. And where, where Iron Man starts talking to, uh, starts talking to Odin, it's kind of interesting because his response is, I didn't actually expect you to answer. But the funny response that Odin gives Iron Man is basically saying, but like you're a friend of Thor, like like you are one of Thor's teammates as part of the Avengers. It's the only reason why I'm talking to you right now. And so it's, it's interesting because with Tony Stark basically being drunk and just yelling at Odin, uh, one of the like what he starts to talk about is the idea of how Odin is leaving the entirety of Earth superheroes to fend for themselves. And Odin interprets this as, as Iron Man saying, I want you to give us your armies. Like I want you to give us as guardians to fight on our behalf or to fight alongside us so we can protect the Earth. But Odin's interpretation interpretation is entirely wrong and Iron Man picks up on this when Odin just kind of like look this is I mean sure this is our fight but like we're mustering our forces here we'll fight the serpent once basically all you guys are dead and there's nothing left and then we're going to obliterate the entirety of the planet earth but Iron Man's response is no that's not what I want I don't want you to fight on our behalf I don't want you to 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 you know fight in our stead we don't want your Asgardians to pick up the slack for us or anything like that what I do for a living is I make weapons like I am exceedingly good at making weapons. I don't want access to your soldiers. I want access to your workshop. I want to blend as guardian, you know, technology with Stark tech. That's what I want to do. I want to create a whole new slew of weapons designed to use your power with my power and destroy the serpent. And so it's actually pretty cool. And it's, and it's really awesome because it's basically Iron Man developing, you know, as guardian slash Stark technology uh, using, you know, his own ingenuity and, and so on and so forth. And it's entirely possible. I mean, it's one of those things where it's not like this is unfamiliar territory to Iron Man. It is to a degree, but he's been a friend of Thor for so long that he's well versed in, in essentially just like navigating the waters of using Asgardian energy or the very use at uh, the very least understanding how it works I mean he's made anti you know he's made like Thor buster suits in the past so it's not entirely you know something that he's entirely unaware of but at this point we end up having Thor who had basically faced off against the serpent and he was able I mean wasn't really able to hold his own but he was enough of a challenge that the serpent saw him as somebody that could potentially get in the way and so what he ends up doing is having Thor face off against uh Ben Grimm and the and the Incredible Hulk now Thor fighting against Ben Grimm is pretty quick and to the point. I mean, he's defeated pretty fast and, and it's kind of interesting thor literally throws his hammer and summons it back and summons it back to himself and it punches a hole through ben Grimm, much like you guys probably saw in the story of infinity when thor destroyed a builder but then he turns his attention to the incredible hulk and this fight is hard core i mean it is an absolute brutal brutal intense fight i mean it's 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 balls to the wall and it's cool to see because with these two guys you know tearing through each other it's it's literally blow for blow punch for punch hit for hit but one of the things that thor says and this is a very very big thing one of the things that thor says is i can't beat you like i know for a fact i've never been able to beat you and the incredible hulk's response is i always knew that like i always knew that was the case and that makes sense i mean the incredible hulk strength is limitless thor's strength is not so just by logic and reason we know that thor would not have been able to to defeat the incredible hulk i mean in my mind i think it really comes down to the superman versus incredible hulk style fight right like that's one of the big debates can superman beat the incredible hulk yes unless the fight goes on long enough and then the incredible hulk will just be too strong for superman and then superman will be defeated but like at the outset maybe he can maybe he can't i don't know it's probably a wash i don't really care enough to argue the point but with thor it's much the same way you know if thor nips it in the bud right off the bat maybe he can win maybe he can't i don't know it's a crapshoot i mean they've there's been fights where thor's won there's been fights with the incredible hulk's won it really just comes down to which character you like the most but at the end of the day with this battle between the two again this is also taking place at the same time that everything's going on with like the serpent and with with captain america and so on now, this is kind of a big moment here in the fear itself and the reason why is because when the serpent finally arrives when he basically you know picks up on the scene you have like the avengers you know spider-man spider-woman all that kind of stuff luke cage and so on who, who try to combat him and they all get dealt with quick fast and in a hurry i mean they're 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 taken out right off the bat they're not killed they're all just basically knocked out right off the bat and in turn captain america throws his shield to the serpent and the serpent breaks it in half now this is a very very big thing because the only time we've ever really seen this happen is one if it's a person with reality warping powers or two thanos with the infinity gauntlet we've never seen a person by sheer strength alone shatter the shield of captain america that's never happened before and that's a pretty big deal the problem with this is that in reality the event of captain america's shield being shattered the way it was during infinity gauntlet really kind of overshadows this because the event was so significant but essentially what's 
going on here is the serpent has single-handedly dismantled the entirety of the superhero community and this is kind of etching in stone that when the incredible hulk's knocked out into space by by hulk i'm sorry by thor when he's sent flying you know into the atmosphere and falls back down again that it's really a stopgap measure that's all this has ever really been a stopgap these guys are nothing more than just you know bubble gum on a leaking wall sure it stops it temporarily but it's only a matter of time before the pressure builds up and that that bubble gum gets blown out of the way and that small leak turns into a full-blown flood so that's exactly what's happening here they're just kind of in the way at the moment they're really more of a nuisance than anything else and that's basically what happens captain america chiming into hawkeye basically saying like we have to stop we have to stand down and when the question is asked why captain america says because we're gonna lose like look at around you look around you at everything you've seen like thor's defeated the avengers are getting wrecked to pieces you know the incredible hulk is a bad guy juggernaut's a bad guy the serpent shattered my shield with his own bare hands like we're facing off against the force we could not possibly hope to defeat on our own and so it's it's not very often you see captain america do that in fact i've only ever seen captain america turn tail and run twice this is the this is this is one of those times the second time was age of ultron when ultron raised the entirety of earth and captain america had just kind of given up he was like there's nothing we can do until he realized until he he, he thought of dr doom's time platform and so and you know with those things in mind fear itself is an amazing story because it's basically like pushing the superheroes to the brink it's presumably the end of all things Okay, so we are finally getting back into Fear Itself, and we're really covering in this part, like, the one tie-in that everybody cares about. Really, I would say the one part of the story that most people care about, which is the Uncanny X-Men tie-in, Unstoppable Juggernaut. So, it's, it's kind of funny. In these crossover events that Marvel will do, there will just be segments where people are just like, so I don't care about anything else that happens, but I care about, like, that one thing. Because it's cool. Like, like that's, okay, at the end of the day, that's really all comics boil down to, just the cool moments. Like, that's, that's really it. Like, I could cover the entire of like Chris Claremont, uh, Chris Claremont's X-Men run, but there's only like a handful of super cool things that anybody would really care about. So like, it's, it's one of those interesting things in like comic book events and, and all that kind of good stuff. But in any event, switching over to the X-Men, this is all post-Utopia. Now, for those of you guys who are familiar with this, bear with me while I run over this for the guys who are not. Uh, Utopia in the X-Men landscape was basically after the events of Decimation, right? Like the Scarlet Witch took away 98% of the mutant powers population. And then you had an event called Dark Reign. So, so you had like Secret Invasion where the scrolls basically invade the entirety of Earth and the Marvel Universe. Uh, they start replacing superheroes. And so what ended up happening is Deadpool had actually sent information to the superheroes on how to defeat the scrolls. And then Norman Osborn intercepted the information and then used it to win. And so so, uh, yeah, and so that goes into Tony Stark being removed as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Norman Osborn becomes the new director. He disbands S.H.I.E.L.D., creates Hammer, and then he starts Dark Reign. And so in order to, like, consolidate his power, he basically started trying to get rid of, like, all these different groups. But then you have, like, the X-Men. And at the time, the X-Men were still living in Westchester, I'm pretty sure. And they were recovering from the events of Decimation. But realizing that Norman Osborn would seize the opportunity to basically oust them, what they did is they left the United States proper, that is to say the continental United States, and they took up residence on an island island off the coast of San Francisco. So technically speaking, they were outside of the US government's jurisdiction, but not really. And they were still considered to be part of San Francisco. Now, the way that this happened was actually by way of this chick, uh, Sadie Sinclair. She's basically the one who invited the X-Men to, to stay in Utopia in San Francisco. It was kind of like a friend for the X-Men, but not really. Uh, she appeared in like 15 issues. So she never really had like any meaningful role. But with the X-Men residing in San Francisco and being on good terms with Sadie Sinclair, they basically brief her on what's going on so far. And one of the things is this really pointed out here, and this is pretty important, is this established that Juggernaut is insanely powerful at this point, multiple times over than how he normally is. Because when he has the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, as we know the inscription goes, you know, whosoever touches this gem or possesses this gem shall possess the bands of the, or the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak. Henceforth, you who reads these words shall go forward forevermore a human Juggernaut. Paraphrasing. Uh, when it comes to, to that level of power, he's already unstoppable in his own right. It's one of those things where, like, once the Juggernaut starts, starts moving, nobody can really stop him and he's invulnerable to pretty much every form of physical harm the only way to really defeat him is to remove his helmet and then use a psychic attack or something along those lines because even with his helmet gone conventional weapons still wouldn't work he'd be bulletproof they would just bounce off him and so when it comes to something like this what this does is it amplifies his power even that much more and so it's basically the power of the juggernaut with asgardian tech and it's, it's insane what he's capable of not only that he's basically amassed a whole bunch of followers and this is really done more for like a ransom act in the sense that earlier what it what 
has essentially gone on, or at least what happens here is that when the X-Men launch the initial attack, it's really more of like testing to see what they can and can't do because they don't really know what kind of power the Juggernaut has since it's been amplified. And so when Cyclops and company show up, it's the testing ground. They grab Colossus, they grab uh, Kitty Pride, they go through and they say, okay, look, like we've got to find a way to defeat this guy. And it kind of works for what it is. But initially this, this initial skirmish is disastrous because like all the X-Men are absolutely, I mean, they're, they're decimated. Cyclops is manhandled with no real effort on behalf of Juggernaut. Iceman is taken out in the blink of an eye. And these are some Omega level characters. And so with none of them really being able to stand alone against, uh, against Juggernaut, Cyclops essentially calls in and says, okay, look, we have more that we have to do here. So this of course leads to the arrival of Magneto. And it's one of the cool things because you would expect Magneto to be able to slow down Juggernaut or something along those lines. I mean, after all, he is wearing metal. So why not just lift him into the air? But with the enhancements offered by the Serpent, this basically makes Juggernaut and his weapons immune to the powers of Magneto. And so where Magneto stands up and, and essentially tries to like, you know, block or I guess catch the hammer of uh, of Juggernaut when he throws it, it just keeps moving towards him. Ultimately, it, it takes Kitty Pryde jumping in the way, phasing Magneto so that it, the hammer will pass right through him. Otherwise, it would have killed him. And this basically means that like, there's no real way for the X-Men to stop him, that, that Juggernaut truly is unstoppable at this moment in time. And so what they do is they basically say, we need Hope Summers. Now, calling Hope Summers in is no small thing, but you're talking about a character who has the ability to duplicate the powers of anybody around her with no upper limit. And that's what she does. She literally goes through and starts tapping in to the powers. So she's, it's basically a mutant with the powers of a thousand X-Men, or I guess really like a, a you know, a couple hundred X-Men who in turn is facing off against Juggernaut. And notice this, she does it by the skin of her teeth. What she ends up doing is seizing control of his helmet and then basically melting his helmet and pulling it off. And that's all she can do because the sheer number of powers she's absorbed has been entirely overwhelming. Now, what this does is it allows Emma Frost to basically use Cerebra, uh, Cerebra and then tap into the mind of, of uh, Juggernaut. And notice this, this is one of the funny things. Emma Frost is very cavalier in how she does this, right? She's like, okay, you know, his helmet's gone, whatever, you know, I'll just use my, my telepathy that's, you know, amplified several times over and then just, you know, shut his mind down or something along those lines. It doesn't work, not by a long shot. Shot. Her psychic mind is effectively like fractured and, and destroyed. Like it's, it's to the point where she's actually thrown temporarily into a catatonic state because she cannot begin to understand the sheer amount of energy, like psychic energy, rage, fear, anger, the whole nine yards that Juggernaut, uh, Juggernaut is putting off at the moment. It's way more than she knows how to handle and the Juggernaut moves forward. And so at this point, it's a matter of, of kind of running a conflict on two fronts. For Cyclops, again, as leader of the team, one part is getting information, seeing if there's a way to defeat him. And the other part is is basically creating a stopgap measure. And so what they end up doing is they end up traveling to meet Ileana Rasputin. Now, Ileana Rasputin is currently locked up in the in a brig inside the, you know, I guess the X brig is what it's called. And the reason for this is because shortly before this story, there was essentially the return of Legion. And the reason why the return of Legion had happened is because it was basically the purgatory, uh, was it Project Purgatory Saga? And it was this idea that after the events of Inferno, which is a uh, way old story that took place in the 1980s when Jean Grey's clone Madeline Pryor had launched an attack on New York by unleashing demons from this, you know, from basically like the netherworld, nether realm basically, where Ileana Rasputin draws her powers. Uh, what Project Purgatory ended up doing was realizing this was a power source. And so what they started engaging in was was what what amounted to like gene splicing, splicing the genes of mutants with like demons, and then kind of trying to create their own army of sorts. But what happened was Ileana Rasputin had realized what was going on and the power that was available there and essentially brought Legion in from a different dimension and uh, basically brought him back to life. But because Legion is so mentally unstable, because he's so insane, he's a credible threat to everyone. That like his powers to warp reality are extreme. So with this kind of a thing in mind, Ileana Rasputin was basically considered by Cyclops to be a credible threat to the mutant community. So she was thrown in the brig. And so seeking out this information and asking her questions, she basically says, look, I can study this and I can take you to where you need to go, but you're gonna have to let me out of the cell in order to do it. So it's a dangerous game that's being played. Something else is going on here. What we end up doing is kind of sidetracking for a second and picking up with some of these forces who were trying to stop Juggernaut and none of it's working. You know, like you have you have Pixie who's creating like portals trying to get him to different locations and he just walks right through as if they're not there. You've got Rogue who tried to like absorb the power of the Juggernaut way more than she could handle and she ended up shutting down. No one can stop him. And so what ends up happening is they end up taking Ileana Rasputin basically out into the middle of nowhere. She creates a portal and transports everybody but Cyclops to the realm of Sidorak. Now, this is where things really get cool. So Sidorak is one of the elder demons that exists 
existed in the Marvel Universe way, way back in the day and was, was one of the people who retreated. He's also part of the Octessence. The Octessence was a group of super old entities that existed in on Earth in the Marvel in the Marvel Universe. And the idea was they had a contest over which one was the most powerful. And so what they ended up doing is because they couldn't really enter the main Marvel Universe dimension, what they ended up doing was basically creating artifacts, one for each one of these members of the Octessence, and they were placed around Earth. But the idea was that an individual would pick up one of these artifacts and when they did, they would set the, uh, set the Octessence prophecy in motion. The Earth would be divided into eighths, like an, uh, you know, an, an eighth of the Earth's population would be an army for each one of these of these beings. And then in turn, it would just be like a massive war and end time kind of conflict. And whichever army proved to be victorious would show which member of the Octessence was the most powerful. And so during the Korean War, Kane Marco picked up the uh, artifact that belonged to Sidorak, which of course was the Crimson Gem. But with, with Ileana showing up here, she plays it exceedingly smart. What she basically tells Sidorak is Juggernaut is using power that is somebody else's. Now, when it comes to Sidorak, he's very much like the Old Testament God of Abraham, right? Like, I am a selfish God. And so do not use anybody's power before me. And that's how Sidorak functions. That's what he is, because the role that Juggernaut is playing is to serve explicitly for the avatar of Sidorak, the avatar of destruction. And so learning Juggernaut has accepted the power of another entity out there basically means that Sidorak strips Juggernaut of all of his power, basically takes away everything that Sidorak had, give, uh, had given him. Now, it does not really mean that Juggernaut is now insanely weak, hopelessly uncapable, you know, incapable of defeating anybody. He's still insanely powerful. But the problem with this is an avatar has to exist. Someone has to be the new Juggernaut. And so where Ileana Rasputin initially steps up, what ends up happening is Colossus takes her place and says, no, I will be the new host for, for the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. Now, this is where things get kind of crazy too. This is something else that happens. Transitioning back to the forces of the X-Men, there's two major things that happen. The first is that Gambit tries to use his powers to detonate objects by literally taking it like touching it to an aircraft carrier that Magneto is sending like sending directly into Juggernaut and the idea is to bring the aircraft carrier down onto him and then Gambit will blow it up it happens and it still doesn't work I mean it's it's crazy like the level of power that this guy has he's, he's OP as hell but with with Colossus taking on the new power of Juggernaut it is interesting because in the minds of Kitty Pride, who's basically there she essentially says like this will kill Colossus it'll it'll kill who he was and transform him into somebody else and that's kind of what happens here is that when Colossus arrives onto the scene and starts facing off against Unstoppable Juggernaut one of the things he comments on is that like he doesn't really want to stop like he has a desire to just destroy things as the avatar of Sidorak you seek to destroy you seek to conquer and to eliminate things and so what this means for Colossus is that he's following that exact charter and so showing up here and and facing off against Juggernaut one of the things he says is that in this instance in this conflict here that it's not really like Colossus is winning easily that for where Colossus is basically unstoppable, that with the power Kane Marco still has, he's still faster, he's still stronger, he's still more durable, like he's he's still he, he's still far more capable than Colossus is. The difference here is that Colossus is unstoppable. That's the difference. That's the one thing. Like Colossus literally just starts tearing him limb from limb because at this point it just becomes a war of attrition. That Colossus is just like this constant force facing off against Juggernaut, and eventually Juggernaut will wear out. Eventually he'll get tired and he won't be able to fight anymore. And that's exactly exactly what takes place. What ends up going on here is the serpent realizes what's 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 happening at this moment. The fact that Juggernaut's basically losing and in response whisks him away, basically snatches him up and sends him directly back over or brings him directly back to where the serpent's at, leaving Colossus in his current form. Now, what this does is this goes forward into the future of Marvel Comics and even directly into like Avengers versus X-Men with Unstoppable Colossus. It was an attempt to, to change his character up to kind of boost his popularity temporarily and it worked. Dude, it was, it was a talk of the town. Like every dude, every single form, everywhere was like all the time about like unstoppable colossus can unstoppable colossus beat this guy can he beat that guy can he do this can he do that it just turned out it just turned into like battle forms all the time like battle threats everywhere you went and so it's kind of interesting because in this moment what ends up happening is that following the departure of juggernaut this really leads to the x-men just kind of going back to business as usual but one of the things that happens here is cyclops pays a visit directly to sadie and essentially says look if things are how they are then what sadie had intended to do is that if juggernaut got close enough to Utopia that what she wanted to do is kind of take out the entire mutant population and Juggernaut in one fell swoop. Now, it wasn't really from a place of being vindictive. It was a practical approach, but Cyclops learned this was the case. Cyclops learned that ultimately she was going to destroy Utopia. And so what he ends up doing is basically having Hope Summers sit outside and in turn, like, take away the ability for Sadie to control her own body and says, look, this is how things are. We keep to ourselves. We keep our own. Thanks for giving us a home. But if you believe you're going to be able to walk over the X-Men, that's not going to happen because we have X-Men back there that can turn your blood to mercury. 
We have X-Men that can make you lose control of your bodily functions. Like we will have them screw up your mind, turn you inside out and make you live the most hor you know, horrid life you could ever imagine. All the while you don't realize you're just sitting in your living room. So either you can play ball and you can let us be, or we will make you suffer the most horrific experiences you could ever imagine in your entire life. And this is, this is again, continuing the trend of Cyclops falling down the path and becoming somewhat of a darker guy, becoming more extreme and becoming something more akin to a villain. Okay, so getting back into uh, Fear Itself, again, this is just one of those kind of transitionary stories, but for Thor, it's actually pretty interesting. Fear Itself kind of goes into a sort of reshuffling of the landscape for the Thor mytho, uh, mytho somewhat of a, a change up. And again, that even goes into uh, really the new mighty Thor run with, with Tanneris uh, and focuses on like the rebuilding of Asgard, the formation of Asgardia. But at the moment, we're basically picking up with like the fall of Thor, not in the sense that he died, but in the sense that Thor had basically been defeated or at least fought to the point of exhaustion facing off against uh the combined efforts of ben Grimm, the thing and the incredible hulk both of whom had the power of thor essentially and it was cool you know to see that whole thing take place but it means that even thor has limits and so in response to this the idea is earth cannot treat thor earth cannot basically give him the medicine he needs in order to survive and so they have to take him to asgard in order to uh, get him the kind of treatment that he needs but again with Captain America showing up here, this is actually pretty badass because you've got Heimdall who kind of, who tells Odin, look, like there are people showing up here and Captain America alongside like Hawkeye and a handful of others end up bringing in Thor's body. And then Captain America proceeds to read Odin the riot act. Dude, he, dude, he, he rips him up and down. He's like, Thor, fix him this moment right now. And I don't want to hear any of the stuff about Midgard has to die. I don't want to hear any of your nonsense, fix him and be done with it. And Odin's just kind of like left stammering, <laughs> right? You know, Odin is not used to being so openly defied, especially by like an earthling, but that's the nature of Captain America. Captain America is not really special. There's really nothing unique about him aside from his shield. But what he lacks in basically anything that makes a superhero worthwhile in terms of powers, he gains in terms of his willingness to basically do whatever it takes to win. But walking into Asgard and then smack talking Odin and telling him, do your damn job is something you don't normally see. And it's cool because Odin just kind of whisks him away right off the bat now re you know reading between the lines here we could probably make an argument that there's some respect from odin to captain america the guy's got courage and the guy's got like honor and duty and these are things that you don't readily find out there and so it's kind of cool because it's one of these things where odin could just incinerate him just wipe out the entirety of the avengers but instead just sends him back to earth now in reality this is done because the plot has to move forward i mean that's really the reason why it happened the issue with this is that there really is no one left you know they're basically in a boat that's again very akin to age of ultron where it's like so there's like there's like five of us here and we're basically the last men standing there, there's there's really no one else here that can save us now in response to this with thor basically receiving the kind of treatment he needs in order to recover odin is essentially forced to acquiesce or at least temporarily to basically say you were right and i was wrong you know earth has mighty heroes and if you really feel the need to fight alongside them if you really believe this is something that you have to do then do it then take my armor with it and so basically thor gets odin's odin's armor and it's one of these things where odin says look i wore this armor when i fought the serpent and defeated him the first time this armor will help you now it is formidable in its own right it does enhance the powers of thor to a degree but it's really more of like a protection spell basically meaning like the the full uh, bright and you know the full might and brunt of the serpent won't affect you in the same way it did if you didn't have this armor in the first place but notice this where thor is ready to sort of be brash and run headlong there's something to be said about odin basically saying look you believe you're ready but you're not because you're seeing this as a young man you don't have the years or the or the wisdom to understand that what you're basically doing is going headlong into a losing battle it's the prophecy has been foretold you're going to die here now something else that i want you guys to take note of here is that this prophecy that odin is, is referring to is the prophecy of the midgard serpent now the midgard serpent is totally different from this version of the serpent they're, they're distinctly different beings or at least in the original intention in which they were made when it comes to the midgard serpent in in actual norse mythology the idea was that in the in the battle of ragnarok the midgard serpent would pierce thor with a poison tooth and it would kill him and so when jack kirby grabbed those things and rolled it over the idea was that thor would basically die during the events of ragnarok facing off against the midgard serpent what Marvel's really doing here is they're sort of cooking the books, really, if, if we're being honest with ourselves. What Marvel's doing is they're saying, well, the Midgard Serpent was believed to be, you know, believed to have been, you know, your, your, oh God, how do you, how do you pronounce that? Your Mung, your Mungander, I think it is. I, I'm not really sure how to, how to pronounce that. But like the Midgard Serpent, you know, is, is this thing that's there. But in reality, it's actually the hidden brother of Odin. That's kind of what they're saying. But the other half of this is that Thor actually also gets the 
Odin Sword. And the Odin Sword is a pretty powerful artifact. I mean, this is one of the few things out there that is really beyond reproach when it comes to insane levels of power. Now, historically speaking in Marvel Comics, the Odin Sword has kind of been like a multifaceted object, meaning there have been multiple weapons out there that have been dubbed as the uh, as the, the Odin Sword. If you look at like Thor number 300, for example, when Thor fights the Celestials and, and just becomes like ridiculously OP at one point, there's an instance where he's wielding what's called the Oversword, which is kind of like the ultimate weapon out there created by Odin. Uh, and then of course you have like this as the actual Odin Sword. In reality, it kind of fluctuates depending on what story you're reading. If you go and read a story during Walt Simonson's run that features Man, uh, Mangog, and I can't remember the, the issues that it was featured in, if you go and you read that, that basically focuses on like Mangog trying to take the Odin Sword and use it to destroy Asgard. It's one of these weapons that's exceedingly powerful, but it's not immutable, right? Like Celestials have destroyed versions of the Odin Sword before, but Thor being given this weapon is being done so because as far as Odin states, it's the only thing that can actually defeat the Serpent. That, that It's the only thing that can really annihilate this thing, you know, basically bring it to an end. The other half of this is, remember, Tony Stark has been in Asgard proper working on creating Asgardian tech or really melding Asgardian weapons with uh, Stark tech in order to pass those artifacts on to the Avengers. And so what Tony Stark has basically done is he's modified his own suit using Asgard Guardian tech, and then in turn created a whole new series of weapons. So for the most part, like they're going into this battle pretty heavy handed. The other half of this is that with Captain America speaking to really what's left of the Avengers here, you basically got like Wolverine, you got Spider-Woman and so on and so forth. It's kind of interesting here because this is really where Captain America shines, right? Again, there's really nothing special about him, but the fact that he's been through so much, the fact that he's such an incredible leader, so on and so forth, is one of the reasons why so many superheroes look up to him. And so when he sort of stands among the ranks of, of really what's left and says, we have to keep fighting where some people want to give up in the end they don't you kind of have captain america saying this is the last stand if there's no one left here to fight then this is the end of it and really like the dire nature of the situation is given way when we end up seeing this instance of captain america just brandishing a shotgun this is really designed to be like captain america among militiamen captain america with a shotgun basically looking like a poor man's leader facing off against you know this almost indestructible army of people that are led by the serpent and so when captain america basically brandishes this shotgun <laughs> and goes to jump into the conflict, what this essentially means is that he acknowledges the fact they all may, uh, may very well die here. But in the middle of all this, suddenly the Bifrost opens, Iron Man shows up alongside a whole bunch of these other superheroes, or I guess really the, the various Asgardians with the weapons they've brought here. Now that's kind of a cool thing because what Iron Man does is dish them out accordingly and then say, look, these are going to create physical changes in your body. Your body's gonna be modified to reflect the various enchantments that have been put on here by Odin. You're gonna have a transformation akin to Thor. And it works for what it is because because each member of these, uh, of really of, of, of the Avengers wielding these weapons are able to face off against like the heralds of the serpent, but not really the serpent himself. That fight is really geared more to, or really, really reserved more for, uh, for Thor himself. And so it's kind of an interesting thing because by and large, we would expect this to be a battle that Odin would fight. Odin is usually hands off and the story does really center around Asgard and, and Thor. But when it comes to like Odin engaging in battle, that only ever really happens in like the most dire of situations, only if there's no other choice left. In this instance, Thor, the, the prophecy states, Thor is supposed to fight the Midgard Serpent, and so that's what Odin's allowing to happen. He's just kind of going into this prophecy and calling it a day. Now, of course, Thor throwing his hammer doesn't really do anything, and we never expected it to. And so where the hammer basically falls back to Earth, it's left to Odin, I'm sorry, left to uh, Thor to face off using the Odin sword and basically call it a day. But in this instance, and it's one of the coolest moments in the story, Captain America refuses to quit, and he will not back down. And so where he's falling, where the other Avengers are falling, left and right, and all really seems to be lost, Captain America rallies the troops yet again and picks up the hammer of Thor. Now, this is the first real time that Captain America's picked up Thor's hammer. He's done it before, and I can't remember the exact issue. I want to say it was it was back during Walt Simonson's run, maybe even before that, but there was an instance where Captain America, in a, in a moment of desperation, had picked up Thor's hammer, but it was really just kind of like, you know, like kind of swinging, like swinging it towards Thor. It wasn't really enough where he could pick it up with one hand and wield it. But with Captain America wielding the hammer of Thor, the bad battle begins to shift because seeing Captain America do this really like emboldens and heartens the various Avengers even more because it means now we've legitimately got a fighting chance. Cap picked up Thor's hammer. Holy shit. That's really kind of what that means here. And so it's a, it's a really, really cool moment because turning the tide against the forces of, uh, of, of, of the serpent basically means that like the battle's essentially coming to an end, that it's really beginning to, to wind down here. And so in this massive conflict against the Midgard serpent, some of the Asgardians end up riding into the scene 
uh, really being led by Odin to face off directly against, you know, the, the forces of the serpent. But the idea is that, that essentially Thor is going to die here, which he basically does. He manages to stab the serpent in the head using the Odin sword, essentially killing him, and then in turn falls to his own death. And so it's kind of a cool thing here, because what this does is it disperses the various hammers of the serpent. Everybody returns back to their normal state, and then Odin in turn grabs Thor and takes him back to Asgard. Now, this is kind of a big moment here, because the way that this was done, all indications was that this was going to see the, the death of Thor, that Thor was going to be officially removed from the Marvel landscape. That's the entire perspective that was being put off by Marvel. The issue with this is that while Thor is not the highest selling character that Marvel's ever had, he is certainly one of the most recognizable, especially now in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And so when you're talking about someone like Thor, you can't just kill him off, right? I mean, you can't just get rid of him. Somebody has to take his place. And so in this instance, of course, now, like, well, at least as awesome as it was, we had Jane Foster, which I'm still so pissed that she's not Thor anymore. <laughs> but in this instance, like Thor would have to return in some form or fashion. And so what this does is that in this kind of rebuilding phase, you know, in this moment when everything's sort of being, uh, the Avengers are kind of rebuilding everything and, and really a lot of the work's being handed over to damage control, who in turn are going to start rebuilding everything with their government subsidies and contracts and absolute corruption in the most heinous of ways. What this means is that the serpent himself is kind of being brought back to Asgard and is going to be monitored by Odin. But at the same time, Thor is essentially like burned at the pyre. It's basically like he's getting, he's receiving an Asgardian funeral. And so the question a lot of people had is what comes next? Like what comes after this with Thor being removed? Now, this is something that's kind of interesting here. So following this in from 2010 going to 2011 and 2012, Marvel launched Marvel Now. And what Marvel Now was designed to do was kind of reshuffle things. Now this kicks off something called Shattered Heroes. And Shattered Heroes was basically the aftermath of fear itself and the fact that like the heroes had basically been forced to face some of their biggest fears and with the Marvel, you know, as the Marvel tagline always goes and it changed the Marvel universe forever. Not really, but that was that that was the kind of tagline that was basically being used. But but in this whole thing, what this did is it set the stage for Matt Fraction to finish his run, which brings in Tanneris. I'm pretty sure is how you pronounce his name, which is basically Ulik the troll pretending to be Thor or pretending to be like a like a Thor reborn character. And then Loki essentially rescuing the real Thor by kind of splitting Donald Blake and Thor in half again. So it was it was sort of like a like a, a ham fisted thing is really what it was. It was it was kind of kind of like this idea. Well, Thor and and, and De Donald Blake are still one person. All right, get rid of him. Like get rid of that thing. It's old hat. Marvel's been doing it. Like we've been doing it since the 1960s. Just split them and be done with it. And that's basically what it was. And that leads directly into Jason Aaron's Go uh, Gore the God Butcher story arc. So you got like six issues and then Gore. That, that's that's really what happens here. It just kind of wraps up the tail bit of Thor. He eventually returns, and that's that's really the end of that. But going into Shattered Heroes, things are actually kind of cool to a degree. It, it, it kind of depends on what you're reading about. If you're reading like Mighty Avengers, things actually get pretty badass. If you're reading just like your standard Avengers, well, you know, that basically goes into Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run. And then you go into like, you know, the the you know, the whole like basically setting the stage for like Avengers versus X-Men and all that kind of good stuff. Uncanny X-Force, I think, continues on for a little while. There's a few things that happen here and there. Of course, this also leads directly, you know, with this whole situation between uh Banner and the Hulk, the Hulk becoming a sort of herald of the serpent. Uh, this led into the incredible Hulk himself separating Bruce Banner, which we covered in Jason Aaron's run. So again, like a lot of the things that we've covered recently within the last year or so, from like Captain America and Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk and the Avengers and so on and so forth, all that really stems out of fear itself. All that really comes out of all this stuff. So again, it's a pretty cool story and, and it's pretty interesting in terms of the purpose it serves, but again, it just kind of sets the stage for things to come after this. So as we continue our discussion on all new, all different Marvel, we pick up now with Jason Aaron's The Mighty Thor. Now, one of the funny things about this is The Mighty Thor has really split the Thor community. There are some fans that really want Odin's son to come back, and Odin's son will come back. That's one of the things that happens at, this, in, at the end of the story, and that's why I titled it The Return of Odin's Son, because this will actually feature the first appearance of Odin's son since the events of Secret Wars came to an end, and all new, all different Marvel started. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk more about that once we get to the end of this video but there are other people who welcome jane foster i personally love jane foster thor i think she's a, a well-written thor i think she's one hell of a character and i think it was a great decision by jason aaron to make her thor because it takes jane foster out of the role of being just kind of a person that's just a supporting character in thor's life and gives her a significant role within the realm of marvel comics what we're also going to talk about here in this video is that uh, jason aaron effectively put her on a ticking clock but what i want to do here is i want to backtrack a little bit because with all new all 
different Marvel, not everything was rebooted. There were some new stories that showed up, like Ultimates. You know, there's things like Champions that have their roots in the current run of Avengers, Uncanny Avengers, and New Avengers. But for the Mighty Thor, there's really no reboot to be had here. There's no refreshing. Instead, Jason Aaron largely continues on from before Secret Wars. He does give us a little bit of a refresher in terms of Jane Foster, but he doesn't really offer much in the way of Malekith the Accursed of the Serpent. It's really just kind of confusing if you're picking this up for the very first time. So for those of you guys who have found yourself kind of a, you know, feeling like a lost ball in high weeds when it came to uh, the start of the Mighty Thor, I'm hoping these next few minutes will clear things up for you. So the first thing I want to talk about here is the Serpent, is Cold Boar Sun. Now he will play a minor role in this. He won't really be like a major focal point, but he still does have a role to play. With regards to the Marvel landscape, specifically the realm of Asgard, Cold Boar Sun was one of the brothers of Odin. Originally in Marvel Comics, it was simply Odin, Vili, and V, and that was it. And what we knew was that Odin had basically secured the Odin Force, created the Odin Force by absorbing the life energies of his brothers and merging them into himself. Now that's the original continuity, that's the way it had always been. Marvel came along and they wrote a story called Fear Itself, and Fear Itself centered on the on the introduction of Cold Boar Sun and the idea that Odin actually had a third brother, but that, that Cold Boar Sun had basically gone crazy with his own power and ruled his own realm using fear. Now where Odin did defeat Boar Sun or did defeat Cole, what ended up happening is that Odin couldn't actually kill his brother, and so instead he imprisoned him inside the oceans of Earth and had Thor basically keep an eye and watched Midgard in order to make sure that Cole would never leave. That's one of the reasons why Earth was so closely tied to Asgard. Some of it had to do with the fact that Thor was part of the protector of Earth, but the largest part of it was that Odin wanted to keep an eye on Earth to make sure that Cole could not actually escape and that if he did, then Odin would be there to stop him. The issue was that during the events of Fear itself, Cole Borsun did escape by virtue of his daughter Sin. Now again, during the events of Fear itself, all this stuff was explained to us, but because of the fact that Cole Borsun had his own hammer, because of the fact that he wanted to take over Earth and then eventually take over Asgard, take over as ruler, kicking Odin out of his current place, the idea here was that he was eventually defeated. What, what also happened though was that he was basically stationed on Asgard, not so much as a hero or an ally, so much as a guy who was just there so that Odin could keep an eye on him. Now, with regards to Malekith the Accursed, Malekith the Accursed was an extremely obscure character. In fact, you'd only ever really know about him if you'd done any measure of reading or read any of the stories surrounding the cask of ancient winners. But Malekith rose to prominence, of course, as we know, with Thor the Dark World. Of course, that story dealt with Malekith leading the Dark Elves in a campaign across the worlds trying to merge the realms into one another and so on and so forth. The MCU version is different from the version that we have in the comics, but the fact remains that because Malekith the Accursed was the main villain in Thor the Dark World, he gained popularity, gained traction in Marvel Comics from people who wanted to know who he was. And so what Jason Aaron did is he basically rolled Malekith the Accursed over from being an obscure character to being the main villain of the uh, Jane Foster Thor line of stories. Now the way he did this is he actually had Malekith the Accursed become part and parcel or begin to engage in shady practices with Roxxon Oil. Now Roxxon Oil has also been mentioned a, a ton of times in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it's not nearly as prominent in the movie universe as it is in the comics. The Roxxon Oil is kind of like the lead uh, CD corporation. It's the lead bad corporation. If it will give them money, if, if they can make money off of it, they will do it. It doesn't matter what it is. They'll assassinate people. They will imprison people illegally. They'll kill people. I mean, they'll, they'll do all kinds of different things. They'll engage in illegal acts of all sorts so long as it turns a profit and it gets them a foothold with regards to having an edge over the competition. Now, the competition, of course, is Alchemax, different things like that. Even Stark and uh, Parker Industries are considered to be competitors to Roxxon Oil. They're not nearly as unsavory as Roxxon, but the idea is that Roxxon will do what it takes in order to turn a profit. The the other half of this coin was that Malekith the Accursed within this line of comics uh, by Jason Aaron wanted to take over the Nine Realms and eventually set his sights on Asgard and be the undisputed ruler of all existence for the most part. But he couldn't do this on his own. He needed a multitude of forces in order to make this happen. And so what he intended to do was launch a campaign to first secure the loyalty of the Frost Giants. The problem with this was that the existing ruler of the Frost Giants, the existing leader, would not ally him himself with Malekith the Accursed. But during the early days of Asgard, when Odin had defeated the Frost Giants and adopted Loki as a son, during the battle, Lofi was killed. But because Lofi was kind of this honored dead of the Frost Giants, because of the fact that if he ever were to come back, all the Frost Giants would swear absolute loyalty to him, including the existing king who would step aside and allow Lofi to take the place as king, Malekith the Accursed came to realize that if he were to resurrect Lofi, he would likely be able to sway Lofi to his side and in turn, get the loyalty of all the Frost
Frost Giants. And so what Luffy did, and this actually coincided with the uh, first story arc of, uh, of Jane Foster Thor, what happened is Malekith traveled to Earth. He found that Roxxon Oil had secured the skull of Luffy and he invaded Roxxon Oil. But Roxxon saw this as an opportunity to expand their own profits. Because of the fact that Malekith wanted to invade the realms, those realms have materials that could not be found on Earth. And so Roxxon rationalized that if they could secure those materials, they could in turn sell them on Earth to anyone who would be willing to buy them and fetch a huge amount of money. And so what Roxxon Oil did is they said they would give uh, Malekith the Accursed the skull of Luffy, but only under the condition that Malekith the Accursed allowed them to basically take the minerals from the, the realms that he conquers and sell them on Earth. Hence, an alliance was formed between Malekith and Roxxon Oil. Now again, this ties into the introduction of Jane Foster Thor, and the way this worked was during the original Sin story arc, when Thor Odin's son lost his ability to use his hammer, when Nick Fury said whatever it was that he said, uh, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen. We didn't know how things were going to work. It was assumed by us as the reader that something would happen somewhere along the line where Thor got the ability to wield his hammer again, but that didn't happen. Instead, Jason Aaron had someone else pick up his hammer, which was later on revealed to be Jane Foster, who was dying of cancer. Now, now, because of the fact that Odin's son did not know that Jane Foster was Thor, when she was diagnosed with cancer, he initially offered her the opportunity to attend Asgard's, uh, you know, magic slash medical facilities and purge the cancer from her body. But Jane Foster chose not to. And so instead, Thor basically granted her the opportunity to, uh, to be part of the Council of Realms, which is to say the Senate that exists where each of the realms sends a representative in order to work out the various problems or disagreements that the realms may have with one another. The problem was that that once Jane Foster became Thor, while she was undergoing chemotherapy, every time she became Thor, it would purge the chemotherapy from her body. It would effectively send her back to zero in terms of her cancer treatment. But the cancer itself was continually progressing. And so what Jason Aaron did is he basically said, yes, Jane Foster is currently Thor, but she's on a ticking clock. It's only a matter of time before she succumbs to the cancer that's killing her because she keeps wiping out the chemotherapy from her body. And so again, this is basically why I called this the return of Odin's son, because this appears to be Jane Jason Aaron setting the stage for the return of Thor. Now we know that Thor will have his own story, uh, Thor the Unworthy, but I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere along the line, Odin's son went back to the position of being Thor as we knew him before Jane Foster took over that position. But with that being said, with all that stuff being added in, hopefully that wasn't too chaotic for you guys. Hopefully you understand it. But what we do now is we actually jump forward into the story arc of, uh, of the return of Odin's son, of the first story arc from the mighty Thor as part of all new, all different Marvel. Now, this story arc initially picks up with uh, Jason Aaron kind of giving us a refresher on Jane Foster, more or less what I had said about the idea that every time she changes into Thor, that it wipes away the chemotherapy from her body. It tells us, of course, that Jane Foster is suffering from cancer, but more so than that, we see him immediately initiating this idea of the War of the Realms when the satellite, or when a satellite of Roxxon Oil is suddenly set upon by what appears to be Light Elves from one of the Nine Realms, uh, who have all been killed and are simply just crashing back to Earth. The issue with this is that because these people from the different realms of, uh, of, you know, one of the nine realms rather, are so durable because they're all roughly equivalent to Thor, maybe a little bit weaker in terms of durability and strength, they immediately tear through the hull of the ship and, or I guess of the satellite, and the result is that it sends a satellite crashing down to Earth. Now, with Jane Foster watching TV and seeing these things happening, she immediately calls Mjolnir to her and uh, she becomes Thor and she takes off alongside the rest of the Avengers in order to uh, keep people as safe as they can from uh, this satellite that's crashing into the ground. Now, for the most part, they are successful in doing this. But once Jane Foster and uh, Vision and a handful of others travel into space to see what's going on, they realize that there is there are some of these elves that have written on them, so begins the War of the Nine Realms. And so what happens is she travels back to uh, back to the hospital, she secures Volstagg, and the two of them basically head off to Asgard. Now when they get there, this is something that I wanted to touch on real quick, and I actually waited until this part of the story to, uh, to get into this, simply because I didn't want to bombard you guys with too much too fast in terms of backstory, when she gets to Asgard, there are signs all over the place that say False Thor. And this is one of the reasons why this is so cool, because when Jason Aaron created uh, Jane Foster Thor, I imagine that for the most part, he knew there was going to be backlash from traditional Thor fans. And he created the sort of meta commentary in the story where even people in Asgard considered her to be a False Thor, that she was a thief, she had stolen Mjolnir, it was never rightfully hers. This was also a major plot thread for the events before Secret Wars in the sense that Odin himself had considered her to be a False Thor 
considered her to be an impersonator, and even tried to have her imprisoned. The result was that Freya had actually come to her aid, had taken up arms against Odin, and given uh, given Jane Foster the ability to escape from uh, from Odin's judgment. The downside to this was that Freya was thrown in prison for her actions while she awaited a trial by Odin himself in order to determine whether or not she was guilty or she was innocent. Now from here, we actually end up jumping to the uh, to the Council of Realms themselves, and we see the Light Elves conversing with the Dark Elves and, you know, people going back and forth, the, uh, the Dwarves, who of course are well known for having fashioned the Hammer of Thor in the first place. And the idea here is they're saying, well, Light Elves are being killed everywhere, that, uh, that something needs to be done to do this. But the idea is that Jane Foster counters this by saying that, yes, these Light Elves are being killed, but it's not as though someone's killing them for no reason. There's a much bigger thing going on here. There's a much bigger set of events taking place here. That someone is a hidden hand. That someone has started this conflict. And so again, what we do is we pick up with Jane Foster trying to find this source, trying to go to the realm of the Light Elves to see what it is that's going on to get more information than what the Light Elves ambassadors are willing to reveal. Now, when she gets to the Bifrost, as we know, Heimdall is the guardian of the Bifrost. Now, one thing I want to touch on here is that Jason Aaron does not really change much of the Asgardian mythos. In fact, this I think was one of the greatest aspects of his run on Thor in the sense that he kept a lot of it the same. For those of you guys who are familiar with Thor in the movies, but you're not widely familiar with him in the comics, what you saw in the movies is basically Heimdall in the comics. Uh, Heimdall basically just guards the Bifrost. He determines who can pass and who cannot. He serves at the behest of the ruler of Asgard, whoever that ruler happens to be, whether it's Odin or someone else who takes his place. Now, Heimdall is an extremely capable warrior in his own right. He's one of those strong silent types in the sense that he rarely ever gets involved in conflicts, but when he does, it is a sight to behold because he absolutely lays waste to whoever it is that he's going against. But because of the fact that Odin considers Jane Foster to be an impersonator, he's very much restricted what it is that she can and cannot do. Most notably, she's not allowed to travel to the realm of Alfheim. She's not allowed to go to the realm of the uh, of the Light Elves. More so than that, even if Odin had more or less kind of given her the ability to do what she wanted to do, this is also still being hindered by Cole Borson. Now, Cole Borson carries out Odin's law. Think of him as somewhat of a, uh, of a sheriff, so to speak, in Asgard, in the sense that because Odin has basically confined himself to the interior of Asgard, because he never really leaves, he's more like an absentee king and Cole Borson carries out his orders in his stead and so on behalf of Odin Cole Borson has decreed that Jane Foster is not allowed to go into the realm of Alfheim. Now from here we transition over to uh, to Malekith himself in the Yawning Void and the Yawning Void is kind of this place hidden from all reality it's one of those locations that Heimdall can't see and so what happens is Malekith the Accursed is of course talking to Roxxon Oil talking about how Roxxon Oil will be able to make money off of the uh, various resources from from the realms that, uh, that Malekith conquers. But the other half of this is that someone wants to join the ranks of their Dark Alliance, so to speak. Someone wants to become part of their, uh, part of their group. Now, the initial idea is this may be a, someone that we haven't seen yet. Maybe it's Cole Borson himself operating from the shadows. But what we learn is that it's actually Loki who wants to join part of their alliance. And this is a big deal because, again, this sees the first appearance of Loki following the events of Secret Wars. But something else that I also want you guys to take note of here is that over the course of this story, we're actually going to see Jason Aaron give us different versions of Loki. It's going to be a singular battle, but it'll be all the versions of Loki that we've ever seen over the course of his history, which is really, really going to be a cool moment. But the idea here is that in order for Loki to become part of the Frost Giants, because of the fact that Luffy has since been resurrected, and because Luffy is leading the Frost Giants, in order for Loki to become part of this Dark Alliance, he has to pass a series of tests that are going to be administered by Luffy. Now, this is a really cool discussion here because this is the first time that Loki has ever encountered Luffy in his current form, that is to say, right now, in this moment, as his father. Uh, there have been times where Loki traveled into the past, where Loki has met Luffy before, but it's never been anything like this. This. this is about as close as the two of them get as a kind of bonding moment of sorts. But what we're told by Jason Aaron and what he shows us is that Luffy has no loss of love for Loki. He considers Loki to be a shameful indication of his offspring. He he considers Loki to be something less than a, than a strong son, you know, kind of a, I guess, a disappointment, so to speak. Now, transitioning back to Asgard, transitioning back to, uh, to Thor, what she says is that she is going to go to the realm of Alfheim. She's not going to be held back. And that Borson is the least likely person to ever get in her way still because 
of the fact that she could easily take him on with the power of Mjolnir. Now, something to point out here is that if it was just Jane Foster herself and all she had was like the Axe Yarnbjorn or something like that, she'd be stomped easily just because of the fact that that Cold War Sun is so powerful. But Mjolnir, with the magic that it holds, with the powers that it possesses, it gives her the edge over over Cold War Sun simply just by virtue of what it's capable of. Now, when she goes through and she's able to take out the forces of Cold War Sun, his experience in battle is the one thing that causes him to gain the upper hand. And that was the reason why I ran over that little segment a second ago, because Cold War Sun does get the upper hand on her, but this is experience. This is not strength and it's not power. This is simply because of the fact that Cold War Sun has been a ruler much longer than Jane Foster has. Cold War Sun has been a fighter much longer than Jane Foster has. And so Cold War Sun knows how to work around the powers of Thor, and he knows how to work around the powers of the Asgardians. Now, something else that's really interesting here is that while this conflict is taking place, this is why I love Jason Aaron's writing so much, Heimdall doesn't lift a finger. He doesn't do anything initially. Instead, he just guards the bridge because that's his job and that's what he does. But this is why I say that he is a force to be reckoned with when he gets into the combat because once Cold War Sun says, or once he once he reveals that he believes Jane Foster to be a, uh, a traitor, once he says that she is not the rightful owner of Mjolnir, that hammer belongs to Thor, he intends to actually cut off her hands because he considers her to be a thief. But right at the moment of the striking blow, Heimdall puts his sword in the way and blocks the attack. Now, Cold War Sun talks a tough game here, all right? He's basically more or less like, you know, how we, why would you do this? You know, you cannot get in my way. I'm operating on the orders of, of Odin, but he doesn't actually make a move to attack Heimdall. And the reason why is because, you know, in part of my language here, Heimdall would stomp his shit. Like, that's just the way it is. He would absolutely crush Cold War Sun. It would be, <laughs> I kind of wish Jason Aaron had shown us that. It would have been awesome. But the fact remains here that because Heimdall works indirectly, because he kind of does his own thing, he uses this as an excuse to, to basically send Jane Foster off to Alfheim, and then he turns around and surrenders himself to uh, to Cold War Sun. Now, this is really more of an honorable act by Heimdall to simply allow himself to be turned over because for him, it's the law above all else. He will happily act against the will of Odin, but he will also turn himself over to the consequences of those acts. Heimdall does not go rogue. Heimdall does not defy and then avoid the consequences. And that's one of the cool things about his character. He's kind of, you know, a representation of the last vestiges of honorable men, so to speak. And so once Jane Foster is sent off to uh, sent off to Alfheim, she eventually does what she can to uh, to find out everything that's going on. But we also learn that Alfheim is in the middle of a massive invasion by the combined forces of Roxxon Oil and the Dark Elves of Malekith. Now, in addition to this, once Thor arrives, she is able to hold her own against these forces, cast them off as best she can. But then we also learn the plot thickens. And not only is Malekith the accursed in an alliance with Roxxon Oil, the Frost Giants, and a handful of others, he's also in an alliance with the Enchantress. Now, the Enchantress seems to have her own motivations here. For those of you guys who don't know, the en Enchantress is a wildly powerful witch in the realm of Asgard. She's extremely capable because what we're talking about, when we talk about Asgardians, we're talking about the level of gods. Now, in my research, I don't know exactly where she stands in relation to like Doctor Strange. I know that before Doctor Strange lost his powers, lost his connection to the Vishanti and got them back, but was less powerful than he was before, which is where people get the reference pre-retcon and post-retcon Doctor Strange. I know that that pre-retcon Doctor Strange was extremely powerful. He was multiversal powerful. I mean, he could do whatever he wanted to because he had the power to do it. He would probably be able to go toe to toe, if not overcome Enchantress. Doctor Strange right now in Marvel Comics is kind of a tough comparison. It's kind of a tough, uh, tough analysis here. Enchantress can hold her own in a multitude of different ways. She can take on gods. She can challenge gods, but so can Doctor Strange. So again, it's, it's kind of a tough comparison. And in fact, I'll leave that to you guys down in the comments section. Who do you think is more powerful? The Enchantress in Asgard or Doctor Strange? Because I'm actually kind of curious to see what answers you guys come up with. But the motivation behind Enchantress being involved in the uh, in the alliance of Malekith is to basically say that she wants Thor as a husband. She wants to have Thor all to herself. And it's always really been this way. You know, Enchantress has always been obsessed with Thor. This is one of the reasons why when the unknown woman first picked up Thor's hammer before we realized it was Jane Foster, the rumors were circling around everywhere that we went to. But one of the one of the ideas is that people thought it was Enchantress. They thought that she became, for whatever reason, she was found worthy of wielding Mjolnir and became the next Thor. But the fact remains here that we switch back over to Loki and Loki was basically given a test by his father Lofi to go against four of, uh, of Lofi's absolute best and strongest warriors, but Loki was able to defeat them. Now, this is where Jason Aaron really highlights the power of Loki. Loki is very strong in comparison to your normal Earthlings. Loki, for example, could easily take on Captain America 
Gattaca or somebody like that. You know, he can easily go toe to toe with him. Loki's actually gone toe to toe with villains like Apocalypse and even the Incredible Hulk. Despite what you guys saw in uh, the Avengers movie, Loki has gone toe to toe with the Incredible Hulk. He'd be outclassed extremely fast because the Incredible Hulk's anger would reach a level where he would just be so strong that Loki wouldn't stand a chance, but he's still very capable. But Loki in and of himself is not a warrior. Loki's a trickster. And so he uses his intelligence in order to overcome situations. And that's what he did here. He basically began manipulating the minds of these warriors. And, and, uh, and what he did is he basically had one of the warriors kill the other three and then drove this warrior to insanity. And so again, this is just kind of Loki having people fight his battles for him, tricking them. But he also has a conversation with his father, Lofi. And what he says is that this is all just one big waste of time. That if Loki was not capable, if Loki was not strong enough to survive in the world of Asgard, then he wouldn't have made it this long. He wouldn't have lasted as long in different conflicts as he has been. He would have been killed off very fast. And so either uh, either Lofi can get his act together and tell him what's going on, or Loki will simply just abandon Lofi or attack his father and drive him insane. And so this seems to be what Lofi was waiting for. He was waiting for Loki to be the honorable son that he knew. But again, what we're actually going to find here, or at least what we find next, is that Lofi still hates his son. He still hates Loki. He considers Loki to be a shameful thing. You know, he considers Loki to be something less honorable than what a frost giant should be. And so again, this is basically the conversation that he has with Malekith when they're on Alfheim. And what, what Lofi says is his intention is to kill both Loki and the, the Light Elves, or at least to enslave the Light Elves, and then turn around and rule Earth or rule Asgard alongside Malekith. Again, the motivations of Lofi are a little uh, are a little skeptical here. But the fact remains that once we're back on Alfheim, uh, once we're dealing with Thor, who's trying to secure the Queen of uh, Queen of the Light Elves, she's eventually met with the arrival of Loki himself. Now again, Thor, or I guess Jane Foster Thor, has had a couple run-ins with Loki, but never anything real, never anything tangible like what Odin's son has. And so Odin's son's well-versed, and Odin's son would know right off the bat, incapacitate Loki and call it a day, because no one knows what Loki's going to do. He's crazy in the things that he does. But I would love for you guys to remember this, because what we're going to learn, I think probably in the next story arc or so, is there's a lot more to Loki's actions than what's going on here. Loki is, what you see is not necessarily what's happening. I will say that. Like, what you see is not necessarily what's going on. I know it's mysterious. I know it's kind of, ooh, you know, cloak and dagger. But, you know, it's it just goes towards the writing of, of Jason Aaron. But the fact remains here that Loki basically, I guess what Jason Aaron does is he actually addresses us as the reader. And this is what's really cool. When Jane Foster Thor first popped up, like I said earlier, there were a lot of people who didn't like the idea of a new Thor, who wanted to see the same old Odin son. But what Jason Aaron says by way of Loki having a conversation with uh, with, with Jane Foster Thor is he says, myself and Odin's son have done that dance time and time again. You know, how often can we really see this same situation going around in circles? And this is really just Jason Aaron saying, look, you guys have had Thor for almost 40 years. You know, how off, how much can you guys really see the same stories over and over and over and over again? This is all new, all different Marvel. Things need to be new and they need to be different. Granted, it's not as new or as different as we wanted it to be, but this is Jason Aaron telling us, you're getting something new and you're getting something different. You wanted new and you wanted different. Why are you complaining? And so this, this is kind of interesting to me because it addresses the reader. It addresses naysayers. But in response to Jason Aaron, I would say it's not really a complaint about something new so much as it is there's history there there's legacy there people like odin's son because they've they've been with him for so long but people like jane foster because she's new it's really a mixed bag when it comes to comic book readers there's no real right and wrong here people who like thor like him because he's had great stories god butcher was an incredible story people like jane foster because she had great stories and she's coming into her own as a superhero people are literally following her as she's learning what it means to be thor but the fact remains here that you know with regards to this situation i'm actually kind of curious too post down i know this is going to be a, a really controversial question post down and uh <laughs> tell me who you like more do you like odin's son or do you like jane foster and i know this is going to create some argument in the comment section please try to keep it civil guys please do not insult each other i know it's a lot to ask but the fact remains that that you know jane foster has had enough run-ins with loki in the past to know that he does need to be incapacitated so she immediately uses her hammer and knocks his head off and from here loki begins conjuring all these different versions of himself over the years. There's a uh, Incredible Hulk version of Loki. There's the original Loki when he first showed up in the Thor comics. There's the modern Loki. There's the kid Loki. There's the woman Loki. There's all these different versions. There's the Loki from Secret Wars when he was a homeless man. There's all these different versions of him, which is really, really cool, you know, in terms of, uh, of what Jason Aaron is giving us. But what we also find out is that Lokis, these different Lokis, begin conversing with themselves. And Loki basically has all these different personalities. Each one is its own self. And so these are, are almost like they're operating independently of the whole, but they're still part of Loki. I don't know if that makes any sense at all, 
But in the end, the fact remains that Jane Foster realizes that in order for her to continue with her plan, Loki at the very least has to be defeated or he has to be held at bay. He has to be kind of pushed away from being a credible threat. And so when she asks the question, why are you here? You know, what's going on with Malekith the Accursed? Why are you allied with him? Why are they invading Alfheim? Loki says, basically, I was a distraction. And the distraction was, I'm waiting for them. And so what happens is when she looks up, she realizes that there are the forces of Loki who are arriving with nuclear bombs under the control of Roxxon oil. And so the idea seems to be that they were going to start dropping these bombs everywhere and they're going to wipe out the entirety of Roxxon oil. But instead, what happens is uh, Jane Foster uses her hammer, she uses her power of lightning, and she takes out all these bombs. Now, this is one of the reasons that I like so much about this is because, again, we're following Jane Foster on her journey to learn about what it means to be Thor. And this is one of the big things. One of the things that she has to recognize is that as a superhero, there comes a time when you may have to sacrifice your life to do the right thing. She doesn't actually die here, but it's her accepting the fact that she is the goddess of thunder, that she cannot be limited by what she thinks she can and cannot do. She simply just has to do what needs to be done. And so she is successful in doing this. She is successful in taking out these various forces. The problem is that it pushes her to a weakened state and she loses her connection to the hammer and actually transitions back to her normal human form. Now, what we do here is we actually end up jumping back to the trial of Freya by her husband, Odin. And what happens is Odin again touches back on what we had talked about earlier, where Freya had been the person that it made it possible for Thor to escape Odin's judgment. She had made it possible for Thor to get away and, you know, return back to the planet Earth. But what we also learn here is that in the background of these events, the goal of, uh, the goal of Malekith was to actually wed the, uh, wed the Light Elf Queen, thereby taking over her realm and taking over all the resources of the Light Elves. Now, how this ties into the bigger picture will be, again, covered later on. And what we'll actually learn is he's simply just going to keep her as a prisoner and do the exact same thing across the other realms, basically take over as absolute ruler. And what this does is it basically makes it official and what I mean by that is in the realm of Asgard or I guess in the nine realms you know rulership is determined by different ways if you have like a barbarian clan like the the frost giants the current ruler is whoever it is that can take over as ruler whoever the strongest of the frost giants is is the one that becomes the king and it's a constant challenge there will constantly be other frost giants who will rise up and try to take their place and if you cannot defeat them they will take your place and they'll be viewed as the king with the light elves it's really more of a monarchy kind of thing it's really more of a, of a high class you know more organized more structured society and because of the fact that it deals so much with heritage and royalty marriage is how you become the ruler of that realm not really through combat and so if Malekith the Accursed had killed the queen of the uh, of the Light Elves then the other forces would have just fought to the death but if he marries her it makes him king and because of that they now have to follow his orders by loyalty to the crown it's really just more of following custom and using subservience as a way to take over a realm as opposed to just killing everything that exists and so again jumping back to Freya this is one of the cool things here is because of the fact that Odin had kept himself so confined inside of Asgard, because of the fact that he wanted virtually nothing to do with what was going on, he failed to take notice of a, of a very significant set of events that were taking place in Asgard. And what I mean here is that much like us as the reader base, Jason Aaron took the derisive aspect of Jane Foster becoming Thor and threw it into Asgard. Like some of you prefer Odin's son, where some of you prefer Jane Foster, in the realm of Asgard, there are some who view Thor, who view Jane Foster as being a thief, who view her as as a false Thor, but there are others who say the hammer chose her, and so she is the Thor. And what this did is it created a rift. It basically set Asgard on a position of civil war. And so what happened here is basically Odin, while he was inside of his realm, failed to take notice of the fact that forces are moving against him while his own forces are trying to protect him. And it's basically created a state of civil war within Asgard itself. And so what happens here is outside of this of the uh, castle, I guess outside of the main chamber of Odin we see that the forces of the Warriors Three are leading the other, I guess, I guess leading other groups of Asgardians against the forces of Kol Borsun and his soldiers. And so again, Odin refuses to take note of this. Odin refuses to accept that this is what's happening. In addition to this, while he's in the middle of getting ready to pronounce guilt over Freya, Jane Foster arrives. And Jane Foster and Odin engage in this massive battle between the two of them. Now, this is where I say the return of Odin's son begins to come into play. While Odin is a very formidable threat, and while he could easily get the upper hand on Jane Foster, one of the cool things is that she's not bound by loyalty to Odin. And this is one of the reasons why a conflict between Thor and Odin would be pretty one-sided on Odin's behalf because Odin's son would have a very hard time attacking his father. He'd have a very hard time killing his father if it came down to it. But Jane Foster does not hold that loyalty. And so what happens here is that with everything that's taking place and everything that's going on, we also learn that there is a whole lot more with Loki. We learn that Loki becoming 
part of the council with regards to the, and I'm actually, I'm actually kind of jumping ahead a bit here, so I apologize, but we learned that Loki becoming part of the Dark Council alongside Malekith was done at the orders of Freya in order to spy on Malekith and find out what he was doing. But what happens is that in the midst of all this, Loki actually turns around and stabs Freya essentially kills her and this is a major focal point now with regards to the return of odin's son this is initially a split second thing and so if you weren't looking for it you wouldn't expect it but in the middle of a conflict between uh between thor and between odin odin suddenly stops and turns around and says what did i just sense and so for me when i first saw this i was like oh my god odin's son is coming back <laughs> i was like thor odin's son is coming back and i was i was so excited and it really kind of blew me away but at the end of all this when everything seems to die down when everything seems to come to an end we ultimately find that that loki basically stabbed freya with a poison blade and it effectively kills her in addition to this this, we also find that Cole Borson, because he has loyalty to the crown, because he has loyalty to Odin and to Freya, immediately turns his axe on Loki. But we also learn that Cole Borson, in and of himself, also has a role to play here in the sense that after the death of Freya, that Odin had basically retreated into his own realm, retreated into uh, into the I guess uh, I guess placed Freya in what was considered to be the Odin sleep, but also went back into his own uh, into his own Arcanum. You know, I guess for lack of a better word, that uh, in his stead, while he was absent, that Cole Borson took up the mantle of regent of Asgard. Now, a regent basically means that you're operating as ruler instead, you know, in, in the place of the king, but it's only designed to be temporary. We also learn that, again, Loki is still allied with uh, with the Frost Giants, at least they believe he's still allied with them, but we also end up transitioning to some other side of the universe or somewhere else in a distant location. And this is when we see the return of Odin's son. I know a lot of you guys have probably been wondering by now, where's Odin's son? When do we get his return? It's only small, but this is Jason Aaron telling us he's coming back. This is the first appearance of Odin's son since the events of Secret Wars, the first time we've ever seen him. And so this is Jason Aaron saying, I didn't wipe him out of existence. I didn't retcon him out of existence. He's not gone forever. He's here and he is going to be coming back. Members of the Rob Corps. I goofed. <laughs> I screwed up. Uh, a lot of you guys who are kind of new here and who were going through a lot of the videos that I had for all new, all different Marvel are probably asking yourself, Rob, didn't you already do like the Lords of Midgard? Uh, the video was titled Lords of Midgard. I actually screwed up. That was thunder in her veins. I don't know why I titled it volume two Lords of Midgard. It may have been that I was going through and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next and ended up jumping into that one. But yeah, I screwed up. <laughs> I made a mistake. But in any event, this is actually the Lords of Midgard. Now, this is really just kind of one of these stories that expands a little bit on Jane Foster, but it doesn't go into like the whole mythology of like the 10 realms, or I guess, yeah, really the 10 realms now, if we count heaven, it doesn't go into like the whole mythology of the 10 realms. It kind of takes it aside for a second and it actually focuses on a guy named Dario Agar. Now, this is what Jason Aaron does. When Jason Aaron goes through and writes stories, whenever he crafts stories, which he did it a lot when he wrote The Incredible Hulk and it was really, really good the way it was done. But one of the things he does is he sits down and he says, okay, let's have this story here. We have this character off doing this thing and then in the middle of that we're gonna focus on something else over here it seems like it's out in the middle of nowhere it seems like it just comes from nowhere but there's a basis behind it all this story does that as well as the untold origin of Mjolnir which we did cover that does that it's really just kind of expanding the mythology and a lot of writers do that Jeff Johns did it with Green Lantern Hickman did it with Fantastic Four and Avengers a lot of it's just kind of expanding on existing mythos because as the story opens up it really focuses a lot on Jane Foster just kind of reminding us of where she at. Now, this also coincides with the idea of Loki running for president, which again, we covered that, you know, vote Loki thing during the presidential election. It was a fun little one-off, you know, with Loki. It wasn't a great big, huge thing, but this idea of bolstering the Thor landscape initially comes to us by way of something called the Universal Bank. Now, the Universal Bank has never been seen before, never been mentioned before, but it's really just one of these instances where a Marvel writer comes along and says, hey, there's a lot of these little things that go on in the background when it comes to villains and stuff, and this is just one of those things. I mean, when Bendis came out and he basically created the illusion Illuminati, it was this idea that the Illuminati served the purpose of operating in the background without anybody really knowing they were there. This Universal Bank is similar to like the Hellfire Club. It's similar to the Secret Avengers for the time that they were there. It's really just one of these things where it operates behind the scenes and it's composed of people like Ezekiel Stain, the son of Obadiah Stain, I think it is, like Shinjin Harada, the guy who runs the Yoshida Corporation. He's basically Silver Samurai. It's Kingpin. You know, it's Sebastian Shaw of the Hellfire Club. It's these extremely wealthy individuals. Now, they're 
They're all here talking to Dario Agger, but the reason why this meeting was convened was actually for the purpose of allowing somebody else to basically get in here and to capture Dario Agger. Now, the person who comes in here and basically assaults him is a woman by the name of Miss Midas. Now, Oublier Minus is a weird character. I mean, she's the daughter of Midas himself, and Midas was literally a guy that had his namesake where he had the Midas touch. Everything he touched physically turned to gold, and it didn't matter what it is. Whatever he touched would turn to gold. I think that maybe Thor's hammer was an exception, but honestly, he was such an obscure character, you'd be hard pressed to find an instance, you know, Midas fighting Thor. I mean, he was super obscure. Obscure. It was really crazy. Really, Original Sin was like the biggest role he had in Marvel Comics, right? But at the time, or at least as far as the story goes anyway, the capture of Dario Agar is for the purpose of the fact that, remember, he's operating with Malekith. For those of you guys who are just joining us in the realm of Jason Aaron's Thor, the way that he had basically played this out, a lot of this went into the events before Secret Wars, and it just kind of kept on going, like most of the Marvel stories did. But it was basically this scenario where there's a company called Roxxon Oil. And Roxxon is a super seedy corporation. I mean, they have their hands in everything. Corruption, gambling, crime you know all, all different kinds of stuff but as long as it makes them money they don't really care what it is they've got lawyers on top of lawyers on top of lawyers that will get them out of any legal problem and if lawyers cannot get them out of problems then they'll go through illegal channels to make that happen but again they're just a very seedy corporation but Dario Agar is the guy who's running the show here what happened was in the realm of Asgard with all the other realms and everything in terms of their mythology one of the dark elves named Malekith a longtime villain in the Thor mythos had basically begun the process of going through through and conquering all the realms. And the idea here was to essentially, and we'll get a little more into this here in a second, but the idea was to basically go to Roxxon Oil and to use Roxxon Oil's resources. In response, Roxxon said, we'll provide you with whatever you need, tanks, guns, armor, the whole nine yards to conquer these different realms. We'll give you what you need, but what we want is to be able to mine all the rare minerals from these realms so we can sell them at a premium on Earth because nobody would be able to gain access to them otherwise. And you gotta keep in mind, in the realm of the dwarves, that's where Uru metal is. That's the material that forged Thor's hammer. And so if Roxxon Oil shows up on Earth and says, hey guys, here's this material that rivals adamantium and strength, they would make boatloads of money off it because you'd have tanks, you'd have guns, you'd have knives, all of which are just as durable as adamantium, but also possess the ability to basically harness magic. It'd be like everybody's running around with their own version of Thor's hammer. It'd be crazy in terms of what it would be capable of. But that was the deal that Roxxon Oil struck. Now, what we also had was Loki going on, but we'll get to him here in a second. With in regards to Jane Foster's character, again, you know, one of the things that Jason Aaron focuses on in a lot of ways is kind of this ongoing subplot that everybody's trying to figure out who the new Thor is. And in this instance, we basically have S.H.I.E.L.D. that takes Jane Foster prisoner and just kind of, you know, really interrogates her for a little while. Now, of course, they're asking questions. Who's Thor? What do you know about Thor? What can you tell us? Are you Thor? And of course, Jane Foster's like, this is ridiculous. You know, there's no way that I'm Thor. I'm literally a woman who's dying of cancer. Now, in terms of Jane Foster's character, because a lot of people have asked me about this, how is it that she's Thor? and she's dying of cancer. What happens is that Jane Foster, of course, as a cancer patient, undergoes chemotherapy. The issue is that whenever she becomes Thor, it purges the chemotherapy from her body. And so when she turns back into Jane Foster again, she's effectively set back to square one. Not that her cancer goes into remission while she's Thor. It's basically that her cancer is just incurable. When she gets a treatment, the treatment's wiped away. And so her cancer just keeps progressing. Now, what this is Jason Aaron doing is basically setting a ticking clock. He's saying it's only a matter of time before Jane Foster Foster will inevitably pass on, and then most likely Odin's son will take her place again, going back to being Thor. So it's really kind of him saying, hey, this is just a cool experiment. It might last five years, it might last 10 years, but it's not going to last forever. It'll probably end when Jason Aaron's run on Thor ends, to be quite frank. That's usually what a lot of writers do. But for the sake of this discussion, we basically have another character come along named Roz Solomon. Now, Roz Solomon, again, has also been a huge part of the Thor mythos. She's been around for quite some time. And in fact, when Jane Foster Thor first showed up, a lot of people thought it was Roz Solomon. Just because of the fact that she was a character that had this kind of on again, off again, teasing of romance between her and Odin's son. She was a huge fan for quite some time. And so people figured if it was going to be anybody, it would be Roz Solomon because she's the most likely person to be a hero because she was such a huge, you know, environmental advocate. She's a shield agent. She has access to resources. She has the means to basically travel to the moon if she wanted to and pick up Thor's hammer. There was a lot of speculation going on there. And Jason Aaron really played on that. I mean, it was constantly being teased. Is that possible? But the fact remains here that with Roz Solomon being a shield agent, she essentially shows up and says, Jane Foster, you're free to go. There's no way you're possibly Thor. Because remember, Roz doesn't know that Jane Foster's Thor. She has no clue. I mean, we as the reader only recently found out around the time this story was released, we'd only recently found out that Jane Foster was Thor. So basically no one knows the truth of the matter. Now, of course, Jane Foster basically grabs her hammer. She ends up taking over the hammer herself.
herself. But in the midst of all this, we essentially have Ross Solomon traveling to the location of Dario Agar almost immediately after he's taken by Miss Midas and Silver Samurai. And the result of this is that Ross Solomon comes to the realization that there is a plan that's been enacted called the Agar Imperative. Now, the Agar Imperative will become prevalent here in a little bit, but it's basically like a doomsday plan is really all it is. But at this point, we basically transition to Loki because keep in mind, in volume one in Thunder in Her Veins, Loki had basically killed, or at least it looked like he had killed All Mother. It looked like he had killed the wife of Odin. And because of this, you know, with Freya basically being incapacitated here, there really doesn't seem to be anybody, or at least there wasn't anybody who was running the throne until, you know, Borson had basically taken over it. Now, again, Borson was this guy who was basically the serpent. He was the unknown brother of Odin that no one knew about. And the story Fear itself actually introduced him. But over the course of Marvel's publication history, he'd more or less just become kind of like a general, you know, a leader among the ranks of Odin's forces on Asgard. But, you know, with Odin essentially running the show and then eventually being cast out and replaced by Freya, what Loki says is that because Freya was on the throne, she was a, a caring leader. She was basically a person that looked out and said, as Asgard, we are, despite it being self-appointed, the protector of all the realms. We have to protect all of them. We have to make sure that evil does not run amok in the realms, even if for no other reason than to make sure that some force doesn't rise up that can basically kill all of us. And so because of that, what Malekith was basically looking for was to have Cole Borson appointed as leader or to have Odin go back as leader. And the reason why was because their only concern would be Asgard. And so by the time Malekith had gone on his campaign, began taking over all the nine realms, by the time that Cole Borson or Odin had looked around and said, hey, we need to do something, it would have been too late. The forces of Malekith with the help of Roxxon would have been bolstered to the degree that there would have been nothing that the Asgardians could have done. And so Loki says, hey, look, I had to make sure that Malekith and his guys trusted me. I had to make sure that if I told them I'm part of your dark council, they'll legitimately believe it. And killing you was the only way that it could be done. Now, of course, we basically have Odin pushing his own energies into Freya in order to keep her alive and try to bring her back. But the idea here is that this is really Jason Aaron saying, hey, when it came to the idea of Loki killing Freya, when we read through the comic and it was like, my God, you know, Loki killed his mom. It wasn't him being vindictive. It wasn't Loki being evil. It was Loki trying to earn the trust of Malekith and, uh, and Dario Agar in order to basically subvert them from within, to effectively work against them and cast them out to protect Asgard. Because keep in mind, when it comes to the character of Loki, there are events like Ragnarok, right? You know, where Loki is basically the one that ends up invading Asgard and tearing it all down. But that's the fate of Loki. Whenever it comes to anybody else who tries to attack Asgard, who tries to tear it all down, Loki's almost always one of the first people on the lines to say, no, that's my job. <laughs> that's my purpose to take out Asgard. If anybody's going to bring this kingdom crashing down, it's going to be me. Now, again, because of the fact of this Agar imperative, this is essentially a scenario where we basically have Agar, who effectively took Roxxon Island, this giant island that kind of floats up in the sky, and essentially set it so that if he dies, the island will come crashing down into New York. It'll literally just kind of rise up into the sky and then come crashing back down again. And that's really the whole basis here. Now, that's the whole protocol that's basically being enacted by Miss Midas and by a Silver Samurai. Now, for a little bit here, we really just kind of get some fighting going on. I mean, we get some threatening from Miss Midas towards Dario Agar. We have Silver Samurai going against Jane Foster Thor. There's not a whole lot going on here, but there are a few things to take note of. Most notably, the reason why Miss Midas did this was for the basis of the fact that she was just kind of angry at the fact that Agar was working with Malekith. He was going to take the resources of the Ten Realms and then use it for himself. And what this means is that because of the money that he would have possessed, assuming that all this worked and he actually was able to sell off these resources, he would have literally been able to come along and just shut out everybody else. I mean, Kingpin would have gone broke. Fisk Industries would have gone down. Yoshida Industries would have gone down. Midas Industries, they all would have basically been purchased, become subsidiaries of Roxxon, or they would have just been pushed out to the point where they couldn't make any money and they would all go broke. And so it's literally just corporate espionage is really all this is. That's really what it comes down to. But the fact remains that in the midst of all this, with Roxxon Island effectively floating above the sky, the question they have to ask Jane Foster, she has to ask herself, do I really help the leader of my greatest enemy? If Roxxon Oil is essentially working alongside Malekith to conquer the Ten Realms, to literally try to conquer Asgard, is Jane Foster really going to put herself in a position where she's going to have to now help the leader of Roxxon Oil in order to spare millions of people who would be killed if he were to die and Roxxon Island were to come crashing down into New York? And the answer to that question is yes. It's really one of these things where she has to make a small sacrifice now for the greater good later on. Now, that's why Jason Aaron's stories are really cool. I mean, granted, this is really just kind of like a filler volume. So, I mean, it's not like there's greatness going on here. It's not like people are going to look at Lords of Midgard and say, this is one of the greatest stories ever told. It's filler content, but it goes towards bolstering the character and building the character of 
Jane Foster. When it comes to the idea of Jane versus Odin's son, I mean, outside the realm of the comic book stories itself, Jane Foster Thor is outselling Odin's son Thor by leaps and bounds. It's almost night and day, and it's crazy how popular she is right now. But in terms of the stories themselves, Odin's son was a pretty two-dimensional character. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot to him. He would show up, he'd beat people up with his hammer, and then he would leave. That was really it. I mean, there weren't that many great stories. You know, off the top of my head, the only stories that really stood out when it came to Odin's son's character was basically everything written by Jason Aaron. <laughs> From God Butcher going forward, his story saw these huge three-dimensional shifts in character to where he was far more interesting than he had ever been. But by that point, it was too little too late. You know, I mean, you had a few things like Thor Ragnarok, you know, you had J. Michael Straczynski's Thor, which is pretty cool. And, and in truth, if I ever decide to start Thor comics, I'll probably pick up with uh, Ragnarok and then just start working forward from Straczynski's Thor like I did with the Incredible Hulk and Greg Pak's run. But the idea here is that Jane Foster's not that way. Jane Foster's conflicted. She struggles. She's an average human being who was imbued with the power of Thor. Odin's son was always the son of Odin. I mean, he was born the son of Odin. He was cocky. He was arrogant. He was cast out. His consciousness was forced into the body of a guy named Donald Blake, and he had to rediscover himself, which is how we were introduced to Thor in Marvel Comics. But he was always the son of Odin. He never really had to deal with like what it meant to really understand humanity on a fundamental scale because he's not human. He wasn't born human. With Jane Foster, it's very much the opposite. She's a woman dying of cancer, so she's basically facing her death every single day. She's a woman that realizes every time she becomes Thor, it continues her path towards dying, that it doesn't stave it off. Now, the question is, why doesn't she just stay Thor forever? Well, in truth, it would just kind of take away from the story if she did, but it creates a very dynamic situation. It creates some really strong dichotomies between being a god and being a human and what it means for the character. And so because of that, you know, with her sitting down and her basically saying, I've got to save the guy that is basically going to try to conquer Asgard, it prolongs the conflict. It kind of keeps things going. But at the same time, it also creates a cool situation because when she arrives on the scene, her arrival takes place at the same time that Dario Agar basically turns into his Minotaur form. Now, for those of you guys who don't know a whole lot about Dario Agar, he's basically a guy that has kind of this weird history, but essentially he was a kid at nine years old, saw his family killed, prayed to a Minotaur, a Minotaur statue in a cave, really. And the result was that he was imbued with the ability to become a Minotaur at will. Now, of course, he got his revenge on pirates and, and so on and so forth, but it created this situation where he was more or less this physical equivalent to Thor in a lot of ways where they would fight. But it was also this situation where he kind of had his Hulk-esque persona. It was kind of like a Hulk transformation for the character of Dario Agar. But it was basically a way to take this CEO guy uh, who could be more than just some face of a very seedy company and actually make him a dangerous individual. So metaphorically, it's kind of like an outward manifestation of the danger that Roxxon represents. But, you know, when Jane Foster shows up, of course, it's kind of the battle between the two of them. But we also have Miss Midas effectively loading a bullet with her father's blood. Now, again, Oublier does not have the irradiated blood that her father did. So she cannot physically touch things and turn them to gold. But because of the fact that her father died, because she preserved a fragment of his blood, when the original sin event happened and she basically took over her father's role, we didn't know what the future held for her character. And in fact, really, a lot of us just didn't really care. But, <laughs> and I don't mean to sound cynical here. It's just that nobody really sat down and said, man, I really can't wait to see what happens with the Midas Corporation. It was just one of those things that nobody ever thought about, which actually, you know, kudos to Jason Aaron for using her in such an interesting way. But because of the fact that her father's blood was irradiated, she was basically able to fire a bullet off and she essentially went to go shoot Dario Agar with the idea that if he dies, it'll bring everything crashing down. Now, the larger goal that she has, I mean, when it comes to Miss Midas, the bigger goal she has is, yeah, a few million people are going to die. She doesn't care about that. What she does care about is the fact that Roxxon Oil is a publicly traded company, which means that if Roxxon Island comes crashing down into New York, investors, people who have money in the company are going to pull out and its shares are going to be virtually worthless and the company's going to go under. So it's really just a way to kill Dario Agar, which would result in the destruction of Roxxon's own company. It would just bring it all crashing down. Now, here's the irony of all this, is that despite the fact that they are mortal enemies, Jane Foster and Miss Midas are basically working for the same goal. They're just going about it two different ways. They both want to bring Roxxon oil down. And if this was any other situation, if it was any other scenario, if, you know, Roxxon Island was just sitting out in the Pacific somewhere, Jane Foster probably would have let Dario Agar die. She probably would have been like, well, your time's up, man. Sorry about your luck. But because of the fact that it would jeopardize millions of innocent lives, where Miss Midas is like, hey, let's just go ahead and kill him. Jane Foster steps up and catches the bullet. Now, the response here is that because of the fact that the bullet, again, has the blood of Dr. Midas and it'll turn anything it touches into gold, it starts doing that with Jane Foster to a degree. Now, this is where things get crazy because didn't we suddenly have 
Jane Foster showing up to help Thor. And this is where Jason Aaron again sort of saying, hey guys, like, are we sure that Jane Foster's Thor? Yeah, I know you think she's Thor, but do we know for a fact that she's actually Thor? Again, we know right now Jane Foster is Thor. And in fact, that gets revealed at the end of all this. But with the actual Jane Foster showing up, Jane Foster Thor looks at her and says, who the hell are you? Like, <laughs> how are you here? Because, you know, you're me, <laughs> I'm Jane Foster, how do we square this circle? Now really, before any questions are asked, and even then, you know, these S.H.I.E.L.D. agents that are here that are still trying to figure out what the connection is between Jane Foster and Thor, they're just kind of like, well, if they're both here in the same place and it's clear that Jane Foster isn't Thor, Dr. Jane Foster, being a doctor for so long, basically, you know, plucks the bullet out of Thor and is like, you are cool, you are healed. The problem with this is that Roxxon Island crashes into a S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier and it just sends everything sort of awry. Now, under normal circumstances, this wouldn't be a huge deal. But it becomes a huge deal. And the reason why is because in the midst of everything, you know, shaking, rattling, kind of panicking and going awry, we suddenly have Jane Foster accidentally dropping the bullet that landed in Thor's hand. And so what this does is it turns the entirety of Roxxon Island into gold. And it literally just brings it crashing down. Now, the reason for this is just simple gravity and weight. That's really all it is. I mean, the idea that the island is now made of gold means the gravitational pull of the planet is far more intense than it normally would have been. Gold is a lot heavier than rock and soil and so on and so forth. And so because of that, it just comes crashing down. Now, of course, Jane Foster is able to keep this from happening. Jane Foster at least seems to be what amounts to destroy the island when she basically takes it and throws it into the sun, which is really kind of cool here. But as a follow-up to this, as the reader, questions were lingering. I mean, you have Dario Agar who's basically taken, or at least it seems like he's gonna be taken by S.H.I.E.L.D., but in the end, the lawyers more or less get him out. But the question that people had, that we as the reader had, is if we have Jane Foster here and we have Thor here, then who the hell is Thor? And this is when we basically learn that this physical manifestation of Jane Foster was created by the hammer. It was established by the hammer. The hammer basically created this physical construct of Jane Foster, and that's what let everybody know what's going on. Now, what also happened here is that Thor basically sits down with Ross Solomon and says, no, 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 that was a manifestation of the hammer. I am Jane Foster. And this is when Thor reveals her true identity to Ross Solomon. And this was really kind of like, wow, this was crazy. Now, from here, this is basically Jason Aaron moving into the process of revealing that the hammer was alive because again people didn't really know what was going on and even Ross Solomon asked the question if the hammer of his own volition made a construct of Jane Foster in order to throw shield off your scent as well as allow you to be treated without anybody asking questions then does that mean the hammer is alive and that's when the hammer grabs Jane Foster and they whisk off and that's when we get into my video on uh, the untold origin of Mjolnir so for those of you guys who are wondering how these two dots get connected those of you guys who are wondering how we got from point A to point B with regards to what at least at the time was believed to be Lords of Midgard and then the story of the untold origin of Thor's hammer. That's how we got here. But again, that was my mistake. You know, I, I screwed up with regards to the titling. What I think I'm going to do as well is maybe start a Thor playlist. The only problem that with doing that right now is it'd be kind of jumping the gun just because of the fact that at the moment, I probably won't really be covering a lot of Thor stuff until we get around to like the release of Ragnarok. And that doesn't come out until November. So, you know, there'll be a huge Thor dump at around that time. But until then, I think I might just go ahead and toss this into the all new, all different Marvel playlist. That's down in the description if you guys are interested in seeing it. But yeah, I mean, again, this is really just kind of Jason Aaron filling things. It's really him just saying, hey guys, we got to get from point A to point B. So here's the bridge that we use. Here's how we get from those two spots. And again, from that point going forward, really from the untold origin of Mjolnir going forward, that's where things get cool. Plus we also have Unworthy Thor, which is amazing, but enough rambling for me. <laughs> Okay, members of the Rob Corps, I gotta be straight up with you guys. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you guys. I like Jane Foster Thor more than Odin's son. I'm just gonna say it. I think she is a better Thor than he was. I think she's more interesting. I think seeing the struggle, you know, with her trying to figure out how to use the hammer, I think the idea that almost everybody in Asgard sees her as a thief and a liar because she's wielding a personal weapon used by Odin's son for the longest time, I think all of those things make her more interesting and intriguing than Odin's son. However, unworthy Thor is probably the best Thor-based story that Jason Aaron has written so far. Granted, it is one giant epic. I mean, Unworthy Thor will just be considered, for the most part, a tie-in to what's going on with Thor, but it basically sees to us the return of Odin's son back to the main Marvel Universe, and pres presumably the role he's going to play going forward. But it is a beautifully crafted story. And the reason why is because as Jason Aaron sitting down and saying, okay, look, a lot of you guys got on board with Thor with all new, all different Marvel. So all you've known is Jane Foster Thor. Whereas he also says, a 
lot of people out there really loved Odin's son. So let's give them the Odin's son they want. Let's give them the Odin's son they know and love. He won't have the hammer of Thor, but let's return to familiarity regarding his character and why people dig him so much. Now, again, we initially pick up with this in this little ship thing. And remember, we talked about this with, with Jane Foster, Thunder in Her Veins, the first story arc that she had as part of all new, all different Marvel. But all we really knew was that Odin's son was being held captive. And it was just like a, you know, a one or two page final showing from, from Jason Aaron, basically teasing the upcoming unworthy Thor story, the story that we're going through right now. And of course, we know that Thor had been held captive by these guys. And that was kind of the cool thing here is because what Jason Aaron does is he bases a lot of what it is that Thor's capable of on his hammer. And even with Thor himself, in terms of how he relates to what he can and can't do, very much what's going to be happening here is the hammer is going to basically be what makes Thor who he is. And that's going to be the, the funny thing about this is because Jason Aaron is going to kind of play on this, right? Like there are fans who say, no, Thor Odin's son is Thor, all right? Thor is not like a title. Thor is a name. Well, Jason Aaron say, no, I mean, I'm writing the book and the character is whatever I say he is because I'm writing him at the moment. It's Odin's son. Thor is a title. Captain America is a title. Iron Man is a title. Thor is a title. And it works out well. I mean, it all comes together pretty well in terms of, you know, how the character functions and how he sees himself and the type of story that we get. But the fact remains here that it's constantly an attempt to free himself. And that's where Thor really kind of reflects on his role so far. He basically says, look, I'm a half measure. I don't have the hammer. I can't fly. I'm just a guy fighting as best I can. Now, keep in mind, just because Thor doesn't have the hammer doesn't mean that he's like a normal human being. I mean, the whole Thor, Blake, you know, uh, Donald Blake thing, that's long since been gone. That was really kind of cast off after Ragnarok. I mean, that was a holdover from really before Thor disassembled and the events leading up to Civil War, you know, the, the first Civil War. But after Ragnarok, the Donald Blake Thor concept was basically kind of thrown out the window. It appeared here and there, but Jason Aaron has very much just kind of left that era of Thor's publication history behind. So what we have here is basically just a super strong, super durable Asgardian. Thor is really kind of who he is because he's the greatest warrior of the Asgardians. But Thor is not intrinsically better than any other Asgardian, with the exception of strength and speed and so on and so forth. But what we also get here is Thor basically attempting to capture the hammer of ultimate Thor. Now we'll find out exactly what this hammer is capable of. But the cool thing about this is that remember during the Secret War story of Thors, where we basically had all these different Thors from across the multiverse that were operating as the police force of Battle World under the rule of God King Doom, of, of Doctor Doom, that in this major battle, in this major conflict, ultimate Thor's hammer had been thrown from the realm of Battle World, had broken through reality and landed on Asgard in the, you know, the main Marvel universe. And so because of this, it had just been sitting there ever since. Now, in reality, this was basically Jason Aaron saying, okay, let's take this ultimate hammer of Thor and let's just set it aside for a second so we can come back to it later on. That's basically all he was doing there. But the ultimate hammer of Thor is different in terms of determining who can wield it and who can't than the main Marvel hammer of Thor. And we'll talk about that, that difference here in a second. But what we do is we actually jump back to three months prior to this point. And again, this is really Thor just kind of dealing with the fact that he does not have the ability to wield his hammer anymore. And more so than that, this is also Thor dealing with the recollection or dealing with the realization that there is a new Thor. Remember, this comes after, you know, Jane Foster had become Thor. Now keep in mind, Odin's son does not know that Jane Foster's Thor. All he knows is the hammer chose someone. There's only like three people. The number of people who know are extremely small. Odin's son is not one of them. In lieu of Jane Foster being Thor, Odin's son's just kind of doing what he can to be the warrior that he considered himself to be. And so it's really just kind of him showing up on the moon, fighting against some trolls, you know, wearing them out. But it's also Jason Aaron sitting down and saying, everyone knows that Odin's son cannot wield his hammer anymore. Everybody knows that he's not Thor anymore, that a new person is Thor. And so there's a lot of taunting that goes on here. A lot of people saying like, you know, you're, you're a half measure. You're, if you're not worthy of your own hammer, why should we worry about you? Now, of course, Thor proves his metal in the sense that he still has a uh, Yarmbjorn. Now keep in mind, Yarmbjorn was established to be a magically enchanted axe during the Uncanny Avengers one-off when Thor fought, uh, fought Apocalypse. That told us the story of why it is that Yarmbjorn is enchanted with magic that allows it to be extremely durable and cut through everything up to celestial armor. So it's still a formidable weapon and Thor is still a very capable warrior. He just doesn't have all the attributes that come along with his hammer. So flight and different things like that. This is very much, you know, him kind of dealing with, with where he stands in the realm of, you know, not having his normal powers. Now, again, this also takes place during the War of the Nine Realms. So keep in mind, you know, we still have Malekith, you know, alongside Loki and the these guys basically trying to conquer all the different realms uh, that are part of Asgard. And so because of that, it creates a really interesting situation because there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. Now, we've covered a lot of that stuff in, in, uh, in, in all new, all different Marvel. Of course, you'll find those videos down in the description, but we've covered a lot of that stuff. So you guys don't have to worry about feeling kind of left out. You can check out those videos.
videos and see what's going on in the background of all this. But again, this is Jason building up to the whisper of Nick Fury, what it was that Nick Fury said to Thor that made him unworthy. And so Thor kind of ponders this for a minute, but then he's visited by the unseen. And that's the cool thing because Jason Aaron really seems to be the only person, you know, aside from Brian Michael Bendis at the moment anyway, you know, they really seem to be the only two people who are referencing events from before Secret Wars. Everybody seems to be kind of focusing on the aftermath of Secret Wars, which is fine. I mean, it's kind of refreshing to get a little bit of both. You know, there were a lot of things that took place before Secret Wars, a lot of unresolved plot points that I really would like to have seen answered. And this is one of them. For those of you guys who never saw my videos on Original Sin, uh, you know, during that story, it was basically revealed that Nick Fury killed the Watcher, the original Nick Fury, the, the white Nick Fury, basically, that he had killed the Watcher. In return, Nick Fury had basically become this inherent bad guy. We learned things like different iterations of Nick Fury that all the superheroes had seen on Earth. That was never the real Nick Fury. The real Nick Fury was just sitting on a satellite orbiting the planet Earth that nobody knew about because it had stealth technology and so on. And all the other Nick Furies that people were seeing were just life model decoys. And so because of this, you know, at the end of the story, Nick Fury was basically kind of cast out. He was more or less killed, kind of, you know, resurrected, but he was basically the new watcher. He's what's called the unseen, meaning he sees everything. Now, the reason why he's called the unseen is because it fits perfectly into Marvel's stance right now that, you know, not everybody's paying attention to it. And so whenever you're going through a story that takes place on the moon and you don't see Nick Fury there, it's like, well, he's the unseen, you know, that kind of thing. But the fact remains here that, again, this is Nick Fury basically saying, look, I've seen everything. I mean, I saw the collapse of the multiverse. I saw the rebirth of the multiverse. But in the time between those two events, I saw a hammer leave one reality and arrive in this reality. It's basically Nick Fury telling Odinson, there's another hammer. There's another hammer out there for you to pick up. And so what this does is it basically leads into the idea that we're going to see Odinson wielding the hammer of Ultimate Thor. And that is amazing because Ultimate Thor was so cool. One of the coolest things that Marvel did, to kind of sidetrack here for a second, one of the coolest things that Marvel did in the Ultimate Universe when it came to Thor is they danced around the idea in the early days of whether or not he was actually Thor. Maybe he was just a crazy guy. You know, maybe it was just he was being possessed or something like that. Because remember, the Ultimate Universe was designed to be very realistic. There were stories that weren't that great. There were stories that were just kind of like, all right, this is ridiculous. Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver were a perfect example. <laughs> but, you know, there were also some great moments too. And Ultimate Thor was pretty solid. But what we also end up doing is we basically pick up with Thor arriving in Asgard. Now, this has been a big source of contention. And the reason why is because it's confused a lot of people. So here's how things went. With regards to the Thor landscape, Asgard is both a specific like place that you can stand on, like an actual landmass, and it's a realm at the same time. So think about it like, like New York, right? Like you have New York State and you have New York City. New York State is like the realm of Asgard. New York City is Asgard itself. So it's both a place and an actual geographical location at the same time. But old Asgard has essentially just vanished and nobody knows where it went to. No one has any idea. Not only that, Odin's son is visited by Beta Ray Bill. And that's why this is such a great story is because it's Jason Aaron hitting all the marks of classic Thor storytelling, classic Thor publications. Now, those of you guys who don't know, Thor fans will swear by Beta Ray Bill. <laughs> it's the one character they want to see in a Thor story. There are some Thor fans out there, and I don't know why anybody would want to see this, but there are some Thor fans out there who would rather see Beta Ray Bill than the Incredible Hulk and Thor Ragnarok. Now, I want to see the Incredible Hulk and Thor Ragnarok because Thor Ragnarok is basically going to be Planet Hulk with Thor. But it's going to be a cool story. But Beta Ray Bill was basically the first person in Marvel Comics to wield the hammer of Thor. And that's why he's so significant. He was the first person to pick it up. Now, of course, Beta Ray Bill was basically a warrior guardian of his race called the Corbinites, and they were basically on the brink of extinction. They were literally leaving their home and trying to find a new one. And so when Thor first encountered Beta Ray Bill after being told by Nick Fury, there's some vessel entering our atmosphere, go check it out and see what's going on. Beta Ray Bill and Thor fought, not because Beta Ray Bill was a bad guy, but because he was trying to protect his people. And so because of that he was inherently a good guy fighting for the right reasons and that worthiness allowed him to pick up the hammer of Thor. Ever since then, Beta Ray Bill has had the saga of Beta Ray Bill, you know, a six issue miniseries, so on and so forth, but he's always been an intrinsic part of Thor's landscape. But what Beta Ray Bill does is he offers Thor his hammer called Stormbreaker. Now, because of the fact that, that Beta Ray Bill was a worthy candidate for the hammer of Thor when they first met, what Odin did is have the two of them fight over the worthiness of who is allowed to wield the hammer of Thor. Now, of course, in return, you know, once it was all said and done, once the battle was finished, Odin's son had, had Beta Ray Bill, you know, given a hammer, had a hammer forged for him that was basically called Stormbreaker. And so in a lot of ways, Stormbreaker is much like Thor's hammer. But Thor's, you know, his hammer is a little special, you know, it's kind of something that's unique to himself. But the two of them are basically teaming up here. The reason why is because Beta Ray Bill says, look, I know who, who it was that took Asgard. We have to go and we have to find them. Now, of course, once they locate where Asgard is, we actually end up finding out that it was the collector. It was Tandelier Tavan that took Asgard. Now, the reason why is because of the fact that basically the 
the hammer of Ultimate Thor landed on Asgard, and only a person who can wield the hammer can pick it up. And so it's a cool question that's going to be asked here in a second. But in the midst of their journey, so on and so forth, again, Thor is constantly succumbing to these dreams. You know, he's constantly having these nightmares, you know, whenever he's knocked out or something along those lines. And the nightmare he experiences comes at the hands of Gore the God Butcher. Now, God Butcher was a story that basically dealt with a guy named Gore who had come to the belief that gods, people who fancied themselves gods, were basically guilty of hubris. They were guilty of extreme arrogance. And so because of that, Gore basically went on this campaign to kill every single god he could find. Now, Gore is going to be a recurring theme in this story. But of course, Thor is basically being held here by Tanalir Tavan, by the Collector. And the reason why is because the Collector says, I can't lift the hammer of Thor off the old city of Asgard, so I took the old city of Asgard, which of course kind of answers the question, you know, if Thor is wielding his hammer, can somebody pick up Thor? This is also Thor coming to the realization that there is another hammer to be used here. Now, of course, this is also the Collector being pretty, pretty evil here. Now, keep in mind, when it comes to the elders of the universe, they're basically the last of their races. I mean, you know, they, they've existed for billions and billions of years, but they're also wildly powerful. You know, the Collector is extremely powerful. Energy projection, super strength, durability. But despite all his vaunted abilities, he cannot lift the hammer. And the reason why is because with Ultimate Thor, anybody who tries to lift the hammer and is unworthy dies. They're basically killed by the hammer. And that's the difference. With the main Marvel Universe Thor, if you were to go and try to pick up his hammer, it just wouldn't lift. I mean, you just wouldn't be able to lift it. In the Ultimate Universe, it'll kill you. So you better choose wisely. <laughs> but it's kind of a cool story. It's kind of a cool a cool set of circumstances. But that's what that's what Collector says. Now, of course, the Collector being as powerful as he is, tried to pick up the hammer. He was administered the same kind of damaging shock you know, as anybody else who tried to pick it up. But because of his durability, he just wasn't killed. He basically said it was just a crushing experience. But again, he basically kind of torments and tortures Thor by way of threatening to kill the last of a race of people. Because remember, the Collector basically collects trinkets, things, you know, the last of something. If there's the last member of a race, you know, and there will never be any other members of that race in the universe, the Collector will try to collect them. Because of this, the the collector's question is basically, how do I lift that hammer? There has to be a way to pick it up because what happens is the collector basically says, look, if I can wield this hammer, then I'll be all powerful. I can conquer worlds. I'll be virtually unstoppable. And that's true. If a normal person, you know, if, if a, a regular human being like Jane Foster were to pick it up, it would make her capable. It would make her as powerful as Thor. If someone like Thanos or someone like the collector were to pick it up, it would make them nigh unstoppable. Now, that's really the goal of the collector is to capture the hammer of Thor to use it for his own ends. Now, at this point, we pick up with the Triskelion. Now, this story basically kind of stretches over a period of time, and so what it does is it basically takes place before the events of Civil War II, during the events of Civil War II, and after the events of Civil War II. The great thing about this is that with the exception of Thanos, there are no other references to Civil War II, so we don't have to worry about the, the greatness of the story being drugged down by Civil War II being as bad as it was. But, you know, what we basically do is we have somebody who's cloaked visiting Thanos, because remember, when Ulysses of the Inhumans was basically looking into the future and saw that Thanos was going going to arrive here, you know, after the death of uh, James Rhodes, Thanos is basically taken prisoner and held inside the Triskelion. The problem here is that we don't know who this person is that's visiting Thanos, and we won't find out until the end of the story. But again, we kind of switch back to the modern day, you know, to, the, to this moment right now, and this is really kind of Jason Aaron just building up the roster of, of Thor characters, you know, in the sense of saying, hey, look, you've got like Thor, which is basically a Hellhound. For those of you guys who don't know, Hellhound is just basically one of the many things that exists inside the realm of Hell, but what had happened is that Hellhound had basically been engineered his escape during the events of Angela, Queen of Hell. Now, there's there's a lot of small things that are being hit here over the course of this. And so what, we're, what we're gonna do, at least what I plan to do, is basically, you know, run over the Thor stories the same way I did the Incredible Hulk. And we'll probably do that once we get closer to the release of Thor Ragnarok, because what I'll do is the actual Ragnarok story, and then we'll pick up with J. Michael Straczynski's Thor when Odin's son came back to life, and all the publications that went through after that, eventually getting into Jason Aaron's run up to the modern day. It'll take us a little while to do, but, you know, I think we're gonna do that the same way we did with, uh, with the Incredible Hulk. I don't think it'll be as long as the Incredible Hulk playlist, but you know, that's that's something that I had kind of planned on doing. But again, it's constantly Thor trying to break his way out. It's constantly Thor trying to make his escape. Now again, Beta Ray Bill eventually comes back to his rescue because remember, you know, once Thor had realized that the Collector had stolen old Asgard, Thor just kind of raced off without Beta Ray Bill. Now with regards to his goat Tooth Nasher, you know, he was captured, Odin's son was captured, and he's just been held ever since. But with Beta Ray Bill arriving to free Thor, this is where we begin to see Jason Aaron kind of tapping into how Thor views his hammer. Instead of Thor looking at his hammer and saying, here is an object that can help me achieve my goals, Thor is addicted to his hammer. Thor needs his hammer. It's very much a drug for him. And the reason we know this is because of the fact that when Beta Ray Bill shows up, this is the first time Thor has seen him in quite some time. Remember, we had that kind of three month jump. So Thor was basically captured by the collector. He's been held for the last three months and now he's seeing Beta Ray Bill again. And so be 
because of that, as soon as he sees Beta Ray Bill, his mind snaps back to the first time that he and Beta Ray Bill first met when Bill took the hammer of Thor and said, the hammer is now mine. Odin's son freaks out and goes into the warrior's madness. And let me tell you something, Rock Four. The warrior's madness is a sight to behold. It's one of the coolest things. Basically what happens here is Thor, it's, it's like it's like Berserker Hulk, right? Like Thor does not care what happens. Thor's like, anybody who's in my path is going to die. I don't care who they are. He'll have, his, he'll have his heart set on a goal. He'll be like, I'm trying to get from A to B. Everybody is in my way between A and B. So he'll snap into the warrior's madness. He'll kill everybody in his path and then get to B. Not only that, when this close figure had basically traveled to Thanos and asked for his aid. What we end up finding out is that his aid comes in the form of Proxima Midnight and Black Swan. Now, it is no mistake that these two characters are in this story. And the reason why is because they're going to be in Thor Ragnarok. At least, I know Proxima Midnight's gonna be in there as well as Corvus Glaive. I don't know if Black Swan is gonna be in there. I think she is. But again, Black Swan is kind of a holdover from uh, from Jonathan Hickman's events of, of Time Runs Out, you know, New Avengers and Avengers. And that's a long series. That's a, that's a whole long story about her that we're not gonna get into. Suffice it to say, she basically joined Thanos' cabal when they were going through and destroying Earth during the incursions. So she had kind of allied herself to inherently being a bad guy. Now, with regards to Proxima Midnight, she was part of Thanos Cabal during the events of Infinity. And so she's been around for quite a while too. But the idea is that they're basically part of something called the Black Order, this group of individuals that follows Thanos. Now, there's a few other people here and there, but they're really kind of like the top ones. Again, we don't we still don't know who this, this cloaked figure is, but basically what's happening is everybody is trying to track down this hammer. Everybody's trying to find this hammer of you know of ultimate Thor. And it's such a cool thing to see. And the reason why is because of the fact that when and this cloaked figure tracks down Odin's son, all she finds is Odin's son with Yarnbjorn, his battle axe, and Beta Ray Bill with Stormbreaker. Well, her initial response is, this is Stormbreaker. It's nowhere near the level of the hammer that we're looking for. I've basically led us on a wild goose chase. We have to regain our bearings and head to where we actually need to go. But in the moment when they're teleporting away, this is when uh, Beta Ray Bill basically recognizes the power that's being used here. Now, in truth, just because of the colors that are being used, just because of the colors of the person, you know, we know that this is basically Hela. That's really who this is, or at least that's who it seems to be, that it's basically Hell, the woman who previously ruled Hell, and it's since been cast out, which is kind of cool because Jason Aaron isn't really kind of sending her off to no man's land. He's keeping her in a role that still has some measure of use. Now, of course, following this, we actually have Proxima Midnight and we have Black Swan and we have this cloaked figure showing up where the collector is and basically trying to take the hammer for their own. Now, the cool thing about this is that this cloaked person, again, presuming that it's Hella, uh, basically says, look, you know, when, when Proxima Midnight and Black Swan try to go after the collector and take the hammer, you know, this cloaked figure says, you guys are running a fool's errand. The elders of the universe are extremely powerful. They're beyond us. And so if you want to go and attack one and try to take the hammer, have at it. Do your best. But in the midst of this battle, the hammer suddenly basically explodes with energy, which is an indication to basically all who were there that Odin's son is coming for the hammer. And that's the coolest thing about this is because we get this really cool moment here. We get this really cool page. We basically see Thori and we see uh, Tooth Nasher and we have Odin's son and we have Beta Ray Bill, you know, and, and Odin's son and Odin says, look, I don't care what it is that I have to do. I don't care if I have to cut through a thousand men. I don't care if I have to wade through a river of blood, but by God, that hammer will be mine. Come hell or high water, I will wield that hammer before the day is out. And so from here, we basically transition over to, again, this current battle that's taking place, where we started at the beginning of the story, which is where you basically have Odin's son and you have these different guys, uh, Odin's son and Beta Ray Bill, facing off against the forces of the Collector. And it's kind of cool to see because everybody's bidding for the hammer. With each breath they take, you know, in, in each instance where they're kind of free from the battle for a second, when they have their enemy distracted, they all try to make a run for the hammer, but no one really seems to have the ability to grab it like they need to. No one has the ability to actually harness it because somebody grabs them, stops them from pulling it off, you know, stops them from being able to harness it. Now, at this point, we switch over to really several years before any of this happened, back when Jane Foster and Thor were still very much in a relationship. Now, keep in mind, with regards to their publication history, before Jane Foster had contracted cancer and before she became Thor, she and Odin's son were lovers. And there was a point where she would spend a lot of time on Asgard. I mean, it was really kind of one of those things where Odin was, was like, I mean, I guess you could, but I always hoped you'd get with Sif. The fact remains here that with the two of them being together, that what happens is they, they basically sit down and Thor, you know, Odin's son, tells Jane Foster how he 
Steve use the hammer. And that's the coolest thing about this because this is basically Jason Aaron saying, here is the real reason why it is that Thor can't wield his hammer. What Nick Fury said was the catalyst and we'll find out what Nick Fury said, but what Nick Fury said was the catalyst. The real reason why Thor can't wield his hammer is because of self doubt. What Odin's son says is that in his mind, he's terrified of his hammer. He's afraid of his hammer. The reason being is because he doesn't know every time, you know, whenever it is that he wakes up that he'll be able to lift the hammer. His biggest fear is that every morning, you know, he'll wake up, you know, whatever morning he happens to wake up on, he'll go to reach for his hammer and he won't be able to lift it. And what this does is it basically shows that Odin's son does not view the hammer as an extension of his self because you usually don't, you know, normal people don't wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm really terrified that I won't be able to move my arm. That's not a normal thought that you have. But with, with, you know, Odin's son looking at his hammer, he doesn't see it as an extension of himself. He sees it as an object. He sees it as a tool. Now it very much is, but he has to view it as an extension of himself. Not only that, he doesn't see himself as inherently worthy. And that's the difference. Jane Foster says, you are, you know, you'll always be worthy. You're the greatest warrior I've ever known. You're tried, you're true. You do the right thing to the best of your ability is her reassuring him. But Odin's son doesn't hear it. He says, I enjoy your words. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're telling me these things. It makes me feel great, but I still do not believe that I'm, you know, inherently worthy of this hammer. I didn't choose the hammer. The hammer chose me. And that's the difference here is because with Jane Foster Thor, the hammer did initially choose her, but she doesn't see the hammer as a tool. She sees the hammer as an extension of herself. The hammer is something that helps her to achieve her goal. That's how Jane Foster sees it. She sees it as basically an ally, as a friend, whereas Odin's son saw it as just an object to be used. And that's what makes it so cool. You know, that's basically kind of Jason Aaron saying, this is the reason why he can't lift it. It's, a, it's not because he's, he's not inherently worthy. He is worthy. It's just the hammer doesn't want him to lift it anymore because it's all about how Thor views himself. Now, in terms of what sent him down this rabbit hole of actually being unworthy in the eyes of the hammer, again, we'll get to that here in a second. But what we end up doing is we basically have, you know, with Odin's son getting to this hammer at the last second, only to be intervened by Tanalir Tavan, only to be intervened by the collector. Now, of course, they grab, you know, Thor, they kind of, you know, grab Odin, so they kind of pull him back. But then we flash back to, you know, around nine months ago after it was that Odin's son was no longer able to wield his own hammer. And that's what makes this scene so ironic is because Jane Foster visits him. She's wielding the hammer, but she can't bring herself to tell Odin's son that she's the one who can wield it. Now, the reason why she can't bring herself to tell him is for a couple reasons. The first is because of the fact that in the early days of her becoming Thor, she felt like she had basically stolen something from Odin's son because the two of them had been so close. And even after they split, even after she had gotten remarried, you know, even after she'd gotten divorced, even after she had contracted cancer, she still loved Thor. And she felt like if she had his hammer, if she was running around wielding it, that it would basically be a betrayal of everything they've had. So she couldn't bring herself to say that. In addition to that, she was dealing with enough as it is with regards to Odin basically saying, you're a false Thor, you're no longer welcome in Asgard. But because Odin couldn't even lift the hammer, he couldn't take it from her. Otherwise he would have taken it from her quite some time ago. And so again, this is crushing for Jane Foster because she has to look at Odin's son for what he is and see that the issue, the reason why he couldn't lift his hammer was because he never saw himself as somebody who was intrinsically worthy. In his mind, he was just a guy who happened to be able to use it for some period of time, and the hammer simply found someone better. Now, as this battle progresses on old Asgard, we basically have Odin's son coming out on top, not necessarily killing everybody, but coming out on top and being able to basically harness the hammer. Now, in the moment which he goes to pick it up, what Jason Aaron does is he switches over to the unseen, to Nick Fury, and Nick Fury is watching this whole event unfold. He's seeing every everything happening. He doesn't tell us what it was that he said to Thor, but he sees everything happening. And he says, yes, Odin's son, this is your future. Pick up this hammer. This is who you are destined to be. Jason Aaron almost gives us that. And as I was reading through the story, I was like, no, I was so mad because Odin's son is just like, I feel, you know, I feel this hammer. I feel the power radiating in this hammer. It hasn't killed me yet. The hammer sees me as someone worthy of picking it up. Someone who could lift it. He says, look, I am Thor. I, I am the mighty Thor. I am the God of thunder. I am Thor whether I'm wielding the hammer or not. But he says, this is not my hammer. My hammer is Mjolnir. I am going to take my hammer back. Or at least it seems to be the indication that Odin's son intends to regain his hammer again to prove his worthiness. Now, of course, in this scene, he basically walks away from the hammer. He leaves the hammer behind. Now, he's still kind of radiating with a bit of the energy that he gained from the hammer while he touched it. But the fact remains that he basically leaves it behind. At the same time, he has Thori free all these different captives that have been held by uh, by the collector. And then he frees old Asgard and returns the landmass of Asgard back to the realm of Asgard. And so it's basically Jason Aaron 
kind of setting the stage and saying, we're going to essentially, you know, bring things into, into full fruition. Now, if I had to hazard a guess, what I'm thinking is that whether or not Thor gets his own hammer back is something that we don't know. But I think Thor will eventually become king of Asgard, that we will see things begin to progress to the point of what we saw at the third act of God Butcher when you have future Thor. You have old Thor that's ruling over Asgard and there are no more Asgardians. You just kind of have this irradiated earth. You know, the earth is basically barren. All life is gone. That kind of thing. It was a very bleak future. But at this point, we switch back over to the Black Quadrant, back to where Thanos is. Remember, Thanos has basically already escaped during the events leading up to and during Civil War II. But when the Black uh, the, the Black Order shows up and says, hey, look, we promised you this object. We promised you this hammer. We'll do whatever we need to do in order to find it. Thanos' response is, look, if Thor is not even worthy enough to wield his own hammer, why is he worthy enough of my my attention. I've got other things to worry about. I've got more important things to worry about than an Asgardian that can't even do something as simple as lift his own hammer. Now, this is cool because this is basically Thanos being Thanos. And that's what I loved about this story is because Jason Aaron writes Thanos so well. He does an amazing job with his character. Thanos says, look, here's the goal that I want to achieve. If that goal can't be achieved, then Thanos is like, whatever, I've got other things that I can be doing. And he just moves on to another goal. Because of that, you know, Thanos basically says, look, the idea was that this coach figure showing up on his doorstep basically said, if you get, you know, if, if you will help me, I will get you the Hammer of Thor. This person failed to show up with the Hammer of Thor. What this cloaked figure does is they basically kill Proxima Midnight. Now, with Proxima Midnight being killed, with Proxima Midnight basically being totally obliterated, with Black Swan looking to be completely killed, what ends up happening here is this person reveals herself to, again, be Hela, the former ruler of Hell. And what Hela says is, look, I can give you the one thing that you desire. I can give you the one thing you want most, more than the Infinity Gauntlet, more than the Cosmic Cube. When Thanos asks what that is, Hela says, I can give you death. And so what this is, is basically Jason Aaron sitting around and saying, this is very much still a part of the Thanos mythos, his, his, his love for death. Not only that, I would also say that this seems to be an indication that in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we probably won't actually see Mistress Death so much as we'll actually see Hela playing the role of Mistress Death. Now, we may see Mistress Death somewhere along the line, and we may actually see her. I'm just kind of guessing at this point, but it sort of makes sense that Hela, if she basically represents death, that if the Marvel Cinematic Universe turned around and you know, brought in the actual cosmic entity Mistress Death, it would confuse people because you've got the Mistress entity Death, and then you've got Hela who represents death. Which one is actually death? It would throw off your casual audience. But what ends up happening is that with old Asgard being restored, Beta Ray Bill and, and Thor sit down and kind of have this conversation, and Beta Ray Bill asks him the question, could you have actually lifted that hammer if you tried to? And Odin son says, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant. It's not my hammer to wield. And so then we have Beta Ray Bill asking the question, you know, do you believe that you are a worthy individual? And Odin's son says, no one is worthy. And when Beta Ray Bill asked him, why would you say that? This is when we get what it is that Nick Fury said to Thor. What Nick Fury said was, Gore was right. And what this did is it sent Thor into self-doubt. It sent Odin's son into self-doubt. Now, this is one of those situations where because of the fact that it's taken so long for us to get an answer, no answer you get would be good enough. So I imagine there's some people who are just going to be like, well, that answer is stupid. Well, any answer you got would be stupid. I mean, let's be honest here, guys. Like any answer you got, you would think was stupid. There would not be a good enough answer. It's just how these kind of things go. But it fits in perfectly with the Jason Aaron Thor mythos because what this does is it circles right back around to the very beginning with God Butcher. And very few writers do this. Very few writers will basically have a story, have this great big huge epic that will stretch, you know, stretch on for 20 volumes and then near the end wrap back around to the very beginning. They'll just say here's A and then here's B and then here's D and then here's C. Here's just a linear set of events and then it'll end with the person dying or something like that. That's classic storytelling. The reason why Jason Aaron stands out is because it's not classic storytelling. It's wrapping it around into one great big huge epic. And that's why I say when this is all said and done, whether or not you love Jane Foster, whether or not you love Odin's son, when Jason Aaron puts down the pen and says, and now we are finished writing, people are going to look back at, at, at his run of Thor and say, it's the greatest run there's ever been. It is the greatest Thor run that has ever existed. And as far as I'm concerned, it is. But the cool thing about this is that with Nick Fury telling Thor Gore was right, what this does is it basically sends Thor into self-doubt because Thor comes to believe that Gore was right, that the, that humanity was better off without gods, that gods are arrogant, that gods are not worth the trust that humanity puts in them. It creates kind of a cool situation here, but yeah, what this story kind of does is it basically shows us that the hammer of Thor, the hammer of, of Ultimate Thor, is picked up by somebody. We don't know who this person is, but the hammer of Thor is picked up by someone. And so because of that, this person basically dons the mantle of War Thor. Now what this means for them, we don't know. 
Okay, so getting into uh, the Asgard Shi'ar War with regards to the Mighty Thor, this is a pretty solid story. Something else to keep in mind, this also seems to take place before the events of Secret Empire, before anything happened in the main Secret Empire story. So this takes place before Secret Empire number zero and the free comic book day issue and number one, all the way up to the present day. It takes place before all that stuff. But the whole set of events that goes on here is actually pretty wild because this gives us a lot more insight into the Shi'ar empire than we previously had before now a little bit of a uh, of explanation here for those of you guys who are just now getting into thor and really just now getting into marvel comics uh the shi'ar empire is a race that dates back quite some time and it really all you know goes all the way back to when chris claremont was writing the x-men and he was looking to introduce the phoenix force and the idea was that the shi'ar empire isn't like an empire like humanity right like the human race could be considered an empire it's a very fledgling empire but it could be considered an empire the difference is that unlike the badoon or unlike the scrolls or the Kree or something like that, the Shi'ar is an amalgamation of races. It's a multitude of different races that have all come together under a single banner of the Shi'ar. Now, more often than not, the reason this is done is because of the fact that there's protection as part of the Shi'ar Empire. And that protection comes in the form of the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. When it comes to their ranks, when it comes to like their governing body, there's the Magistrix or the Emperor, whatever you want to call it, the Emperor or Empress, uh, the ones that are basically running the show. At this point in time in Marvel Comics, uh, it's actually Gladiator. And we'll get into him here in a second because he's a pretty powerful character. The other half of this is that you have the Imperial Guard, which is basically the toughest members of the of the Shi'ar race or the Shi'ar Empire that all gather together as their singular leader. Now, you've got like an inner group of the Imperial Guard, which is like the very top people, but the Imperial Guard's pretty large in size in terms of uh, how it functions and what it does because it's basically like their, their core military. It's basically like the best of their military might. I mean, they have like an armada, they've got ships, all kinds of cool stuff, but the Imperial Guard is what you call in when things really hit the fan. And so whenever you read a story from Marvel Comics where it's like, oh, they're sending in the Imperial Guard, that means things are really going to pop off. Now, in the case of Gladiator, because he's actually running the show here, it's really curious as to why it is he shows up on the steps of Asgardia. Now, the reason why this is kind of cool is because it actually gives us a couple characters fighting that we never really see engage in conflict. Uh, the first one is Heimdall, and the second one, of course, is Gladiator himself. Now, Heimdall functions very much in Marvel Comics the same way he does in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Universe. The difference here is basically how they look. But in terms of his form and function, he just sees virtually everything. But the funny thing about this is that there's this question that's kind of asked by Jason Aaron of if he's an Asgardian, that means that he has to breathe. That means that he has to eat. It means that he has vulnerabilities just like virtually anybody else, albeit enhanced durability and enhanced skills. And so where he's the one that sees pretty much everything happening, if he functions like a normal being, then what happens if he blinks? And that's the coolest thing is because in that instant, in that fraction of a second when he blinks, if someone's fast enough, they can dart from one side of the universe to the other. And that's exactly what happens here. In that fraction of a moment when Heimdall blinks, Gladiator arrives. Now, the cool thing about Gladiator is that he's very much like Marvel's version of Superman, and Marvel has a lot of those. I mean, in truth, when it comes to like those legacy characters, there's no possible way Marvel could make a character that has a cape and that can fly and that has that, that that's super strong without having the same powers as Superman. They're basically just the foundation of virtually all abilities. I mean, Superman's powers aren't really unique anymore. The only ones that stand out are like his super breath, his uh, heat vision, and even then, you know, those aspects of his character are kind of spread out. Now, I mean, it's it's Superman. I mean, you know, no one's going to say Superman falls rank and file with every other superhero ever. It's Superman. <laughs> it's the superhero. So the, the cool thing here is that Gladiator, when it comes to his abilities, he's extremely powerful. I mean, he's extremely strong. He's extremely durable. He has, you know, laser vision and all kinds of cool stuff, but his powers are intertwined directly with his confidence. So if he engages in a conflict and he starts losing and his confidence starts to wane, his powers will go with it. And so it was really kind of a cool scenario, but outside of that one caveat, he is a force to be reckoned with. When it comes down to it, if Gladiator jumps into the conflict, then that means whoever it is that he's facing against, barring, you know, barring it being like Thanos or like Galactus or somebody like that, they're probably going to be done. But the whole idea of him arriving here is for the purpose of actually taking Jane Foster herself. Now, of course, what ends up happening is that where Heimdall is the eyes and ears, he's also the first line of protection uh, with Asgard. And so with Gladiator overpowering Heimdall, this says something. Because remember, if Heimdall is supposed to be the first line of protection, 
then that means that he's the one that comes before Odin and he comes before Thor. He's really one of the most powerful beings in Asgard. But in the middle of all this, because of the fact that the Imperial Guard is just kind of tearing everything apart trying to find Thor, ultimately Jane Foster reveals herself. And in that moment, she's essentially taken by Gladiator and brought before those individuals who sent Gladiator to Asgard in the first place, which are revealed to be none other than Shara and Keithri. Now, here's the cool thing about this. This is why I say we get a lot more expansion on the, the Shi'ar race than we ever really did before. Shara and Keithri is very akin to, to Thor and Odin, just because of the fact that in that part of the world, there are people that worship Thor and Odin. They follow that belief system that there's Odin and there's the son Thor and there's Loki, the god of mischief and so on and so forth. With this, the Shi'ar look at Shara and Keithri much the same way. The difference here is that much like Thor and Odin, Shara and Keithri are very much real and they're basically the gods of the Shi'ar race. And that's the cool thing here because remember, one of the things that was established in Jason Aaron's Thor God of Thunder storyline was the idea of gods, the idea that there is this great big huge pantheon, every planet has its own gods, every universe has gods. In truth, the question that really comes out of that is which came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the gods who arrived on the planet and they were viewed as gods by people who worship them? Or were the gods given life by virtue of the worship that people gave them? And so that's the whole basis behind this, this particular scenario. But in this instance, it's really more of the idea that Shara and Keithri are basically engaging in this challenge of the gods to basically show which god is the greater. Is it Thor or is it Shara and Keithri? Now, the reason behind this, we don't really know. And actually, we won't find out here for a little bit. But transitioning back to Asgard, what we do here is we actually pick up with Sif and we pick up with Cole. Now, Cole Borson is a guy that we will actually talk about once we get around to uh, November with regards to our whole run on Thor, Fear Itself, all that kind of good stuff. But the introduction of Cole was part and parcel to Fear Itself. And what it basically revealed is that Odin had a third brother that nobody knew about. That for years and years and years, it was believed that the the, uh, the Odin force was basically just the amalgamation of the life energies of Odin's brothers and himself combined into a singular being that allowed him to do a wide array of different things. The introduction of Cole also came with him basically having his own hammers. And these hammers were given to different people across the Marvel Universe, each one pertaining to a particular group of uh, group of superheroes. So like Juggernaut, for example, had a hammer and he ended up going against the X-Men. And so that's the kind of cool uh, scenario that we saw because, dude, when Juggernaut has the hammer, it is amazing. It's one of the coolest things ever. Fear itself was an amazing storyline when it came to Thor, one of my absolute favorites. But the overarching gist here is that because Cole Borson was effectively defeated by a large part of the superhero community, this led to Cole more or less just kind of being uh, being resigned to living in Asgard proper. Now, the difference here is that going into the events of Siege and going into these stories where it basically saw, uh, you know, saw Asgard destroyed and then eventually reformed by Odin himself with the injury of the mother of Thor basically having happened at the beginning of the story, which again, we covered all that stuff. Uh, it ultimately led to Odin basically vacating his position as king of Asgard more or less and then Cole Borson taking up his place as regent. And what this means is that Cole Borson has all the authority of Odin, meaning when he speaks, he speaks on behalf of Odin. Now, the reason why this is important is because of the fact that Odin did not remove himself as king and make Cole king in his place, because now that would mean that Cole has the power of a king. He can reject Odin's claim to the throne if Odin ever decided to come back. That's not the case. Instead, what it means is that Odin can return at any time and Cole has to give up his seat. Now, if he refused, I mean, it wouldn't matter. Odin would just crush him and then he would just take his seat back. But the fact remains, when it comes to like proper policy when it comes to politics. That's basically what it is that's going on here. The other half of this is that Cole Borson hates Thor. Cole is a, is a reflection of a lot of the fans out there who do not like Jane Foster. And that's one of the cool things about uh, Jason Aaron's run on Thor is because he recognizes there are people out there who just don't like Jane Foster. To them, Odin's son is the only Thor. And they're not wrong. It's their personal opinion. And there's nothing wrong with them for having that opinion. But Jason Aaron recognizes that. Now, Jane Foster's Thor. <laughs> and we get those stories and we will get those stories until Odin's son gets his hammer back. We know that's going to happen, but the cool thing is we get these really interesting stories in the interim. But the funny thing about Sif in this particular situation is that she actually goads Cole Borson. What she does is she says, look, we know you don't like this new Thor. We know you don't like her. You don't think she's worthy of the hammer. You believe that only the Odin family line should be the ones to be able to wield it. And so the question I have is this, if Asgard has been left in ruins by the Shi'ar, who are you going to allow to carry the glory of defeating the Shi'ar empire in return for their actions? Are you going to let Thor get that glory or are you going to be the one to do it? And so at that point, it's just a matter of honor. At that point, it's just a matter of, I will not let Thor take the glory of this battlefield today. <laughs> 
I will be the one to win, you know, to keep the honor of the Odin family. And so that's the cool thing here. It's just basically just kind of preying on the honor that he has, basically saying, look, I know that, it, that for you, it's family first. So are you going to stick up for your family or are you going to let somebody walk in and capture this glory here? Now, the other half of this is the actual challenge of the gods. And it's actually kind of interesting the way this works, because what Jason Aaron seems to be toying on here is the idea that Shara and Keithri, they're not the embodiment of prayers of the Shi'ar. It's really just a matter of who is it that the various members of the Shi'ar race will pray to in their time of dire need. And so the goal is to basically gain points through prayers. And it's, <laughs> and it's kind of a funny scenario because the way they do this is instituting like mass casualties, doing things like creating tidal waves and these natural disasters and all these huge conflicts. And it's interesting because what they're really doing here is they're saying, it's not a matter of whether or not Jane Foster saves the day. It's a matter of when they're fleeing for their lives, who are they praying to save them? Or who are they praying to to save them? Are they praying to us, Shara and Keithri? Or are they praying to Thor? And so again, it's kind of a cool scenario because it's one of these situations where the more Thor acts, the more people become aware of who she is. And so it's really kind of a cool scenario because she goes through and she begins earning the adoration of all these members of the Shi'ar race who stop, you know, praying to Shara and Keithri and start praying to Thor. Now the, the human element of Jane Foster really comes into play when she basically says, no, don't pray to me. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. I'm just helping you guys. And really for the people who don't like Jane Foster, that will fan them on even further in their hatred for Jane Foster. But, you know, it's still kind of an interesting scenario because if it was Odin's son, it really kind of depends on the writer. I mean, some writers, mo most likely Jason Aaron would have been like, oh, it's not necessary. But if you have alcohol, I'll take some of that, you know, but with regards to, to Jane Foster, it's not that way. She's very human. She's very simple in terms of how she views the world. We could literally have that discussion. I mean, we, we could really say who was working to make the, make the universe a better place. Was it Odin's son or was it Jane Foster? Because in truth, they both pretty much did the same thing. Odin's son fought some amazing and epic battles. He relished in the conflict. He enjoyed the, the thrill of the hunt, so to speak. But at the end of the day, he was fighting bad guys that wanted to destroy the earth. Jane Foster doesn't really relish in the, the glory of battle. She doesn't really live to win the day, but she fights against bad guys and she saves the world. So it really kind of creates this interesting scenario. But in every single instance, every single one of these tests, whether it be some comet, you know, that's just like spiraling across the universe, whether it's, you know, some crazy person who's going to sacrifice their child in the name of Shara and Keithri, each time Jane Foster steps in, she's basically able to save these people or at least save them as best she can. And each time she ends up gaining more prayers, gaining more adoration. Now, in truth, at the end of the day, none of it really matters because of course we end up having this massive battle in space between between uh, Kola Borsan and the Shi'ar Empire, that's not wildly important, but it is kind of interesting to see. I mean, it's something to keep us entertained and keep us a little more interested, but we actually jump back a little bit, jump back about a few days before any of this took place, and we actually end up finding out this entire scenario was basically goaded by Loki himself. Now, something to keep in mind, when it comes to Jason Aaron's run on the Mighty Thor, he's basically been telling us there's a much bigger picture, a much bigger game that Loki's playing. We don't know what it is, but we know that there's a plan in place. Loki's doing all these things because it's all Far, all part of a plan. He's not just running around instigating chaos, you know, seeding conflict and reaping war. It's not that way. Instead, he's going through a plan. It's something that he's basically set up. We just don't really know what it is. And so these little things that come in here and there, every time we see them, we have to ask the question, is Loki doing this because he's just being a dick? <laughs> or is Loki doing it because it's all part of the plan? And so again, it's, it's kind of an interesting scenario, but jumping back into Jane Foster, really, she just ends up having enough of this massive conflict, ends up having enough of this battle. And so what ends up happening is she actually turns on Shara and Keithri, attempts to basically end the conflict. But what we end up learning here is that when it comes to like the scoreboard, Jane Foster lost by like an insane margin. I mean, she was just readily stopped by a country mile when it came to like garnering prayers because Shara and Keithri are just too entrenched into the Shi'ar race. The Shi'ar race has been worshiping them for too long. It's the only gods that they know of, the only gods that they care about. They're too intertwined when it comes to the Shi'ar race itself. But Jane Foster actually ends up winning. And the reason why is because she's awarded bonus points because of the fact that she inspired other gods to fight on, on her behalf. Most notably, even if it's only through wrath, even if it's only through anger and absolute hatred, Cole Borson basically fought the Shi'ar empire on behalf of Jane Foster. He fought the other side of the battle. And that's why I say that's kind of significant significant, but not the most important thing ever. It's the way in which she ends up basically, you know, coming out on top of the conflict. But the cool thing about this is that in the face of 
almost guaranteed defeat at the hands of Jane Foster herself. What is up happening is Shara and Keithry actually invoke the Phoenix Force. Now, the Phoenix Force is an interesting concept in the realm of Marvel Comics because one, this is the first time, or at least that we're aware of, because I don't know where this fits chronologically in relation to like Thanos or the Jean Grey solo series, but uh, you know, we can just kind of assume this is one of the first times that we see the Phoenix Force in all new, all different Marvel. And it's cool to see because of the fact that the Phoenix has existed all around Marvel Comics for quite some time. Now, something that I want to point out here and something that I want to talk about here for a second was the question that we brought up during our Thanos video. One of the things that I pointed out is that historically speaking, there's only ever been one host for the Phoenix Force at any one particular time, which is to say there's only ever been one instance where the Phoenix shows up and then gives somebody his powers. There have been people like Rachel Summers who were time displaced and they had the powers of the Phoenix, but the Phoenix, whenever it shows up, says you as an individual are now my avatar. The only real exception to that came with Avengers versus X-Men, and that was only because of the fact that they tried to destroy the Phoenix Force and ended up dispersing among five people. But the Phoenix did not choose to go into those five people. It was just kind of destroyed or at least attacked by Tony Stark, which led to it splitting up into five different people. What we ended up having with the Thanos story, at least one of the things that I brought up, is that by the time we finished that story, uh, the all new younger version of Jean Grey, Thane himself, and then of course Quentin Quire, as we'll see in the story, all become hosts for the Phoenix. And it doesn't usually work that way. The Phoenix Force is a multiverse entity or kind of like an omniversal entity and what that means is that much like you know the one above all or the living tribunal there's only one phoenix force throughout the multiverse the difference is that the phoenix force will manifest itself in different universes sometimes all the universes at the same time other times only one universe at a time but the phoenix will only ever usually choose one host for itself in any one particular universe what we're seeing here with regards to the younger version of gene gray with uh with thane the son of thanos with uh quentin choir here this is new this is something that we haven't really seen before, or if we have, I've never seen it before. Having multiple hosts for the Phoenix Force who've all gained the power of the Phoenix around the same time in a single continuity of a story. Now, again, we don't really know where like Thanos resides. We don't really know the end result of this Jean, or of this, uh, Jean Grey story, and we don't really know where like this resides in continuity. They could just happen one after the other. It could simply just be that within the realm of all new, all different Marvel's continuity, Quentin Quire becomes the host for the Phoenix, then it leaves him, and then it goes to Thane, then it leaves Thane, and then it appears to Jean Grey. That's entirely possible. We simply just don't know yet. At this point, we're waiting for the stories to flesh out. We're waiting to see where they end up. And then we'll be able to kind of bring them together. And, you know, once we see like middle rows, like for example, if we have a big crossover event, if it's like the, the Omega issue of Secret Empire, the 11th issue, because it's 11 issues now, if it's like 11, the 11th issue of Secret Empire and like Quentin Quire and Thane and Jean Grey are all there and they all have the power of the Phoenix Force, then that would give us an answer to the question that we're looking for. But for right now, we don't really have a definitive answer. But essentially because of the fact that Shara and Keith Reed are facing almost imminent destruction, they basically bring the Phoenix Force back out. They, they effectively resurrect it. Now, this is kind of a cool scenario because for those individuals who love Odin's son and those individuals who are not really parcel to Jane Foster, this is interesting because Jane Foster's never fought the Phoenix Force before. And the Phoenix is not an entity that you can fight through physical contact. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's non-corporeal. You know, for all the good it'll do to hit the Phoenix Force with a hammer, she might as well be swinging at smoke. And so it's really kind of a cool scenario because we're talking about a level of power that's so extreme, even if Jane Foster was able to hit it with the hammer, it wouldn't do any good. And so what ends up happening is we end up having uh, having Jane Foster Thor actually travel back to Earth and grab Quentin Quire and bring him with her to the battlefield, ultimately to deal with the Phoenix Force proper. Now, the reason why this matters is for a couple things. The first is that it's well known that writer Jason Aaron loves Quentin Quire, and I'm really excited to see what his solo series is about. But two, it's not the first time that Quentin Quire and the Phoenix Force have gone hand in hand. And the story that we did from um, new X-Men, which was called Here Comes Tomorrow, I think it was. It dealt with the idea of like Jean Grey, the full encompassing power of what she does as the Phoenix. But we saw all these different alternate reality hosts of the Phoenix Force, which is why I say the Phoenix manifests in a multitude of different realities. But we saw all these different alternate reality hosts of the Phoenix Force, one of whom was Quentin Quire. And so the idea is that Quentin, whether it's in an alternate universe or whether it's in the main Marvel universe, will at some point become a host for the Phoenix Force, just because of the fact that Quentin Quire is an Omega level telepath. The term Omega level when it comes to mutants is just kind of like this general phrase, this, this uh, somewhat vague, a little enigmatic phrase, but it basically means that that's the, the highest level of power that any one particular mutant can have. It's really kind of a cool scenario because Jane Foster is actually yanked into the white hot room of the Phoenix by the Phoenix entity itself.
itself. Now, again, the White Hot Room is kind of like this way station. It's kind of this place. It's basically the core center of the multiverse is the best way that I can describe it. This is one of the weird things about Marvel Comics. Different locations are depicted different ways. Some people say the White Hot Room is the way station you travel to before you go to the afterlife. Some people say the White Hot Room is basically where the current host of the Phoenix Force resides while it's doing whatever the Phoenix Force, you know, is doing. Uh, different people, different writers depict it different ways. But uh, on the whole, the White Hot Room is usually where a person's conscious mind goes when the Phoenix wants to talk to it. Just because of the fact that the Phoenix cannot commune with a person through traditional means, meaning the Phoenix can't talk like a normal human being. It has to take a host in order to be able to pull that off. And so the idea is that it basically talks to Jane Foster and it actually makes fun of her a little bit. It says, look, you fancy yourself a god with your little hammer and you're riding around with your little armor. You know, you know nothing of the term. You know nothing of the phrase God. I am the very manifestation of all life that will of, will ever exist and that has, has ever existed. I serve the singular purpose of destroying all things. If I wanted to, I could snuff you out of existence right now. And that's 100% true. If the Phoenix Force wanted to get rid of Jane Foster Thor, she would be gone. And that's all there is to it. And so ultimately, you know, what she ends up realizing, and it's kind of a caveat that Jason Aaron uses here, but what Jane Foster does is actually manifest her hammer inside the white hot room. Now, in truth, I don't really know how it is this happens. The hammer is a physical object. Right now, they're inside the mind of, or really inside the Phoenix Force itself, you know, really kind of inside the Phoenix Force's own mind, so to speak. There's no real definitive answer given here. It's kind of cloak and dagger. Maybe it's one of those things that'll be explained later on, or maybe it'll be, you know, left ambiguous forever. But attacking the Phoenix Force from the inside is tantamount to the scene from Old Man Logan when Old Man Hulk swallowed Wolverine and Wolverine killed him from the inside out. Uh, that's basically what it was that happened here. In addition to this, when Quentin Quire finally absorbs the Phoenix entity unto its itself and becomes its new host, Odin's son arrives just in time to miss the battle, <laughs> just in time to catch the tail end of it all. So again, it's kind of an interesting situation just because of the fact that Jane Foster has more or less proved that she is a legitimate god among all the other gods that exist out there, or really the concept of Thor is a legitimate god when it stands the test of time of what it is that they're capable of. Uh, what we also end up having is, of course, you know, this revelation that this is the reason why it is Odin's son and Jane Foster both end up traveling back to Earth, which leads them into, uh, leads them into the secret empire conflict. And so what seems to be taking place here is that Jason Aaron is basically moving away from the direction of focusing on Jane Foster Thor and Odin's son in his Thor run and focusing on whoever it is the all new ultimate Thor is. And so again, it's kind of a cool scenario. I'm not going to swear to that, but that seems to be what it is that's happening uh, with regards to the Thor stories. So the story of War Thor is actually really interesting and it's really, really cool because this gives us a version of Thor that we haven't necessarily seen before. But a lot of this is really just sort of up to interpretation in a lot of ways too. And the reason I say that is because we covered Thors the other day and we basically sat down and we looked at this idea of the hammer that belonged to Ultimate Thor and what it was that happened to the hammer. Now, the weird thing about this is that over the years, Ultimate Thor's hammer had kind of ex uh, received this, this sort of bouncing around this since that it was destroyed, it was remade, different things like that. There was one point where he actually got this sort of, you know, traditional Mjolnir that we see in the main Marvel Universe. Not the exact same one, but something similar to it. But the idea was that in the Thor storyline from Secret Wars, that Ultimate Thor was one of these individuals who served as Doctor Doom's uh, police force, basically. And what had happened was that in this massive brawl among these different versions of Thor, that the Ultimate Hammer had left the Secret Wars universe and was either transported throughout all space and time, or just transported into the past or something along those lines, but it ended up in Asgard. It basically broke through the dimensional barriers and ended up in this pocket dimension of Asgard. Now, in truth, that should not have been allowed to happen. The entire basis behind Secret Wars was that all conceivable universes and all spaces, dimensions, the whole, you know, all that stuff, those were all destroyed in the collapse of the multiverse. Everything was gone and the only chunk of existence that was left was Battle World. So again, it kind of fit into a weird situation, but this gives us an update in terms of what's going on in the sense of what this hammer's capable of and what it can do. Now, one thing to keep in mind is there are, st are two schools of thought that are currently floating around right now in terms of the nature of this hammer. The school of thought that I ascribe to is that it's the hammer that originally belonged to Ultimate Thor, but there is a school of thought that also believes that this hammer was used by Ultimate Thor, but was actually forged by Doctor Doom during the events of Battle World. As far as I'm aware, we're not explicitly told if that's true in terms of which version of the hammer this is. All we know is that it's a hammer that does not have a worthiness in 
enchantment. And as we go through this, we'll actually find out this hammer is almost identical in terms of what it can do to the actual hammer of Thor. But the other half of this is that for those of you guys who are just now joining us, we are basically in the midst of what's called the War of Realms. And the idea here is that this is essentially a being named Malekith the Accursed trying to conquer all things in existence. That's basically what it is. Now, Malekith the Accursed is a really cool villain. He's had the casket of ancient winners, but he's always been this sort of background villain. Malekith was always around there somewhere in some form or fashion. What War of the Realms does is it actually brings him to full focus. And essentially what he had been doing is traveling around the various realms of Asgard and recruiting different people to his cause. Initially, it was the Frost Giants. Then it became the Trolls. And it became all these different groups who rallied to Malekith knowing that Malekith probably had the wherewithal to win the conflict. And the reason for that is the other half of the equation. Because while Malekith was traveling around and trying to conquer everything, everybody looked to Asgard as the people who would save them. The problem is that Asgard had a lot of inner turmoil because there was this huge civil war going on in terms of whether or not Jane Foster was actually Thor. And so because that, it led to like Odin taking sides against Jane Foster. It led to Odin's wife Freya going on the side of Jane Foster. And it led to this great big huge conflict. And so because of this, it allowed Malekith the Accursed to begin the process of going through and just conquering all these different realms with almost no one to stand in his way. Now in this instance, what this does is it picks up with the aftermath of the death of the Light Elves, which are one of the various race of elves that exists within the Asgardian mythos. And the idea was that the, the Light Elves were one of the first groups that Malekith Malekith took out just because the Light Elves and the Dark Elves are mortal enemies. And so with the Light Elves being pushed to the brink of extinction, what they had done is they had taken up residence with the Dwarves. Now the Dwarves are extremely important in Asgardian mythos. The reason for this is because of the fact that the Dwarves are basically the greatest craftsmen in all of the Asgardian realms. They're the ones that forged the Hammer of Thor. Now it's kind of a funny thing here because we actually pick up with uh, Volstagg, with Ra's Solomon, and with the Queen of the Light Elves. And the cool thing about this is that Ra's Solomon was originally a character who was introduced as just this random shield agent. And it was actually this girl who had this desire to basically go on a date with Thor, which he granted to her. <laughs> Odin's son went on a date with Ra's Solomon. But ever since then, she's always been kind of this recurring supporting character, but she is quite versed in the Asgardian mythos just because of the fact that she's traveled around and seen a lot of these different things. But Volstagg himself is also a really kindly guy who's also like a force to be reckoned with. Because in truth, he's one of the warriors three that exist inside of the main Marvel universe. Universe, and he's one of the most capable warriors that exist out there, one of the bravest men around. The problem with the War of Realms is that it takes its toll in every conceivable way, physically, because of the loss of life, because people who have to fight over and over and over again simply to just survive. But it also takes a psychological toll. And the reason for this is because Volstagg, of course, spending time with these uh, these Light Elf children, is basically met with the arrival of the forces of Surtur that immediately show up in the land of the dwarves and start tearing everything to pieces. The problem with this is that the parents of these Light Elves are all killed. The parents of these children are all totally destroyed. And it leaves Volstagg in a situation where he's just kind of required to take care of them as best he can and sort of go through there and, and call it a day. The issue is that as he makes his way through there and as these forces of Surtur basically begin to emerge and continue wreaking all this havoc, they end up killing the kids. Now, this is when this psychological break happens in the mind of Volstagg. While he has seen a multitude of conflicts, a multitude of battles, and a multitude of wars, it's one thing to basically fight against an enemy to eliminate them in their entirety, and it's another to stand there and be helpless in the face of loss of life. And that's why this is so huge, is because he literally just experiences this sort of psychic break. I mean, it just cracks him almost in two. And so in response to this, he does the only thing he can do. He literally seeks out the ultimate hammer and picks it up. Now remember, when the ultimate hammer crash landed in old Asgard during the events of Thor's, it was basically safeguarded. It was this idea that no one's going to pick it up. No no one's going to go and take it. No one's going to use it because no one really knows how it works. This whole conflict, this whole idea of whether or not Jane Foster is worthy has thrown into sharp relief the idea that just because a person picks up the hammer of Odin does not mean that everyone in Asgard is going to believe that person is Thor. And so because of that, people do not want to experience yet another civil war within Asgard going on at the same time as the first. And so what they ended up doing was say, this is all hands off. Now, of course, the idea was that Odin's son himself would be the one who would maintain the hammer. The problem with this is that when Jane Foster went to him and basically said, hey, I am currently Thor. I'm the one who was able to pick up your hammer. It was sort of a betrayal for Odin's son in the sense that their relationship had gone back, you know, both as friends and even as people who were an item at one time, it had gone back for quite some time. And for Odin's son, it was this idea that if Jane Foster was going to become the new Thor, the very least she could do is tell him, if only out of just respect for the legacy that he carried. The
the fact that she hid it means there's a lack of trust there. And in that belief of a lack of trust, Odin's son just kind of looked at her with a skewed eye. And so again, this creates this whole huge inner turmoil because with War Thor showing up, he goes to town. And the reason for this is because he shows up in this camp, these armies of Surtur's forces, and just obliterate. I mean, it's, it's one of the most spectacular displays of absolute decimation that I've ever seen. But notice this, this is not Volstagg in his traditional sense. He's kindly, he's more of a jovial character as opposed to like this battle-hardened, everything has to die kind of character. Now, the other half of this is that his path of destruction is being monitored by Amora the Enchantress and Ulick, King of the Trolls. Now, these are two of the most powerful beings in all of Asgard. Trying to take out Warthor, none of it works. Now, what this does is this hits home at the nature of the ultimate hammer of Thor. In the ultimate universe, the hammer was originally tech-based. Over the course of the years, it almost seemed as though the hammer was moving up to becoming almost equivalent to the hammer of Thor in the main Marvel universe, but it was never on that level. It was basically a tech-based hammer. The issue with this is that this is why I say this seems to ascribe to the idea that the hammer as it exists now was forged by Dr. Doom during the events of Battleworld when the Thor core was being formed because we basically end up seeing a display of power that we've never seen before. The ability of the hammer to deflect blasts, to basically eliminate magics in a way that we hadn't seen before. And so again, that's why it looks as though it's a hammer forged by Dr. Doom, but we're not explicitly told that that's the case. But regardless of the circumstances, even with him having this hammer, whether he has it or not, Volstagg is still a match for almost anybody out there just because of how strong he is. He almost kills both Enchantress and Ulick. It's not until Enchantress uses her ability Abilities and basically summons the Black Bifrost, which is to say their own teleportation system and gets them out of there, that she manages to survive the experience. But within Volstagg himself, there's a sort of inner turmoil. This idea that he realizes something's off. Now, what this all seems to do is hit at home to the very nature of the hammers themselves. Because remember, for years and years and years and years, it was this idea that Thor's hammer was just a hammer. Something he picked up, it had a worthiness enchantment, magic was somehow involved, and then he was able to do all kinds of stuff with it. He could teleport, he could fly, he could do all manner of things. It wasn't until recent years when Jason Aaron came back and gave us the untold origin of Thor's hammer when he basically established that the hammer of Thor is basically possessed by this sort of cosmic storm that was equal in power to Odin himself. Odin was able to basically channel the storm into a chunk of Uru, send it over to the dwarves, have them craft it into a hammer, and then his son was eventually able to pick it up. In this particular story, what seems to be going on, or at least what Jason Aaron is hitting at, is that much like the hammer of Thor being sentient, this ultimate hammer is sentient as well, but it's basically sentient with the wrath of a universe that's long since been destroyed. All that energy and all that power is channeled directly into the hammer itself. And so what it means is that it's quite literally dominating Volstagg. And that's why it's such a huge deal is because in the midst of all this, one thing to keep in mind is that it also reminds us that Jane Foster is still dying. One of the things that Jason Aaron established almost immediately before Jane Foster ever picked up the hammer in the first place is that it was ever going to be a temporary thing. That because of the fact that she has cancer, because she's basically dying, she does undergo chemotherapy. But every time she becomes Thor, it purges the chemotherapy from her system. And so in a sense, she might as well have never had chemotherapy at all. And so the result is that she's constantly dying of cancer. And what it'll do is it'll eventually get to the point where she will die altogether and she will never have the hammer again. She'll be dead. But what this does is this actually transfers us for a second to a place called Muspelheim, the realm of Surtur, the realm of these fire demons. And we actually end up picking up with his daughter, Cinder. Now, the crazy thing about this is that Surtur has been dead for quite some time. Surtur was basically destroyed by Odin, or at least his essence was destroyed by Odin. And so what this did is it allowed for some measure of a power vacuum within Muspelheim itself. Now, this vacuum was filled almost immediately by Cinder, but this is the first time we see her character. This is the first time she's being introduced. Surtur had had a whole bunch of children over the years. She was the first one to basically prove herself worthy of taking over her father's role. Remember, Surtur is this guy who basically has it out for Odin and all the Asgard guardians. And a lot of that's because of the fact that Odin and his brothers had faced off against Surtur. Odin was responsible for imprisoning Surtur in Earth. And so it's really one of those things where it's more like a blood vendetta as opposed to, you know, some eternal battle that was always destined to happen or something along those lines. But the idea is that with Malekith showing up alongside Loki, keep in mind, originally Loki was sent to Malekith by Freya to be a spy for the Asgardians. Somewhere along the line, he seems to have turncoated and abandoned his mother's cause, taking up his cause with Malekith. But we don't 
don't know that for certain. Loki's very much a wild card in this story. He seems to be an ally, but we don't know for sure. But regardless of the reasoning behind it, Malekith running this sort of Council of Realms, the idea is to basically make sure that everybody has their own role to play and to make sure they're playing their roles effectively. The fire demons are some of the most formidable beings out there. When they show up and they start cleansing places, those places are gone. But for Malekith, it's also a very tenuous situation because if they chose to turn on him, then not only would he be facing the Asgardians, he would be facing the fire demons. And so again, the goal is to very much make sure that they're playing their role. But what he also does is essentially show up and say, you have a new Thor on the scene and this new Thor needs to be taken care of as quickly as possible because this new Thor was able to single-handedly take down your entire army. Now, what this does is it leads to a battle between War Thor and Cinder. And this is something that I want to talk about for a second because this is interesting to me. If this were Surtur, this battle would be over before it even started. When it comes to someone like Surtur, you're talking about a guy who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Odin, killed Odin prior to the events of Ragnarok. We're talking about a very capable being that's out there. Surtur being out of the picture, his daughter Cinder taking the place, she's not on that same level of power. She's capable, but she's not on that level. And so what this does is it gives us a battle between the two, but I don't want you to see this as something, you know, with regards to Warthor being a lot more powerful than he is. Not at all. This is not like Warthor fighting Surtur. The other half of this is that the death of all these kids keep playing over constantly in the mind of Volstagg, and that's what drives him. While the hammer does kind of seize control of him, the idea of feeding these images into his mind time and time again of these kids dying continues to push him to the point where all he wants to do is destroy. All he wants to do is see the death of all things. Now, because of the fact that, that Warthor cares nothing about everything that exists in Muspelheim, what it does is it brings him and it brings Jane Foster Thor directly into conflict with one another. Now, the reason why this happens is because of the fact that in the mind of Jane Foster, while Cinder is a terrible ruler, while Cinder is a terrible being, you know, all she wants to do is just sort of see the destruction of the Asgardians, Cinder herself is not a reflection of the beings within Muspelheim. There are innocents there. There are young children who are fire demon children, but they are young children nonetheless. They have not had the chance to actually grow and adopt their own mindset. Jane Foster sees these kids as basically innocents, the ability to move on and to have their own life. If, you know, Muspelheim is going to be freed of the control of Cinder and the entire legacy of Surtur, then it starts with the defeat of Cinder herself and then giving the survivors the opportunity to forge their own path. But in the eyes of Jane Foster, it is not acceptable to kill kids. And so what this does is it basically brings Jane Foster and Warthor to this place, this, this sort of in-between area called the Yawning Void. Now, what this does is it basically seems to indicate this empty space in between dimensions or maybe where all life seemed to hail from or something along those lines, the Asgardian depiction of the origin of all things is a little bit different from what we're normally used to in the main Marvel universe. In the beginning, there was only just darkness, that was it, and then darkness somehow gave form to life, life gave form to more life, gave form to planets, gave form to, you know, stars, systems, different things like that, but it all started with absolute darkness, and the idea is that the yawning void is that absolute darkness, it's that lack of anything, there's nothing there. They're basically fighting in a space where there is no concern about, you know, anybody being in danger, there's no concerned about loss of life or anything along those lines. But the idea is that the fight between the two of them just starts spreading through. I mean, it literally tears through all these different facets of the realms in the sense that those who were in uh, the equivalent of hell within the Asgardian mythos can see this fight take place. You know, those who are in heaven, where Angela comes from, can see this fight taking place. It's really not until Jane Foster takes the ultimate hammer of Thor that we as the reader learn that it has been possessing Volstagg the entire time, poisoning his mind. But again, it's sort of a, a wild scenario because once Odin's son realizes that Volstagg is Warthor, that Volstagg is going on this path of tearing things up, initially Odin's son tries to reason with him. The problem with this is that Volstagg seems to be beyond the point of reason. I mean, he's literally a mad dog driven by the only motivation to just see all things destroyed. It's just nothing but anger and wrath and rage. And so it's kind of cool because it's almost one of those things of music soothes the savage beast in the sense that Jane Foster simply puts the hammer down and lets all pretense go and approaches Volstagg as just a normal person. Now, this is cool because this is designed to show Jane Foster as being effective as not just Thor, but also as Jane Foster the character. In this instance, Odin's son basically just kind of sends the hammer away, tells the hammer, get out of here, you're not supposed to be here, you know, sends it back to Asgard, and that's really about it. But it's this idea that Malekith continues his campaign of grabbing all these different armies from around the Asgardian realm and bringing them to his cause. His next stop is the realm of heaven. His next stop is to basically step in to the angels themselves 
themselves and say, become part of my council of realms. Help me basically conquer everything and I will restore your rightful place among the Asgardian landscape. Okay, so we are getting into the death of the mighty Thor. And this is an amazing story. I mean, this is the end of Jane Foster, right? Like we've talked about this before. Anybody who read Jason Aaron's Thor God of Thunder knew that Jane Foster was gonna go away. She was never gonna stay Thor permanently. We saw that at the end of the story. Like we saw that at the end of Thor God of Thunder that like Odin's son gets the hammer back eventually and Jane Foster was only ever a temporary thing. Why people freaked out about her becoming Thor, I'm not really sure. I assume it's because they didn't read that story and so they didn't know, which is fine. But nonetheless, this basically deals with the return of a villain called Mangog. Now, I wanna talk about Mangog for a second because this guy is a beast he is an absolute hoss but it's kind of funny because he was initially designed to be a one-off in marvel comics uh, he originally appeared in thor issues 154 through 157 by stan lee and jack kirby and the whole idea of introducing man god was to basically say like over the course of asgard's history odin had done some pretty seedy things now for the most part odin had been depicted as a guy who had like a nefarious past we didn't know a whole lot about it but it was one of those guys where he just kind of did whatever he felt needed to be done but in this three-part story, it was basically revealed to us that somewhere along the line, Odin had essentially like destroyed a race of beings and that this race of beings had kind of poured their hatred and their animosity into a singular being. And that arose in the form of Mangog. Now, this was very, very like cloak and dagger. There wasn't a whole lot of explanation offered there. And so over the course of that story, by the time issue number 157 came around, what ended up happening is the beings that were destroyed by, uh, by Odin had been returned to the physical form. And because of that, their animosity and hatred had no reason to exist. And so the result was that Mangog basically went away. Now, in Thor issues, God, issue 194, Five, I think. I want to say it was in 1972. It was written by Jerry Conway. And what Jerry Conway did was actually bring Mangog back. And that's one of the big issues. It's because technically there was no reason for him to be alive. When it comes to the character of, of Mangog, usually this means that like everybody's going to get wrecked. Now, the only real exception to this came in Walt Simonson's run of uh, of the Mighty Thor, I guess of, of Thor, when you ended up having Mangog who was basically beaten by Thor. And technically that shouldn't have really happened. Either it should have been a standstill or Mangog should have won. The problem with this is that Mangog's desire is to destroy Asgard. And so if he had won, then Asgard would have been obliterated. So uh, it was one of those things where like Mangog kind of had to lose. But the whole Walt Simonson run of Thor was really designed for the purpose of like taking what Jack Kirby originally did in Tales of Asgard, rolling that into the main Thor stories, and then just kind of rebuilding the entirety of the Asgardian mythos, especially because of the fact that Thor had been struggling for a few years between the time that Jack Kirby and Stan Lee stopped writing him and the time that, that Walt Simonson picked it up. So the fact remains here, what this does is this initially picks up with Mangog facing off against War Thor. Now again, we did that whole story arc with War Thor. Basically, uh, this is Volkstag wheeling the hammer of Ultimate Thor. And really what happens here is like Mangog rolls right through him. Mangog just keeps coming and coming one step after another. And no matter what War Thor does, he can't win. There's no conceivable way he can defeat this guy. And so what ends up happening is you end up having Mangog who basically seizes the hammer of War Thor and then just crushes it with his bare hands. That's the power of Mangog. Is it's just all this hatred and all this vitriol coalesced into a singular being given physical form. And so it's absolutely insane in terms of all the power that he possesses. The following this battle, we pick up with Jane Foster, who's just kind of arm wrestling Hercules, you know, and it's kind of funny because Hercules is like, hey, like, you know, whenever you're not fighting against villains or something like that, like if you want to get together, you know, and like knock some boots, you know, I'm down. <laughs> Which is amazing, but it's basically uh, Odin's son showing up to Jane Foster and saying, you need to come with me because Warthor has been absolutely wrecked and uh, something's amiss here. Like there is a being out there who just totally decimated Warthor and we have to find out who this is. Now, of course, what ended up happening too is Volksag himself had just kind of basically said like, Mangog is coming. And this is when like Odin's son basically reveals to Jane Foster like, Mangog is on his way. And if Mangog is on his way, we're all basically doomed because it took everything I had to go toe to toe with him and I don't know if you can handle this. Which is true. Like, no one knows if Jane Foster would be able to hold her own against someone like Mangog. But in this scenario, like, he basically says, look, like, you can do what you can, hold off as best you can. At the end of the day, this may be a battle that you will lose, that you will not survive. And so what ends up happening is she travels to Asgard to basically besiege Odin. Now, remember, in terms of, like, the whole War of Realms, which is still going on, that's been the whole ongoing idea of, like, Jason Aaron's run on Thor. Everything else has been a secondary plot. For the most part, the Nine Realms are in chaos. They're in turmoil. 
Well, this whole war is going on and like Odin is almost nowhere to be found. He's just sitting inside his throne room, standing next to Freya and that's really about it. And so Jane Foster showing up, this is what's so cool. Jane Foster shows up as just herself, cancer ridden Jane Foster, no more capable of defeating Odin than just any normal human being out there. But she basically shows up and says like, either you can sit in there and be a coward or you can come out here and you can issue the order to recall all the Asgardians from across the nine realms and tell them like they have to return here because we have to face Mangog. We have to face him together. And it's not really one of those things like if we all hold hands, we'll win. It's one of those things like if we're not all here, we're all going to die. The other thing here is that Cold Boar's son, the brother of Thor, is basically like, like a, a steward, more or less, of the throne of Asgard while Odin is kind of out there. And really, Cold Boar's son is completely ill-equipped to be the one to run the show. He's not incompetent, right? Like, he's not a goof. The issue with this is that he doesn't really have the wisdom of Odin. So there are times when, like, he should stand down and he doesn't. In this instance, he should recall all the forces of Asgard, but he's not. He's kind of saying strong and saying, look, we'll do our own thing. You know, we've got this sorted out. Odin uh, basically makes his appearance. He shows up and says, look, I will not stand for anyone calling me a coward. Like I will not stand for anyone being out here telling me that I've somehow failed, that I'm somehow derelict in my duties. Like I am Odin. I run Asgard. I was running Asgard before you were born. I will run Asgard after you are dead. I have seen more than you could possibly imagine. I faced off against celestials. I've done all kinds of different things. I've went toe to toe against Galactus. You are just a chick who showed up on the moon one day got lucky and picked up the hammer. Get out of here. That's Odin's entire response to this whole thing. And it's so cool because I'd be curious to ask Jason Aaron why he didn't take things in this direction. Odin could just obliterate Jane Foster, especially in her current form. I would wager the reason he doesn't do that is because of the fact that Thor was with Jane Foster for quite some time. And even though they're not together anymore, there's still a lot of connection between the two of them, even if they're only the closest of friends. And so to kill Jane Foster would be to alienate his son, potentially start a civil war in Asgard proper, and Odin would be forced to either choose a side, let the war commence, Asgard would just kind of be obliterated. So there would be consequences to that particular act. But what we end up having is Freya, who basically comes to, simply steps out and says like, Jane Foster's right. We have to do something. If we do not marshal our forces, we're all going to die. And so what we do is we switch to Heimdall, who of course is at the Rainbow Bridge, watching like he always does. And then in comes Mangog, having made his way to Asgard onto the Rainbow Bridge and like literally begins this onslaught. And that's something that I want you guys to, to notice here. This is not like an even battle, right? It's not like Heimdall's holding his own and he's holding off and doing the best he can. I mean, this is like, he's he's wrecked like that. There's no conflict here. He's bitten in half. The Rainbow Bridge is totally destroyed. That's the power of Mangog. The other half of this is Jane Foster's chemotherapy. That's how Jason Aaron put a clock on Jane Foster. That's basically how he said, like, she's gonna die. That Jane Foster has cancer. She has breast cancer. Every time she changes into Thor, it washes away the chemotherapy. And so basically she starts back at square one. And so what this essentially means is that it's the equivalent of her having never never undergone chemotherapy in the first place. It shortens her lifespan. And so you have like Dr. Strange, you have various people who were here trying to cure her. In truth, this is really just like a stopgap or a hope is really all it is. When Captain Marvel, the original Captain Marvel, died in 1984 in the death of his character by Jim Starlin, he died of cancer. So it is a foregone conclusion in Marvel Comics that when a character gets cancer, they die. There's no conceivable way to get past that. With Jane Foster having undergone, you know, chemotherapy multiple times, what ends up happening here is that she's essentially told, if you turn into Thor again, you will die. Like this is your last shot. Let the chemotherapy happen. Let it run its course because you're essentially, this, this whole scenario basically plays out like this is the first time you're basically undergoing chemotherapy. And so what ends up happening is a hammer basically appears and it's just got like, it, it speaks to her and says, look like Mangog is there. You have to fight. You have to show up. And that's the indication. Now, the other half of this is we switch to Freya who basically takes control of the destroyer armor. Now, again, this is one of those huge moments. The destroyer armor is kind of like this huge creation that was, that was uh, really performed by Odin. It was originally designed to stop the third host of the of the Celestials. I can never remember if it was the third or the fourth fourth. But regardless of the circumstances, the destroyer armor was created to combat the Celestials. But because of the fact that like Mangog showing up here and just taking the full brunt of the power of the destroyer armor, there's nothing that can be done. It's one of these things where it's like Thor has to respond. That's the power of Mjolnir, the power of the hammer. This is something that I also want you guys to notice. Odin is terrified and we never see that, but it's always been that way. It's always been the idea that like the Mangog is the one thing that scares Odin more than anybody else because one, it's like all his past sins 
come to haunt him. And two, like there's no real conceivable way, or at least there shouldn't be any conceivable way to stop Mangog. And so Odin being terrified for his life, Mangog taunting him the entire time. I've destroyed your destroyer armor. I've destroyed your rainbow bridge. I've destroyed everybody who's coming for me. I'm coming for you, pops. Like I'm coming for you, old man. And his curtains, the sun is setting on the Asgardian empire. That's just the way it is. But the other thing to keep in mind here is like with Thor and Odin's son traveling back to Asgard, this is cool because it's him and his father facing off against like Mangok. But the reality of the situation is they don't really expect to win. Instead, this is kind of like the whole scenario with like Hyperion and Odin's son facing off against the Beyonders at the conclusion of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, right? Like they knew they were going to lose. It was one of those things of like, if we're going to go out, we're not going to go out sitting in chairs. We're not going to go out and just let Mangog destroy us. We're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Like if our legends survive, Survive, then like people will speak of the day that Thor and Odin's son fought to their last breath against the Mangog and just like fought with honor and died at the bitter end. I mean, that's, 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 or I'm sorry, uh, you know, fought and died and, and like, you know, fought with, fought at the bitter end. Like that's going to be the whole story. Like that, that's what they're shooting for. Because remember Asgard itself is very much like rooted in the honor of combat. And so really like they don't expect to win. There's no real way for them to win here. And so what you end up having is Jane Foster seizing control of the hammer, turning back into Thor and then racing off to Asgard. And this, again, this basically means means like Jane Foster is going to die. And so what you end up having is her showing up and like holding her own as best she can and facing off against the man God. And she's able to, she's able to do pretty well just because of the nature of the hammer, because the hammer is so powerful. But in reality, again, like this guy is supposed to be unstoppable. And Jason Aaron stays true for the most part to the nature of man God. Despite all the power that Jane Foster has with this hammer, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because what she does is she basically like goes to hurl man God into the sun. Like the whole idea is to just throw him into the sun, call it a day, let him just like burn alive, you know, in this insane amount of heat. But Mangog manages to kind of ricochet his way around and then basically come back. And when he does, like he just starts wrecking Jane Foster again. Like he just starts tearing her apart alongside like Odin's son and alongside like Odin himself. It really does seem to be the end. And so what happens is Jane Foster basically wraps the Mangog in chains and then like throw the hammer into the sun with Mangog in tow. And so instead of him just kind of ricocheting around like he did before, he actually flies into the sun directly. But like everyone, like like Odin and Odin's son and Freya, everyone's screaming at Jane Foster not to do this because if they do, it'll destroy the hammer. But at the end of the day, like she doesn't care. The only thing that matters to Jane Foster is destroying Mangog, like preserving what's left of Asgard. And so where the hammer flies into the sun, Mangog flies into the sun and both are seemingly destroyed. At this moment, at this point right now, there is no more, no more Mjolnir. The hammer of Thor is gone. The Mangog's destroyed and everything and Asgard is safe. But Jane Foster ultimately succumbs to her cancer. She essentially just dies. I mean, there's there's nothing left for her there. So with that being said, guys, uh, if you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And yeah, like I'm really curious because the Aftermath issue comes out in about a month or probably about three weeks now, maybe two weeks because I think the story is about two weeks out. Uh, but like, yeah, so so we'll get like the Aftermath. I'm curious to see. I mean, the hammer will come back. People are probably going to freak out and just be like, no, Mjolnir can't be destroyed. Like, yeah, you're right. It can't be destroyed. It will come back. <laughs> I mean, I don't imagine why it wouldn't. Like, it's, it's definitely going to make its return. How it makes its return, I don't know. Because there's no more ultimate Thor hammer. That hammer was crushed by Mangog. Like, Beta Ray Bill still has Stormbreaker, but he's floating out there somewhere. I'm willing to surmise whatever weapon Thor gets in the comics will be the weapon he gets in, in Infinity War. Marvel's just going to roll it over. <laughs> That's exactly what's going to happen. Okay, so we're getting into uh, Thor. Well, it's technically not called Thor Reborn, but it might as well be. Um, it's basically Odin's son going back to being in the role of Thor, which, I mean, it's cool, but I like Jane Foster as Thor. I mean, I, I, I miss Jane Foster as Thor. She was awesome. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get a character or get her going back to being Thor again, but she was awesome as Thor, and I, I thought it was great storytelling. But uh, this is Odin's son going back to being the, being the character of himself. Now, what's happened here... <laughs> <laughs> the way this picks up is is this is out in Thailand. And this is actually kind of interesting because technically speaking, this should be in Korea. And, and I'll explain why here in a second. But this starts off in Thailand and it actually starts off with Thor having raided the Temple of Sidorak to steal something called the Warlock's Eye. Now, the Warlock's Eye is a very, very old artifact. This goes all the way back to Thor 131. And uh, well, technically speaking, it's, yeah, I guess it's, man, it's weird. Journey into Mystery in Thor. 
<laughs> anyway, it goes back to Thor uh, 131 by Stanley and Jack Kirby. The Warlock's Eye was an artifact that if a person used it, they could basically dominate the minds of others. Now, Marvel has a lot of artifacts like that, right? Like, like different things like that. Doctor Strange can do that. Telepaths can do that. That's one of the things I want you guys to keep in mind for future reference. When it comes to the Infinity Stones, they are unique in their own right in the sense of like there are only one set of Infinity Stones, but there's a lot of other objects out there that can do something akin to it or are sometimes equally dangerous, like the Casket of Ancient Winters, the Crimson Bands, and the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. Depending on how you use them, they can actually be pretty damn dangerous. But Thor's raided the temple for the purpose of capturing the Eye. And the reason why is because following the destruction of, uh, of Asgardia, basically the rebuilt Asgard that Iron Man had made following the events of Siege, when Mangog had stormed the, the, the gates, really, of Asgardia and started, you know, tearing everything up and basically destroyed the entire area, the weapons of Odin had essentially just like flung across the cosmos and traveled across, you know, to different realms, or not really realms, but different places across really the main Marvel Universe proper. Now, there is an indication here it has traveled across the realms, but Thor can't see into those, and we'll find out why here in a second. But the Warlock's Eye is one of these objects. Now, the Warlock's Eye, if I remember correctly, was taken, it was it was discovered and then used against Odin unsuccessfully, and then Odin took it and kept it inside the, uh, and kept it inside Asgard. That's the way things worked back then. It's one of the reasons why, if you go watch like the first Thor movie or Thor 2, you'll see that Odin has like all these weapons gathered around his room. Those are weapons that he gained over the years by defeating various foes. It's not things that just always existed in inside of uh, inside of Asgard. But with regards to the arrival, or I guess regards to the the temple itself and why it should be in Korea, the reason for this is is a uh, is twofold. The first is that because of the fact that Thor had raided the temple, the cannibals, the the servants of Sidorak, in turn call in their champion, who's a newly reformed Juggernaut. The other reason for this is because during the original Octessence, which is to say the various demons of other dimensions gathering together to see who was the strongest, the Crimson Gem, as it was created by Sidorak and left on Earth for some future person to find and become the Juggernaut, that happened in Korea. It didn't happen in Thailand. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Now, we can largely assume that like different temples were made over the years. I mean, we can we can sort of jump to that assumption. But the way it was originally done, the way it was covered in Eighth Day Juggernaut, is it was only ever just one temple of Sidorak. There weren't multiple temples. But when you have Juggernaut showing up here, we end up finding out that when Kane Marco went back to being the servant of Sidorak, that he's more powerful now than he's ever been before. Now, a lot of that was because when Kane Marco originally gained the uh, gained the, the Crimson Gem, that it was just a fraction of Sidorak's powers. And those powers, the, the potency would wax and wane over the years. Of course, the most the most notable example, the strongest Juggernaut's ever been, was Tryon Juggernaut. But aside from that, this is basically him more in tune with Sidorak, being granted more power due to the fact that presumably Sidorak realized Juggernaut could leave at any point in time and simply didn't want him to. And so you end up having Thor, who's basically given a hammer by uh, by by one of the dwarves uh, and then shows up and then goes to smash it on Juggernaut and it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the hammer goes to pieces. Remember, Mjolnir is, was thrown into the sun by Jane Foster. So as far as Jason Aaron's telling us, it's basically lost. Now it won't be. Thor will discover it eventually. I mean, it's the nature of comics. Everything that changes goes back to being the same again. But this hammer doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of fractures on on Juggernaut, and so in turn, where Juggernaut starts to like pelt Thor, Thor in turn calls back out to uh, to the to the dwarves again and says, "Give me more hammers," and they just bring like thousands of hammers crashing down onto Earth. So it's literally Thor fighting Juggernaut with thousands of hammers, and we don't initially see it all happen. <laughs> In fact, we don't. We only see him pick up like one of the hammers and then use that hammer to like crush Juggernaut across the face. And then you just skip to the next scene, which is kind of disappointing because I would kind of want to see Thor fight Juggernaut with like a thousand hammers. Because like when he when he gets there, when he takes the, the eye and he gets back to the dwarves, he ends up telling him, yeah, I had to use them all. Like I had to use all the hammers. And so they've all been destroyed. I need more. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny, but it's a little bit sad because again, like I would kind of wanted to see that. I mean, I know you guys do. Nobody ever watches Thor to see him talk. People, people like they read Thor comics so, like they want to see Thor like smash and stuff. It's like the Incredible Hulk. People are just like, yeah, I want to see the Incredible Hulk smash things. I know how you guys are because I'm the same way. I'm the exact same way. But uh, but the fact remains that we end up having him basically travel to visit directly with uh, with Odin. And when he's talking to Odin, Odin actually asks about her. And of course, this is Odin referring to Jane Foster. And this is a bit of a, a change for his character. And it's, and it's interesting because Jane Foster had earned the respect of Odin at the end of the story arc because when all the Asgardians failed and in the moment of testing when Odin was basically faced with Mangog, the one being in the entire Marvel Universe that Odin is actually scared of, Jane Foster was the only one to stand up and rise to the challenge. And so she, basically she picked up the slack where Odin was weak and that really earned some, some brownie points. It earned some respect from Odin. And so that's when he asked the question, do you know where she is? Because Odin is actually concerned about Jane Foster, which is a total change because Odin was a reflection of, of a portion of the fan base who were just like 
no, Jane Foster does not need to be Thor. She, he was written to kind of be that way, or at least that seems to have been the case. And so now he's just kind of like, yeah, like, like what happened to her? But then you end up having Thor transition back to Midgard and uh, in the Bronx, no less, <laughs> and meet up with uh, meet up with Jane Foster, only for us to find out that again, the War of Realms is still going on. So Malekith the Accursed, this warlord of the Dark Elves, is still like running across all the various realms and destroying everything that he can find and literally just like like just laying siege to everything I mean, just just annihilating everything that he can find that's really all he's doing and so we end up finding out that, that like a lot of these refugees these various elves and dwarves and so on and so forth who have fled from their realms are being given safe passage in uh in the bronx and not only that jane foster is actually recovering from her cancer so it's really basically jason aaron's way of saying she's not gone yet which i'm very excited about that makes me very very happy <laughs> i'm very pleased to see that but it's really kind of the aftermath of asgard's destruction you have like uh like for example heimdall lost his eyes so we can't see everything I meaning he could not see into the into the other realms and see how the realms are faring the bifrost bridge is broken so thor can't go there asgard's basically cut off from everywhere except for midgard that, that's really the only place he can get to and so we really have jane foster essentially tell thor that the next weapon he's looking for is something called the gem of infinite suns and for the most part it's exactly what it sounds like it's a gem that houses the power of a thousand stars the reason why it matters is if you go back and you read the old stories the old thor stories there was a point where he was attacked with a casket of ancient winters which creates like infinite cold and the gem of infinite suns counter that it's basically the yin and the yang to the to the casket of ancient winters it kind of exists you know as, as yin and yang to each other but tracking that down again it's just another weapon that was lost from from asgard which thor is trying to locate now for the most part it initially seems like busy work right it just kind of seems like well thor is just kind of here doing things and tracking down weapons and so on and so forth and it doesn't really seem like he serves a purpose but this changes when loki shows up here when we basically find out that thor has been taking all these weapons and like throwing them to a singular location and uh, we're really on a boat and uh which is kind of cool to see thor like partying on a yacht but still loki showing up here i like the way that jason aaron does this because thor is immediately hostile to him right because he's like hey look you stabbed freya in the back at the beginning of this whole thing the start of the war of realms and it was a poison dagger and freya was unconscious and almost dead for quite some time but again the way that jason aaron has done this he's been writing loki in such a way to where it seems like there's actually something else going on and jason aaron's been tight-lipped about it like we have no idea it's just there's something else happening here aside from loki just turning against freya and joining malekith in the war of realms we don't know exactly what it is but it, it seems like he's not entirely evil anymore and so when he when he ends up basically telling thor he essentially tells him look you're gonna have to go on a journey here and this journey you're gonna go on is going to locate one of the weapons you're looking for but it's the weapon that will win the war and so it's kind of cool because that entices thor to a degree enough for him to kind of stop and then ask the question what are we talking about and loki says well you have to go on a journey and find out and opens a portal and sends thor off to another location now, the funny thing about this is thor is just like nope i'm not going alone and grabs loki and drags him in <laughs> and loki's just like what are you doing man like like you're gonna mess up the spell <laughs> So it was kind of a funny moment between two brothers, and we end up finding out that where Loki has taken Thor to is the realm of Niflheim. Now, I want to have a little bit of a discussion here, and I want to talk about how the War of Realms is kind of what it really means here. So all in all, the War of Realms has only really been confined to a couple different places, or at least shown to us in a couple different places. It has been mentioned, of course, we've seen sort of off and on where it's expanded across the realms, but all in all, it's been dealing largely with like Jane Foster, how she's coping with it, so on and so forth, because she was the, the star of the Thor stories for some time. But the War of Realms, again, is kind of led by Malekith. And so what's going on here in Niflheim is that Niflheim actually houses a subsect of the realm that's called Helheim, which is essentially just the afterlife. Now, we've talked about this before in previous videos, so for those of you guys who have heard this, bear with me, but the realm of Hell in, in Marvel Comics is not a place of, like, punishment, right? Like, it's not a place of, of torment. When it comes to those who follow the Norse mythological ideology but do not die in honorable battle, they go to Helheim. Those individuals who do die in honorable battle, they go to, to Valhalla. Now, that's just confined to those individuals on Earth in Marvel Comics who believe in, like, the, the Norse mythological deities and so on and so forth. Other religions travel to other afterworlds. And so, again, it, it's really kind of spread out across the entire landscape of what could be the afterlife based on different realms and so on and so forth. But what's been going on here is the realm of Hell is currently being ruled over by a guy named Baldur. Now, Baldur, of course, is the brother of Thor, and he's long since been dead. And in true Norse mythology here in the real world, the death of Baldur signals the beginning of Ragnarok. In Marvel Comics, the death of Baldur is just the death of Baldur. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it was just kind of Jack Kirby back in the day following Norse mythology, but making taking a few liberties to kind of make it fit within the confines of, of Marvel Comics. But at the moment right now, there's a few things going on here. Now, for those of you guys who have read my or who have seen my video on Thanos or who have read the actual Thanos comic by Jeff Lemire, you essentially kind of know what's going on. Uh, but what had essentially happened, kind of winding the clock back a little bit, Marvel introduced a character named Angela. Now, Angela was a character. She was really from like the Spawn mythos. The issue was that the creator of, of Angela from the, the Spawn comics left uh, Image Comics and came 
came to Marvel. And when he did, because Image is basically a, a creator owned company, whereby each creation that's made by a writer goes with them, they own it in its entirety. Angela ended up coming along with that particular, that particular creator. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but she ended up coming with that creator. Marvel rolled her in and then didn't really know what to do with her. And so what they did is they wrote a story called Angela, Queen of Hell, where she basically invaded the realm of hell, invaded Niflheim, and then defeated Hela, cast her out of her own realm, and then took it over. And eventually, Balder took the place of Angela, and then that's where things sort of stand right now. So at the moment, Hela is just kind of free floating. She's just out there. Now, originally, she made a bargain with Thanos for the purpose of, re of using his power to re-secure her rule over hell. And we're just kind of in limbo waiting for that to happen, which will actually happen in this story. But at the moment, that's why Thor's brother is the one ruling over hell. Now, the other half of this is a character by the name of Cinder. Now, Cinder, of course, had previously appeared. We talked about her before. But for those, again, who are kind of catching up here, the idea behind Cinder is that she's essentially the daughter of Surtur. Now, Surtur had a lot of offspring, but the difference between Cinder and all the other offspring that he had was that when they were given a choice, Cinder chose the flame. She chose to follow her father's path. And so the result was that Surtur kept his daughter alive. And then when Surtur was killed by Odin, Cinder ascended as ruler of Muspelheim. And so she's the one who just kind of rules everything. And so Balder is technically the ruler of hell, but not really because he just doesn't have the power necessary in order to defeat Cinder. And so things are just sort of in pandemonium right now. Cinder's got her forces all over, all over the realm of Niflheim, trying to find those who are usurpers who would try to take down her power. And so of course, Loki and Thor being here presents a credible threat. And that's the reason why right off the bat, the forces of Cinder start to arrive and they have to basically face off against them and cast them out as best they can. Now, again, because of the fact that a lot of these different warriors here are in hell, what this means is that they've effectively died. Niflheim is basically a realm that's really home more to like the deceased or those who represent the deceased. These are individuals whose mythological story sort of goes hand in hand with what it means to be dead, even if they aren't technically dead. I mean, for the most part, they all are. But again, Surtur is effectively making a, you know, kind of making a pact with all of them, basically saying, look, I'm ruling this place. And while she's not really saying it in so many words, she's basically admitting that she's ruling by the skin of her teeth. And what she needs are the forces of all these other guys to go alongside her to one, make sure they won't try to challenge her rule, which is to say, band against her and overthrow her forces, which they could. And at, at, at the other, at the same time, because Cinder herself is essentially working alongside Malekith, who's leading the War of Realms, the alliance between Cinder and these forces in Niflheim would expand the forces of Malekith even further. So again, it's a massive campaign. And that's kind of what's being talked about here. And these discussions with, with Balder, these discussions with Thor, with Tyr, who actually joins their ranks. Again, another, another friend of Thor who's been dead for quite some time. Now, this is kind of a cool scenario because when this whole thing happens, what you end up basically getting is, is the return of Hela with Fenris and, or I guess Fenrir, I think is how you pronounce it, Fenrir. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that name, but again, basically showing back up here and saying, look, like I'm here to reclaim my realm. So again, it's kind of cool to see all this pop off, but everything sort of, of shuffling and, and being moved around and being bounced around. Now, again, it's, it's kind of interesting because for Hela herself, her ability to reclaim the realm, not necessarily guaranteed in the sense that Hela is powerful, especially inside her own realm. But just because she returns to the queen of hell doesn't mean that everybody would honor that, that return. Everybody would say, okay, we recognize you as a legitimate queen. And so what this means is that for Hela, she basically forms a marriage with Balder in order to effectively secure the allegiance of those who are loyal to Balder, as well as maintain those followers who are loyal to her. And so because of the fact that this alliance is, is basically being formed here, the forces of Hela and Balder and Thor face off against the forces of Cinder. And for the most part, they hold their own. But what they need here is an additional source of power. What they need here are those individuals who are capable of fighting. Because within the realm of Hell, these are like murderers and thieves and different things like that. And even if they were going to fight alongside Thor, which they're not, they're not really warriors. Because if they were warriors, they would be in Valhalla. And so because of this, the issue that Thor faces is you cannot simply go to Valhalla, right? Like it's the one place you can't access. When Odin created Valhalla and established it as a place for the for those who died in honorable battle, the perspective of Odin was they did their time. They fought their fight. They don't need to fight anymore. And so they basically need to spend the afterlife in peace, enjoying their stories, telling their tales, getting drunk. That's it. And so it's basically a peaceful afterlife. Cutting it off from really the entirety of the universe where no one can access it is the only way to guarantee that. Now, again, we are talking about the power of Odin, which is not absolute. There are those out there who are more powerful than he is. And that's one of the cool things about Loki is that what Loki does is basically tell Thor, I can get you there. Like I can get you into Valhalla because one of the things to bear in mind when it comes to Loki's character is that as powerful as he is and as capable as he is, at the end of the day, he's not on the same level as Odin, but he does know a lot of these back channels for lack of a better word and using his magic to access places he's not really supposed to get to. So in effect, he can use his magic to create a kind of pocket back door, which will give Thor access to Valhalla proper. The issue is that when he gets there, because Odin and the Valkyrie and those who go to Valhalla are the only ones who are supposed to know where its existence is, when Thor arrives, you immediately have Brunhild, the leader of the Valkyrie, who's like, you're not supposed to be here. Like, you're not dead.
dead. And because you're not dead, you cannot access Valhalla. And so she's basically the gatekeeper, the one who decides who can enter and who cannot. Now, at the same time this is happening, at the same time all this is going down, Baldur and even the forces of Cinder are kind of like, look, we're not really siding with Hela proper. And so because Hela really kind of turns her position and tries to kind of brute force her way in, what ends up happening is they're met with the arrival of Thanos. And this is kind of a funny thing, because what this is, is basically Jason Aaron's way of kind of removing Thanos from the equation and throwing him into Infinity Wars. Because Infinity Wars was going on at the time the story was being written. And so the result is that where Infinity Wars was not really good, I would argue this is probably an editorial mandate. Then in reality, Thanos fighting against the forces of, of Niflheim, fighting in hell alongside Hela, would actually be a sight to behold. And so because of the fact that she had previously struck a pact with him, what this does is it leads to Thanos turning against Hela and effectively walking away. And the reason why was because again, Jason Aaron, presumably by editorial mandate, I don't really know what goes on behind the scenes, had to remove Thanos from the equation so Thanos could essentially be a part of like the Infinity Wars conflict. So again, Again, kind of lame here, but Thanos basically leaves and basically walks away and says, hey, look, like my mistress calls and the Infinity Stones demand my attention. So just kind of like Mistress Death is back. I'm going to see her. I'll see you when I see you. Peace. Now, within the context of the story, it works because Thanos has always prized Mistress Death above everybody else. And even in the Thanos line of stories, he basically told Hela, you're no Mistress Death, but you'll do for right now. That's kind of the, the, the stance that he took. And so it made sense for what it was, but Thanos actually leaving and joining the realm of, of, the, of Hell and like facing off against all those forces would have been really, really really cool to see. And so again, with Thor basically speaking directly to Brunhild and essentially saying, look, like we need your forces because the realms are collapsing. We need all the honorable dead that are here in Valhalla. Ultimately, Brunhild ends up agreeing here. Now, this is very big. And the reason why is because this is everyone who's ever fought, who's ever died in honorable battle in the name of the Asgardian mythos. Everyone who's ever died in honorable battle, presumably on Earth, possibly other places who have believed in the Asgardian mythos are here. And so they're basically going to be joining with Thor and showing up to fight against the forces of Hela. And it's actually really, really, really cool to see. And it's pretty awesome to watch it all unfold because when this happens, the forces of Cinder are squashed in almost like the blink of an eye. They are readily crushed. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that just because they're in the realm of Hell does not mean they cannot die again. Now, that's the question that's not answered here. What happens when they do? Originally, before Mistress Death was introduced, there was only the realm of Hell. And so the answer that Stanley and Jack Kirby gave back during the 60s and 70s was that when you die, if you die in honorable battle, you go to Valhalla. If you don't, you go to the realm of Hell, and that's it. When Mistress Death was introduced, then we actually got an afterlife for those who don't believe in the Asgardian mythos. The question that's not being answered here is, if you die either in the realm of Hell or in Valhalla, do you go to the realm of Mistress Death? Is that the one tried and true afterlife. That's not really the answer that we're given here. And so again, with Thor basically taking the power of Hela, like Thor becoming the ruler of Hell, basically using like this flaming battle axe, which looks absolutely amazing, and then crushing the entirety of the forces of Cinder, what this means is she basically retreats. In response to this, Baldur acquiesces, Hela returns back to being ruler of Hell, and for the most part, things kind of seem to be set the way they're supposed to be. And so what this means is that with the realm, the War of Realms effectively starting, that Hela is now back to being ruler of Hell. Things are as they were before. And it's just a matter of, of really asking the question, will the forces of Niflheim, will they join the forces of Thor alongside all the superheroes and presumably supervillains who exist in the Marvel Universe, as well as the warriors of Valhalla to face off against the forces of Malekith? That's really the question that's being asked here. And it's the question we do not have a definitive answer to. Okay, so after what seems like an eternity of waiting, <laughs> the War of Realms has finally begun, and it's just like, oh my god, dude. Okay, I, I, I'm called like I'm, I'm gonna say right now, and I don't, I don't care what anybody says. Jason Aaron's run on Thor is the greatest run on Thor there's ever been, and there's no arguing that point. That's just the way it is. I've been reading Thor since Dan Jurgen started writing it in the 1990s. Like I've been reading Thor for a long time, and like the run of Jason Aaron is the best run. Like it's, it's definitively the best run. So. Basically, all the realms are in shambles right now. <laughs> <laughs> Literally Midgard, which is basically Earth, is like the only realm that's not on the brink of total destruction, right? Like this is the whole basis behind War of Realms. So for those people who haven't really kept up with anything, the way this works is you basically have Malekith the Accursed. He's a dark elf and he's been around for a long, long time. Really the first big campaign he went on was when he got his hands on the casket of ancient winners back in the day. But the idea here is that what Malekith had basically been doing was launching this onslaught on like all of the realms that are out there, right? Like Jotunheim and, and all that stuff, you know, Niflheim and everything. And 
and basically like essentially either conquered them all or killed almost everybody there but essentially like they're all just like derelict spaces now is really all they are everybody who's worth anything has either been killed or they fled as refugees not only that for asgard itself oh it's 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 been torn asunder and we know that because all that happened as a result of uh of of mangog right like that was the whole basis behind the mangog story that mangog was unleashed and when that happened like being one of the only beings that like odin fears that odin's actually like the only thing that odin's actually afraid of mangog basically stormed asgard and just wrecked everything destroyed the bifrost bridge almost killed odin like all the the various asgardians who normally reside here have left and gone to earth because it's the only safe haven and so it makes sense when odin being the only person residing on asgard now is basically met by the arrival of the of like the dark elves who take him out pretty easily now there's a reason why this happens because at the outset like for for those who aren't really sure who haven't really been keeping up at the outset it would be like well odin's way too powerful to be killed by dark elves and that's true under normal circumstances but do not forget mangog took almost all the power of odin to basically hold at bay let alone be like defeated by jane foster like it was the last major story arc for her character so the odin force is readily depleted at the moment like it's almost non-existent there's a little bit left but not enough for odin to really do anything with otherwise he would have fixed asgard and so with him being in such a weakened state he's taken out pretty quickly and so what this does is it switches over to thor now the cool thing about this with thor being in new york alongside a lot of the other asgardians kind of spread across the world that what this does is it leads to the arrival of loki now loki's been kind of like a, a wild card throughout the whole war of realms right like in the beginning of the war of realms it seemed like he was a kind of a, an agent like he was a double agent he was working on behalf of of malekith but while malekith wasn't really aware of it was actually working for his mom only for us to find out he was just kind of pursuing his own goals and was legitimately sided with malekith and so when that happened like he stabbed his mom in the back and she was you know basically unconscious for a while things like that and it kind of allowed jane foster to do her own thing what we end up having to having to come to grips with here and the same thing that, that thor has to deal with is the answer to the question whose side is loki really on it's the one question nobody really seems to be able to answer no one knows whose side loki's on because loki could be on anybody's side but with loki showing up here essentially like injured in such an extreme degree almost on the verge of death the response of thor is take me to where malekith is because the the, the idea behind odin's son here is that, like okay so one he's wielding three hammers which is pretty awesome but literally like he's <laughs> let's talk about that for a second thor wielding three hammers that is amazing i love that's one of the things i love about jason aaron's run right like during god of thunder he was he had like two hammers and like the necro sword but nonetheless it's it's pretty insane in this in this little bit of storytelling here but thor's whole stance is this war starts with malekith thor has to be the one to defeat him now the reality of the situation is that malekith is not someone who can be easily defeated by thor because malekith has all all manner of of, of like you know mystic mystic arts and things like that at his disposal so it's not like thor can just run up on him hit him with a hammer you know cock him over the head one good time and that's the end of that it doesn't really work that way there's a better chance of defeating malekith with thor than without thor and that's literally what he says is like take me to malekith he's the one that started all this i know that we lost the bifrost but malekith has the ability to basically open his own portals to give his people access to different locations give like take me to malekith and i will wipe him out like i will i will destroy him now the funny thing about it is that for for the way that jason aaron writes this it really almost kind of hits on the head that like loki cannot teleport anywhere he wants which is actually not true over the years in marvel comics it's kind of been established that loki has access to these different back doors to different dimensions the way this works when it comes to accessing dimensions is technically there's the front door which is like the direction most people take right like the bifrost is like the front door to a different dimension loki knows the back doors he can sneak in and out to these of these different places without anybody, anybody ever really realizing he was there but in the way it's written here it almost seems like he can't now this could also be the fact that like one of the things that malekith did is cut off people's access access to that realm which is entirely possible but it's not really stated here it's just the bifrost is gone we can't access those realms and so again it seems kind of it seems to limit the idea that like even if loki can teleport in and out of those places that thor cannot go with him it's kind of a weird situation because it seems to kind of contradict a lot of the established history when it comes to loki and the places he's able to access but at the end of the day the the the, the statement's made you know how to get in and out of these places by accessing the kind of backdoor bri uh, bifrost that that malekith uses take me to where he's at and when that happens loki's basically whisked away to Jotunheim which is where Malekith is not and immediately Thor picks up on that Malekith is not here and so with that being the case the response of Thor is there's no way Malekith is here take me to where he's at and the response of Loki is I already have only for us to find out that Malekith is masquerading as Loki now this is a very important thing here and the reason why is because it really hits the nail on the head of just how capable Malekith is and that's one of the reasons why the War of Realms is so cool is because in a lot of ways Malekith is a pretty obscure character to the non-comic book reader and even to some of the 
the comic, some of the normal comic book readers as well, right? Like if I walk up to somebody who's been reading Marvel comics or reading DC comics for five years and I show them a picture of Malekith, they probably won't know who he is. But when you go through and you look at like the lengthy history of his character, he's very Loki-esque in regard to how he functions. And that's what makes Malekith so cool is because what better way to lure Thor away than to basically portray himself as Loki? Not because Thor would ally himself with Loki, but because again, Loki knows all the backdoor channels. Loki is the best way by which Thor can immediately access Malekith and take him out. And that's the one thing Thor wants the most is to eliminate Malekith. And so that's why this is so cool. And that's why it works so well, because then what happens is it's, it's essentially just like this giant battle between Thor and these frost giants. Now, the battle itself largely takes place off panel. Instead, what we do is we switch over to New York and we basically have Spider-Man just kind of swinging about and, and doing his own thing. But then he's basically met by the arrival of Lady Freya. Now, again, all these Asgardians that, that previously existed in the realm of Asgard have taken up refuge on Earth since it's like one of the only safe places. But one of the things that I also want you guys to notice here, and Jason Aaron hasn't really said it to us so much as much as he's shown it to us, but one of the things that Malekith has done is save Midgard for last. And the reason why is because Earth is home to some very, very, very powerful people. And so it'd be foolish for Malekith to initiate the War of Realms and then seek Earth as his first place to conquer because Malekith has been defeated on Earth on more than one occasion. And so it makes sense that if he's going to attack Earth, you know, save it as the last realm and then in turn like amass this gigantic army and then send it there. And so that's one of the reasons why he kind of waited until the very end. But with Spider-Man showing up here and, and basically encountering Lady Freya, it's actually sort of a funny little encounter here. She calls him like the, the man of spiders. And it's interesting because she's like, my son has told me a lot about you, you know, but you know, I didn't really believe the colorful aspects, but I guess it's all true. But the cool thing about this is that from the perspective of Freya, one of the things to bear in mind is that while she hasn't visited Earth all that often, she's well aware of, her, of the exploits of Thor on Earth. And so when she encounters Spider-Man, she knows just by the virtue of what Thor has been telling her that he's not someone to be trifled with. And even if he's not the weakest or not the strongest person on Earth, he's certainly somebody who will do whatever it takes to win. And he'll keep fighting because he's an honorable warrior. This is the kind of thing that Thor communicates to the Asgardians there. And so that's why when like when, when Hildegard and like when Lady Sif show up, when Jane Foster shows up, that, that like Hildegard's just like, there's a giant spider thing here. Let's kill it before it deposits our egg, its eggs in us, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Sif's response is, no, it's just a superhero on Earth. Because again, Sif has dealings with Earthlings. For Freya, her response here is, I'm not really worried about Spider-Man. That's the least of our concerns. The realms are all collapsing. The realms are all falling. They're, they're literally being laid waste to one by one by, by Malekith. And in fact, they're all pretty much conquered. Asgard is really no more. There's no safe haven left. The War of Realms is coming here because there's no place else for it to go. And it's kind of like this all hands on deck situation the way that, that Jason Aaron does it. Because you jump from Doctor Strange, you jump from Daredevil, you jump to Wolverine, you jump to the Punisher, you jump to all these different characters who are all realizing something's very wrong, that something's happening here. And literally around the time that happens, the War of Realms manifests in its entirety. And it's a full blown invasion of New York from the Frost Giants to the forces of Cinder, who's the replacement for Surtur, from like all these different beings all across the different realms. This massive army amassed by Malekith all just pours into the city of New York. And this is kind of a funny thing here because the way that Jason Aaron plays this is almost kind of like, hey, so these guys kind of have a chance, but at the same time, you're kind of like, but no, they don't either. There's not enough Incredible Hulks. There's there's no Thor here. He's on Jotunheim, right? Like there's not, there's like, we don't even know what the Sentry's doing. He's out in space somewhere because he's a perfectly blended version of himself in, in the void. Like we don't know where he is. He's out there somewhere. Hyperion and the Squadron Supreme, we don't know where they are. Things are popping off and like all the powerhouses are seemingly nowhere to be seen here. And so of course this calls in the Avengers. It brings in like Carol Danvers. It brings in Iron Man. It brings in Black Panther, you know, Captain America and, and all these different guys. But for the most part, like they're a stopgap measure. There's no real way they can win here. It's almost a repeat of the events of Ragnarok, right? Like for those of you guys who remember during the events of Ragnarok for Thor disassembled, it was literally Loki leading a giant army against Asgard and everybody died. There was really nobody who could stand against him. And that's what's happening here. You've got Malekith the Accursed, one of the most powerful beings out there. You've got uh, you've got Enchantress who has insane levels of magical ability. You've got all these different characters. And for the most part, like you've got Captain America who can run and run really fast and punch really hard and he's got a shield. You've got She-Hulk who's almost the Incredible Hulk, but not really. You've got Black Panther who can like move really really fast and he's the king of the dead presumably still you've got carol danvers who's probably the strongest among all the individuals here like you got spider-man with a spider sense you really have no one who can stand against these guys you know there's no one here right now who can really do anything with these forces and that's what happens they all start getting torn to pieces and then suddenly you're met with the arrival of loki and that's when the tide appears to change that's when it really seems to shift but it's kind of a crazy thing here because when loki starts addressing you know starts talking to his mom when he cuts off the hand of his father he starts addressing his mom the idea is well I don't 
trust you, Loki. And Loki's response is, well, I have a way for you to learn to trust me. I have a way for you to show that I'm, I'm a genuinely good guy. And what ends up happening is Loki basically sacrifices himself by getting eaten by his father, which is kind of crazy because then it's like, well, then where do you go from here with Loki? Like what, like what else is there to do? But that's the crazy scenario is Loki basically said, you have to go find Thor. You have to go locate him. If you guys don't have Thor, there's no way you can win. All of it rests on his shoulders. And that's what's so awesome here because now what it turns into is kind of a race to rescue Thor. But while all that's going on, when the Hounds of Hell are coming out, when like the Warriors of Heaven are coming out, when you've got like the Queen of Cinders, again, like the leader of Muspelheim, like the new Surtur, like like when, you, when you've got all these different characters all showing up here, the Earth seems to be doomed. And meanwhile, on Jotunheim, all you have is Thor fighting against what seems to be like this, this basically endless horde of frost giants that just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming and keeping him sidetracked. But even if he defeats them all, it won't matter because the Bifrost is gone. There's seemingly no way for Thor to leave Jotunheim. There's no way to get him out of there. Thor's out there by himself, and it seems that for all intents and purposes, Earth is literally going to be conquered. Okay, so we are getting into the War of Realms Part 2, and um, again, like, I'm really digging War of Realms. Like, I'm digging the whole Thor War of Realms story, right? Like, and, and it's, okay, here's the reason why. What makes the War of Realms so awesome is that, like, everything in Jason Aaron's run led up to it. That's what made it so cool. Because, like, we'll actually see a character here named Dario Agger. We'll talk about him. He was a character who popped up in the very early stories of uh, Jason Aaron on Thor. It's cool to kind of see all those little tidbits sort of brought back in, but one of the things I do want to draw your attention to is Jane Foster. Now, the way this picks up is, again, it's basically like like all these forces of Malekith, right? Like, cause that's one of the things to bear in mind. Malekith has basically organized and brought in all these forces from like all the other realms and use it to invade earth. Now the front face that Malekith puts on is, well, I just wanted to save earth for last. But the reality of it is that earth is home to some very, very powerful people. Some very, very powerful characters, but showing up with like a whole host of, of basically like armies from Muspelheim, from the realm of Surtur, the land of the dark elves, like all these forces that Malekith has brought to bear has basically like landed in New York and it's a full scale panic. It's just evacuation. Let's get out of here as soon as we can. And a lot of the people are basically traveling into Doctor Strange's Sanctum St. Torum, right? Because one of the things about when it comes to Doctor Strange's home is that it's, while it is a confined space, it does have like closets and doors and, and little rooms and things like that that expand on for like eternity, right? So it can house like an endless number of people. But for Jane Foster herself, a lot of you guys will notice Jane Foster is alive. And a lot of you are probably scratching your head in terms of how is that happening because Jane Foster died. There was literally a story called The Death of the Mighty Thor. The way this worked out was that after Jane Foster had died, that what Thor had done is he had basically taken like the storm inside the hammer of Mjolnir and tried to use that as a means to basically resurrect Jane Foster. And then of course, once Odin jumped in, then of course, Jane Foster was brought back to life. Now, the reason for why Jane Foster was allowed to live again was because of the sacrifice she made to save the Asgardians. And so essentially what it meant is that as a warrior people, like she was willing to sacrifice and actually did sacrifice her life in the name of protecting those who needed her help, but basically died like a warrior's death. And we know that because her soul went to Valhalla. And so she was going to be accepted into Valhalla proper, but once everything popped off and basically like, you know, the, the forces of Odin and, and Thor were able to resurrect her, she was brought back to life and cured of her cancer. Now, the reality is that that took me by surprise. I thought she was just going to die and like that would be the end of Jane Foster. I'm glad she's back because it, it makes, it, it leaves room for her to become Thor again, which is something I'd really be excited about. But uh, for, from here, it switches over to like the Punisher. And this is one of the coolest things, right? Because you have the main forces, right? Like you've got like the the angels from from uh, from the 10th realm or from, you know, the realm of, of heaven, basically, which we'll talk, talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But then you've also got like these soldier guys who are just kind of mopping up everything else. And like, as they're going through, like, of course, because Dark Elves have a weakness to iron, they can't stop the Punisher. And and like one of them is like, why why are you guys failing so disastrously? This is like a guy. How could you possibly not be able to kill a guy? And they're like, because he has an unlimited supply of iron. He's just like mowing everybody down with machine guns. Dude, the Punisher is a beast. Not only that, it's actually the Punisher and Wolverine teaming up. We'll actually cover that in a different video, but it's, it's pretty awesome to see them working together. Uh, Captain America, of course, jumping in. You've got Iron Man, you got the Avengers. But one of the things I want you guys to notice here is it's really kind of like we're doing the best we can, but we're not doing much. Because when it comes to the Avengers facing off against, you know, Earth, Earthbound threats, usually what you expect is something along the lines of like, hey, here's like a singular being who's a threat to Earth. Not like an army of, of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of forces who just invade the planet and start attacking everything. Now, one of the other big reasons why New York is being conquered so easily is because the X-Men aren't here. Remember, Age of X, the story that nobody's reading, is currently 
currently going on right now. And so because of that whole thing taking place, like the uncanny X-Men in terms of like a full legitimate roster is basically gone. You've got Cyclops and Wolverine and a smattering of other characters. And like, that's all you have an uncanny X-Men right now. The mutants are, they're, they're doing whatever it is that's going on in Age of X and that's it. But if we had like a full contingent, like all the uncanny X-Men, all oh, the battle would shift dramatically because the, because mutants are just so powerful. But again, it's kind of a cool little thing to see here. One of the things that also hits on is Dario Agar. Now, the idea is that, that with Avengers Mountain, there's all kinds of tools and resources they can use, right? Like that's the new Avengers headquarters. We saw that in the first video we did on Avengers, which you'll find down in the description when they basically kind of change the origin of the universe and all that kind of stuff. And like they, they basically exist inside of a giant celestial more or less. But because of the fact that they're cut off, the reason for this comes from Dario Agar. And that's why I say it's cool to see him kind of make a return. So Dario Agar is basically like the leading guy with Roxxon Oil. And Roxxon Oil is like this hyper corrupt organization, right? That basically has his hands in like everything. If it comes to like, like any, any illegal activity you can imagine, Roxxon Oil has a hand in it. But given the resources of Roxxon, what they've done is hacked, hacked the Avengers HQ and then shut off their ability to like teleport anywhere or really do anything. So they're essentially stuck in New York, or at least they're, they're, they can, they can leave. But like in terms of getting all their resources to their availability, they're kind of stuck here. Now, at this point, things get kind of interesting because what we do is we switch over to Doctor Strange and then like the Coven of Witches of Malekith. Now, Malekith does have War Witches and the War Witches are very, very powerful. The problem with the War Witches is that technically they should not be able to defeat Doctor Strange, right? Like that's the big kind of thing is, is at this point, the mantle of Sorcerer Supreme when it comes to Doctor Strange is really more of like a title than an actual role he lives up to. And the reason why is that while he is the most powerful sorcerer, the, mo the most powerful practitioner of magic on Earth, you see these stories intermittently where he's like not the most powerful sorcerer in the universe. And by virtue of being the Sorcerer Supreme, he's supposed to be the universe's most powerful practitioner of magic. But over the years, Marvel's kind of shifted that up. Now he's a lot more, a lot more limited, which makes the stories a little more interesting because you've got to kind of find a way to write a story about a guy who's the Sorcerer Supreme and can do almost anything, but not really, and then make it compelling, which of course we've seen done before. But in this instance, with him being Sorcerer Supreme, that name kind of flies in the face of the idea that like he should be the strongest person there, but he's not because this coven of witches are able to basically kind of shut down his power to a degree, basically block access to different different things for Doctor Strange to be able to pull off. And it makes it kind of intriguing because if the War Witches are really that strong and the Realm of the Dark Elves is outside the main Marvel Universe, I'm sorry, in a different dimension in the universe, it should still apply, right? Because like Doctor Strange is the most powerful practi practitioner of magic in this house. And that closet over there in this house is where these War Witches are from. So technically speaking, he should be more powerful than them. But again, it's the nature of Doctor Strange. It gets a little finicky and it gets a little strange. You've also got Enchantress facing off against uh, against Ghost Rider. Now, while Robbie Reyes is not technically Johnny Storm or Danny Ketch, still, the fact remains that, like, as the Ghost Rider, he's basically powered by, by Hellfire by Mephisto. And so it stands to reason that he should be able to topple Enchantress. And it's kind of interesting that he's not. There's a little bit of inconsistency here. But again, it's not a great big huge deal. And so it's kind of a cool little thing because following all this, while all this is happening, you suddenly have Odin showing up here with a Valkyrie. Now, this is a dangerous game. And the reason why is that while the Valkyrie are exceedingly powerful, the Valkyrie are the women who shepherd the souls of those who die in honorable battle to Valhalla. But with them being here on the battlefront, what this is designed to do is basically say it's a last ditch effort. Every single warrior that can be used by the Asgardians is being thrown into this fight because that's how capable this whole thing is. And that's where it's very easy to lose focus of all this is that when you're talking about like this, this whole conflict going on, you're essentially talking about various beings out there who in some, in some degree have power akin to Thor, if not a little more powerful or a little weaker. But by and large, almost all these guys who are fighting on behalf of Malekith are all stronger than your average Avenger. They're stronger than Captain America. They're stronger than like Iron Man or any of those guys. All these guys are exceedingly capable. And so again, because of the fact that the Coven of Witches is ultimately taken down by Jane Foster, what this does is it allows Doctor Strange to essentially like use his magic and then essentially like create a giant gateway of sorts that allows like all these various people who are still here instead of funneling into his house, grab them all and snatch them all away. The problem with this is that this is a kind of power Doctor Strange doesn't use very often. What it does is it, it, it drains him by a huge margin. So he's essentially just like totally exhausted. Doctor Strange has to rest. Odin, of course, has to rest. And is basically marshalling all these forces and creating the groups that are going to branch off to face off against these various characters. Now, we kind of knew that by way of the solicitations, right? We saw like there's War of Realms 1 and War of Realms 2. And then you start branching off into the little titles, right? So you have like the War Scrolls books and different things like that. You've got like the various forces who, who go off to achieve various goals. One of these groups is going to serve the purpose of going to Jotunheim and finding Thor. Other groups will serve other purposes, but this is usually how that pattern goes, right? Like we've seen that play out in a wide array of different crossovers over the years of Marvel Comics. In Civil War, you had Captain America's uh, Secret Avengers, you had Iron Man's Mighty Avengers, and then you had the actual like Iron Man Avengers group proper 
doing its own thing. So again, like in this scenario where you literally have Jane Foster watching everything unfold, what we end up finding out here is that Brunhild had, she'd basically been killed. And, and the question that's being asked is if like all the Valkyries are dead, then what happens to those who die in honorable battle? Where do they go? You know, is there, there cause there's nobody there to shepherd them to Valhalla, which means their souls will never truly find peace. It's, it's basically one of these things where it's like, we don't know what to do now. Like all the, the characters who really stood a chance to defeat Malekith are essentially out of the picture right now. You got a, a smattering of people here and there, but none of these are like really heavy hitters. And that's kind of what they need to a degree. Things are really bad is basically what this means. <laughs> Things are really, really bad. Now, the one thing I will say here, and that's what's kind of ironic about it, is that it doesn't really seem to show that, right? Like, you don't really feel that. It's just like, it really kind of seems to lack the idea that, like, things are really, really dire for the superheroes. That tone and kind of emotion really kind of seems to be lost a little bit. But again, it's actually kind of cool to sort of see the story take place. Because the one thing that I really don't like when it comes to events is that, like, oftentimes, every single issue will end on the note that, like, and this is when everyone dies. You kind of get tired of that. So it is kind of a cool feeling to see it sort of continue on. But again, you know, I'm loving War of Realms. It's pretty awesome. Like, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> I'm really digging it. Okay, so we are continuing on with the War of Realms, which I love. I love the War of Realms. I'm glad it's turning out the way it is because it's just like, all right, like this is kind of what it's all been building towards, right? Like everything with Jason Aaron's run of Thor. And that's why I say Jason Aaron's run is going to go down as like one of the greatest runs in Thor history. Like that's, that's, it's amazing the way it's turned out. But again, like Earth is really kind of on its last legs, right? Like the invasion of Malachis seemingly came out of nowhere. And so what it means is like, there's no safe refuge here. And so because of that, like with all this unfolding the way that it is, with Odin basically undertaking the Odin sleep to recharge his energies with Thor missing on Jotunheim and Earth's heroes kind of scattered to the winds trying to protect what they can where they can it turns into we can't really just kind of rest on our laurels and play defense we basically have to start going on the offensive and so the plan of Freya is twofold the first is to destroy the black Bifrost of uh, Malekith and the second is to find Thor now remember the Bifrost itself was destroyed by Mangog when he attacked Asgard and even Asgard itself was mostly destroyed and so because of the fact that the, Bla the, the Bifrost was eliminated there's no real way to send anybody in or anybody out. And so the result of this is that they have to basically go to the Black Bifrost of Malekith and destroy that because that's how Malekith is sending his forces across all the nine realms and consolidating them all back onto Midgard. And so at the same time, Thor is basically missing here. Again, it's, it's one of those cool little things here because what ends up happening is you basically kind of get like this return of the Secret Avengers more or less. Now, the Secret Avengers was a concept that was established during the Heroic Age, right? And the way this worked out, you had Joe Quesada's whole thing where it was like revamp it all, right? Like rework, revamp it all, all that kind of good stuff. So the Avengers were disassembled. We got the new Avengers and then about seven or eight years later the Avengers came back again and so as a result of that during that whole era you had an event called Dark Reign and Dark Reign was a story that actually came out of Secret Invasion when you had Norman Osborn who became the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and so as a result of that with Norman Osborn taking over he did what bad guys do and he basically dismantled S.H.I.E.L.D. he established Hammer and then tried to conquer everything so finally once Dark Reign finishes and then the whole thing comes to an end Captain America is put in uh, he's basically put in charge of the whole like intelligence organization more or less he disbands Hammer and he reforms shield but when he does that he creates like these small little avengers teams here and there and one of them is the secret avengers it's basically a black ops team but what we end up getting here is this mission for him to go to jotunheim to get thor and then bring him back again basically the secret avengers carrying out the carrying out the task that they always had so it's cool to see the secret avengers coming back at the same time what we do is we switch over to asgard and we switch over to daredevil basically becoming the new heimdall now this is not something that we really see very often right in fact i don't think we've ever really seen this before where heimdall has allowed somebody else to especially an earthling to lift his sword and then recreate the Bifrost. But what this does is it allows the Bifrost to be reformed. And basically like the heroes uh, really kind of have a chance here as opposed to having almost like a guaranteed loss. So it is kind of cool and, and it is really interesting. But again, switching back to the Secret Avengers, this is one of the cool little moments that you don't see all that often in Marvel Comics. When people think about characters like Wolverine, right? Like they think about like his healing factor, they think about like his enhanced senses and so on and so forth. And even when you kind of expand beyond Wolverine and you look at characters like Storm who can control the weather, things like that, they really really only look at that through the lens of like how it affects earth but when it comes to characters like this they're universal right i mean storm she can control the weather on any other planet she's on so long as it has a climate that can deal with inclement weather that provides that kind of that kind of scenario and so because of that um when it comes to wolverine his ability to track senses it's universal no matter where he is in the universe he can pick up a scent of somebody uh, if they're in the general vicinity now it's not like wolverine can pick up a scent on earth and then travel to the other side of the universe and then track the scent back to earth it's not that it's not that strong it's not that capable 
capable. But in this instance, he knows the scent of Thor. And so no matter where Thor is, Wolverine can pick it up if he's on the same planet, essentially. Like if the winds blow and things like that, and he can pick up the scent. And so that's literally when they're in Jotunheim and they're like, okay, so like we know how to find Thor. Now there's two ways to find Thor here. The first is by, you know, using Wolverine to track his scent. The second is by following this giant river of, of frost giant blood that's literally flowing through the entire planet because Thor's killing so many of them, which is kind of cool. <laughs> It's kind of awesome. But again, the other part of this is you also get to a degree something akin to the Dark Avengers in the sense that you've got Punisher, you've got Blade, you've got Captain Marvel, um, um, and then you've got, you know, She-Hulk. So and you kind of get like the Dark Avengers. So literally like the Secret Avengers and the Dark Avengers sort of reform. Now, it's not really the Dark Avengers in the traditional sense. The Dark Avengers were just villains masquerading as Avengers during Dark Reign, but it's the Dark Avengers insofar as you're dealing with darker elements of the Avengers team. So that's why I really kind of call it the, the Dark Avengers. It's really in name only, but you know, with Ghost Rider and all those guys, there, it really still just kind of serves the purpose. But the fact remains, like with them breaking into Svartalheim and then trying to find their way directly to where um to where the, the Black Bifrost is, things pop off exactly the way you would expect because you've basically got Blade and Punisher on one team. That's not going to go well for anybody. <laughs> what you end up having is literally Punisher being like, let's just kill them all. And you've got Blade like, I agree. And before anybody else is like, maybe we should think about that, they take off their masks and they start attacking everybody. <laughs> Which is kind of cool to see because that's the way they work, right? That, that's why they were so cool is because Blade will just run in with his sword and just kill everybody, you know, kill all the vampires he sees. And Punisher will just run in and just shoot up all the villains he sees. And like no quarters given, none of that stuff. It's just like you all, you all have to die. And it's kind of cool to see. These aren't really guys who are well known for their tact. They just go in and attack things. So it's kind of interesting to see. Now, from here, we switch back over to Earth and we actually change over to Europe. And we basically pick up with the fall of Dane Whitman, what looks like Megan and the new Captain Britain. And this is interesting here because what you have is Malekith wielding the ebony sword. Now, this is a huge deal. For if you're if you're not familiar with the stories of like of, of Black Knight, which it's probably fine if you're not, Black Knight is pretty obscure when it comes to like the comic book landscape. But the ebony blade was a sword that was fashioned by by Merlin. Now eventually it was given to a guy named Percy, and basically he started wielding it to like attack everything and, and just like kill people, which gave it a bloodstained curse, right? So like the blade the blade basically like ash for blood and it'll it'll corrupt the person who wields it. But in Marvel Superheroes number 17 in 1968, there was a storyline that was established where Merlin had put a kind of spell on the blade so that the person who wielded it could be injured but never killed. And so what that means is that as long as Malekith wields the ebony blade, he cannot be killed. For Earth superheroes, he's almost beyond reproach now, right? Like almost completely untouchable. There's really nothing they can do for him. But seizing control of this, uh, you basically end up having him like run in and just start like attacking things again, which is kind of cool, which is which is is, is, is interesting and it serves its purpose. And I don't know why I said that, um, that it was uh, Carol Danvers on the the Dark Avengers team. That's not her. She's not in. She's not. She's not there. She's not in Svartalheim. <laughs> <laughs> she's in Europe. That was uh, that was Freya. Um, no, she's in Europe with like with the existing Captain Britain, Venom, and Deadpool, and then uh, and then actually, well, really like Hulk Vereen. Hulk Vereen is weird. Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Hulk Vereen was basically a character created by William Stryker as uh, during the events of like the first X, uh, I think it was X Force story or something like that by Greg Pak, and it was basically trying to create like an ultimate being that could kill mutants. Uh, ultimately, it was defeated, and then you know Hulk Vereen kind of went out on his own and did his own thing. It's okay. It's just Wolverine Hulk kind of merged together and like tearing things up uh and then of course venom being there now remember as far as i'm aware this is not eddie brock venom this is venom without this is the venom symbiote acting of its own accord without eddie brock remember we covered that in the venom stories with donny cates that you basically had like the venom symbiote and eddie brock which separated from each other and now the venom symbiote's out there doing its own thing absent eddie and so again like that really kind of seems to be what's going on here that theme is being maintained either that or it just kind of got snapped back together and i was somehow totally unaware of it so with that being the case it's really just kind of like marshalling what forces they can and it's kind of cool because we get the sort of overview of what's going on by Jason Aaron, right? That's one of the great things about Jason Aaron writing. Jason Aaron will be like, okay, so here's where things stand. And then a bunch of stuff happens. And now here's where things stand. And then a bunch of stuff happens. It's really good because he's really, really good at kind of keeping you aware of like what all is going on at any point in time. And essentially what's taking place here is the world's gone to pot. That Atlantis is basically being attacked. Name of the Submariner fighting like flaming space sharks, which is kind of cool. Um, You have like like the, the angels, like literally the warriors of heaven of the, the 10th realm of the, the angels, which was cut off by Odin a long time ago. Uh, they've basically invaded Wakanda, so they're attacking the Dora Malashe. I mean, you've got like rocks on oil and everything. The only thing really protecting Manhattan right now is a Fantastic Four. Something for you to notice, Reed Richards looks like John Krasinski. I just want to throw that out there. He looks exactly like John Krasinski. I really hope somebody noticed that. <laughs> 
<laughs> I really hope somebody saw that. But again, like switching back over to where the Dark Avengers are in Svartalheim, once they actually access the Black Bifrost, suddenly Freya comes to the realization that the main Bifrost has been destroyed yet again. And so with the main Bifrost being destroyed, it seems like there doesn't really seem to be a way to bring it back. You would expect there would with Daredevil basically wielding the power of Heimdall, but again, it doesn't seem like that's the case because right now they're in the midst of fighting everybody. So literally you have like this giant horde of Dark Elves that came flooding into uh, into what remained of Avengers Avengers um, Mountain. And then basically you have like Daredevil and all of them fighting them with not enough time, no real opportunity to recreate the Bifrost because it takes time. And so with that in mind, like the, the, the argument is, okay, if that Bifrost is done, if that Bifrost is dead, then what it basically means is if we destroy this Black Bifrost, there's no way for us to get out of Svartalheim. We're trapped here. By the time they do reform the Bifrost or find some way to basically save us, we'll be killed by all the forces of Malekith because we're literally in his base of operations. And so we're in the worst possible place we could be to get stuck. And so the result is we hold we hold the Bifrost. We hold the Black Bifrost. We keep everybody at bay as best we can. We hold everybody back for as long as we can. And we and, and we literally do whatever we can do in order to keep everything going. And that's basically it. <laughs> There's no real option there. And so what we do is we pick back up with the Secret Avengers, again, finally locating Thor. But here's the problem. Thor at the moment right now is in the midst of a Berserker rage. Now, Thor usually enters the midst of this rage when battle goes on for too long. And it's literally exactly what you expect it is. It's Thor when he essentially loses his mind, loses all form of sanity, and really any understanding of who he is, and almost reverts to an animalistic state. It's very similar and almost completely identical to Wolverine's Berserker Rage. And so because of that, if they walk up to Thor right now and they say, hey Thor, we're here to rescue you, Thor will kill them. What you have to do is give it time to calm down. And so most likely what's going to happen is you're basically going to have Thor like kind of come down off his Berserker Rage. Hopefully you're going to have Thor fighting all, fighting like the Secret Avengers. That's going to make one hell of a clickbait video. Hopefully you're going to have that, but basically they're going to kind of like, they're going to have to bob and weave, dodge attacks until he starts to kind of wind down, right? Like it's like letting your adrenaline begin to drop off. Then it'll be regular Thor, who again is missing his arm, which hopefully it'll get reattached. <laughs> Okay, so we are covering War of Realms Part 4. Like, we're finally getting back into War of Realms. It's been like three weeks since we covered Part 3. Okay, so War of Realms, for those of you guys who are kind of playing catch-up here, uh, War of Realms is a story where basically earth is like the last stand for like all the asgardians or at least what's left of the asgardians really all the other nine realms right i mean that's one of, that's, that's what we kind of talked about in like the last three videos right that like you have malekith the accursed who's basically this dark elf this evil dark elf uh dark elf who's been co like conquering all the other realms that exist out there so like muspelheim the realm of surter which is currently being ruled by his daughter cinder as well as like the fall of asgard which is kind of ironic because malekith didn't really have to do anything all he had to do was unleash like mangog right like this force of of evil that just horrifies everybody who has to fight it <laughs> and really like this immutable and indestructible force onto Asgard and then in turn just kind of conquered everything but at this point in time you kind of have the groups that have sort of split off right and this story actually picks up or really focuses largely on not really Freya but the team that was I guess really the secret Avengers the team that was designed to face off against um well not really the secret Avengers but the team that was designed to face off and and essentially like take out the black Bifrost now remember when it comes to Marvel Comics and it comes to the Bifrost it's essentially a worm I mean, it's a wormhole by different names, but it's a wormhole. I mean, it does create a physical bridge that you can use to like teleport yourself to another realm, but there has to be a an access point on the other side. I don't know. It's kind of a hard example to describe, but the basis behind this is that you can't, it has to be a two-way door, right? So like you have a, a door on one side where Asgard is, which is usually where the Bifrost is located at. And then you have a door on the other side, which could be like the main Marvel universe, like Earth, which is called Midgard or like Jotunheim where the frost giants are or, or the realm of, uh, the realm of like Nadavalir where the dwarves dwell and they build weapons and things like that. Um, you have to have the door on the other side. And where the, the Bifrost in Asgard was destroyed, Malekith actually built his own Black Bifrost, which allowed his forces to enter into the other realms. And that's how he's been getting around so fast. It was one of the things that was that was kind of thrown out to us, and, and it really it kind of made sense the more we thought about it. But at the same time, we've also got like the rescue of Thor, right? We talked about that in the previous video where Thor had basically been tricked and whisked away to the Frost Giants, where he was just kind of destined to fight for presumably until he exhausted against what was a basically a battle of attrition, right? Like just an almost endless number of frost giants. And then by the time he was located by the secret Avengers, uh, he was in like a, his, his berserker rage, right? That's one of the things we talked about with Thor is Thor has a berserker rage that doesn't really come out all that often, but it will if Thor engages in a battle and becomes bloodlusted and it lasts long enough, right? Because that's kind of the, the stages of Thor. You have like baseline Thor that we know of, right? The one who's just kind of like, let's go fight some enemy or something like that. But if he goes into like a fierce battle and he's fighting for his life and then that goes on long enough, 
he'll almost kind of go into a feral state and then go into a berserker rage much like what Wolverine does where he doesn't really recognize anybody he knows he just attacks everything he sees now the benefit to that is it amps up Thor to like an extreme degree the downside of that is he could attack you <laughs> and so that's kind of the danger of like the secret Avengers showing up there and having to rescue him and like talk him down is it's literally like okay man so like he could kill us all so we kind of have to be on our guard now of course all this leads to the secret Avengers retreating back to Avengers Mountain which of course is located in the body of a dead celestial and this is kind of an important thing here because what Jason Aaron does is almost kind of defy conventional wisdom a celestial for the most part they were actual beings at one point in time but by whatever manner and whatever means which has never really been fully explored they basically kind of evolved past a baseline mortal form and kind of became beings of pure energy and when that happened they kind of maintained these shells almost like what Galactic has that sort of regulates their energy but they can be defeated when they're destroyed they end up going to what's basically this bar that's occupied by a being called the fulcrum now a lot of that was covered in uh neil gaiman's eternals but the fulcrum is maybe the one above all maybe it's not we're never really given a definitive answer and we never have and we may never get one but celestials can be killed and so with this celestial being dead what jason aaron again is kind of defying conventional wisdom by saying there's still energy within this celestial which really shouldn't be that way so it means one of two things either he's totally changing the mythos on what happens to celestials when they die or this celestial is not dead and so it's, it's, it's kind of cool you know to see that see this sort of scenario play out but of course it ends up being shuri who basically like uses the power of the celestial to destroy a whole bunch of the forces of the of the frost giants and the forces of cinder uh, from muspelheim and and so on but it's a huge amount of energy being let off now of course while that's going on you have freya who's basically using like the black sword and and crushing all these enemies which is kind of par for the course but the big thing that comes out of this is odin makes his return now odin has arisen from the Odin sleep but he's done it prematurely now that's a very important thing for us to understand here and the reason why is that when Odin you know because of the vast amount of power he possesses letting all that energy off using all that energy really requires him to basically rest his mortal form right not really his mortal form but to rest his physical form and I guess it is mortal insofar as he can die but to basically rest his essence right like to basically sit down and rejuvenate and recuperate which is called the Odin sleep but because of the huge amount of power he possesses the more of that power he uses the longer he has to recharge right so it's like rechargeable battery if you if you take a take a rechargeable uh, rechargeable battery off and you use you know you use it for like five or six minutes and then you put it back on it'll take less time to charge than if you totally used the entire battery it'll take more time to recharge that's how odin works now the massive amount of power he possesses the odin force he uses is huge in scale but because of the fact that he used a huge amount of it to try to face off against mangog and was ultimately unsuccessful what this means is that when he kind of reawakened he's not fully charged and so this is not odin at 100 percent power if odin was at 100 percent power this war will be over like that because odin's just that powerful he's just that capable i mean the forces that are at play here are dwarfed by the power of odin and that's consistently happened across the board right i mean with the exception of like of like surter in his home realm and sometimes outside of asgard depending on the case but the fact that odin was able to imprison him really indicates odin overpowers him uh the forces of like malekith things like that but more often than not odin at like 100 full strength facing off against a foe can usually defeat most of them of course again there's a few here and there that he can't beat super powerful cosmic entities different things like that but in this scenario he'd be able to overpower them but being in a weakened state of course he wants to know where is my wife uh what's going on with freya because he's kind of been overhearing these little tidbits of a conversation and the little tidbits of conversation he's been hearing is basically that like freya's still on svartalheim and she's basically trying to protect the dark bifrost of malekith now with that being the case what this means is that with a huge amount of power at their disposal all these different forces facing off against her while the power of the black sword does amplify what what freya can do and it makes her really really capable she can still still exhausted she can still be tired and so that's basically what will happen again it's a war of attrition the forces keep coming and coming and coming and eventually she'll just wear out and then she'll end up falling and that's really the fear of odin is that his wife will die because she doesn't have the odin force she cannot fight for uh, for an extended period of time she can fight about as long as any asgardian can and probably a little bit less than most because she's not really battle hardened and while she is older that does take a physical toll on her body and so again like it's kind of a funny thing because what ends up happening is in the midst of all this tony stark basically chimes in remember he's back alive now that's covered in dan slot's iron man run where he basically cloned his body and then put his essence put his mind into it and then came back right we've seen him do that a couple times before so it's not really an, a new thing that dan slot thought up but what he does is he sits down and he says okay look so like we kind of knew that you were going to make a return somewhere along the line it was only a matter of when and so what we did is we started making preparations what we've done is built you a suit that will serve the purpose of allowing you to like go into battle despite the fact that you may not be fully recharged right because there have been times in 
Marvel Comics where Odin has, has undertaken the Odin sleep and he's been in the Odin sleep for years, right? Like just for years. I mean, not like 20, 30, 40 years, but like two, three or four years. Like he's been asleep for a long time. And so with that being the case, it was kind of like, we don't know exactly when he's going to return, but we do know that when he does return, he probably won't be at 100% power. Now, again, while all that happens, you kind of have Freya who again, basically falls. And that's because Malekith has shown up in, Far in Svartalheim. Now, the way this works in Marvel Comics is something I want to talk about for a second. The way it works in Marvel Comics is you have various beings or entities or deities or, or, or whatever they're defined as, like Dormammu or Mephisto or Sidorak, who gives a juggernaut his power. You have these various beings that have what are called home dimensions. And what that means is that as so long as they're in that home dimension, they're at peak strength. And so Malekith isn't really like Mephisto, right? Like the longer Mephisto, the devil basically of Marvel Comics, the longer he stays away from his home dimension, the weaker he gets. With Malekith, it's not really that way. But in his home dimension, he usually is more powerful than he is if he's outside of his home dimension. Now, again, he's still a force to be reckoned with outside of Svartalheim, but here in Svartalheim, he's pretty strong. Not only that, he's cunning and he's battle hardened. And so showing up here and with Freya wielding her sword, she's not really experienced. She's she's not Thor. And so when this happens, like she's taken out by Malekith pretty quickly. He literally throws like a spear through her and essentially takes her out. And where he intends to kill her, suddenly we end up having Odin who shows up with his Iron Man armor. Now, this is kind of a cool thing, but it also doesn't come out of nowhere. And that's one of the funny things about this is that, you know, kind of the, the, the Iron Allfather is really what it's called. You know, like Odin gets Iron Man armor, essentially. <laughs> uh, when it comes to Tony Stark, um, for the most part, with his Iron Man armors that he's developed over the years, they've largely been confined to himself, right? I mean, it's usually kind of been like, okay, I need a pseudo armor to achieve a particular goal, right? Like I need to sneak into some place and I can't be detected. So I'm going to build myself a suit of armor that can basically camouflage. It can, for all intents and purposes, refract light and become invisible. And then it's things like, I need to be able to travel through space. So I need a suit of armor that will let me travel through space. And depending on where I need to go, uh, sometimes achieve speeds that are not necessarily faster than light, uh, but are exceedingly fast, right? So when he was part of the Guardians of the Galaxy, then there's like the classic Iron Man armor where he just fights on earth and, and it's pretty straightforward. But we've also seen instances where he's built suits of armor for other beings out there, right? For people that are beyond his own, uh, beyond himself. We've seen him do it with Thor. We've seen him blend uh, Thor armor. I'm sorry, uh, Asgardian technology with his own and then create like weapons. And so it was only a matter of time before something like this happened. And I have to admit the suit of Odin actually looks pretty badass. Like it looks pretty beast. <laughs> it's even got like built in eye patch where like it just covers one of his eyes. It's kind of cool. I think it would have been like really Tony Stark. Like it, it would have been so Starky if like Tony Stark came along and was like, I gave it two eyes. And it's like, but why? I can only use one. It's like, I don't know. I just kind of felt like it should have two eyes. I, mean, I, I think it would have been funny. <laughs> <laughs> There's just one eye there that he can't use. I don't know. Make Odin believe that he has two eyes. Like, hey, I've got two eyes again. Yay! Like, I, I don't, I don't know. But him showing up here, what it does is it basically like mainlines and channels the Odin force. And so it's a, it's a suit of armor built by Iron Man that's designed to regulate and channel the power of the Odin force for Odin himself. Now, likely he will keep this armor, and that's kind of the cool thing is we can see him use it in the future. And that's why stories like this are so cool is because these small little tidbits get thrown in that will likely play a bigger role later on down the line but again like in this this particular conflict where him and freya start facing off against each other they're ready to die and that's kind of an important thing here right because for an asgardian uh, at least an asgardian warrior the greatest death they can achieve is to die in honorable battle that's why valhalla is such a huge mythos in in, in marvel comics when it comes to like thor dying and things like that joining my brothers in, in the afterlife you know and telling tales of my great exploits and wars and getting drunk and having lots of sex and eating amazing food like that kind of stuff is is really like what asgardians look forward to and so that's one of the things you notice here is they actually kind of welcome this death. And so that's why it's, it's interesting because in this moment, the Black Bifrost is totally destroyed, which means that Odin and, and Freya appear to have been lost in it all, like they're basically dead. And then you have like all the forces of Malekith that have been cut off. Now, what you also have here is the Punisher and you've got the forces of like what's left of, of Asgard in the Avengers Mountain and, and Punisher's like, so these are called guns and like they're very good because they help you get rid of bad guys. Just point and pull this trigger. <laughs> The Punisher is educating Asgardians on the use of guns. And I'm going to be honest, if ever there were anybody to do it, it would be the Punisher. This guy knows how to use it all. It, it is kind of cool to see that that little bit of a moment, that little bit of a discussion between these guys. But then you sort of have, uh, you have Jane Foster who pipes up. Remember, she was made the new All-Mother when Freya left to join the mission to take out the Black Bifrost. And so she is, for all intents and purposes, the leader of the Asgardians, right? Because Thor was gone at that point. There was nobody left to lead the Asgardians. Uh, like Odin was in the Odin sleep, so he obviously couldn't, couldn't partake in the whole battle. 
Loki is basically dead, Thor was, you know, cast out and, and banished to Jotunheim, and Freya herself had to leave, and Heimdall's incapacitated, and so there are really, there were really, like, no Asgardians left, but Jane Foster's also been Thor, and so, like, she was the best person to pick for this role, and so it's kind of a funny thing, because in this moment, what ends up happening is where she steps up and says, like, somebody has to lead this battle, uh, the forces of Malekith are essentially cut off, he can't bring any more forces to Midgard, it's now our chance to turn the tide and to win the war, then you have Odin's son who steps up and says, no, if anybody is going to lead this, it's going to be me, it's going to be, like, the, the, the son of Odin, which makes sense, because, like, Thor's the battle-hardened guy, Thor's the experienced guy, and that's why I kind of like it, because they both get their time to shine, right, I mean, I said it a million times before, I love Jane Foster Thor, she was awesome, you know, and for all the naysayers, whatever, but, like, I, I love the idea of Jane Foster Thor, and so having Odin, I'm sorry, having, like, Odin's son step up and say, hey, look, no, 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 I'm going to lead this battle, because this is a war of Asgard's forces, therefore, like, as, you know, like, a true Asgardian should be the one to lead the, uh, lead this, it's kind of cool, because it's basically Jason Aaron, or at least it seems like Jason Aaron, saying, hey, Hey, like Thor's a character that everybody looks looks to when it comes to like leading a war of Asgardians and really Earth's forces against anybody else. Do I think Jane Foster could have done it? Absolutely. But it makes sense that you would bring like Odin's son in, like Thor, the last guy, because that was a prophecy that was made at the beginning of the story, right? Like Odin's son is the only one who can really win this war. He's the only one that can pull it off. That was the last, you know, little tidbit of advice that was given by Loki before he died. Uh, and so like bringing Thor back and bringing him in makes the most sense. Okay, so picking back up again with the War of Realms, this is actually the conclusion. I mean, there's a conclusion of this, which is actually pretty legit. Like, it's it's pretty solid. And I actually really, really dug it. Now, here's here's kind of the funny thing, though. Odin's son is kind of an idiot. And the reason why is because, like, this whole thing picks up. Remember, like, Odin and Freya, like, Thor's parents, had basically been captured by Malekith. And so, the way the whole... I guess kind of like barrier, magical barrier had been established by Malekith was to ensure that no other Avengers, nobody besides Thor came in, that only Thor could pass through it. And so what Thor ended up doing was actually going to the, going to the Norns, the tree of Idrisil, and then in turn, like taking out one of his eyes, basically like costing himself an eye for wisdom, and then like basically learning the way to essentially defeat Malekith. Now, this is kind of ironic for two reasons. One, because again, Thor's kind of an idiot. I guess Odin's son's kind of an idiot. And two, he's done this before. For people who are looking at this, they're like, but I already thought Thor took an eye out. And that's true. But that was during the events of Ragnarok. When Thor came back during J. Michael Straczynski's run after Ragnarok, he had both of his eyes, and he has ever since. The idea here is that much like we saw during the Ragnarok event, in order to basically gain the wisdom of Odin, he had to follow the same steps as Odin, which was to remove one of his eyes. And so what that basically meant was that he saw essentially the, the way to defeat Malekith. Now, the other reason, uh, the, really the second reason here, and the reason why I say that Odin's son's kind of an idiot is because what he ends up learning is that the only way to defeat Malekith is to get all the versions of himself from across time and band them together in order to fight. Right. Now, it's kind of funny because he's done that before, and you would think, like, that'd be his first thing, right? Like, well, I mean, we defeated God Butcher when we all came together from, like, three different time periods, so, like, let's do that again. Like, you'd think he would figure it out on his own, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of ironic. Still, the funny thing about this is that when they all start to band together, it really is, in a, in a lot of ways, it's kind of a send-off, right? And that's kind of the irony of this, is because when I look at this, and I look at the idea of them making a return, in truth, like, I would have switched them. And I would have had, like, this, this, like, this War of Realms, basically kind of, uh, the, the circumstance anyway, like, with Malekith and all that, I would have done that in place of, like, God Butcher, and then I would have made God Butcher a villain that everybody had to face off against, right? Because God Butcher was super strong. He had the all-black necro sword of, a uh, Null the Symbiote God, and he had, like, all these crazy abilities he was super powerful um and it took like like all three thors couldn't really even beat him at the same time like he managed like ended up taking thor using two hammers and the power of the all black necro sword in order to defeat gore the god butcher so it's kind of crazy because when you set them side by side this almost kind of seems a little anticlimactic in you know in comparison to what we saw at the very beginning of jason aaron's run with the god butcher storyline having said that the god butcher storyline was so good that it really is kind of hard to top that like it was pretty amazing like it was it was pretty stellar but we basically have like modern like like present day odin son we've got his future version right so like the all father thor like from from however many millennia into the future and then you've got his past self and then of course you have jane foster so you kind of have like these different iterations of thor now the fun thing about this is remember mjolnir had basically been thrown into the sun right and the belief was that it had been destroyed or at the very least was beyond reach for like odin's son to go and grab himself the funny thing is that what jane foster had done is she had actually reformed the hammer of thor from like the ultimate universe right like the war thor essentially like reforming his hammer that he had he had taken after thor from the ultimate universe had lost it but it's really just kind of being held together by what's essentially like shoestrings right it's just literally like it's on its last leg after having been reformed but at the very least like the, the cool thing about this is it kind of addresses the situation that, like hey they're kind of a ragtag band right like they're running on what they have they're like the the rebel alliance from star wars right like they're just kind of it's like a shoestring budget basically keeping everything together hope is the only thing 
that keeps them alive, <laughs> you know, by by all standards of measurement. And so you essentially have like like Thor from the past. Who remember, at that point in his past, had not become worthy enough to lift Mjolnir because he hadn't faced off against uh, Hela in order to save Sif. So he hadn't reached that point in his history yet. But then you've also got modern day Odin's son. You've got Jane Foster, and then you've got future Thor. So you got four Thors who basically come racing into this place. And it's kind of a funny thing because when that happens, Malekith's response is, okay, but like only Thor should be able to access this. And it's like, yeah, but it's all Thors from different time periods, which seems to be the one thing that Malekith didn't account for. Now, the other thing about this too is that Malekith has actually bonded himself to the Venom symbiote. Now, here's a, here's a crazy thing about that. When it came to the Venom tie-in for War of Realms, that dealt with Eddie Brock. And we didn't really know what was going to be happening with the Venom symbiote. And it kind of makes sense because with the way the tie-in was done, a lot of the emphasis has kind of been focused directly on Eddie Brock in terms of where he goes next, which is really a large portion of what the Venom story was about because of the fact that you had like Eddie getting the Venom symbiote back and the two of them kind of working together. Then like their first conflict was with Noel, the symbiote God. And then following that, it went into the revelation that like Eddie Brock had a son. Following trends, if history repeats itself, then like the tie-ins will basically still focus on like the main brunt of the story in terms of whatever that tie-in happens to pertain to, in this instance, pertaining to Venom. So it would make sense that it would focus on Eddie Brock and not the symbiote. And so with, with Malekith bonding himself to the symbiote is actually kind of crazy because one of the things that seems to happen here is we don't hear the voice of the symbiote. We just see like literally Malekith using it for his own ends. Now it's kind of crazy because when this happens and he pops up, he's got a crazy looking face and you know, he's got his wings and so on. But the funny thing here is that Malekith does not use the Venom symbiote to its full totality. And the reason why is because he just doesn't know how. And that's one of the important things to bear in mind. That's one of the reasons why when Lee Price got the Venom symbiote, he didn't have like the full power of the symbiote because he didn't know how to use it in its entirety. It wasn't until like Eddie Brock got it back that it was like a whole new host of powers for the symbiote because Eddie was able to push it to its limits and then go a little bit further after Null had woke up some of the powers that it previously had that we didn't know about. But this fight that goes on is simultaneous between the fights in like the Secret Avengers and the, the Frost Giants and so on. It wraps up pretty quickly, like it wraps up pretty fast. But one thing that I want to draw your attention to is that while all of this is happening, while all these fights across, you know, these realms and these forces of, of Malekith are taking place, that energy is emanating from the sun. A storm is brewing, so to speak, you know, no pun intended, but energy is emanating from the sun. And it's kind of crazy because as that goes on, you end up having some of these, uh, some of these trolls who are watching this thing unfold. And what they do is they basically say like, like in the beginning, there was ice and there was fire and that was it. And that really sees you what's going on here. Energy and like at least cold energy, like frost energy, and then heat energy from the sun. And one of the trolls comments and says, this is how everything began. This is how all life originated. Now, remember when it comes to the Asgardian legends in terms of where life began and you know, with regards to the creation of everything that's really relegated to Asgard and Marvel is pretty well accepted that, you know, that, that Odin did not create everything in existence, right? That's just kind of Norwegian mythology or at least uh, as Asgardian mythology. And then that's basically it, right? Like that's really all you get there. So it's really kind of isolated and alone, but what they're doing is they're basically saying like something's being created here. Life is being given. Now, the other cool thing about this is that when you have the, the secret Avengers, right? So like Captain America's guys and those those folks who were facing off against uh, against Lofi, the king of the frost giants in Jotunheim, he actually consumes the casket of ancient winters. For those guys who don't know, the casket of ancient winters is this, uh, this little, literally like this box that if you open it up, it releases the infinite cold of Jotunheim. A lot of you guys saw it in the original Thor movie, that uh, that giant casket looking thing that Loki was holding on to when you first learned that he was basically pro uh, part frost giant. That's the casket of ancient winters. You can channel that energy and you can, you can blanket infinite cold across whatever landscape you want to use. And that's what Lofi intends to do, right? Like Lofi's intention is to basically like, like defeat all these guys here, encase them all in cold, and then travel to Midgard, travel to Earth, and then unleash the power of the casket of ancient winters, which is kind of cool because in truth, like that was really one of Malekith's first big schemes. When Malekith first showed up in Marvel Comics, one of his first big schemes was to steal the casket of ancient winters and open it up on Midgard. And of course he was defeated and he was stopped, but it's cool to kind of see, you know, uh, Jason Aaron make these little hints to like the history of the Thor mythos and really with the villain of Malekith. But with the, with all these Thors showing up and, and going against Malekith himself, the reality is that he was totally unprepared for this. And the reason why is because when it comes to Malekith as a character, he's really more of a magical entity, right? So it's like Doctor Strange. And Doctor Strange is very, very powerful when it comes to like magic and sorcery, but he's not much of a fist fighter, right? I mean, if you throw him in like a fist fight with like the Punisher, well, he's going to get the crap beat out of him because he's really good at magic. He's not really good at fighting. Malekith is much the same way. I mean, granted, he has the enhancements and the various attributes that come along with someone who's of Asgardian mythos, right? So like enhanced strength and speed and durability and all that kind of cool stuff. But when you're talking about him facing off against Thor, that's going to be a challenge for him in and of himself if he's not really able to wield magic. You have him facing off against four Thors and all the magic in the world is not going to help because it's just going to be way too much strength, way too much uh, raw power for him to be able to defeat on his own. And that's where his, his cockiness really begins to get the better of him. And the reason why is because Malekith is a 
aware of who Null is, right? Like the symbiote god. He knows who Null is. He knows the power Null possess. And so because of that, when he bonds himself to the symbiote, his hubris gets carried away. He basically fancies himself a god and very high above his station, like much higher above his station than he actually is. And so the result is that when he when he faces off against these Thors, he's able to get the upper hand for a short amount of time. But at the end of the day, like once this energy starts to reform, it starts to coalesce in the sun and suddenly everybody's made aware of what it is that's happening, we end up finding out that what's been going on is the hammer of Mjolnir has been reformed and it returns right back down to earth and crashes in front of Odin's son. And so it's the coolest thing because he in turn goes and picks it up and Odin's son gets Mjolnir back. And so like when he gets that, well then the battle's over. Like it's basically done. This fight ends like that. It's it's the craziest thing. But it's kind of cool because for those who are, are fans of Thor, right? Like those who are fans of Thor and who have been reading comics for a long time, we all basically knew this is exactly what was going to happen, right? For the new readers, they didn't really know because I mean, they haven't been, they haven't really been reading comics long enough to see the kind of patterns that you see. But from the time Thor lost his, or I guess Odin's son lost his hammer until like now, it was only ever a matter of time until he got it back, until he was absolutely worthy of wielding his hammer again, right? And that's kind of the cool thing because this is like a singular cohesive story arc. So it's like treating it like it's six issues, but spread over multiple years with multiple issues. So again, it's the nature of comics. Things change and then they always go back to the way they were before. It always happens that way. So don't get too torn up over things changing. They always go back. After a while, you just learn to realize the pattern and see what's going on. It's like, okay, cool. Like, like another really good example, Loki was eaten by Lofi and he was believed to have been dead only to cut himself out. So again, like it's, it's everything always goes back to the status quo. It always has and it always will. I mean, just read comics long enough and I promise you, <laughs> I promise you, you will see it happen, right? Like heroes reborn, heroes return. It's the nature of things, right? The actual heroes reborn story arc and the actual heroes return story arc is really what I'm referring to. Heroes return sucked, but nonetheless, uh, getting back into this, <laughs> getting back into the story proper, because of the fact that, that, that Odin's son has Mjolnir back, this is really kind of designed to highlight the power of Mjolnir, just what it's capable of. And that's one of the cool things that, that if you were really kind of reading between the lines and you were really sort of looking at like the contextual circumstance, the way this played out was like once Mjolnir was gone and then the War of Realms began, hope was, was, wasn't really lost so much as things were very, very bleak. But with Mjolnir coming back, because you're talking about a hammer that is by all standards of measurement nearly indestructible and is now back in the hands of Odin's son, then it's just a countdown to when everything ends. It's designed to say, hey, here's what happens when Odin's son or really like anybody bearing the mantle of Thor gets Mjolnir back, then like they win. And that's basically it. <laughs> that's that's basically the way this goes. And so like literally when I say this fight ends like super quick, I mean, it ends in like three pages, like literally like the hammer comes back, Malekith gets hit in the face and then he gets carried away. And that's basically it. He, get, he literally gets torn to pieces and carried away. And that's basically it. Like he's done now. And it's, it's kind of like, wow, like that fast, huh? <laughs> that quick, huh? It's kind of disappointing to see it end that fast. But there are a few things that come out of this. One of the cool things that come out of this is that we're actually going to see like future crossovers between Wolverine and Punisher, which we've seen them before, but they usually fought. It looks like what we're going to be seeing in the future are like, are like team ups between Wolverine and the Punisher, which I'm actually really, really excited about. Um, Daredevil, of course, loses the eyesight of, of Heimdall. He, you know, Heimdall basically goes back to being his normal self and, and Daredevil goes back to being blind. The Venom symbiote, oddly enough, the Venom symbiote, because of the fact that he was basically, you know, possessed by a being of dark magic, when Malekith was freed, the Venom symbiote went back to its normal self, right? Like regained its mind essentially. And so now we're going to see how that follows up going into Donnie Cates' Venom. Jane Foster, we don't know what's going to happen to her. If I'm a betting man, I would say that she would take over the role of the Valkyries, right? She's going to become the new Valkyrie because all the Valkyries are dead, right? Like they're all basically, they were, they were all killed off. So like she's going to become the new Valkyrie. That makes the most sense to me. Loki, of course, goes back to doing the Loki stuff, going, going back to doing like mischievous things. But probably the biggest set of events here, the biggest change to come out of all of this is that following the defeat of Malekith and all of his forces, everything returning to the status quo, the one big change that comes out, Odin steps aside and says, you are now the All Father, which is really Jason Aaron's way of explaining how it is that Thor became that character in the future anyway. I mean, we are always kind of left to assume that Odin just died somewhere along the line. Either he died in battle with like Surtur or he just died of old age or whatever the case is, because because Asgardians can die of old age. He basically died and that left the mantle open for Thor. Instead, that doesn't happen. Instead, what goes on here is Odin actually steps aside and says, you are now the new All Father. Like you are, you are now the new ruler of Asgard. You are essentially the new Odin. Okay, so we are finally picking up with the end of Thor, or I guess really the War of Realms. See, here's the thing. The War of Realms technically has two endings. The first one is in Thor number 15, which is this video, and the second one is War of Realms Omega, but this one's actually better. War of Realms Omega just really kind of sets the stage for what comes next with regards to some of the characters, but honestly, a lot of that stuff's answered here. Um, really, like, you don't even really have to read War of Realms Omega. If you want to, you can, but you don't really have to. What this does is this immediately picks up after Odin makes Thor the new all 
Allfather. Now, that happened, remember, that happened at the end of the, the main War of Realms story, right? Like the actual uh, main event itself in part six. The fact that Odin would like kneel down to Thor and say like, you're the new Allfather is actually sort of overwhelming, right? Because over the course of Marvel Comics history, right? Like in, in the Thor mythos, Thor has always tried to live up to the expectations of Odin, right? Like what Odin wants him to be and what Odin believes he should be. It's kind of been that way ever since he was banished to Earth. Before that, he was just a really impetuous child and he kind of got carried away with himself and he was drinking and fighting and, and really didn't care about like the role that he was meant to take, what it meant to be the actual, you know, ruler of Asgard itself. Instead, he just wanted to go have fun all the time. So basically, Thor was a teenager growing up. <laughs> he was a teenager and just felt like having fun all the time. But Thor actually, like he initially rejects the offer of Odin. That's interesting to me because what it does is it switches over to Jane Foster. Now, this is the question that a lot of people had. What comes of Jane Foster now that Odin's son is back to being Thor, right? Like now that he's reclaimed his title. And for a long time, I always argued that Jane Foster would end up becoming the new Valkyrie, right? Like she would basically take over the role of the new Valkyrie. Because one of the things that Jason Aaron established and, and just kind of going based on knowledge of Marvel and, and trends, you have story arcs where like the status quo gets changed and then it gets changed back. It always goes that way, right? Like that's why I never really never really understood all the people who complained about Jane Foster being Thor because for new people, yes, it made sense, right? Because they're not really familiar with comics. But anybody who had been reading Marvel for any measure of time knew that like Odin's son was going to go back to being Thor right? because that's the pattern that always gets followed, right? So I mean, either it was people looking for a reason to complain or people who just didn't really understand what was going on. But regardless of the situation, Jane Foster essentially has, well really, Jason Aaron kind of makes a change here, right? So Jane Foster ends up going in the hammer of ultimate Thor when she used it essentially broke apart. But what it did is it basically resealed itself or didn't really reseal itself, it bonded itself to her and kind of merged with her. Now, this is Jason Aaron changing the mythos in a pretty big way, right? Because the hammer of ultimate Thor was engineered by humans, right? It was designed by humans. For those of you guys who aren't familiar with this, in the ultimate universe, when Thor was banished from Asgard and showed back up on Earth, there was a lot of, of not really confusion so much as Marvel being a little bit ambiguous and dubious there because Marvel toyed with the notion that Thor was just a crazy guy who believed that he was Thor. Now, we knew the, the truth that he actually was Thor, but when he showed up on Earth, people thought he was crazy. But taking the idea of him basically going forward and becoming a superhero, he was basically given this great big huge like, you know, energy charge suit and a hammer to go with it. But the hammer wasn't really magical in nature. The hammer was just a hammer. And so during the events of Battle World with Secret Wars, uh, when the hammer broke the dimensional bar uh, barrier and landed inside the main Marvel Universe after Secret Wars ended, that it was basically the ultimate hammer of Thor in the main Marvel Universe. And that was the war, the, the hammer of War Thor, right? Like that was the hammer that he used uh, and that ultimately ended up breaking apart. Jason Aaron's changing this in a big way by basically saying that the hammer of ultimate Thor, either it was engineered by humans, but is now changed or it wasn't. I would go by, I would go as far as to say that like it's essentially changed by whatever manner and whatever means the hammer has been modified and been changed when it was reforged and uh, now it could basically take on any form but the idea here is that that this uh, this offers the opportunity for Jane Foster to take on a new role following this of course you know there's a few things that go on kind of some wrapping up here uh Loki because of the fact that he killed his father because he killed uh Lofi this now makes Loki the king of the frost giant so he essentially takes over his father's role what he'll do with that we don't know we'll actually have to kind of follow up after War of Realms to figure out what it is that Loki's going to end up doing with this newfound power for Malekith his torment is actually kind of screwed up. So as, as we know from like the War of Realms and the lead up to the War of Realms, Malekith had escaped the realm of hell, right? Now remember, in Asgardian mythos, or at least in, in Marvel's Asgardian mythos, hell is not a not a, really a realm of suffering. Hell is just where people go, or at least those who believe in the Asgardian mythos, where they go when they're not battle worthy and they don't go to Valhalla. And of course, Valhalla doesn't really exist anymore. And even if it did, Malekith wouldn't go there. The, the realm of hell is just the realm of the dead, right? Now there is a section for pain and suffering, and then there is a section for those who just kind of live out eternity in the realm of Niflheim and so on. And so with Malekith being brought here because he had previously escaped and in a lot of ways really brought shame to, to Hela by kind of embarrassing her by escaping from her realm as well as Carnilla, what this does is it leads to uh, at least to them kind of implementing the suffering on Malekith by going through and saying, okay, so like the dogs that consumed you and tore you apart uh, basically ended up dying shortly after, but we managed to kind of bring them back essentially. But we're not going to have them eat you for all eternity. We're going to have them eat your younger self. And remember, this is the part of Malekith that was always kind of tormenting him, right? This idea that when he was a little baby boy, when he was very, very young, that his mother had sold him off into slavery. And so the result was that he was always just kind of working battlefields and lived this really crappy life. And what ends up happening here is that for him, he lives by this torment, right? Like this, this idea that he'd been sold into slavery and the chip he carries on his shoulder as a result is what he uses as a means to kind of justify his own existence and go forward. It's kind of the thing he needs. And so what they say is like, these dogs are going to be spending all eternity with your, really with your younger self. Uh, and that's really going to be it. And so the belief of, of Malekith is is that this torment is going to involve like all these dogs essentially like either tearing apart uh, tearing apart his younger self
yourself or or something along those lines it's it's kind of screwed up and it's kind of crazy but we'll actually find out it's a little more interesting than jason aaron initially leads it to believe or leads us to believe now following this what we do is we join thor where he's sitting uh sitting at the throne of asgard and determining what it is that he's going to do now this is very very important because when it comes to this the the future of asgard and the future of the nine realms will all be determined by the choice that thor makes here if thor ultimately turns it down and if thor says no then odin will go back to being the all father but the issue with this is that odin really kind of established his weakness here he established the fact that i mean he does love his wife but ultimately his pride is his weakness the fact that he he just kind of abandoned the nine realms and just kind of let things unfold with malekith because his wife was was you know injured and she was on the verge of death now there comes a point when you kind of have to choose or at least in, for for odin anyway because of the role he plays a choice has to be made between duty and personal desire and while it was necessary for odin to stand next to his wife and to be there it was also necessary for him to make sure that things were done to maintain the safety of the nine realms there's no reason he couldn't have done both and so when thor sits down and looks at this his his, his idea is am i worthy to basically be the new all father and I, am i someone capable of doing this is this something i can pull off and that's when he's visited by his by old king thor the future version of himself who basically says yes you are because i am you in the future now i'm not gonna i'm not the best all father there ever was and i certainly am not and not as wise as odin but i am still a good all father in my own right and i'm not a failure right i'm not a person that that led to catastrophe i mean he kind of did right like in the future loki ends up wiping out all life on earth so like he kind of failed i mean they don't really judge thors but if your brother wipes out all life on the planet then then you probably failed i mean that's that's really kind of how it works <laughs> i like that line of logic <laughs> But, but nonetheless, like, it's an interesting scenario because it's like the one thing that Thor has always looked forward to, right? Like, he's always looked forward to the idea of becoming the new Allfather. But once it's presented to him, then he doesn't know. And that's one of the cool things. It's, it's, it's very human in nature, right? Like, there's the thing we always wanted, and then once we get it, we don't know what to do with it. We're like, well, I mean, is it really what I always wanted? Or, you know, you know because you're, you're kind of imagining how things play out versus the reality of how they play out, fantasy versus reality. And so it's 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 a, it's a cool concept. It's, a, it's an interesting idea. And so ultimately, Thor ends up saying yes. And he does does this because Odin comes to him and tells him the one thing that he's never told him over the course of his entire life, that where Odin has always been harsh on Thor, where he's always basically said, you have to do better. You can't just kind of be fine with where you are right now. You constantly have to improve. Odin comes to Thor and finally tells him, I am proud of you. Like, I'm proud of everything that you've done since you've become Thor, since you've basically become the hero you were always meant to be. I'm proud of the man that you've become. And what it does is it emboldens Thor. It bolsters the confidence that he needed. And ultimately, it allows him to basically say, yes, I will take over the throne. Like, I will be the new all father that's what thor ends up doing thor becomes the new odin and it's awesome to see because it's it's a really curious question what direction things will go in what role will thor play because odin was always just kind of in asgard doing his own thing the question now is will thor be as active in like the avengers and things like that now the statement he makes is we're going to clean up midgard and we're going to fix everything and we're going to get everything back to the way it was and then i'll become the all father so we don't know how long that's going to last we don't know how long it'll take him to basically set things back to rights you know following the war of realms and so my question is once that's done Done, what's going to become of Thor? What role is he going to play? Now, of course, this basically, the, the, the story itself ends when we end up finding out that basically the torture of Malekith doesn't really come by way of him watching his younger self being torn apart. Uh, it comes by way of his younger self playing with puppies for like all eternity, which is adorable. It's like the most adorable thing ever. It's so cute. <laughs> if Mariah was watching this, she would be like, puppies. Like it's 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 pretty adorable. You know, it's 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 pretty cute to see. Uh, I was under the impression, like I thought originally like the dogs were just gonna like tear his younger self apart for all eternity. I was like, man, Jason Aaron, you're a dick. Like, if that's what you were going to do, like, that's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> That's awful. I was actually kind of worried about it for a minute there. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's a pretty cool story. You know, I, mean, I really enjoy War of Realms. If I'm being honest, I feel like it's a great way to end the the entire run of Jason Aaron. And I still say to this day, Jason Aaron's entire run, everything from Thor God of Thunder running up to Jane Foster becoming Thor, going all the way into the War of Realms, it's probably the greatest Thor run of all time. Like the greatest single cohesive story of Thor of all time. I think it's better than Walt Simonson's run. It's, it's pretty amazing. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.